The Texts of Taoism, Part 1. By James Legg. Preface. I end the preface to the third volume of these Sacred Books of the East, 1879, I stated that I proposed giving in due course, in order to exhibit the system of Taoism, translations of the Tao Te King by Lao Dees, 6th century BC. The writings of Quang Dees, between the middle of the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, and the treatise of actions and their retributions, of our 11th century. And perhaps also of one or more of the other characteristic productions of the system. The two volumes now submitted to the reader are a fulfillment of the promise made so long ago. They contain versions of the three works which were specified, and, in addition, as appendixes, for other shorter treatises of Taoism, analyses of several of the books of Kuang Di's by Lin Shikung. A list of the stories which form so important a part of those books, two essays by two of the greatest scholars of China, written the one in AD 586 and illustrating the Taoistic beliefs of that age, and the other in AD 1078 and dealing with the four books of Kuang Di's, whose genuineness is frequently called in question. The concluding index is confined very much to proper names. For subjects the reader is referred to the tables of contents, the Introduction to the Books of Quang Dees, Volume 39, pages 127 to 163, and the introductory notes to the various appendixes. The Treatise of Actions and Their Retributions exhibits to us the Taoism of the 11th century in its moral or ethical aspects. In the two earlier works, we see it rather as a philosophical speculation than as a religion in the ordinary sense of that term. It was not till after the introduction of Buddhism into China in our first century that Taoism began to organize itself as a religion, having its monasteries and nunneries, its images and rituals. While it did so, it maintained the superstitions peculiar to itself, some, like the cultivation of the Tao as a rule of life favorable to longevity, come down from the earliest times, and others which grew up during the decay of the Cao dynasty, and subsequently blossomed. Now in mystical speculation, now in the pursuits of alchemy, now in the search for the pills of immortality and the elixir vitae, now in astrological fancies, now in visions of spirits and in magical arts to control them. And finally in the terrors of its purgatory and everlasting hell. Its phases have been continually changing, and at present it attracts our notice more as a degraded adjunct of Buddhism than as a development of the speculations of Lao Dees and Quang Dees. Up to its contact with Buddhism, it subsisted as an opposition to the Confucian system, which, while admitting the existence and rule of the Supreme Being, bases its teachings on the study of man's nature and the enforcement of the duties binding on all men from the moral and social principles of their constitution. It is only during, the present century that the texts of Taoism have begun to receive the attention which they deserve. Christianity was introduced into China by Nestorian missionaries in the 7th century. And from the Xi'an monument, which was erected by their successors in 781, nearly 150 years after their first entrance, we perceive that they were as familiar with the books of Lao Dees and Quang Dees as with the Confucian literature of the empire. But that monument is the only memorial of them that remains. In the 13th century the Roman Catholic Church sent its earliest missionaries to China, but we hardly know anything of their literary labors. The great Romish missions which continue to the present day began towards the end of the 16th century, and there exists now in the India office a translation of the Tao Te King in Latin, which was brought to England by a Mr. Matthew Raper, and presented by him to the Royal Society, of which he was a fellow, on January 10, 1788. The manuscript is in excellent preservation, but we do not know by whom the version was made. It was presented, as stated in the introduction, page 12, to Mr. Raper by P. de Gramont, Missionarius Apostolicus, ex Jesuda. The chief object of the translator or translators was to show that, the mysteries of the Most Holy Trinity and of the Incarnate God were anciently known to the Chinese nation. The version as a whole is of little value. The reader will find, on pp. 115, 116, its explanation of Lao's 72nd chapter, the first morsel of it that has appeared in print. Protestant missions to China commenced in 1807, but it was not till 1868 that the Reverend Dr. 
Chalmers, a member of one of them, published his Speculations on Metaphysics, Polity, and Morality of The Old Philosopher, Lao Tse. Meanwhile, Abel Remusat had aroused the curiosity of scholars throughout Europe, in 1823, by his Memoir on the Life and Opinions of Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher of the 6th century before our era, who professed the opinions commonly attributed to Pythagoras, to Plato, and to their disciples. Remusat was followed by one who had received from him his first lessons in Chinese, and had become a truly great Chinese scholar, the late Stanislas Julian. He published in 1842, a complete translation for the first time of this memorable work, which is regarded with reason as the most profound, the most abstract, and the most difficult of all Chinese literature. Dar. Chalmers's translation was also complete, but his comments, whether original or from Chinese sources, were much fewer than those supplied by Julian. Two years later, two German versions of the treatise were published at Leipzig. By Reinhold von Plankner and Victor von Strauss, differing much from each other, but both marked by originality and ability. I undertook myself, as stated above, in 1879 to translate four, the sacred books of the East, the texts of Taoism which appear in these volumes. And, as I could find time for my labors on, the texts of Confucianism, I had written out more than one version of Lao's work by the end of 1880. Though not satisfied with the result, I felt justified in exhibiting my general views of it in an article in the British Quarterly Review of July, 1883. In 1884 Mr. F. H. Balfour published at Shanghai a version of Taoist texts, ethical, political, and speculative. His texts were ten in all, the Tao Te King being the first and longest of them. His version of this differed in many points from all previous versions. And Mr. H. A. Giles, of H.M.S. Consular Service in China, vehemently assailed it and also Dr. Chalmers's translation, in the China Review for March and April, 1886. Mr. Giles, indeed, occasionally launched a shaft also at Julian and myself. But his main object in his article was to discredit the genuineness and authenticity of the Tao Te King itself. The work, he says, is undoubtedly a forgery. It contains, indeed, much that Lao Tzu did say, but more that he did not. I replied, so far as was necessary, to Mr. Giles in the same review for January and February, 1888, and a brief summary of my reply is given in the second chapter of the introduction in this volume. My confidence has never been shaken for a moment in the Tao Te King as a genuine relic of Lao Di's, one of the most original minds of the Chinese race. In preparing the version now published, I have used First, the complete works of the Ten Philosophers, a Sukao reprint in 1804 of the best editions of the Philosophers, nearly all belonging more or less to the Taoist school, included in it. It is a fine specimen of Chinese printing, clear and accurate. The treatise of Lao Di's of course occupies the first place, as edited by Kui Yu Kuang, better known as Kui Kanshan, of the Ming Dynasty. The text and commentary are those of Ho Shang Kung, Int Rod, page 7, along with the division of the whole into parts and 81 chapters, and the titles of the several chapters, all attributed to him. Along the top of the page, there is a large collection of notes from celebrated commentators and writers down to the editor himself. Second, the text and commentary of Wang Pai, called also Fu Zi, who died A.D. 249, at the early age of 24. See Introduction, page 8. Third, Helps, Lit. Wings, to Lao Di's, by Zio Hung, called also Zio Hao, and prefaced by him in 1587. This is what Julian calls the most extensive and most important contribution to the understanding of Lao Di's, which we yet possess. Its contents are selected from the ablest writings on the treatise from Han Fei, Intrad, p. 5, downwards, closing in many chapters with the notes made by the compiler himself in the course of his studies. Altogether the book sets before us the substance of the views of 64 writers on our short king. Julian took the trouble to analyze the list of them, and found it composed of three emperors, twenty professed Taoists, seven Buddhists, and thirty-four Confucianists or members of the literati. 
He says, these last constantly explain Laodice according to the ideas peculiar to the school of Confucius, at the risk of misrepresenting him, and with the express intention of throttling his system. Then adding, the commentaries written in such a spirit have no interest for persons who wish to enter fully into the thought of Laodice, and obtain a just idea of his doctrine. I have thought it useless, therefore, to specify the names of such commentaries and their authors. I have quoted these sentences of Julian, because of a charge brought by Mr. Balfour, in a prefatory note to his own version of the Tao Te King, against him and other translators. One prime defect, he says, though with some hesitation, lies at the root of every translation that has been published hitherto. And this is, that not one seems to have been based solely and entirely on commentaries furnished by members of the Taoist school. The Confucian element enters largely into all, and here, I think, an injustice has been done to Laodice. To a Confucianist the Taoist system is in every sense of the word a heresy, and a commentator holding this opinion is surely not the best expositor. It is as a grammarian rather than as a philosopher that a member of the Ju Chia deals with the Tao Te King, he gives the sense of a passage according to the syntactical construction rather than according to the genius of the philosophy itself. And in attempting to explain the text by his own canons, instead of by the canons of Taoism, he mistakes the superficial and apparently obvious meaning for the hidden and esoteric interpretation. Mr. Balfour will hardly repeat his charge of imperfect or erroneous interpretation against Julian, and I believe that it is equally undeserved by most, if not all, of the other translators against whom it is directed. He himself adopted as his guide the explanations of the Tao Te King, current as the work of Lu Yan, called also Lu Zhu, Lu Tungpin, and Lu Kunyang, a Taoist of the 8th century. Through Mr. Balfour's kindness I have had an opportunity of examining this edition of Lao's treatise, and I am compelled to agree with the very unfavorable judgment on it pronounced by Mr. Giles as both spurious and ridiculous. All that we are told of Lu Yen is very suspicious, much of it evidently false. The editions of our little book ascribed to him are many. I have for more than twenty years possessed one with the title of, The Meaning of the Tao Te King Explained by the True Man of Kunyang, being a reprint of 1690, and as different as possible from the work patronized by Mr. Balfour. Fourth, the Tai Shang Wan Suan Tao Te Kin King, a work of the present dynasty, published at Shanghai, but when produced I do not know. It is certainly of the Lu Zhu type, and is worth purchasing as one of the finest specimens of block printing. It professes to be the production of, the immortals of the eight grottos, each of whom is styled, a divine ruler, T. Kuan, dot. The eighty-one chapters are equally divided for commentary among them, excepting that, the divine ruler, the universal refiner, has the last eleven assigned to him. The text is everywhere broken up into short clauses, which are explained in a very few characters by God, the true helper, the same, I suppose, who is also styled, the divine ruler, the true helper, and comments at length on chapters 31 to 40. I mention these particulars as an illustration of how the ancient Taoism has become polytheistic and absurd. The name, God, the true helper, is a title, I imagine, given to Lu Zhu. With all this nonsense, the composite commentary is a good one, the work, evidently, of one hand. One of several recommendatory prefaces is ascribed to Wan Kang, the god of literature. And he specially praises the work, as explaining the meaning by examination of the text. Fifth, a collection of the most important treatises of the Taoist fathers, Tao Zhu Kin Quan Qi Yao, dot. This was reprinted in 1877 at Kangkau in Kiangsu. Beginning with the Tao Te King, and ending with the Canning Fien. Between these there are fourteen other treatises, mostly short, five of them being among Mr. Balfour's, Taoist texts. The collection was edited by a Lu Yu. And the commentary selected by him, in all but the last treatise, was by a Li Shi Yu, who appears to have been a recluse in a monastery on a mountain in the department of Pauning, Ziquan, if, indeed, what is said of him be not entirely fabulous. Sixth, the commentary on the Tao Te King, by Wu Kang, A.D. 1249-1333, of Lin Quan. 
this has been of the highest service to me. Wu Kang was the greatest of the Yuan scholars. He is one of the literati quoted from occasionally by Zio Hung in his Wings, but by no means so extensively as Julian supposes, observations to Tachis, P. Zlai. My own copy of his work is in the twelfth section of the large collection of the Yuya Hall, published in 1853. Writing of Wu Kang in 1865, Prolegue. To the Shu, P. 36, I said that he was a bold thinker and a daring critic, handling his text with a freedom which I had not seen in any other Chinese scholar. The subsequent study of his writings has confirmed me in this opinion of him. Perhaps he might be characterized as an independent, rather than as a bold, thinker, and the daring of his criticism must not be supposed to be without caution. See Intrad, page 9. The writings of Quang Di's have been studied by foreigners still less than the treatise of Lao Di's. When I undertook in 1879 to translate them, no version of them had been published. In 1881, however, there appeared at Shanghai Mr. Balfour's The Divine Classic of Nanhua, Intrad, pages 11, 12, being the works of Chuang Tse, Taoist philosopher. It was a bold undertaking in Mr. Balfour thus to commence his translations of Chinese books with one of the most difficult of them. I fancy that he was himself convinced of this, and that his undertaking had been, too bold, by the criticism to which his work was subjected in the China Review by Mr. Giles. Nevertheless, it was no small achievement to be the first to endeavor to lift up the veil from Quang Di's. Even a first translation, though imperfect, is not without benefit to others who come after and are able to do better. In preparing the draft of my own version, which draft was finished in April, 1887, I made frequent reference to the volume of Mr. Balfour. Having exposed the errors of Mr. Balfour, Mr. Giles proceeded to make a version of his own, which was published last year in London, with the title of Chuang Tzu, Mystic, Moralist, and Social Reformer. It was not, however, Till I was well through with the revision of my draft version, that I supplied myself with a copy of his volume. I did not doubt that Mr. Giles's translation would be well and tersely done, and I preferred to do my own work independently and without the help which he would have afforded me. In carrying my sheets through the press, I have often paused over my rendering of a passage to compare it with his, and I have pleasure in acknowledging the merits of his version. The careful and competent reader will see and form his own judgment on passages and points where we differ. Before describing the editions of Quang Di's which I have consulted, I must not omit to mention Professor Gablin's Treatise on the Speech or Style of Quang Di's as a contribution to Chinese grammar, published at Leipzig in 1888. It has been a satisfaction to me to find myself on almost every point of usage in agreement with the views of so able a Chinese scholar. The works which I employed in preparing my version have been First, The True King of Nanhua, in The Complete Works of the Ten Philosophers, which has been described above. The commentary which it supplies is that of Kuo Xiang, Intrad. Pages 9, 10, with The Sounds and Meanings of the Characters from Lu Te Ming's Explanations of the Terms and Phrases of the Classics of our 7th Century. As in the case of the Tao Te King, the Ming editor has introduced at the top of his pages a selection of comments and notes from a great variety of scholars down to his own time. Second, Helps, Wings, to Quang Di's by Zio Hung, a kindred work to the one with a similar title on Lao Di's, by the same author, and prefaced by him in 1588. The two works are constructed on the same lines. Zio draws his materials from 48 authorities, from Kuo Xiang to himself. He divides the several books also into paragraphs, more or fewer according to their length, and the variety of subjects in them. And my version follows him in this lead with little or no change. He has two concluding books. The one containing a collation of various readings, and the other a collection of articles on the history and genius of Quang Di's, and different passages of his text. Third, the Quang Di's Su or Quang Di's Made Like Snow, equivalent to our Quang Di's Elucidated, by a Lu Shuqi of Canton Province, written in 1796. The different books are preceded by a short summary of their subject matter. 
the work goes far to fulfill the promise of its title. Fourth, Quan Di Zin, meaning the train of thought in Quan Di's traced in its phraseology. My copy is a reprint, in 1880, of the commentary of Lin Shikang, who lived from the Ming into the present dynasty, under the editorship of a Lu Ku Wang of Kiangsu province. The style is clear and elegant, but rather more concise than that of the preceding work. It leaves out the four disputed books, 18i to XXXI, but all the others are followed by an elaborate discussion of their scope and plan. Fifth, the Nanhua classic of Quang Di's explained, published in 1621, by a Suaning or Zheng, the name is printed throughout the book, now in one of these ways, now in the other, called also Mao Kung. The commentary is carefully executed and ingenious, but my copy of the book is so incorrectly printed that it can only be used with caution. Mr. Balfour appears to have made his version mainly from the same edition of the work. And some of his grossest errors pointed out by Mr. Giles arose from his accepting without question the misprints of his authority. Sixth, Independent Views of Quang Di's, by Hu Wanning, published in 1751. Occasionally, the writer pauses over a passage, which, he thinks, has defied all preceding students, and suggests the right explanation of it, or leaves it as inexplicable. It only remains for me to refer to the repertories of elegant extracts, called by the Chinese Ku Wan, which abound in their literature. And where the masterpieces of composition are elucidated with more or less of critical detail and paraphrase. I have consulted nearly a dozen of these collections, and would mention my indebtedness especially to that called Mei Quan, which discusses passages from twelve of Quang Di's books. When consulting the editions of Lin Shikung and Lu Shuqi, the reader is surprised by the frequency with which they refer to the old explanations as incomplete and unsatisfactory, often as absurd or ridiculous. And he finds on examination that they do not so express themselves without reason. He is soon convinced that the translation of Quang Di's calls for the exercise of one's individual judgment, and the employment of every method akin to the critical processes by which the meaning in the books of other languages is determined. It was the perception of this which made me prepare in the first place a draft version to familiarize myself with the peculiar style and eccentric thought of the author. From Quang Di's to the Tractate of Actions and their Retributions the transition is great. Translation in the latter case is as easy as it is difficult in the former. It was Remusit who in 1816 called attention to the Canning Fian in Europe, as he did to the Tao Te King seven years later, and he translated the text of it with a few notes and illustrative anecdotes. In 1828 Klaproth published a translation of it from the Manchow version, and in 1830 a translation in English appeared in the Canton Register, a newspaper published at Macau. In 1828 Julian published what has since been the standard version of it. With an immense amount of additional matter under the title Le Livre des Recompenses et des Pains, en chinois et en francais. Accompanying the Cotter sent legends, anecdotes et histoires, que font canadier les doctrines, les croyances et les mours de la secte de Tau SSE. In writing out my own version, I have had before me. First, the Tai Shang Kening Fien, with plates and the description of them. A popular edition, as profusely furnished with anecdotes and stories as Julian's original, and all pictorially illustrated. The notes, comments, and corresponding sentences from the Confucian classics are also abundant. Second, the Tai Shang Kening Fien, with explanations collected from the classics and histories, a Cantonese reprint of an edition prepared in the Qin Lung reign by a Xia Qiu Xia. Third, the edition in the collection of Taoist texts described above on page 17, by Su Siate. It is decidedly Taoistic, but without stories or pictures. Fourth, the Tai Shang Kening Fian Ku, by Hui Tang, of the present dynasty. The work follows the commentary of Wu Kang on the Tao Te King in the collection of the Yuya Hall. The preface of the author is dated in 1749. The commentary, he tells us, was written in consequence of a vow, when his mother was ill, and he was praying for her recovery. It contains many extracts from Ko Hung, Introduction, p. 5, Note, to whom he always refers by his nom de plume of Pao Fo Dees, or, Maintainer of Simplicity. 
he considers indeed this tractate to have originated from him. I have thus set forth all that is necessary to be said here by way of preface. For various information about the treatises comprised in the appendixes, the reader is referred to the preliminary notes, which precede the translation of most of them. I have often sorely missed the presence of a competent native scholar who would have assisted me in the quest of references, and in talking over difficult passages. Such a helper would have saved me much time. But the result, I think, would scarcely have appeared in any great alteration of my versions. J. L. Oxford. December 20, 1890. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Introduction 1. Was Taoism older than Laodice? 1. In writing the preface to the third volume of these sacred books of the East in 1879, I referred to Laodice as, the acknowledged founder, of the system of Taoism. Prolonged study and research, however, have brought me to the conclusion that there was a Taoism earlier than his. And that before he wrote his Tao Te Ching, the principles taught in it had been promulgated, and the ordering of human conduct and government flowing from them inculcated. For more than a thousand years, the three religions has been a stereotyped phrase in China, meaning what we call Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. The phrase itself simply means the three teachings, or systems of instruction, leaving the subject matter of each teaching to be learned by inquiry. Of the three, Buddhism is of course the most recent, having been introduced into China only in the first century of our Christian era. Both the others were indigenous to the country, and are traceable to a much greater antiquity, so that it is a question to which the earlier origin should be assigned. The years of Confucius's life lay between BC 551 and 478. But his own acknowledgement that he was a transmitter and not a maker, and the testimony of his grandson, that he handed down the doctrines of Yao and Shun, B.C. 2300, and elegantly displayed the regulations of Wan and Wu, B.C. 1200, taking them as his model, are well known. 2. Laodi's birth is said, in the most likely account of it, to have taken place in the third year of King Ting of the Cao dynasty, B.C. 604. He was thus rather more than fifty years older than Confucius. The two men seem to have met more than once, and I am inclined to think that the name of Laodes, as the designation of the other, arose from Confucius's styling him to his disciples, the old philosopher. They met as heads of different schools or schemes of thought, but did not touch, so far as we know, on the comparative antiquity of their views. It is a peculiarity of the Tao Te King that any historical element in it is of the vaguest nature possible, and in all its chapters there is not a single proper name. Yet there are some references to earlier sages whose words the author was copying out, and to sentence makers whose maxims he was introducing to illustrate his own sentiments. One. In the most distant antiquity, he saw a happy society in which his highest ideas of the Tao were realized, and in the seventeenth chapter, he tells us that in the earliest times the people did not know that there were their rulers. And when those rulers were most successful in dealing with them, simply said, We are what we are of ourselves. Evidently, men existed to Laodice at first in a condition of happy innocence in what we must call a paradisiacal state, according to his idea of what such a state was likely to be. When we turn from the treatise of Laodice to the writings of Kuangdis, the greatest of his followers, we are not left in doubt as to his belief in an early state of paradisiacal Taoism. Huang Ti, the first year of whose reign is placed in B.C. 2697, is often introduced as a seeker of the Tao, and is occasionally condemned as having been one of the first to disturb its rule in men's minds and break up the state of perfect unity. He mentions several sovereigns of whom we can hardly find a trace in the records of history as having ruled in the primeval period, and gives us more than one description of the condition of the world during that happy time too. I do not think that Quang Di's had any historical evidence for the statements which he makes about those early days, the men who flourished in them, and their ways. 
His narratives are for the most part fictions, in which the names and incidents are of his own devising. They are no more true as matters of fact than the accounts of the characters in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress are true, with reference to any particular individuals. But as these last are grandly true of myriads of minds in different ages, so may we read in Quang Di's stories the thoughts of Taoistic men beyond the restrictions of place and time. He believed that those thoughts were as old as the men to whom he attributed them. I find in his belief a ground for believing myself that to Taoism, as well as to Confucianism, we ought to attribute a much earlier origin than the famous men whose names they bear. Perhaps they did not differ so much at first as they came afterwards to do in the hands of Confucius and Laodice, both great thinkers, the one more of a moralist, and the other more of a metaphysician. When and how, if they were ever more akin than they came to be, their divergence took place, are difficult questions on which it may be well to make some remarks after we have tried to set forth the most important principles of Taoism. Those principles have to be learned from the treatise of Laodice and the writings of Kuangdis. We can hardly say that the Taoism taught in them is the Taoism now current in China, or that has been current in it for many centuries. But in an inquiry into the nature and origin of religions these are the authorities that must be consulted for Taoism, and whose evidence must be accepted. The treatise, actions, and the responses to them, will show one of the phases of it at a much later period. 2. The texts of the Tao Te King and Quang Zi Xu, as regards their authenticity and genuineness, and the arrangement of them. I. 1. I will now state briefly, first, the grounds on which I accept the Tao Te King as a genuine production of the age to which it has been assigned, and the truth of its authorship by Laodis to whom it has been ascribed. It would not have been necessary a few years ago to write as if these points could be called in question, but in 1886 Mr. Herbert A. Giles, of Her Majesty's Consular Service in China, and one of the ablest Chinese scholars living, vehemently called them in question in an article in the China Review for the months of March and April. His strictures have been replied to, and I am not going to revive here the controversy which they produced, but only to state a portion of the evidence which satisfies my own mind on the two points just mentioned. 2. It has been said above that the year B.C. 604 was, probably, that of Laodi's birth. The year of his death is not recorded. Zima Qin, the first great Chinese historian, who died in about B.C. 85, commences his biographies with a short account of Laodi's. He tells us that the philosopher had been a curator of the Royal Library of Cao, and that, mourning over the decadence of the dynasty, he wished to withdraw from the world, and proceeded to the pass or defile of Xin, Ku Three, Leading from China to the West. There he was recognized by the warden of the pass, Yin Shi, often called Quan Yin, himself a well-known Taoist, who insisted on his leaving him a writing before he went into seclusion. Laodice then wrote his views on the Tao and its characteristics, in two parts or sections, containing more than five thousand characters, gave the manuscript to the warden, and went his way for, nor is it known where he died. This account is strange enough, and we need not wonder that it was by and by embellished with many marvels. It contains, however, the definite statements that Laodice wrote the Tao Te King in two parts, and consisting of more than five thousand characters. And that Keen was himself well acquainted with the treatise is apparent from his quotations from it, with, in almost every case, the specification of the author. He thus adduces part of the first chapter, and a large portion of the last chapter but one. His brief references also to Laodice and his writings are numerous. 3. But between Laodice and Zima Keen there were many Taoist writers whose works remain. I may specify Lidis, assuming that his chapters, though not composed in their present form by him, may yet be accepted as fair specimens of his teaching. Quang Dis, of the 4th century BC. We find him refusing to accept high office from King Wei of Ku, BC 339-299, Han Fei, a voluminous author, who died by his own hand in BC 230. And Luan, a scion of the imperial house of Han, King of Wei Nan, and better known to us as Wei Nan Dees, who also died by his own hand in B.C. 122. 
In the books of all these men we find quotations of many passages that are in our treatise. They are expressly said to be, many of them, quotations from Laodes, Han Fei several times all but shows the book beneath his eyes. To show how numerous the quotations by Han Fei and Luan are, let it be borne in mind that the Tao Te King has come down to us as divided into eighty-one short chapters, and that the whole of it is shorter than the shortest of our Gospels. Of the eighty-one chapters, either the whole or portions of seventy-one are found in those two writers. There are other authors not so decidedly Taoistic, in whom we find quotations from the little book. These quotations are in general wonderfully correct. Various readings indeed there are, but if we were sure that the writers did trust to memory, their differences would only prove that copies of the text had been multiplied from the very first. In passing on from quotations to the complete text, I will clinch the assertion that Keen was well acquainted with our treatise, by a passage from the history of the former Han dynasty, B.C. 206 A.D. 24, which was begun to be compiled by Pan Ku, who died however in 92, and left a portion to be completed by his sister, the famous Pan Kao. The thirty-second chapter of his biographies is devoted to Zima Qin, and towards the end it is said that, on the subject of the great Tao he preferred Huang and Lao to the sixth king. Huang and Lao must there be the writings of Huang Ti and Lao Dees. The association of the two names also illustrates the antiquity claimed for Taoism, and the subject of Note 1, page 2. 4. We go on from quotations to complete texts, and turn, first, to the catalogue of the Imperial Library of Han, as compiled by Lu Hsan, not later than the commencement of our Christian era. There are entered in it Taoist works by 37 different authors, containing in all 993 chapters or sections, Fien. Ayin, the premier of Kang Tang, B.C. 1766, heads the list with 51 sections. There are in it four editions of Lao Di's work with commentaries, by a Mr. Lin, in four sections, a Mr. Fu, in thirty-seven sections, a Mr. Su, in six sections, and by Lu Xiang, Hsian's own father, in four sections. All these four works have since perished, but there they were in the imperial library before our era began. Quan Di's is in the same list in fifty-two books or sections, the greater part of which have happily escaped the devouring tooth of time. We turn now to the twentieth chapter of Keen's biographies, in which he gives an account of Yo Ai, the scion of a distinguished family, and who himself played a famous part, both as a politician and military leader. And became prince of Wangku under the kingdom of Cao in B. C. 279. Among his descendants was a Yo Khan, who learned in Kai, the words, that is, the Taoistic writings, of Huang Ti and Lao Di's from an old man who lived on the Ho side. The origin of this old man was not known, but Yo Khan taught what he learned from him to a Mr. Ko, who again became preceptor to Zhao Zhan, the chief minister of Kai, and afterwards of the new dynasty of Han, dying in BC 190. 5. Referring now to the catalogue of the Imperial Library of the Dynasty of Sui, d. 589 to 618, we find that it contained many editions of Lao's treatise with commentaries. The first mentioned is the Tao Te King, with the commentary of the old man of the Ho side, in the time of the Emperor Wan of Han, b. c. 179 to 142. It is added in a note that the Dynasty of Liang, a.d. 502 to 556, had possessed the addition of the old man of the Ho side, of the time of the warring states, but that with some other texts and commentaries it had disappeared. I find it difficult to believe that there had been two old men of the Ho side, both teachers of Taoism and commentators on our king, but I am willing to content myself with the more recent work, and accept the copy that has been current say from B. C. 150 when Zima Qin could have been little more than a boy. Taoism was a favorite study with many of the Han emperors and their ladies. Wei Nan Di's, of whose many quotations from the text of Lao I have spoken, was an uncle of the Emperor Wan. To the Emperor King, B.C. 156-143, the son of Wan, there is attributed the designation of Lao's treatise as a king, a work of standard authority. At the beginning of his reign, we are told, 
someone was commending to him four works, among which were those of Lao Dees and Quang Dees. Deeming that the work of Huang Dees and Lao Dees was of a deeper character than the others, he ordered that it should be called a king, established a board for the study of Taoism and issued an edict that the book should be learned and recited at court, and throughout the country five. Thenceforth it was so styled. We find Huang Fu Mi, AD 215-282, referring to it as the Tao Te King. The second place in the Sui catalogue is given to the text and commentary of Wang Pai or Wang Fu Zi, an extraordinary scholar who died in A.D. 249, at the early age of 24. This work has always been much prized. It was its text which Lu Taiming used in his explanation of the terms and phrases of the classics, in the 7th century. Among the editions of it which I possess is that printed in 1794 with the imperial movable metal types. I need not speak of editions or commentaries subsequent to Wang Pai's. They soon begin to be many, and are only not so numerous as those of the Confucian classics. 6. All the editions of the book are divided into two parts, the former called Tao, and the latter Te, meaning the qualities or characteristics of the Tao, but this distinction of subjects is by no means uniformly adhered to. I referred already to the division of the whole into 81 short chapters, 37 plus 44, which is by common tradition attributed to Ho Shang Kung, or, the old man of the Ho side. Another very early commentator, called Yen Zun or Yen Kuen Feng, made a division into 72 chapters, 40 plus 32, under the influence, no doubt, of some mystical considerations. His predecessor, perhaps, had no better reason for his 81. But the names of his chapters were, for the most part, happily chosen, and have been preserved. Wu Kang arranged the two parts in 67 chapters, 31 plus 36. It is a mistake, however, to suppose, as even Mr. Wiley with all his general accuracy did six, that Wu curtails the ordinary text to some extent. He does not curtail, but only rearranges according to his fashion, uniting some of Ho Shang Kung's chapters in one, and sometimes altering the order of their clauses. Zima Qin tells us that, as the treatise came from Lao Di's, it contained more than 5,000 characters, that is, as one critic says, more than 5,000 fewer than 6,000. Ho Shang Kung's text has 5,350, and one copy 5,590. Wang Pai S, 5683, and one copy 5610. Two other early texts have been counted, giving 5,720 and 5,635 characters respectively. The brevity arises from the terse conciseness of the style, owing mainly to the absence of the embellishment of particles, which forms so striking a peculiarity in the composition of Mencius and Quangdis. In passing on to speak, secondly and more briefly, of the far more voluminous writings of Quangdis, I may say that I do not know of any other book of so ancient a date as the Tao Te King, of which the authenticity of the origin and genuineness of the text can claim to be so well substantiated. 2. 7. In the catalogue of the Han Library we have the entry of Quang Di's in 52 books or sections. By the time of the Sui dynasty, the editions of his work amounted to nearly a score. The earliest commentary that has come down to us goes by the name of Kuo Xiang's. He was an officer and scholar of the Xin dynasty, who died about the year 312. Another officer, also of Xin, called Xiang Su, of rather an earlier date, had undertaken the same task, but left it incomplete. And his manuscripts coming, not, as it appears, by any fraud, into Quo's hands, he altered and completed them as suited his own views, and then gave them to the public. In the short account of Quo, given in the twentieth chapter of the biographies of the Xin history, it is said that several tens of commentators had labored unsatisfactorily on Quang's writings before Xiang Su took them in hand. As the joint result of the labors of the two men, however, we have only 33 of the 52 sections mentioned in the Han catalog. It is in vain that I have tried to discover how and when the other 19 sections were lost. In one of the earliest commentaries on the Tao Te King, that by Yen Zun, 
we have several quotations from Quan Di's which bear evidently the stamp of his handiwork, and are not in the current books. But they would not altogether make up a single section. We have only to be thankful that so large a proportion of the original work has been preserved. Su Shi, Di's Can, and Tung Fo, it is well known, called in question the genuineness of books 28 to 317. Books 15 and 16 have also been challenged, and a paragraph here and there in one or other of the books. The various readings, according to a collation given by Zio Hung, are few. 8. There can be no doubt that the books of Quan Di's were hailed by all the friends of Taoism. It has been mentioned above that the names Huang Ti and Lao Di's were associated together as denoting the masters of Taoism, and the phrase, the words of Huang Ti and Lao Di's, came to be no more than a name for the Tao Te King. Gradually the two names were contracted into Huang Lao, as in the passage quoted on page 6 from Pan Ku. After the Han Dynasty, the name Huang gave place to Quang, and the names Lao Quang, and, sometimes inverted, Quang Lao, were employed to denote the system or the texts of Taoism. In the account, for instance, of Qi Kang, in the 19th chapter of the biographies of Xin, we have a typical Taoist brought before us. When grown up, he loved Lao and Quang. And a visitor, to produce the most favorable impression on him, says, Lao Di's and Quang Cao are my masters. 9. The 33 books of Quang Di's are divided into three parts, called Nei, or the inner, Y, or the outer. And Za, the miscellaneous. The first part comprises seven books, the second, fifteen, and the third, eleven. Inner may be understood as equivalent to esoteric or more important. The titles of the several books are significant, and each expresses the subject or theme of its book. They are believed to have been prefixed by Quang Di's himself, and that no alteration could be made in the composition but for the worse. Outer is understood in the sense of supplementary or subsidiary. The fifteen books so called are wings to the previous seven. Their titles were not given by the author, and are not significant of the Taoistic truth which all the paragraphs unite, or should unite, in illustrating. They are merely some name or phrase taken from the commencement of the first paragraph in each book, like the names of the books of the Confucian Analects, or of the Hebrew Pentateuch. The fixing them originally is generally supposed to have been the work of Kuo Xiang. The eleven miscellaneous books are also supplementary to those of the first part, and it is not easy to see why a difference was made between them and the fifteen that precede. 10. Quang Di's writings have long been current under the name of Nan Hua Kin King. He was a native of the Duchy of Sung, born in what was then called the District of Mang, and belonged to the state or kingdom of Liang or Wei. As he grew up, he filled some official post in the city of Zhiyuan the site of which it is not easy to determine with certainty. In A.D. 742, the name of his birthplace was changed, but only for a time, to Nanhua, and an imperial order was issued that Quang Zi should thenceforth be styled the true man of Nanhua, and his book, the true book of Nanhua. To be a true man is the highest Taoistic achievement of a man, and our author thus canonized communicates his glory to his book. 3. What is the meaning of the name Tao? And the chief points of belief in Taoism. 1. The first translation of the Tao Te King into a Western language was executed in Latin by some of the Roman Catholic missionaries, and a copy of it was brought to England by a Mr. Matthew Raper, F.R.S., and presented by him to the Society at a meeting on the 10th January, 1788, being the gift to him of P. Jos de Gramont, Missionarius Apostolicus, ex Jesuda. In this version, Tao is taken in the sense of ratio or the supreme reason of the divine being, the creator and governor. M. Abel Remusit, the first professor of Chinese in Paris, does not seem to have been aware of the existence of the above version in London, but his attention was attracted to Lao's treatise about 1820, and, in 1823, he wrote of the character Tao. So emotimi semblen pa pouvoir etre bien traduit, S.I.C.E. ne par lo M.O.T. Lambda Gamma Omicron don le triple sens de souverain etre, de raison, et de parole. Remusit's successor in the chair of Chinese, the late Stanislas Julian, P. 
published in 1842 a translation of the whole treatise. Having concluded from an examination of it, and the earliest Taoist writers, such as Kuang Di's, Ho Kuan Di's, and Ho Shang Kung, that the Tao was devoid of action, of thought, of judgment, and of intelligence. He concluded that it was impossible to understand by it, the primordial reason, or the sublime intelligence which created, and which governs the world. And to this he subjoined the following note, Quel que trange que puis parader cette idée de laudis, elle n'est pas sans exemple dans l'histoire de la philosophie. Le MOT nature natl pas été employé par certains philosophes, que la religion et la raison condamnant, pour designer un cause premier, a galimant de pourvue de pensée et de intelligence. Julian himself did not doubt that Lao's idea of the character was that it primarily and properly meant a way, and hence he translated the title Tao Te King by Le Livre de la Voix et de la Vertu, transferring at the same time the name Tao to the text of his version. The first English writer who endeavored to give a distinct account of Taoism was the late Archdeacon Hardwick, while he held the office of Christian advocate in the University of Cambridge. In his Christ and Other Masters, Volume 2, p. 67, when treating of the religions of China, he says, I feel disposed to argue that the center of the system founded by Lao Dees had been awarded to some energy or power resembling that nature of modern speculators. The indefinite expression Tao was adopted to denominate an abstract cause of the initial principle of life and order, to which worshippers were able to assign the attributes of immateriality, eternity, immensity, invisibility. It was, probably, Julian's reference in his note to the use of the term nature, which suggested to Hardwick his analogy between Laudis Tao and the nature of modern speculation. Canon Farrar has said, We have long personified under the name of nature the sum total of God's laws as observed in the physical world. And now the notion of nature as a distinct, living, independent entity seems to be ineradicable alike from our literature and our systems of philosophy 8. But it seems to me that this metaphorical or mythological use of the word nature for the cause and ruler of it, implies the previous notion of him, that is, of God, in the mind. Does not this clearly appear in the words of Seneca, vis illum, he? Juvum deum, naturum vocare, non peccabis, hic est ex quo nada sunt omnia, cuja spirita vivimus 9. In his translation of the works of Quang Dees in 1881, Mr. Balfour adopted nature as the ordinary rendering of the Chinese Tao. He says, when the word is translated way, it means the way of nature, her processes, her methods, and her laws. When translated reason, it is the same as Li, the power that works in all created things, producing, preserving, and life-giving, the intelligent principle of the world. When translated doctrine, it refers to the true doctrine respecting the laws and mysteries of nature. He calls attention also to the point that, he uses nature in the sense of natura naturans, while the Chinese expression wan wu, equals all things, denotes natura naturata. But this really comes to the metaphorical use of nature which has been touched upon above. It can claim as its patrons great names like those of Aquinas, Giordano Bruno, and Spinoza, but I have never been able to see that its barbarous phraseology makes it more than a figure of speech 10. The term nature, however, is so handy, and often fits so appropriately into a version, that if Tao had ever such a signification I should not hesitate to employ it as freely as Mr. Balfour has done. But as it has not that signification, to try to put a non-natural meaning into it, only perplexes the mind, and obscures the idea of Laudis. Mr. Balfour himself says, page 18, the primary signification of Tao is simply, road. Beyond question this meaning underlies the use of it by the great master of Taoism and by Quang Di's eleven. Let the reader refer to the version of the 25th chapter of Lao's treatise, and to the notes subjoined to it. There Tao appears as the spontaneously operating cause of all movement in the phenomena of the universe, and the nearest the writer can come to a name for it is, the great Tao. Having established this name, he subsequently uses it repeatedly. C. C. H. 34 and 53. In the third paragraph of his twentieth chapter, Quang Dees uses a synonymous phrase instead of Lao's Great Tao, calling it the Great Thursday, 
about which there can be no dispute, as meaning, the great path, way, or, course 12. In the last paragraph of his 25th book, Quang Di's again sets forth the metaphorical origin of the name Tao. Tao, he says, cannot be regarded as having a positive existence, existences cannot be regarded as non-existent. The name Tao is a metaphor used for the purpose of description. To say that it exercises some causation, or that it does nothing, is speaking of it from the phase of a thing, how can such language serve as a designation of it in its greatness? If words were sufficient for the purpose, we might in a day's time exhaust the subject of the Tao. Words not being sufficient, we may talk about it the whole day, and the subject of discourse will only have been a thing. Tao is the extreme to which things conduct us. Neither speech nor silence is sufficient to convey the notion of it. When we neither speak nor refrain from speech, our speculations about it reach their highest point. The Tao therefore is a phenomenon, not a positive being, but a mode of being. Lao's idea of it may become plainer as we proceed to other points of his system. In the meantime, the best way of dealing with it in translating is to transfer it to the version, instead of trying to introduce an English equivalent for it. 2. Next in importance to Tao is the name Tian, meaning at first the vaulted sky or the open firmament of heaven. In the Confucian classics, and in the speech of the Chinese people, this name is used metaphorically as it is by ourselves for the Supreme Being, with reference especially to His will and rule. So it was that the idea of God arose among the Chinese fathers, so it was that they proceeded to fashion a name for God, calling Him Ti, and Shang Ti, the ruler, and the supreme ruler. The Taoist fathers found this among their people. But in their idea of the Tao they had already a supreme concept which superseded the necessity of any other. The name Ti for God only occurs once in the Tao Te King. In the well-known passage of the fourth chapter, where, speaking of the Tao, Lao Di says, I do not know whose son it is, it might seem to be before God. Nor is the name Tian very common. We have the phrase, heaven and earth, used for the two great constituents of the cosmos, owing their origin to the Tao, and also for a sort of binomial power, acting in harmony with the Tao, covering, protecting, nurturing, and maturing all things. Never once is Tian used in the sense of God, the Supreme Being. In its peculiarly Taoistic employment, it is more an adjective than a noun. The Tao of Heaven means the Tao that is heavenly, the course that is quiet and undemonstrative, that is free from motive and effort, such as is seen in the processes of nature, grandly proceeding and successful without any striving or crying. The Tao of Man, not dominated by this Tao, is contrary to it, and shows will, purpose, and effort, till, submitting to it, it becomes, the Tao or way of the sages, which in all its action has no striving. The characteristics both of heaven and man are dealt with more fully by Kuang than by Lao. In the conclusion of his eleventh book, for instance, he says, what do we mean by Tao? There is the Tao, or way, of heaven, and there is the Tao of man. Acting without action, and yet attracting all honor, is the way of heaven. Doing and being embarrassed thereby is the way of man. The way of heaven should play the part of Lord, the way of man, the part of minister. The two are far apart, and should be distinguished from each other. In his next book, Par. 2, Quang Dees tells us what he intends by, heaven, acting without action, this is what is called heaven. Heaven thus takes its law from the Tao. The oldest sages and sovereigns attained to do the same, it was for all men to aim at the same achievement. As they were successful, vacancy, stillness, placidity, tastelessness, quietude, silence, and non-action would be found to be their characteristics, and they would go on to the perfection of the Tao One Three. The employment of Tian by the Confucianists, as of heaven by ourselves, must be distinguished therefore from the Taoistic use of the name to denote the quiet but mighty influence of the impersonal Tao. And to translate it by God only obscures the meaning of the Taoist writers. This has been done by Mr. Giles in his version of Quang Di's, which is otherwise for the most part so good. Everywhere on his pages there appears the great name, God. 
a blot on his translation more painful to my eyes and ears than the use of nature for Tao by Mr. Balfour. I know that Mr. Giles's plan in translating is to use strictly English equivalents for all kinds of Chinese terms 14. The plan is good where there are in the two languages such strict equivalents, but in the case before us there is no ground for its application. The exact English equivalent for the Chinese Tian is our heaven. The Confucianists often use Tian metaphorically for the personal being whom they denominated Ti, God, and Shang Ti, the Supreme God, and a translator may occasionally, in working on books of Confucian literature, employ our name God for it. But neither Lao and nor Kuang ever attached anything like our idea of God to it. And when one, in working on books of early Taoist literature, translates Tian by God, such a rendering must fail to produce in an English reader a correct apprehension of the meaning. There is also in Quang Di's a peculiar usage of the name Tian. He applies it to the beings whom he introduces as masters of the Tao, generally with mystical appellations in order to set forth his own views. Two instances from Book 11 will suffice in illustration of this. In par. For, Huang Ti does reverence to his instructor Quang Kang Di's 1 5, saying, In Quang Kang Di's we have an example of what is called heaven, which Mr. Giles renders, Quang Kang Di's is surely God. In par. 5. Again, the mystical Yun Kiang is made to say to the equally fabulous and mystical Hung Meng, O oh heaven, have you forgotten me? And, farther on, O oh heaven, you have conferred on me, the knowledge of, your operation, and revealed to me the mystery of it, in both which passages Mr. Giles renders Tian by, your holiness. But Mr. Giles seems to agree with me that the old Taoists had no idea of a personal god, when they wrote of Tian or heaven. On his 68th page, near the beginning of Book 6, we meet with the following sentence, having every appearance of being translated from the Chinese text, God is a principle which exists by virtue of its own intrinsicality, and operates without self-manifestation. By an inadvertence he has introduced his own definition of God as if it were Quang Di's. And though I can find no characters in the text of which I can suppose that he intends it to be the translation, it is valuable as helping us to understand the meaning to be attached to the great name in his volume. I have referred above, p. 16, to the only passage in Lao's treatise, where he uses the name T or God in its highest sense, saying that, the Tao might seem to have been before him. He might well say so, for in his first chapter he describes the Tao, conceived of as, having no name, as the originator of heaven and earth, and, conceived of as, having a name, as the mother of all things. The reader will also find the same predicates of the Tao at greater length in his 51st chapter. The character T is also of rare occurrence in Quang Di's, excepting as applied to the five ancient Tis. In Bank, 3, Par. 4, and in one other place, we find it indicating the Supreme Being, but the usage is ascribed to the ancients. In Bank, 15, Par, 3, in a description of the human spirit, its name is said to be, Thung Ti, which Mr. Giles renders, of God, Mr. Balfour, one with God, while my own version is, the divinity in man, in Bank, 12, Par. 6, we have the expression, the place of God, in Mr. Giles, the kingdom of God, in Mr. Balfour, the home of God. In this and the former instance, the character seems to be used with the ancient meaning which had entered into the folklore of the people. But in Book 6, Par. 7, there is a passage which shows clearly the relative position of Tao and Ti in the Taoistic system, and having called attention to it, I will go on to other points. Let the reader mark well the following predicates of the Tao before there were heaven and earth, from of old, there it was, securely existing. From it came the mysterious existence of spirits, from it the mysterious existence of T, God. It produced heaven, it produced earth 16. This says more than the utterance of Lao, that, the Tao seemed to be before God, does it not say that Tao was before God, and that he was what he is by virtue of its operation? 3. Among the various personal names given to the Tao are those of Zeo Wa, Maker and Transformer, and Zeo Wu Ku maker of things. Instances of both these names are found in Book 6, 
Par. 9, 10. Creator and God have both been employed for them. But there is no idea of creation in Taoism. Again and again Kuang Dees entertains the question of how it was at the first beginning of things. Different views are stated. In Bank 2, Par. 4, he says, among the men of old their knowledge reached the extreme point. What was that extreme point? Some held that at first there was not anything. This is the extreme point the utmost limit to which nothing can be added. A second class held that there was something, but without any responsive recognition of it, on the part of man. A third class held that there was such recognition, but there had not begun to be any expression of different opinions about it. It was through the definite expression of different opinions about it that there ensued injury to the doctrine of the Tao One Seven. The first of these three views was that which Quang Dees himself preferred. The most condensed expression of it is given in Book Twelve, Par. 8. In the grand beginning of all things there was nothing in all the vacancy of space, there was nothing that could be named 18. It was in this state that there arose the first existence, the first existence, but still without bodily shape. From this things could be produced, receiving, what we call their several characters. That which had no bodily shape was divided, and then without intermission there was what we call the process of conferring. The two processes, continued to operate, and things were produced. As they were completed, there appeared the distinguishing lines of each, which we call the bodily shape. That shape was the body preserving in it the spirit, and each had its peculiar manifestation which we call its nature. Such was the genesis of things, the formation of heaven and earth and all that in them is, under the guidance of the Tao. It was an evolution and not a creation. How the Tao itself came, I do not say into existence, but into operation neither Lao and nor Quang ever thought of saying anything about. We have seen that it is nothing material 19. It acted spontaneously of itself. Its sudden appearance in the field of non-existence, producer, transformer, beautifier, surpasses my comprehension. To Lao it seemed to be before God. I am compelled to accept the existence of God, as the ultimate fact, bowing before it with reverence, and not attempting to explain it, the one mystery, the sole mystery of the universe. 4. The bodily shape was the body preserving in it the spirit, and each had its peculiar manifestation which we call its nature. So it is said in the passage quoted above from Quang Di's twelfth book, and the language shows how Taoism, in a loose and indefinite way, considered man to be composed of body and spirit, associated together. Yet not necessarily dependent on each other. Little is found bearing on this tenet in the Tao Te King. The concluding sentence of Ch. 33, he who dies and yet does not perish, has longevity, is of doubtful acceptation. More pertinent is the description of life as, a coming forth, and of death as, an entering twenty, but Quan Dees expounds more fully, though after all unsatisfactorily, the teaching of their system on the subject. At the conclusion of his third book, Writing of the Death of Lao Dees, he says, When the Master came, it was at the proper time, when he went away, it was the simple sequence, of his coming. Quiet acquiescence in what happens at its proper time, and quietly submitting, to its sequence, afford no occasion for grief or for joy. The ancients described, death, as the loosening of the cord on which God suspended, the life. What we can point to are the faggots that have been consumed, but the fire is transmitted elsewhere, and we know not that it is over and ended. It is, however, in connection with the death of his own wife, as related in the eighteenth book, that his views most fully I do not say, clearly appear. We are told that when that event took place, his friend Huides went to condole with him, and found him squatted on the ground, drumming on the vessel, of ice, and singing. His friend said to him, when a wife has lived with her husband, brought up children, and then dies in her old age, not to wail for her is enough. When you go on to drum on the vessel and sing, is it not an excessive, and strange, demonstration? Quang Dees replied, it is not so. When she first died, was it possible for me to be singular, and not affected by the event? But I reflected on the commencement of her being, when she had not yet been born to life. 
Not only had she no life, but she had no bodily form. Not only had she no bodily form, but she had no breath. Suddenly in this chaotic condition there ensued a change, and there was breath, another change, and there was the bodily form. A further change, and she was born to life, a change now again, and she is dead. The relation between those changes is like the procession of the four seasons, spring, autumn, winter, and summer. There she lies with her face up, sleeping in the great chamber 21. And if I were to fall sobbing and going on to wail for her, I should think I did not understand what was appointed for all. I therefore restrained myself. The next paragraph of the same book contains another story about two ancient men, both deformed, who, when looking at the graves on Quanluan, begin to feel in their own frames the symptoms of approaching dissolution. One says to the other, Do you dread it? and gets the reply, No. Why should I dread it? Life is a borrowed thing. The living frame thus borrowed is but so much dust. Life and death are like day and night. In every birth, it would thus appear, there is, somehow, a repetition of what it is said, as we have seen, took place at, the grand beginning of all things, when out of the primal nothingness, the Tao somehow appeared. And there was developed through its operation the world of things, material things and the material body of man, which enshrines or enshrouds an immaterial spirit. This returns to the Tao that gave it, and may be regarded indeed as that Tao operating in the body during the time of life, and in due time receives a new embodiment. In these notions of Taoism there was a preparation for the appreciation by its followers of the Buddhistic system when it came to be introduced into the country, and which forms a close connection between the two at the present day. Taoism itself constantly becoming less definite and influential on the minds of the Chinese people. The book which tells us of the death of Quang Di's wife concludes with a narrative about Li Di's and an old bleached skull 22, and to this is appended a passage about the metamorphoses of things. Ending with the statement that, the panther produces the horse, and the horse the man, who then again enters into the great machinery, of evolution, from which all things come forth, at birth, and into which they re-enter, at death, dot. Such representations need not be characterized. 5. Ku Shi, the prince of literature, described the main object of Taoism to be, the preservation of the breath of life. And Lu Mi, probably of our 13th century 23, in his, dispassionate comparison of the three religions, declares that, its chief achievement is the prolongation of longevity. Such is the account of Taoism ordinarily given by Confucian and Buddhist writers, but our authorities, Lao and Kuang, hardly bear out this representation of it as true of their time. There are chapters of the Tao Te King which presuppose a peculiar management of the breath, but the treatise is singularly free from anything to justify what Mr. Balfour well calls, the antics of the Kung Fu, or system of mystic and recondite calisthenics 24. Lao insists, however, on the Tao as conducive to long life, and in Quang Di's we have references to it as a discipline of longevity, though even he mentions rather with disapproval, those who kept blowing and breathing with open mouth. Inhaling and exhaling the breath, expelling the old and taking in new. Passing their time like the, dormant, bare, and stretching and twisting, their necks, like birds. He says that all this simply shows their desire for longevity, and is what the scholars who manage the breath, and men who nourish the body and wish to live as long as Fang Zhu, are fond of doing twenty-five. My own opinion is that the methods of the Tao were first cultivated for the sake of the longevity which they were thought to promote, and that Lao, discountenancing such a use of them, endeavored to give the doctrine a higher character. And this view is favored by passages in Quang Di's. In the seventh paragraph, for instance, of his book 6, speaking of parties who had obtained the Tao, he begins with a prehistoric sovereign, who got it and by it adjusted heaven and earth. Among his other instances is Fang Zhu, who got it in the time of Shun, and lived on to the time of the five leading princes of Cao a longevity of more than 1800 years, greater than that ascribed to Methuselah. In the paragraph that follows there appears a new you, who is addressed by another famous Taoist in the words, You are old, sir, while your complexion is like that of a child, how is it so? And the reply is, I became acquainted with the Tao. 
I will adduce only one more passage of Quan. In his eleventh book, and the fourth paragraph, he tells us of interviews between Huang Ti, in the nineteenth year of his reign, which would be thirteen. C. 2679, and his instructor Quang Kangdi's. The Taoist sage is not readily prevailed on to unfold the treasures of his knowledge to the sovereign, but at last his reluctance is overcome, and he says to him, Come, and I will tell you about the perfect Tao. Its essence is surrounded with the deepest obscurity, its highest reach is in darkness and silence. There is nothing to be seen, nothing to be heard. When it holds the spirit in its arms in stillness, then the bodily form will of itself become correct. You must be still, you must be pure, not subjecting your body to toil, not agitating your vital force, then you may live for long. When your eyes see nothing, your ears hear nothing, and your mind knows nothing, your spirit will keep your body, and the body will live long. Watch over what is within you, shut up the avenues that connect you with what is external. Much knowledge is pernicious. I will proceed with you to the summit of the grand brilliance, where we come to the bright and expanding, element, I will enter with you the gate of the dark and depressing element. There heaven and earth have their controllers, there the yin and yang have their repositories. Watch over and keep your body, and all things will of themselves give it vigor. I maintain the, original, unity, of these elements. In this way I have cultivated myself for 1200 years, and my bodily form knows no decay. Add 1200 to 2679, and we obtain 3879 as the year BC of Kuang Kangdi's birth. 6. Lao Di's describes some other and kindred results of cultivating the Tao in terms which are sufficiently startling, and which it is difficult to accept. In his fiftieth chapter he says, He who is skillful in managing his life travels on land without having to shun rhinoceros or tiger, and enters a host without having to avoid buff coat or sharp weapon. The rhinoceros finds no place in him into which to thrust its horn, nor the tiger a place in which to fix its claws, nor the weapon a place to admit its point. And for what reason? Because there is in him no place of death. To the same effect he says in his fifty-fifth chapter, he who has in himself abundantly the attributes, of the Tao, is like an infant. Poisonous insects will not sting him, fierce beasts will not seize him, birds of prey will not strike him. Such assertions startle us by their contrariety to our observation and experience, but so does most of the teaching of Taoism. What can seem more absurd than the declaration that, the Tao does nothing, and so there is nothing that it does not do. And yet this is one of the fundamental axioms of the system. The 37th chapter, which enunciates it, goes on to say, if princes and kings were able to maintain, the Tao, all things would of themselves be transformed by them. This principle, if we can call it so, is generalized in the 40th, one of the shortest chapters, and partly in rhyme. The movement of the Tao. By contraries proceeds. And weakness marks the course. Of Tao's mighty deeds. All things under heaven sprang from it as existing, and named, that existence sprang from it as non-existent, and not named, dot. Ho Shang Kung, or whoever gave their names to the chapters of the Tao Te King, styles this fortieth chapter dispensing with the use, of means, dot. If the wish to use means arise in the mind, the nature of the Tao as, the nameless simplicity, has been vitiated, and this nature is celebrated in lines like those just quoted. Simplicity without a name. Is free from all external aim. With no desire, at rest and still. All things go right, as of their will. I do not call any passages from Quan Di's to illustrate these points. In his eleventh book his subject is government by, let it be and the exercise of forbearance. 7. This Tao ruled men at first, and then the world was in a paradisiacal state. Neither of our authorities tells us how long this condition lasted, but as Lao observes in his eighteenth chapter, the Tao ceased to be observed. Quan Di's, however, gives us more than one description of what he considered the paradisiacal state was. He calls it, the age of perfect virtue. In the thirteenth paragraph of his twelfth book he says, in this age, they attached no value to wisdom, nor employed men of ability. 
superiors were, but, as the higher branches of a tree, and the people were like the deer of the wild. They were upright and correct, without knowing that to be so was righteousness, they loved one another, without knowing that to do so was benevolence, they were honest and leal-hearted, without knowing that it was loyalty. They fulfilled their engagements, without knowing that to do so was good faith, in their movements they employed the services of one another, without thinking that they were conferring or receiving any gift. Therefore their actions left no trace, and there was no record of their affairs. Again, in the fourth paragraph of his tenth book, addressing an imaginary interlocutor, he says, Are you, sir, unacquainted with the age of perfect virtue? He then gives the names of twelve sovereigns who ruled in it, of the greater number of whom we have no other means of knowing anything, and goes on, in their times the people used knotted cords in carrying on their business. They thought their, simple, food pleasant, and their, plain, clothing beautiful. They were happy in their, simple, manners, and felt at rest in their, poor, dwellings. The people of, neighboring states might be able to descry one another. The voices of their cocks and dogs might be heard from one to the other, they might not die till they were old, and yet all their life they would have no communication together. In those times perfect good order prevailed. One other description of the primeval state is still more interesting. It is in the second paragraph of Book 9, the people had their regular and constant nature they wove and made themselves clothes, they tilled the ground and got food. This was their common faculty. They were all one in this, and did not form themselves into separate classes, so were they constituted and left to their natural tendencies. Therefore in the age of perfect virtue men walked along with slow and grave step, and with their look steadily directed forwards. On the hills there were no footpaths nor excavated passages, on the lakes there were no boats nor dams. All creatures lived in companies, and their places of settlement were made near to one another. Birds and beasts multiplied to flocks and herds, the grass and trees grew luxuriant and long. The birds and beasts might be led about without feeling the constraint, the nest of the magpie might be climbed to, and peeped into. Yes, in the age of perfect virtue, men lived in common with birds and beasts, and were on terms of equality with all creatures, as forming one family, how could they know among themselves the distinctions of superior men and small men? Equally without knowledge, they did not leave the path of their natural virtue, equally free from desires, they were in the state of pure simplicity. In that pure simplicity, their nature was what it ought to be. Such were the earliest Chinese of whom Kuangdis could venture to give any account. If ever their ancestors had been in a ruder or savage condition, it must have been at a much antecedent time. These had long passed out of such a state. They were tillers of the ground, and acquainted with the use of the loom. They lived in happy relations with one another, and in kindly harmony with the tribes of inferior creatures. But there is not the slightest allusion to any sentiment of piety as animating them individually, or to any ceremony of religion as observed by them in common. This surely is a remarkable feature in their condition. I call attention to it, but I do not dwell upon it. 8. But by the time of Lao and Kuang the cultivation of the Tao had fallen into disuse. The simplicity of life which it demanded, with its freedom from all disturbing speculation and action, was no longer to be found in individuals or in government. It was the general decay of manners and of social order which unsettled the mind of Lao, made him resign his position as a curator of the royal library, and determined to withdraw from China and hide himself among the rude peoples beyond it. The cause of the deterioration of the Tao and of all the evils of the nation was attributed to the ever-growing pursuit of knowledge, and of what we call the arts of culture. It had commenced very long before. In the time of Huang Ti, Kuang says in one place 26, and in another he carries it still higher to Suizan and Fuxi 27. There had been indeed, all along the line of history, a groping for the rules of life, as indicated by the constitution of man's nature. The results were embodied in the ancient literature which was the lifelong study of Confucius. He had gathered up that literature, he recognized the nature of man as the gift of heaven or God. The monitions of God as given in the convictions of man's mind supplied him with a Tao or path of duty very different from the Tao or mysterious way of Lao. 
All this was gall and wormwood to the dreaming librarian or brooding recluse, and made him say, if we could renounce our sageness and discard our wisdom, it would be better for the people a hundredfold. If we could renounce our benevolence and discard our righteousness, the people would again become filial and kindly. If we could renounce our artful contrivances and discard our, scheming for, gain, there would be no thieves nor robbers 28. We can laugh at this. Taoism was wrong in its opposition to the increase of knowledge. Man exists under a law of progress. In pursuing it there are demanded discretion and justice. Moral ends must rule over material ends, and advance in virtue be ranked higher than advance in science. So have good and evil, truth and error, to fight out the battle on the field of the world, and in all the range of time. But there is no standing still for the individual or for society. Even Confucius taught his countrymen to set too high a value on the examples of antiquity. The school of Laodice fixing themselves in an unknown region beyond antiquity a prehistoric time between the grand beginning of all things out of nothing, and the unknown commencement of societies of men. Has made no advance but rather retrograde, and is represented by the still more degenerate Taoism of the present day. There is a short parabolic story of Kuang Di's, intended to represent the antagonism between Taoism and knowledge, which has always struck me as curious. The last paragraph of his seventh book is this, the ruler, or god T, of the southern ocean was Shu, that is, heedless, the ruler of the northern ocean was Hu, that is, hasty, and the ruler of the center was one ton, that is, chaos. Shu and Hu were continually meeting in the land of one ton, who treated them very well. They consulted together how they might repay his kindness, and said, Men have all seven orifices for the purposes of seeing, hearing, eating, and breathing, while this, poor, ruler alone has not one. Let us try and make them for him. Accordingly they dug one orifice in him every day, and at the end of seven days chaos died. So it was that chaos passed away before light. So did the nameless simplicity of the Tao disappear before knowledge. But it was better that the chaos should give place to the cosmos. Heedless and hasty did a good deed. 9. I have thus set forth eight characteristics of the Taoistic system, having respect mostly to what is peculiar and mystical in it. I will now conclude my exhibition of it by bringing together under one head the practical lessons of its author for men individually, and for the administration of government. The praise of whatever excellence these possess belongs to Lao himself, Quang Di's devotes himself mainly to the illustration of the abstruse and difficult points. First, it does not surprise us that in his rules for individual man, Lao should place humility in the foremost place. A favorite illustration with him of the Tao is water. In his eighth chapter he says, the highest excellence is like that of water. The excellence of water appears in its benefiting all things, and in its occupying, without striving to the contrary, the low ground which all men dislike. Hence, its way, is near to that of the Tao. To the same effect in the 78th chapter, there is nothing in the world more soft and weak than water, and yet for attacking things that are firm and strong there is nothing that can take precedence of it. Everyone in the world knows that the soft overcomes the hard, and the weak the strong, but no one is able to carry it out in practice. In his 67th chapter Lao associates with humility two other virtues, and calls them his three precious things or jewels. They are gentleness, economy, and shrinking from taking precedence of others. With that gentleness, he says, I can be bold, with that economy I can be liberal, shrinking from taking precedence of others, I can become a vessel of the highest honor. And in his 63rd chapter, he rises to a still loftier height of morality. He says, it is the way of the Tao, to act without, thinking of, acting, to conduct affairs without, feeling, the trouble of them. To taste without discerning any flavor, to consider the small as great, and the few as many, and to recompense injury with kindness. Here is the grand Christian precept, render to no man evil for evil. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We know that the maxim made some noise in its author's lifetime, 
that the disciples of Confucius consulted him about it, and that he was unable to receive it. 29. It comes in with less important matters by virtue of the Taoistic rule of contraries. I have been surprised to find what little reference to it I have met with in the course of my Chinese reading. I do not think that Quan Di's takes notice of it to illustrate it after his fashion. There, however, it is in the Tao Te King. The fruit of it has yet to be developed. Second, Lao laid down the same rule for the policy of the state as for the life of the individual. He says in his 61st chapter, what makes a state great is its being like a low-lying, down-flowing stream. It becomes the center to which tend all, the small states, under heaven. He then uses an illustration which will produce a smile, take the case of all females. The female always overcomes the male by her stillness. Stillness may be considered, a sort of, abasement. Resuming his subject, he adds, thus it is that a great state, by condescending to small states, gains them for itself. And that small states, by abasing themselves to a great state, win it over to them. In the one case the abasement tends to gaining adherence, in the other case, to procuring favor. The great state only wishes to unite men together and nourish them. A small state only wishes to be received by, and to serve, the other. Each gets what it desires, but the great state must learn to abase itself. All very well in theory, someone will exclaim, but, the world has not seen it yet reduced to practice. So it is. The fact is deplorable. No one saw the misery arising from it, and exposed its unreasonableness more unsparingly, than Quang Di's. But it was all in vain in his time, as it has been in all the centuries that have since rolled their course. Philosophy, philanthropy, and religion have still to toil on, faint, yet pursuing, believing that the time will yet come when humility and love shall secure the reign of peace and goodwill among the nations of men. While enjoining humility, Lao protested against war. In his thirty-first chapter he says, Arms, however beautiful, are instruments of evil omen, hateful, it may be said, to all creatures. They who have the Tao do not like to employ them. Perhaps in his sixty-ninth chapter he allows defensive war, but he adds, there is no calamity greater than that of lightly engaging in war. To do that is near losing the gentleness which is so precious. Thus it is that when weapons are, actually, crossed, he who deplores the, situation, conquers. There are some other points in the practical lessons of Taoism to which I should like to call the attention of the reader, but I must refer him for them to the chapters of the Tao Te King, and the books of Quang Di's. Its salient features have been set forth somewhat fully. Notwithstanding the scorn poured so freely on Confucius by Quang Di's and other Taoist writers, he proved in the course of time too strong for Lao as the teacher of their people. The entrance of Buddhism, moreover, into the country in our first century, was very injurious to Taoism, which still exists, but is only the shadow of its former self. It is tolerated by the government, but not patronized as it was when emperors and empresses seem to think more of it than of Confucianism. It is by the spread of knowledge, which it has always opposed, that its overthrow and disappearance will be brought about ere long. 4. Accounts of Lao Di's and Quang Di's given by Zima Qin. It seems desirable, before passing from Lao, and Quang in this introduction, to give a place in it to what is said about them by Zima Qin. I have said that not a single proper name occurs in the Tao Te King. There is hardly an historical allusion in it. Only one chapter, the twentieth, has somewhat of an autobiographical character. It tells us, however, of no incidents of his life. He appears alone in the world through his cultivation of the Tao, melancholy and misunderstood, yet binding that Tao more closely to his bosom. The books of Quang Di's are of a different nature, abounding in pictures of Taoist life, in anecdotes and narratives, graphic, argumentative, often satirical but they are not historical. Confucius and many of his disciples, Lao and members of his school, heroes and sages of antiquity, and men of his own day, move across his pages. But the incidents in connection with which they are introduced are probably fictitious, and devised by him, to point his moral or adorn his tale. 
His names of individuals and places are often like those of Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress or his Holy War, emblematic of their characters and the doctrines which he employs them to illustrate. He often comes on the stage himself, and there is an air of verisimilitude in his descriptions, possibly also a certain amount of fact about them, but we cannot appeal to them as historical testimony. It is only to Zima Keen that we can go for this, he always writes in the spirit of an historian, but what he has to tell us of the two men is not much. And first, as to his account of Laudes. When he wrote, about the beginning of the first century BC, the Taoist master was already known as Laudes. Keen, however, tells us that his surname was Li, and his name are, meaning ear, which gave place after his death to Tan, meaning long-eared, from which we may conclude that he was named from some peculiarity in the form of his ears. He was a native of the state of Ku, which had then extended far beyond its original limits, and his birthplace was in the present province of Honan or of Anhui. He was a curator in the royal library. And when Confucius visited the capital in the year BC 517, the two men met. Keen says that Confucius's visit to Luoyang was that he might question Lao on the subject of ceremonies. He might have other objects in mind as well. But however that was, the two met. Li said to Kung, The men about whom you talk are dead, and their bones are moldered to dust, only their words are left. Moreover, when the superior man gets his opportunity, he mounts aloft. But when the time is against him, he is carried along by the force of circumstances. 30. I have heard that a good merchant, though he have rich treasures safely stored, appears as if he were poor. And that the superior man, though his virtue be complete, is yet to outward seeming stupid. Put away your proud air and many desires, your insinuating habit and wild will. They are of no advantage to you, this is all I have to tell you. Confucius is made to say to his disciples after the interview, I know how birds can fly, fishes swim, and animals run. But the runner may be snared, the swimmer hooked, and the flyer shot by the arrow. But there is the dragon, I cannot tell how he mounts on the wind through the clouds, and rises to heaven. Today I have seen Laudes, and can only compare him to the dragon. In this speech of Confucius we have, I believe, the origin of the name Laudes, as applied to the master of Taoism. Its meaning is, the old philosopher, or, the old gentleman 31. Confucius might well so style the R. At the time of this interview he was himself in his thirty-fifth year, and the other was in his eighty-eighth. Keen adds, Laudes cultivated the Tao and its attributes, the chief aim of his studies being how to keep himself concealed and remain unknown. He continued to reside at, the capital of, Cao, but after a long time, seeing the decay of the dynasty, he left it and went away to the barrier gate, leading out of the kingdom on the northwest. In Shi, the warden of the gate, said to him, You are about to withdraw yourself out of sight. Let me insist on your, first, composing for me a book. On this, Laudes wrote a book in two parts, setting forth his views on the Tao and its attributes, in more than five thousand characters. He then went away, and it is not known where he died. He was a superior man, who liked to keep himself unknown. Keen finally traces Lao's descendants down to the first century BC. And concludes by saying, those who attach themselves to the doctrine of Laudes condemn that of the literati, and the literati on their part condemn Laudes, verifying the saying. Parties whose principles are different cannot take counsel together. Li are taught that by doing nothing others are as a matter of course transformed, and that rectification in the same way ensues from being pure and still. This morsel is all that we have of historical narrative about Lao Dees. The account of the writing of the Tao Te King at the request of the Warden of the Barrier Gate has a doubtful and legendary appearance. Otherwise, the record is free from anything to raise suspicion about it. It says nothing about previous existences of Lao, and nothing of his traveling to the West, and learning there the doctrines which are embodied in his work. He goes through the pass out of the domain of Cao, and died no one knowing where. It is difficult, however, to reconcile this last statement with a narrative in the end of Kuang Di's third book. There we see Lao Di's dead, and a crowd of mourners wailing round the corpse, 
and giving extraordinary demonstrations of grief, which offend a disciple of a higher order, who has gone to the house to offer his condolences on the occasion. But for the peculiar nature of most of Kuang's narratives, we should say, in opposition to Keen, that the place and time of Lao's death were well known. Possibly, however, Kuang Di's may have invented the whole story, to give him the opportunity of setting forth what, according to his ideal of it, the life of a Taoist master should be, and how even Lao Di's himself fell short of it. Second, Qin's account of Kuang Di's is still more brief. He was a native, he tells us, of the territory of Mang, which belonged to the kingdom of Liang or Wei, and held an office, he does not say what, in the city of Kaiyuan. Kuang was thus of the same part of China as Lao Di's, and probably grew up familiar with all his speculations and lessons. He lived during the reigns of the kings Hui of Liang, Suan of Kai, and Wei of Ku. We cannot be wrong therefore in assigning his period to the latter half of the 3rd, and earlier part of the 4th century BC. He was thus a contemporary of Mencius. They visited at the same courts, and yet neither ever mentions the other. They were the two ablest debaters of their day, and fond of exposing what they deemed heresy. But it would only be a matter of useless speculation to try to account for their never having come into argumentative collision. Keen says, Kuang had made himself well acquainted with all the literature of his time, but preferred the views of Lao Di's, and ranked himself among his followers. So that of the more than ten myriads of characters contained in his published writings the greater part are occupied with metaphorical illustrations of Lao's doctrines. He made The Old Fisherman, The Robber Key, and The Cutting Open Satchels, to satirize and expose the disciples of Confucius, and clearly exhibit the sentiments of Lao. Such names and characters as Wei Lei Su and Kang Sang Di's are fictitious, and the pieces where they occur are not to be understood as narratives of real events 32. But Kuang was an admirable writer and skillful composer, and by his instances and truthful descriptions hit and exposed the Mahists and literati. The ablest scholars of his day could not escape his satire nor reply to it, while he allowed and enjoyed himself with his sparkling, dashing style, and thus it was that the greatest men, even kings and princes, could not use him for their purposes. King Wei of Ku, having heard of the ability of Kuang Kao, sent messengers with large gifts to bring him to his court, and promising also that he would make him his chief minister. Kuang Di's, however, only laughed and said to them, A thousand ounces of silver are a great gain to me, and to be a high noble and minister is a most honorable position. But have you not seen the victim ox for the border sacrifice? It is carefully fed for several years, and robed with rich embroidery that it may be fit to enter the grand temple. When the time comes for it to do so, it would prefer to be a little pig, but it cannot get to be so. Go away quickly, and do not soil me with your presence. I had rather amuse and enjoy myself in the midst of a filthy ditch than be subject to the rules and restrictions in the court of a sovereign. I have determined never to take office, but prefer the enjoyment of my own free will. Keen concludes his account of Kuang Di's with the above story, condensed by him, probably, from two of Kuang's own narratives, in par. 11 of BK. 17, and 13 of XXXII, to the injury of them both. Paragraph 14 of XXXII brings before us one of the last scenes of Kuang Di's life, and we may doubt whether it should be received as from his own pencil. It is interesting in itself, however, and I introduce it here, when Quang Di's was about to die, his disciples signified their wish to give him a grand burial. I shall have heaven and earth, he said, for my coffin and its shell. The sun and moon for my two round symbols of jade, the stars and constellations for my pearls and jewels, will not the provisions for my interment be complete? What would you add to them? The disciples replied, we are afraid that the crows and kites will eat our master. Quan Di's rejoined, Above, the crows and kites will eat me, below, the mole crickets and ants will eat me. To take from those and give to these would only show your partiality. Such were among the last words of Quan Di's. His end was not so impressive as that of Confucius. But it was in keeping with the general magniloquence and strong assertion of independence that marked all his course. 5. 
on the tractate of actions and their retributions. 1. The contrast is great between the style of the Tao Te King and the books of Kuangdi's and that of the Canning Fian, a translation of which is now submitted as a specimen of the texts of Taoism. The works of Lao and Kuang stand alone in the literature of the system. What it was before Lao cannot be ascertained, and in his chapters it comes before us not as a religion, but as a subject of philosophical speculation, together with some practical applications of it insisted on by Lao himself. The brilliant pages of Kuang Di's contain little more than his ingenious defense of his master's speculations, and an aggregate of illustrative narratives sparkling with the charms of his composition, but in themselves for the most part unbelievable. Often grotesque and absurd. This treatise, on the other hand, is more of what we understand by a sermon or popular tract. It eschews all difficult discussion, and sets forth a variety of traits of character and actions which are good, and a still greater variety of others which are bad, exhorting to the cultivation and performance of the former. And warning against the latter. It describes at the outset the machinery to secure the record of men's doings, and the infliction of the certain retribution, and concludes with insisting on the wisdom of repentance and reformation. At the same time it does not carry its idea of retribution beyond death, but declares that if the reward or punishment is not completed in the present life, the remainder will be received by the posterity of the good doer and of the offender. A place is given to the treatise among the texts of Taoism in the Sacred Books of the East, because of its popularity in China. The various editions of it, as observed by Mr. Wiley, are innumerable. It has appeared from time to time in almost every conceivable size, shape, and style of execution. Many commentaries have been written upon it, and it is frequently published with a collection of several hundred anecdotes, along with pictorial illustrations, to illustrate every paragraph seriatim. It is deemed a great act of merit to aid by voluntary contribution towards the gratuitous distribution of this work 33. 2. The author of the treatise is not known, but, as Mr. Wiley also observes, it appears to have been written during the Sung dynasty. The earliest mention of it which I have met with is in the continuation of Mat Wan Lin's encyclopedic work by Wang Kai, first published in 1586, the fourteenth year of the fourteenth emperor of the Ming dynasty. In Wang's supplement to his predecessor's account of Taoist works, the sixth notice is of a commentary on the Tai Shang Kening Fian by Li Kangling. And immediately before it is a commentary on the short but well-known Yin Fu King by Lu Tian, who lived 1042-1102. Immediately after it other works of the 11th century are mentioned. To that same century therefore we may reasonably refer the origin of the Canning Fian. As to the meaning of the title, the only difficulty is with the two commencing characters Tai Shang. Julian left them untranslated, with the note, however, that they were bell abbreviation de Tai Shang Lao Kuan, expression honorifique par lequel les Tao Zi design at Lao Dies, Le Fondateur de leur sect 34. This is the interpretation commonly given of the phrase, and it is hardly worth while to indicate any doubt of its correctness. But if the characters were taken, as I believe they were, from the beginning of the seventeenth chapter of the Tao Te King, I should prefer to understand them of the highest and oldest form of the Taoistic teaching 35. 3. I quoted on page 13 the view of Hardwick, the Christian advocate of Cambridge, that the indefinite expression Tao was adopted to denominate an abstract cause, or the initial principle of life and order. To which worshippers were able to assign the attributes of immateriality, eternity, immensity, invisibility. His selection of the term worshippers in this passage was unfortunate. Neither Lao nor Kuang says anything about the worship of the Tao, about priests or monks, about temples or rituals. How could they do so, seeing that Tao was not to them the name of a personal being, nor heaven a metaphorical term equivalent to the Confucian T, ruler, or Shang T, supreme ruler? With this agnosticism as to God, and their belief that by a certain management and discipline of the breath life might be prolonged indefinitely, I do not see how anything of an organized religion was possible for the old Taoists. The Taoist proclivities of the founder of the Qin dynasty are well known. If his life had been prolonged, and the dynasty become consolidated, 
there might have arisen such a religion in connection with Taoism, for we have a record that he, as head of the empire, had eight spirits thirty-six to which he offered sacrifices. Kin, however, soon passed away, what remained in permanency from it was only the abolition of the feudal kingdom. 4. We cannot here attempt to relate in detail the rise and growth of the Kong family in which the headship of Taoism has been hereditary since her first Christian century, with the exception of one not very long interruption. One of the earliest members of it, Kong Liang, must have been born not long after the death of Kuang Di's, for he joined the party of Lu Pang, the founder of the dynasty of Han, in B.C. 208, and by his wisdom and bravery contributed greatly to his success over the adherents of Qin, and other contenders for the sovereignty of the empire. Abandoning then a political career, he spent the latter years of his life in a vain quest for the elixir of life. Among Liang's descendants in our first century was a Kong Tao Ling, who, eschewing a career in the service of the state, devoted himself to the pursuits of alchemy, and at last succeeded in compounding the grand elixir or pill. And at the age of 123 was released from the trammels of the mortal body, and entered on the enjoyment of immortality, leaving to his descendants his books, talismans and charms, his sword, mighty against spirits, and his seal. Tao Ling stands out, in Taoist accounts, as the first patriarch of the system, with the title of Tian Shi, Master or Preceptor of Heaven. Suan Zung of the Tang Dynasty in 748, confirmed the dignity and title in the family. And in 1016 the Sung Emperor Qin Zung invested its representative with large tracts of land near the Lunghu Mountain in Kiangxi. The present patriarch for I suppose the same man is still alive made a journey from his residence not many years ago, and was interviewed by several foreigners in Shanghai. The succession is said to be perpetuated by the transmigration of the soul of Kong Tao Ling into some infant or youthful member of the family, whose heirship is supernaturally revealed as soon as the miracle is effected 37. This superstitious notion shows the influence of Buddhism on Taoism. It has been seen from the 18th of the books of Kuang Di's what affinities there were between Taoism and the Indian system. And there can be no doubt that the introduction of the latter into China did more than anything else to affect the development of the Taoistic system. As early as the time of Confucius there were recluses in the country, men who had withdrawn from the world, disgusted with its vanities and in despair from its disorders. Lao would appear to have himself contemplated this course. When their representatives of our early centuries saw the Buddhists among them with their images, monasteries, and nunneries, their ritual and discipline, they proceeded to organize themselves after a similar fashion. They built monasteries and nunneries, framed images, composed liturgies, and adopted a peculiar mode of tying up their hair. The three precious ones of Buddhism, emblematic to the initiated of intelligence personified in Buddha, the law, and the community or church, but to the mass of the worshippers merely three great idols, styled by them Buddha past, present. And to come, these appeared in Taoism as the three pure ones, also represented by three great images, each of which receives the title of His Celestial Eminence, and is styled the Most High God, Shangti. The first of them is a deification of chaos, the second, of Laodis, and the third of I know not whom or what, perhaps of the Tao. But those three pure ones have been very much cast into the shade, as the objects of popular worship and veneration, by Yu Huang Ti or Yu Huang Shang Ti. This personage appears to have been a member of the Kong clan, held to be a magician and venerated from the time of the Tang dynasty, but deified in 1116 by the Sung Emperor Hui Zeng at the instigation of a charlatan Lin Ling Su. A renegade Buddhist monk. He is the god in the court of heaven to whom the spirits of the body and of the hearth in our treatise proceed at stated times to report for approval or condemnation the conduct of men. Since the first publication of the Canning Fien, the tenets of Buddhism have been still further adopted by the teachers of Taoism, and shaped to suit the nature of their own system. I have observed that the idea of retribution in our treatise does not go beyond the present life. But the manifestos of Taoism of more recent times are much occupied with descriptions of the courts of purgatory and threatenings of the everlasting misery of hell to those whom their sufferings in those courts fail to wean from their wickedness. 
Those manifestos are published by the mercy of Yu Huang Shang Ti that men and women may be led to repent of their faults and make atonement for their crimes. They emanate from the temples of the tutelary deities 38 which are found throughout the empire, and especially in the walled cities, and are under the charge of Taoist monks. A visitor to one of the larger of these temples may not only see the pictures of the purgatorial courts and other forms of the modern superstitions, but he will find also astrologers, diviners, geomancers, physiognomists, edid genus omni. Plying their trades or waiting to be asked to do so, and he will wonder how it has been possible to affiliate such things with the teachings of Laodice. Other manifestos of a milder form, and more like our tractate, are also continually being issued as from one or other of what are called the state gods, whose temples are all in the charge of the same monks. In the approximation which has thus been going on of Taoism to Buddhism, the requirement of celibacy was long resisted by the professors of the former. But recent editions of the Penal Code 39 contain sundry regulations framed to enforce celibacy, to bind the monks and nuns of both systems to the observance of the Confucian maxims concerning filial piety, and the sacrificial worship of the dead. And also to restrict the multiplication of monasteries and nunneries. Neither Lao nor Kuang was a celibate or recommended celibacy. The present patriarch, as a married man, would seem to be able still to resist the law. The Tao Te King, Part 1. 1. CH1. 1. The Tao that can be trodden is not the enduring and unchanging Tao. The name that can be named is not the enduring and unchanging name. 2. Conceived of as, having no name, it is the originator of heaven and earth, conceived of as, having a name, it is the mother of all things. 3. Always without desire we must be found. If it's deep mystery we would sound. But if desire always within us be. Its outer fringe is all that we shall see. 4. Under these two aspects, it is really the same, but as development takes place, it receives the different names. Together we call them the mystery. Where the mystery is the deepest is the gate of all that is subtle and wonderful. Embodying the Tao. The author sets forth, as well as the difficulty of his subject would allow him, the nature of the Tao in itself, and its manifestation. To understand the Tao one must be partaker of its nature. Par. 3 suggests the words of the Apostle John, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Both the Tao, Laodi's ideal in the Absolute, and its Te, or operation, are comprehended in this chapter, the latter being the Tao with the name, the mother of all things. See pages 12, 13 in the introduction on the translation of the term Tao. 2. 2, 1. All in the world know the beauty of the beautiful, and in doing this they have, the idea of, what ugliness is, they all know the skill of the skillful, and in doing this they have, the idea of, what the want of skill is. 2. So it is that existence and non-existence give birth the one to, the idea of, the other, that difficulty and ease produce the one, the idea of, the other, that length and shortness fashion out the one the figure of the other. That, the ideas of, height and lowness arise from the contrast of the one with the other, that the musical notes and tones become harmonious through the relation of one with another. And that being before and behind give the idea of one following another. 3. Therefore the sage manages affairs without doing anything, and conveys his instructions without the use of speech. 4. All things spring up, and there is not one which declines to show itself, they grow, and there is no claim made for their ownership, they go through their processes, and there is no expectation, of a reward for the results. The work is accomplished, and there is no resting in it, as an achievement. The work is done, but how no one can see. Tis this that makes the power not cease to be. The nourishment of the person. But many of Ho Shang Kung's titles are more appropriate than this. The chapter starts with instances of the antinomies, which suggests to the mind each of them the existence of its corresponding opposite. And the author finds in them an analogy to the contraries, which characterize the operation of the Tao, as stated in chapter 40. He then proceeds to describe the action of the sage in par. 
3. As in accordance with this law of contraries. And, in par. 4. That of heaven and earth, or what we may call nature, in the processes of the vegetable world. Par. 2. Should be rhymed, but I could not succeed to my satisfaction in the endeavor to rhyme it. Everyone who can read Chinese will see that the first four members rhyme. The last two rhyme also, the concluding being pronounced so, see the Kangxi Dictionary in Vok. 3. 3, 1. Not to value and employ men of superior ability is the way to keep the people from rivalry among themselves, not to prize articles which are difficult to procure is the way to keep them from becoming thieves. Not to show them what is likely to excite their desires is the way to keep their minds from disorder. 2. Therefore the sage, in the exercise of his government, empties their minds, fills their bellies, weakens their wills, and strengthens their bones. 3. He constantly, tries to, keep them without knowledge and without desire, and where there are those who have knowledge, to keep them from presuming to act, on it. When there is this abstinence from action, good order is universal. Keeping the people at rest. The object of the chapter is to show that government according to the Tao is unfavorable to the spread of knowledge among the people, and would keep them rather in the state of primitive simplicity and ignorance. Thereby securing their restfulness and universal good order. Such is the uniform teaching of Lao Dees and his great follower Kuang Dees, and of all Taoist writers. 4. 4. 1. The Tao is, like, the emptiness of a vessel, and in our employment of it we must be on our guard against all fullness. How deep and unfathomable it is, as if it were the honored ancestor of all things. 2. We should blunt our sharp points and unravel the complications of things. We should attemper our brightness and bring ourselves into agreement with the obscurity of others. How pure and still the Tao is, as if it would ever so continue. 3. I do not know whose son it is. It might appear to have been before God. The fountainless. There is nothing before the Tao, it might seem to have been before God. And yet there is no demonstration by it of its presence and operation. It is like the emptiness of a vessel. The second character equals equals. See Kang Shi on the latter. The practical lesson is, that in following the Tao we must try to be like it. 5. 5. 1. Heaven and earth do not act from, the impulse of, any wish to be benevolent. They deal with all things as the dogs of grass are dealt with. The sages do not act from, any wish to be, benevolent, they deal with the people as the dogs of grass are dealt with. 2. May not the space between heaven and earth be compared to a bellows? Tis emptied, yet it loses not its power. Tis moved again, and sends forth air the more. Much speech to swift exhaustion lead we see. Your inner being guard, and keep it free. The use of emptiness. Quiet and unceasing is the operation of the Tao, and effective is the rule of the sage in accordance with it. The grass dogs in par. One were made of straw tied up in the shape of dogs, and used in praying for rain. And afterwards, when the sacrifice was over, were thrown aside and left uncared for. Heaven and earth and the sages dealt so with all things and with the people, but the illustration does not seem a happy one. Both Quan Dees and Wei Nand mention the grass dogs. See especially the former, 14, 25a, b. In that book there is fully developed the meaning of this chapter. The illustration in par. 2 is better. The Chinese bellows is different to look at from ours, but the principle is the same in the construction of both. The par. Concludes in a way that lends some countenance to the later Taoisms dealing with the breath. 6. 6. The valley spirit dies not, I the same. The female mystery thus do we name. Its gate, from which at first they issued forth, is called the root from which grew heaven and earth. Long and unbroken does its power remain. Used gently, and without the touch of pain. The completion of material forms. This title rightly expresses the import of this enigmatical chapter.
but there is a foundation laid in it for the development of the later Taoism, which occupies itself with the prolongation of life by the management of the breath, or vital force. The valley is used metaphorically as a symbol of emptiness or of a vacancy, and the spirit of the valley is the something invisible, yet almost personal, belonging to the Tao, which constitutes the Te, in the name of our king. The spirit of the valley has come to be a name for the activity of the Tao in all the realm of its operation. The female mystery is the Tao with a name of chapter 1, which is, the mother of all things. All living beings have a father and mother. The processes of generation and production can hardly be imaged by us but by a recognition of this fact. And so Lao Di's thought of the existing realm of nature of life as coming through an evolution, not a creation, from the primal air or breath, dividing into two, and thence appearing in the forms of things, material and immaterial. The chapter is found in Li Di's, 1b, quoted by him from a book of Huang Ti, and here Lao Di's has appropriated it, and made it his own. See the introduction, page 2. 7. 7, 1. Heaven is long enduring and earth continues long. The reason why heaven and earth are able to endure and continue thus long is because they do not live of, or for, themselves. This is how they are able to continue and endure. 2. Therefore the sage puts his own person last, and yet it is found in the foremost place, he treats his person as if it were foreign to him, and yet that person is preserved. Is it not because he has no personal and private ends, that therefore such ends are realized? Sheathing the light. The chapter teaches that one's best good is realized by not thinking of it, or seeking for it. Heaven and earth afford a pattern to the sage, and the sage affords a pattern to all men. 8. 8, 1. The highest excellence is like, that of, water. The excellence of water appears in its benefiting all things, and in its occupying, without striving, to the contrary, the low place which all men dislike. Hence, its way, is near to, that of, the Tao. 2. The excellence of a residence is in, the suitability of, the place, that of the mind is in abysmal stillness, that of associations is in their being with the virtuous, that of government is in its securing good order. That of, the conduct of, affairs is in its ability, and that of, the initiation of, any movement is in its timeliness. 3. And when, one with the highest excellence, does not wrangle, about his low position, no one finds fault with him. The placid and contented nature. Water, as an illustration of the way of the Tao, is repeatedly employed by Laodis. The various forms of what is excellent in par. Two are brought forward to set forth the more, by contrast, the excellence of the humility indicated in the acceptance of the lower place without striving to the contrary. 9. 9, 1. It is better to leave a vessel unfilled, than to attempt to carry it when it is full. If you keep feeling a point that has been sharpened, the point cannot long preserve its sharpness. 2. When gold and jade fill the hall, their possessor cannot keep them safe. When wealth and honors lead to arrogancy, this brings its evil on itself. When the work is done, and one's name is becoming distinguished, to withdraw into obscurity is the way of heaven. But I cannot give a satisfactory rendering of this title. The teaching of the chapter is, that fullness and complacency in success are contrary to the Tao. The first clauses of the two sentences in par. 1. Are instances of the inverted style not uncommon in the oldest composition? The way of heaven equals the heavenly Tao, exemplified by man. 10. 10. 1. When the intelligent and animal souls are held together in one embrace, they can be kept from separating. When one gives undivided attention to the vital breath and brings it to the utmost degree of pliancy, he can become as a tender babe. When he has cleansed away the most mysterious sights, of his imagination, he can become without a flaw. 2. In loving the people and ruling the state, cannot he proceed without any, purpose of, action? In the opening and shutting of his gates of heaven, cannot he do so as a female bird? 
while his intelligence reaches in every direction, cannot he, appear to, be without knowledge. 3. The Tao, produces, all things, and nourishes them, it produces them and does not claim them as its own, it does all, and yet does not boast of it. It presides over all, and yet does not control them. This is what is called the mysterious quality, of the Tao. Possibilities. This chapter is one of the most difficult to understand and translate in the whole work. Even Ku Shi was not able to explain the first member satisfactorily. The text of that member seems well supported, but I am persuaded the first clause of it is somehow corrupt. The whole seems to tell what can be accomplished by one who is possessed of the Tao. In par. 3 He appears free from all self-consciousness in what he does, and of all self-satisfaction in the results of his doing. The other two paragraphs seem to speak of what he can do under the guidance of the Tao for himself and for others. He can by his management of his vital breath bring his body to the state of Taoistic perfection, and keep his intelligent and animal souls from being separated, and he can rule men without purpose and effort. The Gates of Heaven, in par. 2 is a Taoistic phrase for the nostrils as the organ of the breath, see the commentary of Ho Shang Kung. 11. 11. The thirty spokes unite in the one nave, but it is on the empty space, for the axle, that the use of the wheel depends. Clay is fashioned into vessels, but it is on their empty hollowness, that their use depends. The door and windows are cut out, from the walls, to form an apartment, but it is on the empty space, within, that its use depends. Therefore, what has a, positive, existence serves for profitable adaptation, and what has not that for, actual, usefulness. The use of what has no substantive existence. The three illustrations serve to set forth the freedom of the Tao from all preoccupation and purpose, and the use of what seems useless. 12. 12, 1. Colors five hues from th, eyes their sight will take. Music's five notes the ears as deaf can make. The flavors five deprive the mouth of taste. The chariot course, and the wild hunting waste. Make mad the mind, and objects rare and strange. Sought for, men's conduct will to evil change. 2. Therefore the sage seeks to satisfy, the craving of, the belly, and not the, insatiable longing of the eyes. He puts from him the latter, and prefers to seek the former. The Repression of the Desires Government in accordance with the Tao seeks to withdraw men from the attractions of what is external and pleasant to the senses and imagination, and to maintain the primitive simplicity of men's ways and manners. Compare Chapter 2 The five colors are black, red, green or blue, white, and yellow, the five notes are those of the imperfect Chinese musical scale, R G A B D E. the five tastes are salt, bitter, sour, acrid, and sweet. I am not sure that Wang Pai has caught exactly the author's idea in the contrast between satisfying the belly and satisfying the eyes, but what he says is ingenious, in satisfying the belly one nourishes himself. In gratifying the eyes he makes a slave of himself. 13. 13, 1. Favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared, honor and great calamity, to be regarded as personal conditions, of the same kind. 2. What is meant by speaking thus of favor and disgrace? Disgrace is being in a low position, after the enjoyment of favor. The getting that, favor, leads to the apprehension, of losing it, and the losing it leads to the fear of, still greater calamity, this is what is meant by saying that favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared. And what is meant by saying that honor and great calamity are to be, similarly, regarded as personal conditions. What makes me liable to great calamity is my having the body, which I call myself. If I had not the body, what great calamity could come to me? 3. Therefore he who would administer the kingdom, honoring it as he honors his own person, may be employed to govern it, and he who would administer it with the love which he bears to his own person may be entrusted with it. Loathing Shame The chapter is difficult to construe, and some disciples of Ku Shi had to ask him to explain it as in the case of CH10. 
his remarks on it are not to my mind satisfactory. Its object seems to be to show that the cultivation of the person according to the Tao, is the best qualification for the highest offices, even for the government of the world. Par. 3 is found in Quang Di's, 11, 18b, in a connection which suggests this view of the chapter. It may be observed, however, that in him the position of the verbal characters in the two clauses of the paragraph is the reverse of that in the text of Ho Shang Kung. So that we can hardly accept the distinction of meaning of the two characters given in his commentary, but must take them as synonyms. Professor Gablentz gives the following version of Quang Di's, Derem, Jebrock der Sane Person Axum in der Verwaltung der Reichs, so mag man ihm die Reichstwalt anvertrauen, Leibend, Skonend, Albertrigen. 14. 14, 1. We look at it, and we do not see it, and we name it, the equable. We listen to it, and we do not hear it, and we name it, the inaudible. We try to grasp it, and do not get hold of it, and we name it, the subtle. With these three qualities, it cannot be made the subject of description, and hence we blend them together and obtain the one. 2. Its upper part is not bright, and its lower part is not obscure. Ceaseless in its action, it yet cannot be named, and then it again returns and becomes nothing. This is called the form of the formless, and the semblance of the invisible, this is called the fleeting and indeterminable. 3. We meet it and do not see its front, we follow it, and do not see its back. When we can lay hold of the Tao of old to direct the things of the present day, and are able to know it as it was of old in the beginning, this is called, unwinding, the clue of Tao. The Manifestation of the Mystery The Subject of Par One is the Tao, but the Tao in its operation, and not the primal conception of it, as entirely distinct from things, which rises before the mind in the second paragraph. The Chinese characters which I have translated, the equable, the inaudible, and the subtle, are now pronounced I, Hai, and Wei, and in 1823 Remusat fancied that they were intended to give the Hebrew tetragrammaton, which he thought had come to Laodi somehow from the West, or been found by him there. It was a mere fancy or dream, and still more so is the recent attempt to revive the notion by Victor von Strauss in 1870, and Dr. Edkins in 1884. The idea of the latter is specially strange, maintaining, as he does, that we should read the characters according to their old sounds. Laudes has not in the chapter a personal being before his mind, but the procedure of his mysterious Tao, the course according to which the visible phenomena take place. Incognizable by human sense and capable of only approximate description by terms appropriate to what is within the domain of sense. See the introduction, pages 14, 15. 15. 15, 1. The skillful masters, of the Tao, in old times, with a subtle and exquisite penetration, comprehended its mysteries, and were deep, also, so as to elude men's knowledge. As they were thus beyond men's knowledge, I will make an effort to describe of what sort they appeared to be. 2. Shrinking looked they like those who wade through a stream in winter, irresolute like those who are afraid of all around them. Grave like a guest, in awe of his host, evanescent like ice that is melting away, unpretentious like wood that has not been fashioned into anything, vacant like a valley, and dull like muddy water. 3. Who can, make, the muddy water, clear? Let it be still, and it will gradually become clear. Who can secure the condition of rest? Let movement go on, and the condition of rest will gradually arise. 4. They who preserve this method of the Tao do not wish to be full, of themselves. It is through their not being full of themselves that they can afford to seem worn and not appear new and complete. The exhibition of the quality, that is, of the Tao, which has been set forth in the preceding chapter. Its practical outcome is here described in the masters of it of old, who in their own weakness were yet strong in it, and in their humility were mighty to be co-workers with it for the good of the world. The variety of the readings in par. For it is considerable, but not so as to affect the meaning. This par. Is found in Wainan, 12, 23a, with an unimportant variation. From the illustration to which it is subjoined he understood the fullness, evidently as in ch. 
9, as being that of a vessel filled to overflowing. Both here and there such fullness is used metaphorically of a man overfull of himself, and then Laudis slides into another metaphor, that of a worn-out garment. The text of Par. 3 has been variously tampered with. I omit the of the current copies, after the example of the editors of the Great Recension of the Young Low Period, d. 1403-1424, of the Ming Dynasty. 16. 16, 1. The state of vacancy should be brought to the utmost degree, and that of stillness guarded with unwearying vigor. All things alike go through their processes of activity, and, then, we see them return, to their original state. When things, in the vegetable world, have displayed their luxuriant growth, we see each of them return to its root. This returning to their root is what we call the state of stillness. And that stillness may be called a reporting that they have fulfilled their appointed end. 2. The report of that fulfillment is the regular, unchanging rule. To know that unchanging rule is to be intelligent. Not to know it leads to wild movements and evil issues. The knowledge of that unchanging rule produces a, grand, capacity and forbearance, and that capacity and forbearance lead to a community, of feeling with all things. From this community of feeling comes a kingliness of character, and he who is king-like goes on to be heaven-like. In that likeness to heaven he possesses the Tao. Possessed of the Tao, he endures long. And to the end of his bodily life, is exempt from all danger of decay. Returning to the root. The chapter exhibits the operation of the Tao in nature, in man, and in government, an operation silent, but all-powerful. Unaccompanied with any demonstration of its presence, but great in its results. An officer receives a charge or commission from his superior, when he reports the execution of it he is said. So all animate things, including men, receive their charge from the Tao as to their life, and when they have fulfilled it they are represented as reporting that fulfillment. And the fulfillment and report are described as their unchanging rule, so that they are the Tao's impassive instruments, having no will or purpose of their own according to Laudi's formula of, doing nothing and yet doing all things, dot. The getting to possess the Tao, or to be an embodiment of it, follows the becoming heaven or heaven-like, and this is in accordance with the saying in the fourth chapter that, the Tao might seem to have been before God. But, in Quang Di's especially, we often find the full possessor and displayer of the Tao spoken of as, heaven. The last sentence, that he who has come to the full possession of the Tao is exempt from all danger of decay, is generally illustrated by a reference to the utterances in ch. 50, as if Lao Dees did indeed see in the Tao a preservative against death. 17. 17, 1. In the highest antiquity, the people, did not know that there were, their rulers. In the next age they loved them and praised them. In the next they feared them, in the next they despised them. Thus it was that when faith, in the Tao, was deficient, in the rulers, a want of faith in them ensued, in the people. 2. How irresolute did those, earliest rulers, appear, showing, by their reticence, the importance which they set upon their words. Their work was done and their undertakings were successful, while the people all said, we are as we are, of ourselves. The unadulterated influence. The influence is that of the Tao, as seen in the earliest and paradisiacal times. The two chapters that follow are closely connected with this, showing how the silent, passionless influence of the Tao was gradually and injuriously superseded by, the wisdom of the world, in the conduct of government. In the first sentence there is a small various reading of four, but it does not affect the meaning of the passage. The first clause of par. Two give some difficulty, they made their words valuable or precious, i.e., they seldom spake, cp 1 Sam. 3, 1. 18. 18, 1. When the great Tao, way or method, ceased to be observed, benevolence and righteousness came into vogue. Then, appeared wisdom and shrewdness, and there ensued great hypocrisy. 2. When harmony no longer prevailed throughout the six kinships, filial sons found their manifestation, when the states and clans fell into disorder, loyal ministers appeared. 
The Decay of Manners A sequel to the preceding chapter, and showing also how the general decay of manners afforded opportunity for the display of certain virtues by individuals. Observe the Great Tao, occurring here for the first time as the designation of the Tao. 19. 19. 1. If we could renounce our sageness and discard our wisdom, it would be better for the people a hundredfold. If we could renounce our benevolence and discard our righteousness, the people would again become filial and kindly. If we could renounce our artful contrivances and discard our, scheming for, gain, there would be no thieves nor robbers. 2. Those three methods, of government. Thought olden ways in elegance did fail. And made these names their want of worth to veil. But simple views, and courses plain and true. Would selfish ends and many lusts eschew. Returning to the unadulterated influence. The chapter desires a return to the simplicity of the Tao, and shows how superior the result would be to that of the more developed systems of morals and government which had superseded it. It is closely connected with the two chapters that precede. Laudis call for the renunciation of the methods of the sages and rulers in lieu of his fancied paradisiacal state is repeated ad nauseum by Quangdis. 20. 20. 1. When we renounce learning we have no troubles. The, ready, yes, and, flattering, yeah. Small is the difference they display. But mark their issues, good and ill. What space the gulf between shall fill. What all men fear is indeed to be feared, but how wide and without end is the range of questions, asking to be discussed. 2. The multitude of men look satisfied and pleased, as if enjoying a full banquet, as if mounted on a tower in spring. I alone seem listless and still, my desires having as yet given no indication of their presence. I am like an infant which has not yet smiled. I look dejected and forlorn, as if I had no home to go to. The multitude of men all have enough and to spare. I alone seem to have lost everything. My mind is that of a stupid man, I am in a state of chaos. Ordinary men look bright and intelligent, while I alone seem to be benighted. They look full of discrimination, while I alone am dull and confused. I seem to be carried about as on the sea, drifting as if I had nowhere to rest. All men have their spheres of action, while I alone seem dull and incapable, like a rude borderer. Thus, I alone am different from other men, but I value the nursing mother, the Tao. Being different from ordinary men. The chapter sets forth the difference to external appearance which the pursuit and observance of the Tao produces between its votaries and others, and Laudis speaks in it as himself an example of the former. In the last three chapters he has been advocating the cause of the Tao against the learning and philosophy of the other school of thinkers in the country. Here he appears as having renounced learning, and found an end to the troubles and anxieties of his own mind, but at the expense of being misconceived and misrepresented by others. Hence the chapter has an autobiographical character. Having stated the fact following the renunciation of learning, he proceeds to dwell upon the troubles of learning in the rest of Par. 1. Until the votary of learning knows everything, he has no rest. But the instances which he adduces of this are not striking nor easily understood. I cannot throw any light on the four lines about the yes and the yeah. Confucius, Anna. 16, 8, specifies three things of which the superior man stands in awe. And these and others of a similar nature may have been the things which Laudis had in his mind. The nursing mother at the end is, no doubt, the Tao in operation, with a name, as in CHI the mysterious virtue of chapters 51 and 52. 21. 21. The grandest forms of active force. From Tao come, their only source. Who can of Tao the nature tell? Our sight it flies, our touch as well. Eluding sight, eluding touch. The forms of things all in it crouch. Eluding touch, eluding sight. There are their semblances, all right. Profound it is, dark and obscure. Things' essences all there endure. Those essences the truth enfold. Of what, 
when seen, shall then be told. Now it is so, twas so of old. Its name what passes not away. So, in their beautiful array. Things form and never know decay. How know I that it is so with all the beauties of existing things? By this, nature of the Tao. The empty heart. But I fail to see the applicability of the title. The subject of the chapter is the Tao in its operation. This is the significance of the in the first clause or line, and to render it by virtue, as Julian and Chalmers do, only serves to hide the meaning. Julian, however, says that, the virtue is that of the Tao. And he is right in taking, the last character of the second line, as having the sense of, from, the source from, and not, as Chalmers does, in the sense of, following. Laudi's mind is occupied with a very difficult subject to describe the production of material forms by the Tao, how or from what, he does not say. What I have rendered, semblances, Julian, less images, and Chalmers, forms, seems, as the latter says, in some way to correspond to the, eternal ideas of Plato in the divine mind. But Laudis had no idea of, personality, in the Tao. 22. 22. 1. The partial becomes complete, the crooked, straight, the empty, full, the worn out, new. He whose, desires, are few gets them, he whose, desires, are many goes astray. 2. Therefore the sage holds in his embrace the one thing, of humility, and manifests it to all the world. He is free from self-display, and therefore he shines, from self-assertion, and therefore he is distinguished. From self-boasting, and therefore his merit is acknowledged, from self-complacency, and therefore he acquires superiority. It is because he is thus free from striving that therefore no one in the world is able to strive with him. 3. That saying of the ancients that, the partial becomes complete, was not vainly spoken, all real completion is comprehended under it. The increase granted to humility. This title rightly expresses the subject matter of the chapter. I cannot translate the first clause otherwise than I have done. It was an old saying, which Laudis found and adopted. Whether it was intended to embrace all the cases which are mentioned may be questioned, but he employs it so as to make it do so. The emptiness which becomes full is literally the hollowness of a cavity in the ground which is sure to be filled by overflowing water, see Mencius, for, 2, 18. The worn out is explained by the withered foliage of a tree, which comes out new and fresh in the next spring. I have taken the first sentence of Par. 2 as Wu Kang does, see his commentary in Locke. 23. 23, 1. Abstaining from speech marks him who is obeying the spontaneity of his nature. A violent wind does not last for a whole morning, a sudden rain does not last for the whole day. To whom is it that these, too, things are owing? To heaven and earth. If heaven and earth cannot make such, spasmodic, actings last long, how much less can man? 2. Therefore when one is making the Tao his business, those who are also pursuing it, agree with him in it, and those who are making the manifestation of its course their object agree with him in that. While even those who are failing in both these things agree with him where they fail. 3. Hence, those with whom he agrees as to the Tao have the happiness of attaining to it. Those with whom he agrees as to its manifestation have the happiness of attaining to it, and those with whom he agrees in their failure have also the happiness of attaining, to the Tao. But, when there is not faith sufficient, on his part, a want of faith, in him, ensues, on the part of the others. Absolute Vacancy This, I think, is the meaning of the title, Emptiness and Nothingness, an entire conformity to the Tao in him who professes to be directed by it. Such an one will be omnipotent in his influence in all others. The Tao in him will restrain all, spasmodic, loquacity. Those who are described in par. 2 as the failing are not to be thought of as bad men, men given up, as Julian has it, O crime. They are simply ordinary men, who have failed in their study of the Tao and practice of it, but are won to truth and virtue by the man whom the author has in mind. 
As we might expect, however, the mention of such men has much embarrassed the commentators. Compare the concluding sentence with the one at the end of par. 1 in ch 17. 24. 24. He who stands on his tiptoes does not stand firm. He who stretches his legs does not walk easily. So, he who displays himself does not shine, he who asserts his own views is not distinguished, he who vaunts himself does not find his merit acknowledged. He who is self-conceited has no superiority allowed to him. Such conditions, viewed from the standpoint of the Tao, are like remnants of food, or a tumor on the body, which all dislike. Hence those who pursue, the course, of the Tao do not adopt and allow them. Painful Graciousness The chapter should be so designated. This concludes the subject of the two previous chapters pursuing the course, the course of the unemotional Tao without vain effort or display. The remnants of food were not used as sacrificial offerings, see the Li Qi, volume 27, page 82. In what I have rendered by, a tumor attached to the body, the is probably, by a mistake, for, see a quotation by Wu Kang from Zima Qin. Which all dislike, is, literally, things are likely to dislike them, that things, being, spirits and men, as Wu explains the term. 25. 25, 1. There was something undefined and complete, coming into existence before heaven and earth. How still it was and formless, standing alone, and undergoing no change, reaching everywhere and in no danger, of being exhausted. It may be regarded as the mother of all things. 2. I do not know its name, and I give it the designation of the Tao, the way or course. Making an effort, further, to give it a name I call it the Great. 3. Great, it passes on, in constant flow. Passing on, it becomes remote. Having become remote, it returns. Therefore the Tao is great, heaven is great, earth is great, and the sage, king is also great. In the universe there are four that are great, and the sage, king is one of them. 4. Man takes his law from the earth, the earth takes its law from heaven, heaven takes its law from the Tao. The law of the Tao is its being what it is. Representations of the Mystery in this chapter Lao approaches very near to give an answer to the question as to what the Tao is, and yet leaves the reader disappointed. He commences by calling it, a thing, but that term does not necessitate our regarding it as, material. We have seen in the preceding chapter that it is used to signify, spirits and men. Nor does his going on to speak of it as, chaotic, I necessarily lead us to conceive it as made up of the, material elements of things. We have the same term applied in ch 14 to the three immaterial constituents there said to be blended in the idea of it. He does not know its name, and he designates it by the term denoting a course or way, tau, and indicating the phenomenal attribute, the method in which all phenomena come before our observation, in their development or evolution. And to distinguish it from all other methods of evolution, he would call it, the great method, and so he employs that combination as its name in ch 18 and elsewhere. But it cannot be said that this name has fully maintained itself in the writings of his followers. But understood thus, he here says, as in ch 1, that it is, the mother of all things. And yet, when he says that, it was before heaven and earth were produced, he comes very near his affirmations in chapters 1 and 4, that, the nameless Tao was the beginning, or originating cause, of heaven and earth. And might seem to have been before God. Was he groping after God if haply he might find him? I think he was, and he gets so far as to conceive of him as, the uncaused cause, but comes short of the idea of his personality. The other subordinate causes which he mentions all get their force or power from the Tao, but after all the Tao is simply a spontaneity, evolving from itself, and not acting from a personal will. Consciously in the direction of its own wisdom and love. Who can by searching find out God? Who can find out the Almighty to perfection? The predicate of the Tao in the chapter, most perplexing to myself, is, it returns, in par. 3. It flows away, far away, and comes back. 
Are not the three statements together equal to, it is everywhere? 26. 26, 1. Gravity is the root of lightness, stillness, the ruler of movement. 2. Therefore a wise prince, marching the whole day, does not go far from his baggage wagons. Although he may have brilliant prospects to look at, he quietly remains, in his proper place, indifferent to them. How should the lord of a myriad chariots carry himself lightly before the kingdom? If he do act lightly, he has lost his root, of gravity, if he proceed to active movement, he will lose his throne. The quality of gravity. Gravity and stillness are both attributes of the Tao. And he who cultivates it must not give way to lightness of mind, or hasty action. The rule for a leader not to separate from his baggage wagons is simply the necessity of adhering to gravity. I have adopted from Han Fei the reading of, The Wise Prince for the Sage, which is found in Ho Shang Kung, and later on the reading of, Has Lost His Root for His, Loses His Ministers, though the latter is found also in Han Fei. 27. 27, 1. The skillful traveler leaves no traces of his wheels or footsteps, the skillful speaker says nothing that can be found fault with or blamed, the skillful reckoner uses no tallies. The skillful closer needs no bolts or bars, while to open what he has shut will be impossible, the skillful binder uses no strings or knots, while to unloose what he has bound will be impossible. In the same way the sage is always skillful at saving men, and so he does not cast away any man, he is always skillful at saving things, and so he does not cast away anything. This is called, hiding the light of his procedure. 2. Therefore the man of skill is a master, to be looked up to, by him who has not the skill, and he who has not the skill is the helper of, the reputation of, him who has the skill. If the one did not honor his master, and the other did not rejoice in his helper, an, observer, though intelligent, might greatly err about them. This is called, the utmost degree of mystery. Dexterity in using, that is, in the application of the Tao. This is the substance of the chapter, celebrating the effective but invisible operation of the Tao, and the impartial exercise of it for the benefit of all men and all things. I have given the most natural construction of the two characters at the end of par. 1. The only possible construction of them, so far as I can see, suitable to the context. The action of the Tao, non-acting and yet all efficient, and that of the sage in accordance with it, are veiled by their nature from the sight of ordinary men. It is more difficult to catch the scope and point of par. 2. If there were not the conditions described in it, it would be hard for even an intelligent onlooker to distinguish between the man who had the skill and the man without it, between him who possessed the Tao, and him who had it not. Which would be strange indeed. 28. 28, 1. Who knows his manhood strength? Yet still his female feebleness maintains. As to one channel flow the many drains. All come to him, yeah, all beneath the sky. Thus he the constant excellence retains. The simple child again, free from all stains. Who knows how white attracts? Yet always keeps himself within black's shade. The pattern of humility displayed. Displayed in view of all beneath the sky. He in the unchanging excellence arrayed. Endless return to man's first state has made. Who knows how glory shines. Yet love's disgrace, nor e'er for it is pale. Behold his presence in a spacious veil. To which men come from all beneath the sky. The unchanging excellence completes its tale. The simple infant man in him we hail. 2. The unwrought material, when divided and distributed, forms vessels. The sage, when employed, becomes the head of all the officers, of government. And in his greatest regulations he employs no violent measures. Returning to Simplicity The chapter sets forth humility and simplicity, an artless freedom from all purpose, as characteristic of the man of Tao, such as he was in the primeval time. The sage, in par. May second be, the son of heaven, the head of all rule in the kingdom, or the feudal lord in a state. 29. 29, 1. 
If any one should wish to get the kingdom for himself, and to effect this by what he does, I see that he will not succeed. The kingdom is a spirit-like thing, and cannot be got by active doing. He who would so win it destroys it, he who would hold it in his grasp loses it. 2. The course and nature of things is such that what was in front is now behind. What warmed anon we freezing find. Strength is of weakness oft the spoil. The store in ruins mocks our toil. Hence the sage puts away excessive effort, extravagance, and easy indulgence. Taking no action. All efforts made with a purpose are sure to fail. The nature of the town necessitates their doing so, and the uncertainty of things and events teaches the same lesson. That the kingdom or throne is a spirit-like vessel, has become a common enough saying among the Chinese. Julian has, l'empire est come un vase divin, but I always shrink from translating by, divine. Its English analogue is, spirit, and the idea in the text is based on the immunity of spirit from all material law, and the uncertain issue of attempts to deal with it according to ordinary methods. Wu Kang takes the phrase as equivalent to, superintended by spirits, which is as inadmissible as Julian's, divin. The Tao forbids action with a personal purpose, and all such action is sure to fail in the greatest things as well as in the least. 30. 30, 1. He who would assist a lord of men in harmony with the Tao will not assert his mastery in the kingdom by force of arms. Such a course is sure to meet with its proper return. 2. Wherever a host is stationed, briars and thorns spring up. In the sequence of great armies there are sure to be bad years. 3. A skillful, commander, strikes a decisive blow, and stops. He does not dare, by continuing his operations, to assert and complete his mastery. He will strike the blow, but will be on his guard against being vain or boastful or arrogant in consequence of it. He strikes it as a matter of necessity. He strikes it, but not from a wish for mastery. 4. When things have attained their strong maturity they become old. This may be said to be not in accordance with the Tao, and what is not in accordance with it soon comes to an end. A caveat against war. War is contrary to the spirit of the Tao, and, as being so, is productive of misery, and leads to early ruin. It is only permissible in a case of necessity, and even then its spirit and tendencies must be guarded against. In translating by, striking a decisive blow, I have, no doubt, followed Julian's, for payer un coup decisive. The same, occurs six times in par. 3, followed by, and Zio Hung says that in all but the first instance this should be taken as equivalent to, so that we should have to translate, he is determined against being vain, and but there is no necessity for such a construction of weakness, and not strength is the character of the Tao, hence the lesson in par. 4. 31. 31, 1. Now arms, however beautiful, are instruments of evil omen, hateful, it may be said, to all creatures. Therefore they who have the Tao do not like to employ them. 2. The superior man ordinarily considers the left hand the most honorable place, but in time of war the right hand. Those sharp weapons are instruments of evil omen, and not the instruments of the superior man, he uses them only on the compulsion of necessity. Calm and repose are what he prizes, victory, by force of arms, is to him undesirable. To consider this desirable would be to delight in the slaughter of men, and he who delights in the slaughter of men cannot get his will in the kingdom. 3. On occasions of festivity to be on the left hand is the prized position. On occasions of mourning, the right hand. The second in command of the army has his place on the left, the general commanding in chief has his on the right, his place, that is, is assigned to him as in the rites of mourning. He who has killed multitudes of men should weep for them with the bitterest grief, and the victor in battle has his place, rightly, according to those rites. Stilling War the chapter continues the subject of the preceding. The imperially appointed editors of Wang Pai's text and commentary, 1765, say that from the beginning of Par. 2 to the end, there is the appearance of text and commentary being mixed together. 
but they make no alteration in the text as it is found in Hoshang Kung, and in all other ancient copies. The concluding sentence will suggest to some readers the words of the Duke of Wellington, that to gain a battle was the saddest thing next to losing it. 32. 32, 1. The Tao, considered as unchanging, has no name. 2. Though in its primordial simplicity it may be small, the whole world dares not deal with, one embodying, it as a minister. If a feudal prince or the king could guard and hold it, all would spontaneously submit themselves to him. 3. Heaven and earth, under its guidance, unite together and send down the sweet dew, which, without the directions of men, reaches equally everywhere as of its own accord. 4. As soon as it proceeds to action, it has a name. When it once has that name, men, can know to rest in it. When they know to rest in it, they can be free from all risk of failure and error. 5. The relation of the Tao to all the world is like that of the great rivers and seas to the streams from the valleys. Chalmers translates this by, sagely virtue. But I cannot adopt that rendering, and find it difficult to supply a better. The virtue, is evidently the attribute of the Tao come out from the condition of the Absolute, and capable of being named. In the former state it has no name, in the latter, it has. Par. 1 and the commencement of par. For must both be explained from ch1. The primordial simplicity, in par. 2 is the Tao in its simplest conception, alone, and by itself, and the in par. For it is that Tao come forth into operation and become Te, the Te which affords a law for men. From this to the end of the paragraph is very obscure. I have translated from the text of Wang Pai. The text of Ho Shang Kung is different, and he comments upon it as it stands, but to me it is inexplicable. 33. 33, 1. He who knows other men is discerning, he who knows himself is intelligent. He who overcomes others is strong, he who overcomes himself is mighty. He who is satisfied with his lot is rich, he who goes on acting with energy has a, firm, will. 2. He who does not fail in the requirements of his position, continues long, he who dies and yet does not perish, has longevity. Discriminating between, different, attributes. The teaching of the chapter is that the possession of the Tao confers the various attributes which are here most distinguished. It has been objected to it that elsewhere the Tao is represented as associated with dullness and not intelligence, and with weakness and not with strength. But these seem to be qualities viewed from without, and acting on what is beyond itself. Inwardly, its qualities are the very opposite, and its action has the effect of enlightening what is dark, and overcoming what is strong. More interesting are the predicates in par. 2. Zio Hung gives the comment on it of the Indian monk, Komarajiva, one of the four sons of Buddhism, and who went to China in AD 401, to be alive and yet not alive may well be called long, to die and yet not be dead may well be called longevity. He also gives the views of Lu Nangxi, AD 1042-1102, that the freedom from change of Li Di's, from death of Kuang Di's, and from extinction of the Buddhists, have all the same meaning as the concluding saying of Lao Di's here. That the human body is like the covering of the caterpillar or the skin of the snake, that we occupy it but for a passing sojourn. No doubt, Lao Di's believed in another life for the individual after the present. Many passages in Kuang Di's indicate the same faith. 34. 34, 1. All pervading is the great Tao. It may be found on the left hand and on the right. 2. All things depend on it for their production, which it gives to them, not one refusing obedience to it. When its work is accomplished, it does not claim the name of having done it. It clothes all things as with a garment, and makes no assumption of being their lord, it may be named in the smallest things. All things return, to their root and disappear, and do not know that it is it which presides over their doing so. It may be named in the greatest things. 3. Hence the sage is able, in the same way, to accomplish his great achievements. It 
is through his not making himself great that he can accomplish them. The task of achievement. The subject is the greatness of what the Tao, called here by Lao's own name for it in ch 25, does, and the unconscious simplicity with which it does it, and then the achievements of the sage who is permeated by the Tao. Par. 2 is descriptive of the influence of the Tao in the vegetable world. The statements and expressions are much akin to those in parts of chapters 2, 10, and 51, and for Ho Shang Kung's difficult reading of some copies give, as in chapter 2. 35. 35, 1. To him who holds in his hands the great image, of the invisible Tao, the whole world repairs. Men resort to him, and receive no hurt, but, find, rest, peace, and the feeling of ease. 2. Music and dainties will make the passing guest stop, for a time. But though the Tao as it comes from the mouth, seems insipid and has no flavor, though it seems not worth being looked at or listened to, the use of it is inexhaustible. The Attribute of Benevolence But there seems little appropriateness in this title. The subject of the chapter is the inexhaustible efficacy of the Tao for the good of the world. The great image, of the invisible Tao, is a name for the Tao, in its operation, as in chapters 14 and 41. He who embodies this in his government will be a center of attraction for all the world. Or the may be taken as a predicate of the holder of the great image if he go all under heaven teaching the Tao. Both constructions are maintained by commentators of note. In par. 2 The attraction of the Tao is contrasted with that of ordinary pleasures and gratifications. 36. 36, 1. When one is about to take an inspiration, he is sure to make a, previous, expiration. When he is going to weaken another, he will first strengthen him, when he is going to overthrow another, he will first have raised him up. When he is going to despoil another, he will first have made gifts to him, this is called, hiding the light, of his procedure. Dot. 2. The soft overcomes the hard, and the weak the strong. 3. Fishes should not be taken from the deep. Instruments for the profit of a state should not be shown to the people. Minimizing the light, equivalent, as Wu Kang has pointed out, to the of ch 27. The gist of the chapter is to be sought in the second paragraph, where we have two instances of the action of the Tao by contraries, supposed always to be for good. But there is a difficulty in seeing the applicability to this of the cases mentioned in par. 1. The first case, indeed, is merely a natural phenomenon, having no moral character. But the others, as they have been illustrated from historical incidents, by Han Fei and others at least, belong to schemes of selfish and unprincipled ambitious strategy, which it would be injurious to Laodes to suppose that he intended. Par. 3 is the most frequently quoted of all the passages in Our King, unless it be the first part of ch 1. Fishes taken from the deep, and brought into shallow water, can be easily taken or killed, that is plain enough. The sharp instruments of a state are not its weapons of war, nor its treasures, nor its instruments of government, that is, its rewards and punishments, though this last is the interpretation often put on them. And sustained by a foolish reference to an incident, real or coined, in the history of the dukedom of Sung. The Li Kai are contrivances for gain, machines, and other methods to increase the wealth of a state, but, according to the principles of Laodis, really injurious to it. These should not be shown to the people, whom the Taoistic system would keep in a state of primitive simplicity and ignorance. This interpretation is in accordance with the meaning of the characters, and with the general teaching of Taoism. In no other way can I explain the paragraph so as to justify the place undoubtedly belonging to it in the system. 37. 37, 1. The Tao in its regular course does nothing, for the sake of doing it, and so there is nothing which it does not do. 2. If princes and kings were able to maintain it, all things would of themselves be transformed by them. 3. If this transformation became to me an object of desire, I would express the desire by the nameless simplicity. Simplicity without a name. Is free from all external aim. With no desire, at rest and still. All things go right as of their will. 
The exercise of government. This exercise should be according to the Tao, doing without doing, governing without government. The subject of the third paragraph is a feudal prince or the king, and he is spoken of in the first person, to give more vividness to the style, unless the, I, may, possibly, be understood of Laudis himself personating one of them. The Tao Te King, Part 2. 38. 38, 1. Those who, possessed in highest degree the attributes, of the Tao, did not, seek, to show them, and therefore they possessed them, in fullest measure. Those who, possessed in a lower degree those attributes, sought how, not to lose them, and therefore they did not possess them, in fullest measure. 2. Those who, possessed in the highest degree those attributes did nothing, with a purpose, and had no need to do anything. Those who, possessed them in a lower degree were, always, doing, and had need to be so doing. 3. Those who, possessed the highest benevolence were, always seeking, to carry it out, and had no need to be doing so. Those who, possessed the highest righteousness were, always seeking, to carry it out, and had need to be so doing. 4. Those who, possessed the highest, sense of, propriety were, always seeking, to show it, and when men did not respond to it, they bared the arm and marched up to them. 5. Thus it was that when the Tao was lost, its attributes appeared. When its attributes were lost, benevolence appeared, when benevolence was lost, righteousness appeared, and when righteousness was lost, the proprieties appeared. 6. Now propriety is the attenuated form of leal-heartedness and good faith, and is also the commencement of disorder, swift apprehension is, only, a flower of the Tao, and is the beginning of stupidity. 7. Thus it is that the great man abides by what is solid, and eschews what is flimsy, dwells with the fruit and not with the flower. It is thus that he puts away the one and makes choice of the other. About the attributes, of Tao, that is. It is not easy to render Te here by any other English term than the virtue, and yet there would be a danger of its thus misleading us in the interpretation of the chapter. The the virtue, is the activity or operation of the Tao, which is supposed to have come out of its absoluteness. Even Han Fei so defines it here, Te is the meritorious work of the Tao. In par. 5 we evidently have a resume of the preceding paragraphs, and, as it is historical, I translate them in the past tense. Though what took place on the early stage of the world may also be said to go on taking place in the experience of every individual. With some considerable hesitation I have given the subjects in those paragraphs in the concrete, in deference to the authority of Ho Shang Kung and most other commentators. The former says, by, the highest Tay, is to be understood the rulers of the greatest antiquity, without name or designation, whose virtue was great, and could not be surpassed. Most ingenious, and in accordance with the Taoistic system, is the manner in which Wu Kang construes the passage, and I am surprised that it has not been generally accepted. By, the higher Tay, he understands, the Tao, that which is prior to and above the Tay, by, the lower Tay, benevolence, that which is after and below the Tay, by, the higher benevolence, the Tay which is above benevolence. By, the higher righteousness, the benevolence which is above righteousness, and by, the higher propriety, the righteousness which is above propriety. Certainly in the summation of these four paragraphs which we have in the fifth, the subjects of them would appear to have been in the mind of Laodice as thus defined by Wu. In the remainder of the chapter he goes on to speak depreciatingly of ceremonies and knowledge. So that the whole chapter must be understood as descriptive of the process of decay and deterioration from the early time in which the Tao and its attributes swayed the societies of men. 39. 39, 1. The things which from of old have got the one, the Tao, are. Heaven which by it is bright and pure. Earth rendered thereby firm and sure. Spirits with powers by it supplied. Valleys kept full throughout their void. All creatures which through it do live. Princes and kings who from it get. The model which to all they give. All these are the results of the one, Tao. Two, if heaven were not thus pure, it soon would rend. If earth were not thus sure, 
would break and bend. Without these powers, the spirits soon would fail. If not so filled, the drought would parch each veil. Without that life, creatures would pass away. Princes and kings, without that moral sway. However grand and high, would all decay. 3. Thus it is that dignity finds its, firm, root in its, previous, meanness, and what is lofty finds its stability in the lowness, from which it rises. Hence princes and kings call themselves orphans, men of small virtue, and as, carriages without a knave. Is not this an acknowledgment that in their considering themselves mean they see the foundation of their dignity? So it is that in the enumeration of the different parts of a carriage we do not come on what makes it answer the ends of a carriage. They do not wish to show themselves elegant looking as jade, but, prefer, to be coarse looking as an, ordinary, stone. The Origin of the Law In this title there is a reference to the law given to all things by the Tao, as described in the conclusion of chapter 25. And the Tao affords that law by its passionless, undemonstrative nature, through which in its spontaneity, doing nothing for the sake of doing, it yet does all things. The difficulty of translation is in the third paragraph. The way in which princes and kings speak depreciatingly of themselves is adduced as illustrating how they have indeed got the spirit of the Tao. And I accept the last epithet as given by Ho Shang Kung, naveless, instead of, equals, the unworthy, which is found in Wang Pai, and has been adopted by nearly all subsequent editors. To see its appropriateness here, we have only to refer back to chapter 11, where the thirty spokes, and the nave, empty to receive the axle, are spoken of. And it is shown how the usefulness of the carriage is derived from that emptiness of the nave. This also enables us to give a fair and consistent explanation of the difficult clause which follows, in which also I have followed the text of Ho Shang Kung. For his, Wang Pai has, which also is found in a quotation of it by Wei Nan Dees. But this need not affect the meaning. In the translation of the clause we are assisted by a somewhat similar illustration about a horse in the 25th of Kuang Di's books, par. 10. 40. 40, 1. The movement of the Tao. By contraries proceeds. And weakness marks the course. Of Tao's mighty deeds. 2. All things under heaven sprang from it as existing, and named, that existence sprang from it as non-existent, and not named. Dispensing with the use, of means, with their use, that is, as it appears to us. The subject of the brief chapter is the action of the Tao by contraries, leading to a result the opposite of what existed previously, and by means which might seem calculated to produce a contrary result. In translating par. 2 one have followed Zio Hung, who finds the key to it in ch1. Having a name, the Tao is, the mother of all things, having no name, it is, the originator of heaven and earth. But here is the teaching of Laodes if Tao seems to be before God, Tao itself sprang from nothing. 41. 41, 1. Scholars of the highest class, when they hear about the Tao, earnestly carry it into practice. Scholars of the middle class, when they have heard about it, seem now to keep it and now to lose it. Scholars of the lowest class, when they have heard about it, laugh greatly at it. If it were not, thus, laughed at, it would not be fit to be the Tao. 2. Therefore the sentence-makers have thus expressed themselves. The Tao, when brightest seen, seems light to lack. Who progress in it makes, seems drawing back. Its even way is like a rugged track. Its highest virtue from the veil doth rise. Its greatest beauty seems to offend the eyes. And he has most whose lot the least supplies. Its firmest virtue seems but poor and low. Its solid truth seems changed to undergo. Its largest square doth yet no corner show. A vessel great, it is the slowest made. Loud is its sound, but never word it said. A semblance great, the shadow of a shade. 3. The Tao is hidden, and has no name. But it is the Tao which is skillful at imparting, to all things what they need, and making them complete. Sameness and Difference The chapter is a sequel of the preceding, 
and may be taken as an illustration of the Tao's proceeding by contraries. Who the sentence makers were whose sayings are quoted we cannot tell, but it would have been strange if Laodice had not had a large store of such sentences at his command. The fifth and sixth of those employed by him here are found in Lidis, 2, 15a, spoken by Lao in reproving Yang Ku, and in 7, 3a, that heretic appears quoting an utterance of the same kind, with the words, according to an old saying. 42. 42, 1. The Tao produced one, one produced two, two produced three, three produced all things. All things leave behind them the obscurity, out of which they have come, and go forward to embrace the brightness, into which they have emerged, while they are harmonized by the breath of vacancy. 2. What men dislike is to be orphans, to have little virtue, to be as carriages without knaves, and yet these are the designations which kings and princes use for themselves. So it is that some things are increased by being diminished, and others are diminished by being increased. 3. What other men, thus, teach, I also teach. The violent and strong do not die their natural death. I will make this the basis of my teaching. The Transformations of the Tao In Par 2 We have the case of the depreciating epithets given to themselves by kings and princes, which we found before in ch. 39, and a similar lesson is drawn from it. Such depreciation leads to exaltation, and the contrary course of self-exaltation leads to abasement. This latter case is stated emphatically in Par. 3. And Laudes says that it was the basis of his teaching. So far therefore we have in this chapter a repetition of the lesson that the movement of the Tao is by contraries, and that its weakness is the sure precursor of strength. But the connection between this lesson and what he says in par. 1. It is difficult to trace. Up to this time at least it has baffled myself. The passage seems to give us a cosmogony. The Tao produced one. We have already seen that the Tao is the one. Are we to understand here that the Tao, and the One were one and the same? In this case what would be the significance of the, produced, that the Tao which had been previously, non-existent, now became, existent, or capable of being named? This seems to be the view of Zima Kuang, AD 1009-1086. The most singular form which this view assumes is in one of the treatises on our king, attributed to the Taoist patriarch Lu, that, the One is Heaven, which was formed by the congealing of the Tao. According to another treatise, also assigned to the same Lu, the one was, the primordial ether, the two, the separation of that into its yin and yang constituents, and the three, the production of heaven, earth, and man by these. In quoting the paragraph Weinan Dees omits, and commences with, and his glossarist, Kao Yu, makes out the one to be the Tao, the two to be spiritual intelligences, and the three to be the harmonizing breath. From the mention of the yin and yang that follows, I believe that Laodis intended by the two these two qualities or elements in the primordial ether, which would be, the one. I dare not hazard a guess as to what the three were. 43. 43, 1. The softest thing in the world dashes against and overcomes the hardest, that which has no, substantial, existence enters where there is no crevice. I know hereby what advantage belongs to doing nothing, with a purpose. 2. There are few in the world who attain to the teaching without words, and the advantage arising from non-action. The universal use, of the action in weakness of the Tao, dot. The chapter takes us back to the lines of ch. 40, that. Weakness marks the course. Of Tao's mighty deeds. By, the softest thing in the world, it is agreed that we are to understand water, which will wear away the hardest rocks. Dashing against and overcoming is a metaphor taken from hunting. Ho Shang Kung says that, what has no existence is the Tao, it is better to understand by it the unsubstantial air, which penetrates everywhere, we cannot see how. Compare Par. 2 with CH2, Par. 3. 44. 44, 1. Or fame or life. Which do you hold more dear? Or life or wealth. To which would you adhere? 
Keep life and lose those other things. Keep them and lose your life, which brings sorrow and pain more near. 2. Thus we may see who cleaves to fame, rejects what is more great, who loves large stores, gives up the richer state. 3. Who is content, needs fear no shame, who knows to stop, incurs no blame, from danger free. Long live shall he. Cautions. The chapter warns men to let nothing come into competition with the value which they set on the Tao. The Tao is not named, indeed, but the idea of it was evidently in the writer's mind. The whole chapter rhymes after a somewhat peculiar fashion, familiar enough, however, to one who is acquainted with the old rhymes of the Book of Poetry. 45. 45, 1. Who thinks his great achievements poor? Shall find his vigor long endure. Of greatest fullness, deemed a void. Exhaustion ne'er shall stem the tide. Do thou what straight still crooked deem. Thy greatest art still stupid seem. And eloquence a stammering scream. 2. Constant action overcomes cold, being still overcomes heat. Purity and stillness give the correct law to all under heaven. Great or overflowing virtue. The chapter is another illustration of the working of the Tao by contraries. According to Wu Kang, the action which overcomes cold is that of the yang element in the developing primordial ether. And the stillness which overcomes heat is that of the contrary yin element. These may have been in Lao Di's mind, but the statements are so simple as hardly to need any comment. Wu further says that the purity and stillness are descriptive of the condition of non-action. 46. 46. 1. When the Tao prevails in the world, they send back their swift horses to, draw, the dung carts. When the Tao is disregarded in the world, the war horses breed in the borderlands. 2. There is no guilt greater than to sanction ambition, no calamity greater than to be discontented with one's lot no fault greater than the wish to be getting. Therefore the sufficiency of contentment is an enduring and unchanging sufficiency. The moderating of desire or ambition. The chapter shows how the practice of the Tao must conduce to contentment and happiness. In translating par. One I have, after Wu Kang, admitted a after the, his chief authority for doing so being that it is so found in a poetical piece by Kong Hang, d. 78 to 139. Ku Shi also adopted this reading, 18, 7a. In par. 2 Haning has a tempting variation of 4, but I have not adopted it because the same phrase occurs elsewhere. 47. 47, 1. Without going outside his door, one understands, all that takes place, under the sky. Without looking out from his window, one sees the Tao of Heaven. The farther that one goes out, from himself, the less he knows. 2. Therefore the sages got their knowledge without traveling, gave their, right, names to things without seeing them. And accomplished their ends without any purpose of doing so. Surveying what is far off. The chapter is a lesson to men to judge of things according to their internal conviction of similar things in their own experience. Short as the chapter is, it is somewhat mystical. The phrase, the Tao, or way of heaven, occurs in it for the first time, and it is difficult to lay down its precise meaning. Laudis would seem to teach that man is a microcosm. And that, if he understand the movements of his own mind, he can understand the movements of all other minds. There are various readings, of which it is not necessary to speak. I have translated par. 2 in the past tense, and perhaps the first should also be translated so. Most of it is found in Haning, preceded by, formerly, or anciently. 48. 48, 1. He who devotes himself to learning, seeks, from day to day to increase, his knowledge. He who devotes himself to the Tao, seeks, from day to day to diminish, his doing. 2. He diminishes it and again diminishes it, till he arrives at doing nothing, on purpose. Having arrived at this point of non-action, there is nothing which he does not do. 
3. He who gets as his own all under heaven does so by giving himself no trouble, with that end. If one take trouble, with that end, he is not equal to getting as his own all under heaven. Forgetting knowledge, the contrast between learning and the Tao. It is only by the Tao that the world can be won. Zio Hung commences his quotations of commentary on this chapter with the following from Kumar Jiva on the second part, colon, he carries on the process of diminishing till there is nothing coarse about him which is not put away. He puts it away till he has forgotten all that was bad in it. He then puts away all that is fine about him. He does so till he has forgotten all that was good in it. But the bad was wrong, and the good is right. Having diminished the wrong, and also diminished the right, the process is carried on till they are both forgotten. Passion and desire are both cut off, and his virtue and the Tao are in such union that he does nothing. But though he does nothing, he allows all things to do their own doing, and all things are done. Such is a Buddhistic view of the passage, not very intelligible, and which I do not endorse. In a passage in the Narratives of the School, B.K. 9, Art. 2. We have a Confucian view of the passage let perspicacity, intelligence, shrewdness, and wisdom be guarded by stupidity, and the service of the possessor will affect the whole world. Let them be guarded by complaisance, and his dating and strength will shake the age, let them be guarded by timidity, and his wealth will be all within the four seas. Let them be guarded by humility, and there will be what we call the method of diminishing it, and diminishing it again. But neither do I endorse this. My own view of the scope of the chapter has been given above in a few words. The greater part of it is found in Quang Di's. 49. 49, 1. The sage has no invariable mind of his own, he makes the mind of the people his mind. 2. To those who are good, to me, I am good, and to those who are not good, to me, I am also good. And thus, all, get to be good. To those who are sincere, with me, I am sincere, and to those who are not sincere, with me, I am also sincere, and thus, all, get to be sincere. 3. The sage has in the world an appearance of indecision, and keeps his mind in a state of indifference to all. The people all keep their eyes and ears directed to him, and he deals with them all as his children. The Quality of Indulgence the chapter shows how that quality enters largely into the dealing of the sage with other men, and exercises over them a transforming influence, dominated as it is in him by the Tao. My version of Par. 1. Is taken from Drive Chalmers. A good commentary on it was given by the last emperor but one of the earlier of the two great Sung dynasties, in the period, d. 1111-1117 the mind of the sage is free from preoccupation and able to receive, still, and able to respond. In par. 2 I adopt the reading of to get, to get, instead of the more common, virtue, or, quality. There is a passage in Han Ing, 9, 3b, 4a, the style of which, most readers will probably agree with me in thinking, was molded on the text before us, though nothing is said of any connection between it and the saying of Laodice. I must regard it as a sequel to the conversation between Confucius and some of his disciples about the principle, Lao's principle, that injury should be recompensed with kindness, as recorded in the Khan Anna, 1436. We read, Dees Lu said, When men are good to me, I will also be good to them, when they are not good to me, I will also be not good to them. Dees Kung said, When men are good to me, I will also be good to them. When they are not good to me, I will simply lead them on, forwards it may be or backwards. Yen Hui said, When men are good to me, I will also be good to them when they are not good to me, I will still be good to them. The views of the three disciples being thus different, they referred the point to the master, who said, The words of Dees Lu are such as might be expected among the wild tribes of the man and the mo. Those of Dees Kung, such as might be expected among friends, those of Hui, such as might be expected among relatives and near connections. This is all. The master was still far from Lao Di's standpoint, and that of his own favorite disciple, Yen Hui. 50. 50, 1. Men come forth and live, they enter, again, and die. 
Two of every ten three are ministers of life, to themselves. And three are ministers of death. Three, there are also three in every ten whose aim is to live, but whose movements tend to the land, or place, of death. And for what reason? Because of their excessive endeavors to perpetuate life. 4. But I have heard that he who is skillful in managing the life entrusted to him for a time travels on the land without having to shun rhinoceros or tiger, and enters a host without having to avoid buff coat or sharp weapon. The rhinoceros finds no place in him into which to thrust its horn, nor the tiger a place in which to fix its claws, nor the weapon a place to admit its point. And for what reason? Because there is in him no place of death. The value set on life. The chapter sets forth the Tao as an antidote against decay and death. In par. One life is presented to us as intermediate between two non-existences. The words will suggest to many readers those in Job I, 21. In pars. 2 and 3 I translate the characters by 3 in 10, instead of by 13, as Julian and other translators have done. The characters are susceptible of either translation according to the tone in which we read them. They were construed as I have done by Wang Pai, and many of the best commentators have followed in his wake. The ministers of life to themselves would be those who eschewed all things, both internal and external, tending to injure health. The ministers of death, those who pursued courses likely to cause disease and shorten life, the third three would be those who thought that by mysterious and abnormal courses they could prolong life, but only injured it. Those three classes being thus disposed of, there remains only one in ten rightly using the Tao, and he is spoken of in the next paragraph. This par. For it is easy of translation, and the various readings in it are unimportant, differing in this respect from those in par. 3. But the aim of the author in it is not clear. In ascribing such effects to the possession of the Tao, is he trifling, as Dr. Chalmers thinks? Or indulging the play of his poetical fancy? Or simply saying that the Taoist will keep himself out of danger? 51. 51. 1. All things are produced by the Tao, and nourished by its outflowing operation. They receive their forms according to the nature of each, and are completed according to the circumstances of their condition. Therefore all things without exception honor the Tao, and exalt its outflowing operation. 2. This honoring of the Tao and exalting of its operation is not the result of any ordination, but always a spontaneous tribute. 3. Thus it is that the Tao produces, all things, nourishes them, brings them to their full growth, nurses them, completes them, matures them, maintains them, and overspreads them. 4. It produces them and makes no claim to the possession of them. It carries them through their processes and does not vaunt its ability in doing so, it brings them to maturity and exercises no control over them, this is called its mysterious operation. The operation, of the Tao, in nourishing things. The subject of the chapter is the quiet passionless operation of the Tao in nature, in the production and nourishing of things throughout the seasons of the year, a theme dwelt on by Laudes, in 2, 4, x, 3, and other places. The Tao is the subject of all the predicates in par. 1. And what seem the subjects in all but the first member should be construed adverbially. On par. 2 Wu Kang says that the honor of the Son of Heaven is derived from his appointment by God, and that then the nobility of the feudal princes is derived from him. But in the honor given to the Tao and the nobility ascribed to its operation, we are not to think of any external ordination. There is a strange reading of two of the members of Par. 3 In Wang Pai, viz. 4. This is quoted and predicated of Heaven in the Nestorian monument of Xi'an in the 8th century. 52. 52, 1. The Tao, which originated all under the sky is to be considered as the mother of them all. 2. When the mother is found, we know what her children should be. When one knows that he is his mother's child, and proceeds to guard, the qualities of, the mother that belong to him, to the end of his life he will be free from all peril. 3. 
Let him keep his mouth closed, and shut up the portals, of his nostrils, and all his life he will be exempt from laborious exertion. Let him keep his mouth open, and, spend his breath, in the promotion of his affairs, and all his life there will be no safety for him. For, the perception of what is small is, the secret of, clear-sightedness. The guarding of what is soft and tender is, the secret of, strength. 5. Who uses well his light. Reverting to its, source so, bright. Will from his body ward all blight. And hides the unchanging from men's sight. Returning to the source. The meaning of the chapter is obscure, and the commentators give little help in determining it. As in the preceding chapter, Laudis treats of the operation of the Tao on material things, he seems in this to go on to the operation of it in man, or how he, with his higher nature, should ever be maintaining it in himself. For the understanding of paragraph 1 we must refer to the first chapter of the treatise, where the Tao, having no name, appears as, the beginning or, first cause, of the world, and then, having a name, as its mother. It is the same thing or concept in both of its phases, the ideal or absolute, and the manifestation of it in its passionless doings. The old Jesuit translators render this par. By, Mundus Principium et Causum Swam Habit in Divino, Seu Action Divini Sapientiae Quae Deci Potest Aegis Mater. So far I may assume that they agreed with me in understanding that the subject of the par. Was the Tao. Par. 2 lays down the law of life for man thus derived from the Tao. The last clause of it is given by the same translators as equivalent to unde fit uti post mortem nihil ei timendum sit, a meaning which the characters will not bear. But from that clause, and the next par, I am obliged to conclude that even in Laudi's mind there was the germ of the sublimation of the material frame which issued in the asceticism and life preserving arts of the later Taoism. Par. 3 seems to indicate the method of guarding the mother in man, by watching over the breath, the protoplastic one of ch 42, the ethereal matter out of which all material things were formed. The organs of this breath in man are the mouth and nostrils, nothing else should be understood here by and, see the explanations of the former in the last par. Of the fifth of the appendixes to the E in volume 16, page 432. And the management of the breath is the mystery of the esoteric Buddhism and Taoism. In par. For, the guarding what is soft is derived from the use of, the soft lips in hiding and preserving the hard and strong teeth. Par. 5 gives the gist of the chapter, man's always keeping before him the ideal of the Tao, and, without purpose, simply doing whatever he finds to do, Tao-like and powerful in all his sphere of action. I have followed the reading of the last character but one, which is given by Zio Hung instead of that found in Ho Shang Kung and Wang Pai. 53. 53, 1. If I were suddenly to become known, and, put into a position to, conduct, a government, according to the great Tao, what I should be most afraid of would be a boastful display. 2. The great Tao, or way, is very level and easy. But people love the byways. 3. Their court, yards and buildings, shall be well kept, but their fields shall be ill-cultivated, and their granaries very empty. They shall wear elegant and ornamented robes, carry a sharp sword at their girdle, pamper themselves in eating and drinking, and have a superabundance of property and wealth, such, princes, may be called robbers and boasters. This is contrary to the Tao surely. Increase of Evidence The chapter contrasts government by the Tao with that conducted in a spirit of ostentation and by oppression. In the I of paragraph 1 does Lao Di speak of himself? I think he does. Wu Kang understands it of any man, i.e. anyone in the exercise of government, which is possible. What is peculiar to my version is the pregnant meaning given to, common enough in the mouth of Confucius. I have adopted it here because of a passage in Lu Xiang Shuo Wan, XX, 13b, where Lao Di's is made to say, excessive is the difficulty of practicing the Tao at the present time, adding that the princes of his age would not receive it from him. On the Great Tao, see chapters 25, 34, et al. From the 20th book of Han Fei, 
12b and 13a, I conclude that he had the whole of this chapter in his copy of our king, but he broke it up, after his fashion, into fragmentary utterances, confused and confounding. He gives also some remarkable various readings, one of which, instead of Ho Shang Kang and Wang Pai S, character 48, is now generally adopted. The passage is quoted in the Kangxi Dictionary under with this reading. 54. 54, 1. What, Tao's, skillful planter plants. Can never be uptorn. What his skillful arms enfold. From him can ne'er be born. Sons shall bring in lengthening line. Sacrifices to his shrine. 2. Tao when nursed within oneself. His vigor will make true. And where the family it rules. What riches will accrue. The neighborhood where it prevails. In thriving will abound. And when, tis seen throughout the state. Good fortune will be found. Employ at the kingdom o'er. And men thrive all around. 3. In this way the effect will be seen in the person, by the observation of different cases, in the family. In the neighborhood, in the state, and in the kingdom. 4. How do I know that this effect is sure to hold thus all under the sky? By this, method of observation. The cultivation, of the Tao, and the observation, of its effects, dot. The sentiment of the first paragraph is found in the 27th and other previous chapters that the noiseless and imperceptible acting of the Tao is irresistible in its influence. And this runs through to the end of the chapter with the additional appeal to the influence of its effects. The introduction of the subject of sacrifices, a religious rite, though not presented to the highest object, will strike the reader as peculiar in our king. The Te mentioned five times in par. 2. Is the virtue of the Tao embodied in the individual, and extending from him in all the spheres of his occupation, and is explained differently by Han Fei according to its application, and his example I have to some extent followed. The force of pars. 3 and 4 is well given by Ho Shang Kung. On the first clause he says, take the person of one who cultivates the Tao, and compare it with that of one who does not cultivate it, which is in a state of decay and which is in a state of preservation. 55. 55, 1. He who has in himself abundantly the attributes, of the Tao, is like an infant. Poisonous insects will not sting him, fierce beasts will not seize him, birds of prey will not strike him. 2. The infant's, bones are weak and its sinews soft, but yet its grasp is firm. It knows not yet the union of male and female, and yet its virile member may be excited, showing the perfection of its physical essence. All day long it will cry without its throat becoming hoarse, showing the harmony, in its constitution. 3. To him by whom this harmony is known. The secret of, the unchanging, Tao, is shown. And in the knowledge wisdom finds its throne. All life increasing arts to evil turn. Where the mind makes the vital breath to burn. False, is the strength, and o'er it we should mourn. 4. When things have become strong, they, then, become old, which may be said to be contrary to the Tao. Whatever is contrary to the Tao soon ends. The mysterious charm, meaning, apparently, the entire passivity of the Tao. With pars. 1 and 2, compare what is said about the infant in chapters 10 and 20, and about the immunity from dangers such as here described of the disciple of the Tao in ch. 50. My evil in the second triplet of par. 3 has been translated by felicity. But a reference to the Kangxi dictionary will show that the meaning which I give to is well authorized. It is the only meaning allowable here. The third and fourth in this par. Appear in Ho Shang Kung's text as, and he comments on the clauses accordingly. Page 100. But is now the received reading. Some light is thrown on this paragraph and the next by an apocryphal conversation attributed to Lao Di's in Lu Xiang Shuo Wan, X, 4a. 56. 56, 1. He who knows, the Tao, does not, care to, speak, about it. He who is, ever ready to, speak about it does not know it. 
2. He, who knows it, will keep his mouth shut and close the portals, of his nostrils. He will blunt his sharp points and unravel the complications of things. He will attemper his brightness, and bring himself into agreement with the obscurity, of others. This is called, the mysterious agreement. 3. Such an one, cannot be treated familiarly or distantly. He is beyond all consideration of profit or injury, of nobility or meanness he is the noblest man under heaven. The Mysterious Excellence The chapter gives us a picture of the man of Tao, humble and retiring, oblivious of himself and of other men, the noblest man under heaven. Par One is found in Kuangdi's, 13, 20b, not expressly mentioned, as taken from Laodi's, but at the end of a string of sentiments, ascribed to, the master, some of them, like the two clauses here, no doubt belonging to him, and the others. Probably Quang Di's own. Par. 2 is all found in chapters 4 and 52, excepting the short clause in the conclusion. 57. 57, 1. A state may be ruled by, measures of, correction, weapons of war may be used with crafty dexterity. But, the kingdom is made one's own, only, by freedom from action and purpose. 2. How do I know that it is so? By these facts in the kingdom the multiplication of prohibitive enactments increases the poverty of the people. The more implements to add to their profit that the people have, the greater disorder is there in the state and clan, the more acts of crafty dexterity that men possess, the more do strange contrivances appear. The more display there is of legislation, the more thieves and robbers there are. 3. Therefore a sage has said, I will do nothing, of purpose, and the people will be transformed of themselves. I will be fond of keeping still, and the people will of themselves become correct. I will take no trouble about it, and the people will of themselves become rich. I will manifest no ambition, and the people will of themselves attain to the primitive simplicity. The Genuine Influence the chapter shows how government by the Tao is alone effective, and of universal application. Contrasting it with the failure of other methods. After the, weapons of war, in par. 1, one is tempted to take, the sharp implements in par. 2 as such weapons, but the meaning which I finally adopted, especially after studying chapters 36 and 80, seems more consonant with Laudi's scheme of thought. In the last member of the same par. Ho Shang Kung has the strange reading of, and uses it in his commentary, but the better text of is found both in Wei Nan and Zima Qin, and in Wang Pai. We do not know if the writer were quoting any particular sage in par. 3. Or referring generally to the sages of the past, men like the sentence makers of ch 41. 58. 58. 1. The government that seems the most unwise. Oft goodness to the people best supplies. That which is meddling, touching everything. Will work but ill, and disappointment bring. Misery, happiness is to be found by its side. Happiness, misery lurks beneath it. Who knows what either will come to in the end. 2. Shall we then dispense with correction? The method of correction shall by a turn become distortion, and the good in it shall by a turn become evil. The delusion of the people, on this point, has indeed subsisted for a long time. 3. Therefore the sage is, like, a square which cuts no one, with its angles, like, a corner which injures no one, with its sharpness. He is straightforward, but allows himself no license, he is bright, but does not dazzle. Transformation according to circumstances, but this title does not throw light on the meaning of the chapter. Nor are we helped to an understanding of it by Han Fei, with his additions and comments, 11, 3b, 4b, nor by Wei Nan with his illustrations, 12, 21a, b. The difficulty of it is increased by its being separated from the preceding chapter of which it is really the sequel. It contrasts still further government by the Tao, with that by the method of correction. The sage is the same in both chapters, his character and government both marked by the opposites or contraries which distinguish the procedure of the Tao, as stated in ch. 40. 59. 
59, 1. For regulating the human, in our constitution, and rendering the proper, service to the heavenly, there is nothing like moderation. 2. It is only by this moderation that there is effected an early return, to man's normal state. That early return is what I call the repeated accumulation of the attributes, of the Tao. With that repeated accumulation of those attributes, there comes the subjugation, of every obstacle to such return. Of this subjugation we know not what shall be the limit, and when one knows not what the limit shall be, he may be the ruler of a state. 3. He who possesses the mother of the state may continue long. His case is like that, of the plant, of which we say that its roots are deep and its flower stalks firm, this is the way to secure that its enduring life shall long be seen. Guarding the Tao The chapter shows how it is the guarding of the Tao that ensures a continuance of long life, with vigor and success. The abuse of it and other passages in our king helped on, I must believe, the later Taoist dreams about the elixir vitae and life-preserving pills. The whole of it, with one or two various readings, is found in Han Fei, 6, for B, 6a, who speaks twice in his comments of, the book. Par. One has been translated, in governing men and in serving heaven, there is nothing like moderation. But by, heaven, there is not intended, the blue sky, above us, nor any personal power above it, but the Tao embodied in our constitution, the heavenly element in our nature. The moderation is the opposite of what we call living fast, burning the candle at both ends. In par. 2 I must read, instead of the more common. I find it in Lu Taiming, and that it is not a misprint in him appears from his subjoining that it is pronounced like. Its meaning is the same as in in ch 52, par. 5. Te is not virtue in our common meaning of the term, but the attributes of the Tao, as almost always with Laodis. In par. 3. The mother of the state is the Tao as in ch 1, and especially in ch 52, par. 1. 60. 60, 1. Governing a great state is like cooking small fish. 2. Let the kingdom be governed according to the Tao, and the manies of the departed will not manifest their spiritual energy. It is not that those manies have not that spiritual energy, but it will not be employed to hurt men. It is not that it could not hurt men, but neither does the ruling sage hurt them. 3. When these two do not injuriously affect each other, their good influences converge in the virtue, of the Tao. Occupying the throne. Occupying it, that is, according to the Tao, noiselessly and purposelessly, so that the people enjoy their lives, free from all molestation seen and unseen. Par. 1, that is, in the most quiet and easy manner. The whole of the chapter is given and commented on by Han Fei, 6, 6a, 7b, but very unsatisfactorily. The more one thinks and reads about the rest of the chapter, the more does he agree with the words of Julian, it presents the frequent recurrence of the same characters, and appears as insignificant as it is unintelligible. If we give to the Chinese characters their ordinary meaning, the reader will observe that we have here the second mention of spirits, the manies, Chalmers, the ghosts, Julian, Les Demons. CCH 39. Whatever Laodice meant to teach in par. 2. He laid in it a foundation for the superstition of the later and present Taoism about the spirits of the dead, such as appeared few years ago in the detail cutting scare. 61. 61, 1. What makes a great state is its being, like, low lying, down flowing, stream, it becomes the center to which tend, all the small states, under heaven. 2. To illustrate from, the case of all females, the female always overcomes the male by her stillness. Stillness may be considered, a sort of, abasement. 3. Thus it is that a great state, by condescending to small states, gains them for itself. And that small states, by abasing themselves to a great state, win it over to them. In the one case the abasement leads to gaining adherence, in the other case to procuring favor. 4. The great state only wishes to unite men together and nourish them, 
a small state only wishes to be received by, and to serve, the other. Each gets what it desires, but the great state must learn to abase itself. The Attribute of Humility A favorite theme with Laodice, and the illustration of it from the low-lying stream to which smaller streams flow is also a favorite subject with him. The language can hardly but recall the words of a greater than Laodice. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. 62. 62, 1. Tao has of all things the most honored place. No treasures give good men so rich a grace, bad men it guards, and doth their ill efface. 2. Its, admirable words can purchase honor. Its, admirable deeds can raise their performer above others. Even men who are not good are not abandoned by it. 3. Therefore when the sovereign occupies his place as the son of heaven, and he has appointed his three ducal ministers, though, a prince, were to send in a round symbol of rank large enough to fill both the hands. And that as the precursor of the team of horses, in the courtyard, such an offering would not be equal to, a lesson of, this Tao, which one might present on his knees. 4. Why was it that the ancients prized this Tao so much? Was it not because it could be got by seeking for it, and the guilty could escape, from the stain of their guilt, by it? This is the reason why all under heaven consider it the most valuable thing. Practicing the Tao, the value set on the Tao, would have been a more appropriate title. The chapter sets forth that value in various manifestations of it. Par. 1. For the meaning of, see Confucian Analects, 3, ch. 13. Par. 2. I am obliged to adopt the reading of the first sentence of this paragraph given by Wei Nan. See especially his quotation of it in 18, 10a, as from a superior man, I have not found his reading anywhere else. Par. 3. Is not easily translated, or explained. See the rules on presenting offerings at the court of a ruler or the king, in volume 27 of the Sacred Books of the East, page 84, note 3, and also a narrative in the Zhou Quan under the 33rd year of Duke Shi. 63. 63, 1. It is the way of the Tao, to act without, thinking of, acting, to conduct affairs without, feeling the, trouble of them, to taste without discerning any flavor, to consider what is small as great, and a few as many. And to recompense injury with kindness. 2. The master of it, anticipates things that are difficult while they are easy, and does things that would become great while they are small. All difficult things in the world are sure to arise from a previous state in which they were easy, and all great things from one in which they were small. Therefore the sage, while he never does what is great, is able on that account to accomplish the greatest things. 3. He who lightly promises is sure to keep but little faith. He who is continually thinking things easy is sure to find them difficult. Therefore the sage sees difficulty even in what seems easy, and so never has any difficulties. Thinking in the beginning. The former of these two characters is commonly misprinted, and this has led Chalmers to mistranslate them by, the beginning of grace. The chapter sets forth the passionless method of the Tao, and how the sage accordingly accomplishes his objects easily by forestalling in his measures all difficulties. In par. 1 The clauses are indicative, and not imperative, and therefore we have to supplement the text in translating in some such way, as I have done. They give us a cluster of aphorisms illustrating the procedure of the Tao, by contraries, and conclude with one, which is the chief glory of Laodice's teaching. Though I must think that its value is somewhat diminished by the method in which he reaches it. It has not the prominence in the later teaching of Taoist writers which we should expect, nor is it found, so far as I know, in Kuang Di's, Han Fei, or Wei Nan. It is quoted, however, twice by Lu Xiang, see my note on par. 2 of ch. 49. It follows from the whole chapter that the Taoistic, doing nothing, was not an absolute quiescence and inaction, but had a method in it. 64. 64, 1. That which is at rest is easily kept hold of. Before a thing has given indications of its presence, it is easy to take measures against it, 
that which is brittle is easily broken, that which is very small is easily dispersed. Action should be taken before a thing has made its appearance. Order should be secured before disorder has begun. 2. The tree which fills the arms grew from the tiniest sprout, the tower of nine stories rose from a, small, heap of earth, the journey of a thousand li commenced with a single step. 3. He who acts, with an ulterior purpose, does harm, he who takes hold of a thing, in the same way, loses his hold. The sage does not act, so, and therefore does no harm, he does not lay hold, so, and therefore does not lose his hold. But, people in their conduct of affairs are constantly ruining them when they are on the eve of success. If they were careful at the end, as, they should be, at the beginning, they would not so ruin them. 4. Therefore the sage desires what, other men, do not desire, and does not prize things difficult to get, he learns what, other men, do not learn, and turns back to what the multitude of men have passed by. Thus he helps the natural development of all things, and does not dare to act, with an ulterior purpose of his own. Guarding the Minute The chapter is a continuation and enlargement of the last. Wu Kang, indeed, unites the two, blending them together with some ingenious transpositions and omissions, which it is not necessary to discuss. Compare the first part of Par. 3 with the last part of Par. 1. Ch. 29. 65. 65. 1. The ancients who showed their skill in practicing the Tao did so, not to enlighten the people, but rather to make them simple and ignorant. 2. The difficulty in governing the people arises from their having much knowledge. He who, tries to, govern a state by his wisdom is a scourge to it while he who does not, try to, do so is a blessing. 3. He who knows these two things finds in them also his model and rule. Ability to know this model and rule constitutes what we call the mysterious excellence, of a governor. Deep and far-reaching is such mysterious excellence, showing indeed its possessor as opposite to others, but leading them to a great conformity to him. Pure, unmixed excellence. The chapter shows the powerful and beneficent influence of the Tao in government, in contrast with the applications and contrivances of human wisdom. Compare CH 19. My, simple and ignorant is taken from Julian. More literally the translation would be, to make them stupid. Might scourge in par. 2 is also after Julian's, flow. 66. 66, 1. That whereby the rivers and seas are able to receive the homage and tribute of all the valley streams, is their skill in being lower than they, it is thus that they are the kings of them all. So it is that the sage, ruler, wishing to be above men, puts himself by his words below them, and, wishing to be before them, places his person behind them. 2. In this way though he has his place above them, men do not feel his weight, nor though he has his place before them, do they feel it an injury to them. 3. Therefore all in the world delight to exalt him and do not weary of him. Because he does not strive, no one finds it possible to strive with him. Putting oneself last. The subject is the power of the Tao, by its display of humility in attracting men. The subject and the way in which it is illustrated are frequent themes in the King. See chapters 8, 22, 39, 42, 61, et al. The last sentence of Par. 3 is found also in ch. 22. There seem to be no quotations from the chapter in Han Fei or Wei Nan. But Wu Kang quotes passages from Tung Kung Shu, of the 2nd century B.C., and Yang Sung, B.C. 53 A.D. 18, which seem to show that the phraseology of it was familiar to them. The former says, when one places himself in his qualities below others, his person is above them, when he places them behind those of others, his person is before them, the other, men exalt him who humbles himself below them and give the precedence to him who puts himself behind them. 67. 67, 1. All the world says that, while my Tao is great, it yet appears to be inferior, to other systems of teaching. 
now it is just its greatness that makes it seem to be inferior. If it were like any other system, for long would its smallness have been known. 2. But I have three precious things which I prize and hold fast. The first is gentleness. The second is economy, and the third is shrinking from taking precedence of others. 3. With that gentleness I can be bold, with that economy I can be liberal, shrinking from taking precedence of others, one can become a vessel of the highest honor. Nowadays they give up gentleness and are all for being bold, economy, and are all for being liberal, the hindmost place, and seek only to be foremost, of all which the end is, death. 4. Gentleness is sure to be victorious even in battle, and firmly to maintain its ground. Heaven will save its possessor, by his, very, gentleness protecting him. The Three Precious Things This title is taken from Par. 2. And suggests to us how the early framer of these titles intended to express by them the subject matter of their several chapters. The three things are the three distinguishing qualities of the possessor of the Tao, the three great moral qualities appearing in its followers, the qualities, we may venture to say, of the Tao itself. The same phrase is now the common designation of Buddhism in China, the Triratna or Ratnatraya, the precious Buddha, the precious law, and the precious priesthood, or rather monkhood, or church. Appearing also in the Trisarana, or formula of the three refuges, what Dr. Itel calls the most primitive formula fidei of the early Buddhists, introduced before southern and northern Buddhism separated. I will not introduce the question of whether Buddhism borrowed this designation from Taoism, after its entrance into China. It is in Buddhism the formula of a peculiar church or religion. In Taoism a rule for the character, or the conduct which the Tao demands from all men. My Tao, in par. One is the reading of Wang Pai, Ho Shang Kung's text is simply a. Wang Pai's reading is now generally adopted. The concluding sentiment of the chapter is equivalent to the saying of Mencius, 7, 2, 4, 2, If the ruler of a state love benevolence, he will have no enemy under heaven. Heaven, is equivalent to the Tao, the course of events, providence, as we should say. 68. 68. He who in, Tao's, wars has skill. Assumes no martial port. He who fights with most good will. To rage makes no resort. He who vanquishes yet still. Keeps from his foes apart. He whose hests men most fulfill. Yet humbly plies his art. Thus we say, he ne'er contends. And therein is his might. Thus we say, men's wills he bends. That they with him unite. Thus we say, like heavens his ends. No sage of old more bright. Matching heaven. The chapter describes the work of the practicer of the Tao as accomplished like that of heaven, without striving or crying. He appears under the figure of a mailed warrior, of the ancient chariot. The chapter is a sequel of the preceding, and is joined on to it by Wu Kang, as is also the next. 69. 69, 1. A master of the art of war has said, I do not dare to be the host, to commence the war. I prefer to be the guest, to act on the defensive. I do not dare to advance an inch, I prefer to retire a foot. This is called marshalling the ranks where there are no ranks, bearing the arms, to fight, where there are no arms to bear. Grasping the weapon where there is no weapon to grasp, advancing against the enemy where there is no enemy. 2. There is no calamity greater than lightly engaging in war. To do that is near losing, the gentleness, which is so precious. Thus it is that when opposing weapons are, actually, crossed, he who deplores, the situation, conquers. The use of the mysterious, Tao, dot. Such seems to be the meaning of the title. The chapter teaches that, if war were carried on, or rather avoided, according to the Tao, the result would be success. Laudi's own statements appear as so many paradoxes. They are examples of the procedure of the Tao by contraries or opposites. We do not know who the master of the military art referred to was. Perhaps the author only adopted the style of quotation to express his own sentiments. 
70. 70, 1. My words are very easy to know, and very easy to practice, but there is no one in the world who is able to know and able to practice them. 2. There is an originating and all-comprehending, principle, in my words, and an authoritative law for the things, which I enforce. It is because they do not know these, that men do not know me. 3. They who know me are few, and I am on that account, the more, to be prized. It is thus that the sage wears, a poor garb of, hair cloth, while he carries his, signet of, jade in his bosom. The difficulty of being, rightly, known. The Tao comprehends and rules all Laodi's teaching, as the members of a clan were all in the loins of their first father, and continue to look up to him, and the people of a state are all under the direction of their ruler. Yet the philosopher had to complain of not being known. Laodi's principle and rule or ruler was the Tao. His utterance here is very important. Compare the words of Confucius in the Analects, 14, ch. 37, et al. Par. 2 is twice quoted by Wei Nan, though his text is not quite the same in both cases. 71. 71, 1. To know and yet, think, we do not know is the highest, attainment, not to know, and yet think, we do know is a disease. 2. It is simply by being pained at, the thought of, having this disease that we are preserved from it. The sage has not the disease. He knows the pain that would be inseparable from it, and therefore he does not have it. The disease of knowing. Here, again, we have the Tao working, by contraries, in the matter of knowledge. Compare par. 1 with Confucius's account of what knowledge is in the Analects, 11, ch. 17. The par. 1 is found in one place in Weinan, lengthened out by the addition of particles, but the variation is unimportant. In another place, however, he seems to have had the correct text before him. Par. 2 is in Han Fei also lengthened out, but with an important variation, for, and I cannot construe his text. His is probably a transcriber's error. 72. 72, 1. When the people do not fear what they ought to fear, that which is their great dread will come on them. 2. Let them not thoughtlessly indulge themselves in their ordinary life, let them not act as if weary of what that life depends on. 3. It is by avoiding such indulgence that such weariness does not arise. 4. Therefore the sage knows, these things, of himself, but does not parade, his knowledge, loves, but does not, appear to set a, value on, himself. And thus he puts the latter alternative away and makes choice of the former. Loving oneself, this title is taken from the expression in par. 4. And the object of the chapter seems to be to show how such loving should be manifested, and to enforce the lesson by the example of the sage, the true master of the Tao. In par. 1. The great dread is death, and the things which ought to be feared and may be feared, are the indulgences of the appetites and passions, which, if not eschewed, tend to shorten life and accelerate the approach of death. Pars. 2 and 3 are supplementary to 1. 4. The second character of Ho Shang Kung's text in Par. 2. Wang Pai reads, which has the same name as the other, and according to the Kangxi Dictionary, the two characters are interchangeable. I have also followed Wu Kang in adopting for the former of the two in Par. 3. Wu adopted this reading from a commentator Lu of Lu Ling. It gives a good meaning and is supported by the structure of other sentences made on similar lines. In par. For the sage, must be, the ruler who is a sage, a master of the Tao, the king of ch. 25. He loves himself, i.e. his life, and takes the right measures to prolong his life, but without any demonstration that he is doing so. The above is, I conceive, the correct explanation of the chapter but as to the Chinese critics and foreign translators of it, it may be said, quote hominis, tot sententiae. In illustration of this I venture to subjoin what is found on it in the old version of the Jesuit missionaries, which has not been previously printed. 
Prima Explicatio Juxta Interprets 1. Populus, ubi jam principis iram non timet, nihil non audit ut jugum excusiat, res que communis ad extremum discrimin adducitor. 2. Ambitio principis non faciat turam angusturam, hai vectigalium magnitudine alendo populo insufficientum. Numquam populus patrii pertisis alias terris quarat. 3. Vitae si non te det, nec patriae soli te debit. 4. Quer sanctus sibi semper attentus potentiam suam non ostentat. 5. Cia vir esi amat, non esi preciosum facet. Vel cia sibi rect consulate non esi talum estimat cujus felicitati ed honori infelices populi unici servir debent, immo potius eum esi reputat ca populorum felicitati totum esi debit impendra. 6. Ergo illud resicat, istid amplectator. Alia explicatio. 1. Populus si non eda timet principis magstatum, sed facil ad cum excedit, majestas non minuiter, immo ad sumum prevenit. 2. Vectigalibus terra si non a primiter, sua quisque contentus alias terris non quarat, si se non vexeri populus expirator. 3. Vitae si non te det, nec patriae soli te debit. 4. Quer sanctus magistatus fastum non effectat, immo similem se caterus ostendit. 5. Sibi rect consulens, populorum amans, non se preciosum et inaccessibilum facet. 6. Quid quid ergo timorem incutera potest, hoc evitat. Quat amorem conciliat et benignitatum, se demonstrat hoc elegy et ultro amplectator. 73. 73, 1. He whose boldness appears in his daring, to do wrong, in defiance of the laws, is put to death. He whose boldness appears in his not daring, to do so, lives on. Of these two cases the one appears to be advantageous, and the other to be injurious. But. When heaven's anger smites a man. Who the cause shall truly scan. On this account the sage feels a difficulty as to what to do in the former case. 2. It is the way of heaven not to strive, and yet it skillfully overcomes, not to speak, and yet it is skillful in, obtaining, a reply. Does not call, and yet men come to it of themselves. Its demonstrations are quiet, and yet its plans are skillful and effective. The meshes of the net of heaven are large, far apart, but letting nothing escape. Allowing men to take their course. The chapter teaches that rulers should not be hasty to punish, especially by the infliction of death. Though they may seem to err in leniency, yet heaven does not allow offenders to escape. While heaven hates the ill-doer, yet we must not always conclude from its judgments that everyone who suffers from them is an ill-doer. And the two lines which rhyme, and illustrate this point, are equivalent to the sentiment in our old book, Clouds and Darkness are round about him. They are ascribed to Laudes by Lydes, 6, 7a. But, it has been said, that they are quoted by him, in an entirely different connection. But the same text in two different sermons may be said to be in different connections. In Lydes and our king the lines have the same meaning, and substantially the same application. Indeed Kong Can, of our fourth century, the commentator of Lydes, quotes the comment of Wang Pai on this passage, condensing it into, who can know the mind of heaven. Only the sage can do so. 74. 74, 1. The people do not fear death. To what purpose is it to, try to, frighten them with death? If the people were always in awe of death, and I could always seize those who do wrong, and put them to death, who would dare to do wrong? 2. There is always one who presides over the infliction of death. He who would inflict death in the room of him who so presides over it may be described as hewing wood instead of a great carpenter. Seldom is it that he who undertakes the hewing, instead of the great carpenter, does not cut his own hands. Restraining Delusion The chapter sets forth the inefficiency of capital punishment, and warns rulers against the infliction of it. Who is it that superintends the infliction of death? 
The answer of Ho Shang Kung is very clear it is heaven, which, dwelling on high and ruling all beneath, takes note of the transgressions of men. There is a slight variation in the readings of the second sentence of Par. 2 in the texts of Ho Shang Kung and Wang Pai, and the reading adopted by Zio Hung differs a little from them both, but the meaning is the same in them all. This chapter and the next are rightly joined on to the preceding by Wu Kang. 75. 75, 1. The people suffer from famine because of the multitude of taxes consumed by their superiors. It is through this that they suffer famine. 2. The people are difficult to govern because of the, excessive, agency of their superiors, in governing them. It is through this that they are difficult to govern. 3. The people make light of dying because of the greatness of their labors in seeking for the means of living. It is this which makes them think light of dying. Thus it is that to leave the subject of living altogether out of view is better than to set a high value on it. How greediness injures. The want of the nothing doing Tao leads to the multiplication of exactions by the government, and to the misery of the people, so as to make them think lightly of death. The chapter is a warning for both rulers and people. It is not easy to determine whether rulers, or people, or both, are intended in the concluding sentence of Par. 2. 76. 76, 1. Man at his birth is supple and weak, at his death, firm and strong. So it is with, all things. Trees and plants, in their early growth, are soft and brittle, at their death, dry and withered. 2. Thus it is that firmness and strength are the concomitants of death, softness and weakness, the concomitants of life. 3. Hence he who, relies on, the strength of his forces does not conquer, and a tree which is strong will fill the outstretched arms, and thereby invites the feller. 4. Therefore the place of what is firm and strong is below, and that of what is soft and weak is above. A warning against, trusting in, strength. To trust in one's force is contrary to the Tao, whose strength is more in weakness and humility. In par. 1 The two characters which I have rendered by, so it is with, all things are found in the texts of both Ho Shang Kung and Wang Pai, but Wu Kang and Zio Hung both reject them. I should also have neglected them, but they are also found in Lu Xiang Shuo Wan, X, 4a, with all the rest of pars. 1 and 2, as from Laodice. They are an Anakaluthan, such as is elsewhere found in our king, e.g. In ch. 21, par. 2. The above and below in par. For seem to be merely a play on the words, as capable of meaning more and less honorable. 77. 77, 1. May not the way, or tau, of heaven be compared to the, method of, bending a bow. The, part of the bow, which was high is brought low, and what was low is raised up. So heaven, diminishes where there is superabundance, and supplements where there is deficiency. 2. It is the way of heaven to diminish superabundance, and to supplement deficiency. It is not so with the way of man. He takes away from those who have not enough to add to his own superabundance. 3. Who can take his own superabundance and therewith serve all under heaven? Only he who is in possession of the Tao. 4. Therefore the ruling, sage acts without claiming the results as his. He achieves his merit and does not rest, arrogantly, in it, he does not wish to display his superiority. The way of heaven. But the chapter contrasts that way, unselfish and magnanimous, with the way of man, selfish and contracted, and illustrates the point by the method of stringing a bow. This must be seen as it is done in China fully to understand the illustration. I have known great athletes in this country tasked to the utmost of their strength to adjust and bend a large Chinese bow from Peking. The Sage of Par. For is the King of CH 25. Compare what is said of him with CH 2, Par. 4, et al. 78. 78. 1. There is nothing in the world more soft and weak than water, 
and yet for attacking things that are firm and strong there is nothing that can take precedence of it, for there is nothing, so effectual, for which it can be changed. 2. Everyone in the world knows that the soft overcomes the hard, and the weak the strong, but no one is able to carry it out in practice. 3. Therefore a sage has said. He who accepts his state's reproach. Is hailed therefore its altar's lord. To him who bears men's direful woes. They all the name of king accord. 4. Words that are strictly true seem to be paradoxical. Things to be believed. It is difficult to give a short and appropriate translation of this title. The chapter shows how the most unlikely results follow from action according to the Tao. Par. 1. Water was Lao Di's favorite emblem of the Tao. Compare chapters 8, 66, et al. Par. 2. Compare ch. 36, par. 2. Par. 3. Of course we do not know who the sage was from whom Lao Di's got the lines of this paragraph. They may suggest to some readers the lines of Burns, as they have done to me. The honest man, though e'er so poor, is king o oh, men for a that. But the Taoist of Laodes is a higher ideal than Burns's honest man. Par. For it is separated from this chapter, and made to begin the next by Wu Kang. 79. 79, 1. When a reconciliation is effected, between two parties, after a great animosity, there is sure to be a grudge remaining, in the mind of the one who was wrong. And how can this be beneficial, to the other? 2. Therefore, to guard against this, the sage keeps the left-hand portion of the record of the engagement, and does not insist on the, speedy, fulfillment of it by the other party. So, he who has the attributes, of the Tao, regards, only, the conditions of the engagement, while he who has not those attributes regards only the conditions favorable to himself. 3. In the way of heaven, there is no partiality of love. It is always on the side of the good man. Adherence to bond or covenant. The chapter shows, but by no means clearly, how he who holds fast to the Tao will be better off in the end than he who will rather try to secure his own interests. Par. One presents us with a case which the statements of the chapter are intended to meet, two disputants, one good, and the other bad. The latter, though apparently reconciled, still retaining a grudge, and ready to wreak his dissatisfaction, when he has an opportunity. The equals, for, for the good of. Par. 2 is intended to solve the question. The terms of a contract or agreement were inscribed on a slip of wood, which was then divided into two, each party having one half of it. At the settlement, if the halves perfectly fitted to each other, it was carried through. The one who had the right in the dispute has his part of the agreement, but does not insist on it, and is forbearing, the other insists on the conditions being even now altered in his favor. The characters by which this last case is expressed, are very enigmatical, having reference to the satisfaction of the government dues of Laudi's time a subject into which it would take much space to go. Par. 3 decides the question by the action of heaven, which is only another name for the course of the Tao. 80. 80, 1. In a little state with a small population, I would so order it, that, though there were individuals with the abilities of ten or a hundred men, there should be no employment of them. I would make the people, while looking on death as a grievous thing, yet not remove elsewhere, to avoid it. 2. Though they had boats and carriages, they should have no occasion to ride in them. Though they had buff coats and sharp weapons, they should have no occasion to don or use them. 3. I would make the people return to the use of knotted cords, instead of the written characters. 4. They should think their, coarse, food sweet. Their, plain, clothes beautiful, their, poor, dwellings places of rest, and their common, simple, ways sources of enjoyment. 5. There should be a neighboring state within sight, and the voices of the fowls and dogs should be heard all the way from it to us, but I would make the people to old age, even to death, not have any intercourse with it. Standing alone. 
The chapter sets forth what Lao Di's conceived the ancient government of simplicity was, and what he would have government in all time to be. He does not use the personal pronoun, I, as the subject of the thrice recurring, but it is most natural to suppose that he is himself that subject, and he modestly supposes himself in charge of a little state and a small population. The reader can judge for himself of the consummation that would be arrived at. A people rude and uninstructed, using quippos, abstaining from war and all traveling, kept aloof from intercourse even with their neighbors, and without the appliances of what we call civilization. The text is nearly all found in Zima Qin and Quang Di's. The first member of Par. One, however, is very puzzling. The old Jesuit translators, Julian, Chalmers, and V. Von Strauss, all differ in their views of it. Wu Kang and Zio Hung take what I have now rendered by abilities, as meaning implements of agriculture, but their view is based on a custom of the Han dynasty, which is not remote enough for the purpose, and on the suppression, after Wang Pai. Of a in Ho Shang Kung's text. 81. 81, 1. Sincere words are not fine, fine words are not sincere. Those who are skilled, in the Tao, do not dispute, about it, the disputatious are not skilled in it. Those who know, the Tao, are not extensively learned. The extensively learned do not know it. 2. The sage does not accumulate, for himself. The more that he expends for others, the more does he possess of his own, the more that he gives to others, the more does he have himself. 3. With all the sharpness of the way of heaven, it injures not, with all the doing in the way of the sage he does not strive. The Manifestation of Simplicity The chapter shows how quietly and effectively the Tao proceeds, and by contraries in a way that only the master of it can understand. The author, says Wu Kang, sums up in this the subject matter of the two parts of his treatise, showing that in all its five thousand characters, there is nothing beyond what is here said. Par. 2 suggests to drive. Chalmers the well-known lines of Bunyan as an analogue of it. A man there was, though some did count him mad. The more he gave away, the more he had. Wu Kang brings together two sentences from Quang Di's, 33, 21b, 22a, written evidently with the characters of this text in mind, which, as from a Taoist mint, are a still better analogue. And I venture to put them into rhyme. Amassing but to him a sense of need betrays. He hoards not, and thereby his affluence displays. I have paused long over the first pair of contraries in par. 3, and. Those two characters primarily mean sharpness and wounding by cutting. They are also often used in the sense of I being beneficial, and being injurious, contraries, both of them. Which, contrary, had Lao Di's in mind? I must think the former, though differing in this from all previous translators. The Jesuit version is, Celestis tau natura ditat omnes, nemini noset, Julian's, il est util aux etras, et any ler newt point, Chalmers's, benefits and does not injure, nv. Von Strauss's, Des Himmels Weiss ist Wolfen und nicht Bestigen. The Writings of Quang Dze, Introduction. Book 1. Xiao Yao Yu. The three characters which form the title of this book have all of them the ideogram, Ko, which gives the idea, as the Shuo one explains it, of, now walking, now halting. We might render the title by, sauntering or rambling at ease but it is the untroubled enjoyment of the mind which the author has in view. And this enjoyment is secured by the Tao, though that character does not once occur in the book. Quan Zi illustrates his thesis first by the cases of creatures, the largest and the smallest, showing that however different they may be in size, they should not pass judgment on one another, but may equally find their happiness in the Tao. From this he advances to men, and from the cases of young Dees and Li Dees proceeds to that of one who finds his enjoyment in himself, independent of every other being or instrumentality. And we have the three important definitions of the accomplished Taoist, as, the perfect man, the spirit-like man, and, the sagely man, those definitions are then illustrated. The third in Yao and Su Yu, 
and the second in the conversation between Qian Wu and Lin Xu. The description given in this conversation of the spirit-like man is very startling, and contains statements that are true only of him who is a spirit, the blessed and only potentate, who covereth himself with light as with a garment. Who stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who mocketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh on the wings of the wind, who rideth on a cherub, who inhabiteth eternity. The most imaginative and metaphorical expressions in the Tao take King about the power of the possessor of the Tao are tame, compared with the language of our author. I call attention to it here, as he often uses the same extravagant style. There follows an illustration of, the perfect man, which is comparatively feeble, and part of it, so far as I can see, inappropriate, though Lin Shikung says that all other interpretations of the sentences are ridiculous. In the seventh and last paragraph we have two illustrations that nothing is really useless, if only used taoistically, to the same effect, says Zio Hung, as Confucius in the Analects, 17, 2. They hang loosely, however, from what precedes. An old view of the book was that Quan Di's intended himself by the Great Fang, which, says Lu Xu Qi, is wide of the mark. Book 2. Kai Wu Luan. Mr. Balfour has translated this title by Essay on the Uniformity of All Things, and, the subject of the book being thus misconceived, his translation of it could not fail to be very incorrect. The Chinese critics, I may say without exception, construe the title as I have done. The second and third characters, Wu Luan, are taken together, and mean, discussions about things, equivalent to our, controversies. They are under the government of the first character Kai, used as a verb, with the signification of, harmonizing, or, adjusting. Let me illustrate this by condensing a passage from the, supplementary commentary of a Mr. Kong, a subsecretary of the Imperial Chancery, of the Ming Dynasty. He says, what Quan Di's calls, discussions about things, has reference to the various branches of the numerous schools, each of which has its own views, conflicting with the views of the others. He goes on to show that if they would only adopt the method pointed out by Quan Di's, their controversies would be adjusted, using the first Kai in the passive voice. This then was the theme of our author in this book. It must be left for the reader to discover from the translation how he pursues it. I pointed out a peculiarity in the former book, that though the idea of the Tao underlies it all, the term itself is never allowed to appear. Not only does the same idea underlie this book, but the name is frequently employed. The Tao is the panacea for the evils of controversy, the solvent through the use of which the different views of men may be made to disappear. That the Tao is not a personal name in the conception of Quang Di's is seen in several passages. We have not to go beyond the phenomena of nature to discover the reason of their being what they are. Nor have we to go beyond the bigoted egoism and vaingloriousness of controversialists to find the explanation of their discussions, various as these are, and confounding like the sounds of the wind among the trees of a forest. To man, neither in nature nor in the sphere of knowledge, is there any other heaven but what belongs to his own mind. That is his only true ruler. If there be any other, we do not see his form, nor any traces of his acting. Things come about in their proper course. We cannot advance any proof of creation. Whether we assume that there was something, in the beginning or nothing, we are equally landed in contradiction and absurdity. Let us stop at the limit of what we know, and not try to advance a step beyond it. Towards the end of the book our author's agnosticism seems to reach its farthest point. All human experience is spoken of as a dream or as illusion. He who calls another a dreamer does not know that he is not dreaming himself. One and another commentator discover in such utterances something very like the Buddhist doctrine that all life is but so much illusion. This notion has its consummation in the story with which the book concludes. Quang Di's had dreamt that he was a butterfly. When he awoke, and was himself again, he did not know whether he, Quang Kao, had been dreaming that he was a butterfly, or was now a butterfly dreaming that it was Quang Kao. And yet he adds that there must be a difference between Kao and a butterfly, but he does not say what that difference is. But had he ever dreamt that he was a butterfly, 
so as to lose the consciousness of his personal identity as Quang Cao? I do not think so. One may, perhaps, lose that consciousness in the state of insanity, but the language of Young is not sufficiently guarded when he writes of Dreams, where thought, in fancy's maze, runs mad. When dreaming, our thoughts are not conditioned by the categories of time and space, but the conviction of our identity is never lost. Book 3. Yang Shangku. The Lord of Life is the Tao. It is to this that we are indebted for the origin of life and for the preservation of it. Though not a personal being, it is here spoken of as if it were the Lord of Life. Just as in the preceding book it is made to appear as a true governor and a true ruler. But how can we nourish the Tao? The reply is, by avoiding all striving to do so. By a passionless, unstraining performance of what we have to do in our position in life, simply allowing the Tao to guide and nourish us, without doing anything to please ourselves or to counteract the tendency of our being to decay and death. Par. One exhibits the injury arising from not thus nourishing the life, and sets forth the rule we are to pursue. Par. 2 illustrates the observance of the rule by the perfect skill with which the cook of the ruler Wan Hui of Wei cut up the oxen for his employer without trouble to himself or injury to his knife. Par. 3 illustrates the result of a neglect of one of the cautions in Par. 1 to a certain master of the left, who had brought on himself dismemberment in the loss of one of his feet. Par. For shows how even Laodes had failed in nourishing the Lord of Life, by neglecting the other caution, and allowing in his good doing an admixture of human feeling, which produced in his disciples a regard for him that was inconsistent with the nature of the Tao, and made them wail for him excessively on his death. This is the most remarkable portion of the book, and it is followed by a sentence which implies that the existence of man's spirit continues after death has taken place. His body is intended by the faggots that are consumed by the fire. That fire represents the spirit which may be transferred elsewhere. Some commentators dwell on the analogy between this and the Buddhistic transrotation of births, which latter teaching, however, they do not seem to understand. Others say that, the nourishment of the Lord of Life, is simply acting as you did when he conveyed away the flooded waters, by doing that which gave him no trouble, see Mencius, for, 2.26. In Quan Di's there are various other stories of the same character as that about King Wan Hui's cook e.g. 19, 3 and xxa, 9. They are instances of the dexterity acquired by habit, and should hardly be pressed into the service of the doctrine of the Tao. Book 4. Zan Qian Shi. A man has his place among other men in the world, he is a member, while he lives, of the body of humanity. And as he has his place in society, so also he has his special duties to discharge, according to his position, and his relation to others. Taoist writers refer to this book as a proof of the practical character of the writings of Quang Di's. They are right to a certain extent in doing so, but the cases of relationship which are exhibited and prescribed for are of so peculiar a character, that the book is of little value as a directory of human conduct and duty. In the first two paragraphs we have the case of Yen Hui, who wishes to go to Wei, and try to reform the character and government of its oppressive ruler. In the third and fourth, that of the Duke of She, who has been entrusted by the King of Ku with a difficult mission to the court of Kai, which is occasioning him much anxiety and apprehension. And in the fifth, that of a Yen Ho, who is about to undertake the office of teacher to the son of Duke Ling of Wei, a young man with a very bad natural disposition. The other four paragraphs do not seem to come in naturally after these three cases, being occupied with two immense and wonderful trees, the case of a poor deformed cripple, and the lecture for the benefit of Confucius by, the madman of Ku. In all these last paragraphs, the theme is the usefulness, to the party himself at least, of being of no use. Confucius is the principal speaker in the first four paragraphs. In what he says to Yen Hui and the Duke of She there is much that is shrewd and good, but we prefer the practical style of his teachings, as related by his own disciples in the Confucian Analects. Possibly, it was the object of Quang Di's to exhibit his teaching, as containing, 
without his being aware of it, much of the mystical character of the Taoistic system. His conversation with the Duke of She, however, is less obnoxious to this charge than what he is made to say to Yen Hui. The advisor of Yen Ho is a Ku Piyu, a disciple of Confucius, who still has a place in the sages' temples. In the conclusion, the Taoism of our author comes out in contrast with the methods of Confucius. His object in the whole treatise, perhaps, was to show how the doing nothing, and yet thereby doing everything, was the method to be pursued in all the intercourses of society. Book 5. Take Kung Fu. The Fu, consisted in the earliest times of two slips of bamboo made with certain marks, so as to fit to each other exactly, and held by the two parties to any agreement or covenant. By the production and comparison of the slips, the parties verified their mutual relation, and the claim of the one and the obligation of the other were sufficiently established. Seal seems the best translation of the character in this title. By virtue, we must understand the characteristics of the Tao. Where those existed in their full proportions in any individual, there was sure to be the evidence or proof of them in the influence which he exerted in all his intercourse with other men. And the illustration of this is the subject of this book, in all its five paragraphs. That influence is the seal set on him, proving him to be a true child of the Tao. The heroes, as I may call them, of the first three paragraphs are all men who had lost their feet, having been reduced to that condition as a punishment, just or unjust, of certain offenses. And those of the last two are distinguished by their extraordinary ugliness or disgusting deformity. But neither the loss of their feet nor their deformities trouble the serenity of their own minds, or interfere with the effects of their teaching and character upon others, so superior is their virtue to the deficiencies in their outward appearance. Various brief descriptions of the Tao are interspersed in the book. The most remarkable of them are those in par. 1. Where it appears as, that in which there is no element of falsehood, and as, the author of all the changes or transformations in the world. The sentences where these occur are thus translated by Mr. Balfour, he seeks to know him in whom is nothing false. He would not be affected by the instability of creation, even if his life were involved in the general destruction, he would yet hold firmly to his faith, in God. Dot. And he observes in a note, that the first short sentence is explained by the commentators as referring to Kinzai, the term used by the Taoist school for God. But we met with that name and synonyms of it in Book 2, Par. 2, as appellations of the Tao, coupled with the denial of its personality. Kenzai, the true governor or lord, may be used as a designation for God or God, but the Taoist school denies the existence of a personal being, to whom we are accustomed to apply that name. Hui Dis, the sophist and friend of Kuang Dis, is introduced in the conclusion as disputing with him the propriety of his representing the master of the Tao as being still a man, and is beaten down by him with a repetition of his assertions, and a reference to some of Hui Dis' well-known peculiarities. What would Kuang Dis have said, if his opponent had affirmed that his instances were all imaginary, and that no man had ever appeared who could appeal to his possession of such a seal, to his virtues and influence as he described. Lu Fang Wang compares with the tenor of this book what we find in Mencius, 7, I, 21, about the nature of the superior man. The analogy between them, however, is very faint and incomplete. Book 6. Ta Zeng Shi. So I translate the title of this book, taking Zeng as a verb, and Zeng Shi as equals, the master who is honored. Some critics take Zeng in the sense of, originator, in which it is employed in the Tao Te King, 70, 2. Whichever rendering be adopted, there is no doubt that the title is intended to be a designation of the Tao, and no one of our author's books is more important for the understanding of his system of thought. The key to it is found in the first of its fifteen paragraphs. There are in man two elements, the heavenly or Taoistic, and the human. The disciple of the Tao, recognizing them both, cultivates what he knows as a man so as to become entirely conformed to the action of the Tao, and submissive in all the most painful experiences in his lot, which is entirely ordered by it. A seal will be set on the wisdom of this course hereafter, when he has completed the period of his existence on earth, 
and returns to the state of non-existence, from which the Tao called him to be born as a man. In the meantime he may attain to be the true man possessing the true knowledge. Our author then proceeds to give his readers in five paragraphs his idea of the true man Mr. Balfour says that this name is to be understood, in the esoteric sense, the partaking of the essence of divinity, and he translates it by, the divine man, but we have no right to introduce here the terms, divine, and divinity. Nanway, 7, 5b, gives a short definition of the name which is more to the point, what we call, the true man, is one whose nature is in agreement with the Tao, and the commentator adds in a note, such men as Fu Shi, Huang Ti, and Lao Tan. The Kangxi Dictionary commences its account of the character or true by a definition of the true man taken from the Shuo Wan as a, a recluse of the mountain, whose bodily form has been changed, and who ascends to heaven. But when that earliest dictionary was made, Taoism had entered into a new phase, different from what it had in the time of our author. The most prominent characteristic of the true man is that he is free from all exercise of thought and purpose, a being entirely passive in the hands of the Tao. In par. Three seven men are mentioned, good and worthy men, but inferior to the true. Having said what he had to say of the true man, Quan Dees comes in the seventh paragraph to speak directly of the Tao itself, and describes it with many wonderful predicates which exalt it above our idea of God, a concept and not a personality. He concludes by mentioning a number of ancient personages who had got the Tao, and by it wrought wonders, beginning with a Shi Wei, who preceded Fu Shi, and ending with Fu Yu, the minister of Wu Ting, in the 14th century BC, and who finally became a star in the eastern portion of the zodiac. Fang Zhu is also mentioned as living, through his possession of the Tao, from the 23rd century 13. C. to the 7th or later. The sun and moon and the constellation of the Great Bear are also mentioned as its possessors, and the fabulous being called the mother of the Western King. The whole passage is perplexing to the reader to the last degree. The remaining paragraphs are mostly occupied with instances of learning the Tao, and of its effects in making men superior to the infirmities of age and the most terrible deformities of person and calamities of penury. As tranquility under all that might seem most calculated to disturb it. Very strange is the attempt at the conclusion of Par. 8 apparently to trace the genesis of the knowledge of the Tao. Confucius is introduced repeatedly as the expounder of Taoism, and made to praise it as the any plus ultra of human attainment. Book 7. Ying T. Wang. The first of the three characters in this title renders the translation of it somewhat perplexing. Ying has different meanings according as it is read in the first tone or in the third. In the first tone it is the symbol of what is right, or should be, in the third tone of answering or responding to. One prefer to take it here in the first tone. As Kuo, Xiang says, one who is free from mind or purpose of his own, and loves men to become transformed of themselves, is fit to be a ruler or a king, and as Zhui Quan, another early commentator, says. He whose teaching is that which is without words, and makes men in the world act as if they were oxen or horses, is fit to be a ruler or a king. This then is the object of the book to describe the government which exhibits the Tao equally in the rulers and the ruled, the world of men all happy and good without purpose or effort. It consists of seven paragraphs. The first shows us the model ruler in him of the line of Tai, whom I have not succeeded in identifying. The second shows us men under such a rule, uncontrolled and safe like the bird that flies high beyond the reach of the archer, and the mouse secure in its deep hole from its pursuers. The teacher in this portion is Kiyu, known in the Confucian school as, the madman of Ku, and he delivers his lesson in opposition to the heresy of a Zakang Shi, or, noon beginning. In the third paragraph the speakers are, a nameless man, and a Tian Can, or, heaven root. In the fourth paragraph Lao Dis himself appears upon the stage, and lectures a Yang Dis Ku, the Yang Ku of Mencius. He concludes by saying that, where the intelligent kings took their stand could not be fathomed, and they found their enjoyment in, the realm of, nonentity. The fifth paragraph is longer, and tells us of the defeat of a wizard, a physiognomist in Kong, by Hu Dis, 
the master of the philosopher Lydes, who is thereby delivered from the glamour which the cheat was throwing round him. I confess to not being able to understand the various processes by which Houdis foils the wizard and makes him run away. The whole story is told, and at greater length, in the second book of the collection ascribed to Lydes, and the curious student may like to look at the translation of that work by Mr. Ernst Faber, Der Naturalismus bei den Alten Chinese in Sol nach der Seat de Pantheismus als de Sensualismus, oder die Sandlichen Werke de Philosophen Lysias, 1877. The effect of the wizard's defeat on Lydes was great. He returned in great humility to his house, and did not go out of it for three years. He did the cooking for his wife, and fed the pigs as if he were feeding men. He returned to pure simplicity, and therein continued to the end of his life. But I do not see the connection between this narrative and the government of the rulers and kings. The sixth paragraph is a homily by our author himself on non-action. It contains a good simile, comparing the mind of the perfect man to a mirror, which reflects faithfully what comes before it, but does not retain any image of it, when the mind is gone. The last paragraph is an ingenious and interesting allegory relating how the gods of the southern and northern seas brought chaos to an end by boring holes in him. Thereby they destroyed the primal simplicity, and according to Taoism did chaos an injury. On the whole I do not think that this book, with which the more finished essays of Quang Di's come to an end, is so successful as those that precede it. Book 8. Fien Mao. This book brings us to the second part of the writings of our author, embracing in all fifteen books. Of the most important difference between the books of the first and the other part some account has been given in the introductory chapter. We have here to do only with the different character of their titles, those of the seven preceding books are so many theses, and are believed to have been prefixed to them by Quang Di's himself. Those of this book and the others that follow are believed to have been prefixed by Kuo Xiang, and consist of two or three characters taken from the beginning, or near the beginning of the several books. After the fashion of the names of the books in the Confucian Analects, in the works of Mencius, and in our Hebrew Scriptures. Books 8 to 13 are considered to be supplementary to 7 by Ouyang Su. The title of this eighth book, Fien Mao, has been rendered by Mr. Balfour, after Dr. Williams, double thumbs. But the Mao, which may mean either the thumb or the great toe, must be taken in the latter sense, being distinguished in this paragraph and elsewhere from key, a finger, and expressly specified also as belonging to the foot. The character Fien, as used here, is defined in the Kangxi Dictionary as anything additional growing out as an appendage or excrescence, a growing out at the side. This would seem to justify the translation of it by, double. But in paragraph 3, while the extra finger increases the number of the fingers, this growth on the foot is represented as diminishing the number of the toes. I must consider the fien therefore as descriptive of an appendage by which the great toe was united to one or all of the other toes, and can think of no better rendering of the title than what I have given. It is told in the Zhou Quan, 23rd year of Duke Shi, that the famous Duke Wan of Xin had fien si, that is, that his ribs presented the appearance of forming one bone. So much for the title. The subject matter of the book seems strange to us, that, according to the Tao, benevolence and righteousness are not natural growths of humanity, but excrescences on it, like the extra finger on the hand, and the membranous web of the toes. The weakness of the Taoistic system begins to appear. Quang Di's arguments in support of his position must be pronounced very feeble. The ancient Shun is introduced as the first who called in the two great virtues to distort and vex the world, keeping society for more than a thousand years in a state of uneasy excitement. Of course he assumes that prior to Shun, he does not say for how long a time, and in other places he makes decay to have begun earlier, the world had been in a state of paradisiacal innocence and simplicity, under the guidance of the Tao. Untroubled by any consideration of what was right and what was wrong, men passively allowing their nature to have its quiet development, and happy in that condition. All culture of art or music is wrong, and so it is wrong and injurious to be striving to manifest benevolence and to maintain righteousness. He especially singles out two men, one of the 12th century B.C. The famous Pai, 
who died of hunger rather than acknowledge the dynasty of Cao, and one of a more recent age, the robber Shi, a great leader of brigands, who brought himself by his deeds to an untimely end. And he sees nothing to choose between them. We must give our judgment for the teaching of Confucianism in preference to that of Taoism, if our author can be regarded as a fair expositor of the latter. He is ingenious in his statements and illustrations, but he was, like his master Lao Di's, only a dreamer. Book 9 Ma Ti Horses and hoofs are the first two characters of the text, standing there in the relation of regent and regimen. The account of the teaching of the book given by Lin Shikang is so concise that I will avail myself of it. He says, Governing men is like governing horses. They may be governed in such a way as shall be injurious to them, just as Palau governed the horse, contrary to its true nature. His method was not different from that of the first, potter and carpenter in dealing with clay and wood, contrary to the nature of those substances. Notwithstanding this, one age after another has celebrated the skill of those parties. Not knowing what it is that constitutes the good and skillful government of men. Such government simply requires that men be made to fulfill their regular constant nature the qualities which they all possess in common, with which they are constituted by heaven, and then be left to themselves. It was this which constituted the age of perfect virtue, but when the sages insisted on the practice of benevolence, righteousness, ceremonies, and music, then the people began to be without that perfect virtue. Not that they were in themselves different from what they had been, but those practices do not really belong to their regular nature, they arose from their neglecting the characteristics of the Tao, and abandoning their natural constitution. It was the case of the skillful artisan cutting and hacking his raw materials in order to form vessels from them. There is no ground for doubting that Palau's management of horses gave them that knowledge with which they went on to play the part of thieves. Or that it was the sages' government of the people which made them devote themselves to the pursuit of gain. It is impossible to deny the error of those sages. There is but one idea in the book from the beginning to the end. It is an amplification of the expression in the preceding book that all men have their regular and constant constitution, and is the most easily construed of all Kuangdi's compositions. In consequence, however, of the wonderful touches of his pencil in describing the sympathy between men and other creatures in their primal state, some have imagined that there is a waste and embellishment of language. And doubted whether the book is really his own, but thought it was written by someone in imitation of his style. I apprehend that no other hand would easily have attained to such a mastery of that style. There is no possibility of adjudicating definitely on the suspicion of the genuineness of the book thus expressed in Shikung's concluding remarks. The same suspicion arose in my own mind in the process of translation. My surprise continues that our author did not perceive the absurdity of his notions of the primal state of men, and of his condemnation of the sages. Book 10 Ku Ki It is observed by the commentator Kui Kanquan that one idea runs through this book that the most sage and wise men have ministered to theft and robbery, and that, if there were an end of sageness and wisdom, the world would be at rest. Between it and the previous book there is a general agreement in argument and object, but in this the author expresses himself with greater vehemence, and almost goes to excess in his denunciation of the institutions of the sages. The reader will agree with these accounts of the book. Quang Di's at times becomes weak in his attempts to establish his points. To my mind the most interesting portions of this book and the last one are the full statements which we have in them of the happy state of men when the Tao maintained its undisputed sway in the world. And the names of many of the early Taoistic sovereigns. How can we suppose that anything would be gained by a return to the condition of primitive innocence and simplicity? The antagonism between Taoism and Confucianism comes out in this book very decidedly. The title of the book is taken from two characters in the first clause of the first paragraph. Book 11. Zayu. The two characters of the title are taken from the first sentence of the text, but they express the subject of the book more fully than the other titles in this part do, and almost entitle it to a place in part 1. It is not easy to translate them, and Mr. Balfour renders them by leniency towards faults, probably construing Zai as equivalent to our preposition in which it often is. 
but Quandis uses both Xi and Yu as verbs, or blends them together, the chief force of the binomial compound being derived from the significance of the Xi. Xi is defined by Zhuan, which gives the idea of preserving or keeping intact, and Yu by Quan, being indulgent or forbearing. The two characters are afterwards exchanged for other two, Wu Wei, doing nothing, in action, a grand characteristic of the Tao. The following summary of the book is taken from Su and Ying's explanations of our author, the two characters Zai Yu express the subject matter of the book. And, governing, points out the opposite error as the disease into which men are prone to fall. Let men be, and the tendencies of their nature will be at rest, and there will be no necessity for governing the world. Try to govern it, and the world will be full of trouble, and men will not be able to rest in the tendencies of their nature. These are the subjects of the first two paragraphs. In the third paragraph we have the erroneous view of Zhu Ku that by government it was possible to make men's minds good. He did not know that governing was a disturbing meddling with the minds of men, and how Lao Di set forth the evil of such government, going on till it be irretrievable. This long paragraph vigorously attacks the injury done by governing. In the fourth paragraph, when Huang Ti questions Kuang Kang Di's, the latter sets aside his inquiry about the government of the world, and tells him about the government of himself. And in the fifth, when Yun Kiang asks Hung Meng about governing men, the latter tells him about the nourishing of the heart. These two great paragraphs set forth clearly the subtlest points in the policy of Letter B. Truly it is not an empty name. In the two last paragraphs, Kuang in his own words and way sets forth, now by affirmation, and now by negation, the meaning of all that precedes. This summary of the book will assist the reader in understanding it. For other remarks that will be helpful, I must refer him to the notes appended to the text. The book is not easy to understand or to translate. And a remark found in the Kia Keying edition of The Ten Philosophers, by Lu Su Fu, who died in 1279, was welcome to me, if you cannot understand one or two sentences of Kuang Di's, it does not matter. Book 12. TNT. The first two characters of the book are adopted as its name, TNT, Heaven and Earth. These are employed, not so much as the two greatest material forms in the universe, but as the great powers whose influences extend to all below and upon them. Silently and effectively, with entire spontaneity, their influence goes forth, and a rule and pattern is thus given to those on whom the business of the government of the world devolves. The one character, heaven, is employed throughout the book as the denomination of this purposeless spontaneity which yet is so powerful. Lu Shuqi says, this book also sets forth clearly how the rulers of the world ought simply to act in accordance with the spontaneity of the virtue of heaven, abjuring sageness and putting away knowledge. And doing nothing, in this way the Tao or proper method of government will be attained to. As to the coercive methods of M.O.T. and Huidis, they only serve to distress those who follow them. This object of the book appears, more or less distinctly, in most of the illustrative paragraphs, though, as has been pointed out in the notes upon it, several of them must be considered to be spurious. Paragraphs 6, 7, and 11 are thus called in question, and, as most readers will feel, with reason. From 13 to the end, the paragraphs are held to be one long paragraph where Quan Dees introduces his own reflections in an unusual style. But the genuineness of the whole, so far as I have observed, has not been called in question. Book 13. Tian Tao. Tian Tao, the first two characters of the first paragraph, and prefixed to the book as the name of it, are best translated by, the way of heaven, meaning the noiseless spontaneity, which characterizes all the operations of nature. Proceeding silently, yet perfecting all things. As the rulers of the world attain to this same way in their government, and the sages among men attain to it in their teachings, both government and doctrine arrive at a corresponding perfection. The joy of heaven and the joy of men are both realized. There ought to be no purpose or will in the universe. Vacancy, stillness, placidity, tastelessness, quietude, silence, and non-action. This is the perfection of the Tao and its characteristics. 
Our author dwells especially on doing nothing or non-action as the subject matter of the book. But as the world is full of doing, he endeavors to make a distinction between the ruling powers and those subordinate to and employed by them, to whom doing or action and purpose, though still without the thought of self, are necessary. And by this distinction he seems to me to give up the peculiarity of his system, so that some of the critics, especially Ouyang Su, are obliged to confess that these portions of the book are unlike the writing of Kuangdi's. Still the antagonism of Taoism to Confucianism is very apparent throughout. Of the illustrative paragraphs, the seventh, relating the churlish behavior of Laodice to Confucius, and the way in which he subsequently argues with him and snubs him, is very amusing. The eighth paragraph, relating the interview between Lao and Shikang Kai, is very strange. The allusions in it to certain incidents and peculiarities in Lao's domestic life make us wish that we had fuller accounts of his history. And the way in which he rates his disciple shows him as a master of the language of abuse. The concluding paragraph about Du Quan of Kai is interesting, but I can only dimly perceive its bearing on the argument of the book. Book 14 Tian Yun The contrast between the movement of the heavens, and the resting of the earth, requires the translation of the characters of the title by, The Revolution of Heaven. But that idea does not enter largely into the subject matter of the book. The whole, says Suining, consists of eight paragraphs, the first three of which show that under the sky there is nothing which is not dominated by the Tao, with which the Tiz and the kings have only to act in accordance. While the last five set forth how the Tao is not to be found in the material forms and changes of things, but in a spirit-like energy working imperceptibly, developing and controlling all phenomena. I have endeavored in the notes on the former three paragraphs to make their meaning less obscure and unconnected than it is on a first perusal. The five illustrative paragraphs are, we may assume, all of them factitious, and can hardly be received as genuine productions of Kuangdi's. In the sixth paragraph, or at least a part of it, Lin Shikung acknowledges the hand of the forger, and not less unworthy of credence are in my opinion the rest of it and much of the other four paragraphs. If they may be taken as from the hand of our author himself, he was too much devoted to his own system to hold the balance of judgment evenly between Lao and Kung. Book 15. Ko I. I can think of no better translation for, the two first characters of the book, and which appear as its title, than our, ingrained ideas, notions, that is, held as firmly as if they were cut into the substance of the mind. They do not belong to the whole book, however, but only to the first member of the first paragraph. That paragraph describes six classes of men, only the last of which are the right followers of the Tao. The sages, from the Taoistic point of view, who again are in the last sentence of the last paragraph identified with the true men described at length in the sixth book. The fifth member of this first paragraph is interesting as showing how there was a class of Taoists who cultivated the system with a view to obtain longevity by their practices in the management of the breath. Yet our author does not accord to them his full approbation, while at the same time the higher Taoism appears in the last paragraph, as promoting longevity without the management of the breath. Ku Pasu, in his commentary on Kuangdi's, which was published in 1210, gives Pai and Shukai as instances of the first class spoken of here, Confucius and Mencius, of the second, Ayin and Fu Yu, of the third. Kao Fu and Su Yu, as instances of the fourth. Of the fifth class he gives no example, but that of Fang Zhu mentioned in it. That which distinguishes the genuine sage, the true man of Taoism, is his pure simplicity in pursuing the way, as it is seen in the operation of heaven and earth, and nourishing his spirit accordingly. Till there ensues an ethereal amalgamation between his way and the orderly operation of heaven. This subject is pursued to the end of the book. The most remarkable predicate of the spirit so trained is that in the third paragraph, that, its name is the same as T or God. On which none of the critics has been able to throw any satisfactory light. Balfour's version is, its name is called, One with God. Giles's, its name is then, of God, the, then, being in consequence of his view that the subject is, man's spiritual existence before he is born into the world of mortals. My own view of the meaning appears in my version. 
Lin Shikung, however, calls the genuineness of the whole book into question, and thinks it may have proceeded from the same hand as Book 13. They have certainly one peculiarity in common. Many references to sayings which cannot be traced, but are introduced by the formula of quotation, therefore, it is said. Book 16. Shan Xing. Rectifying or correcting the nature is the meaning of the title, and expresses sufficiently well the subject matter of the book. It was written to expose the vulgar learning of the time as contrary to the principles of the true Taoism, that learning being, according to Lu Shuqi, the teachings of Hui Dees and Kung Sun Lung. It is to be wished that we had fuller accounts of these. But see in Book XXXI. Many of the critics are fond of comparing the book with the 21st chapter of the 7th book of Mencius, Part 1, where that philosopher sets forth man's own nature as the most important thing to him, and the source of his true enjoyment. Which no one can read without admiration. But we have more sympathy with Mencius's fundamental views about our human nature, than with those of Kuang Di's and his Taoism. Lin Shikung is rather inclined to doubt the genuineness of the book. Though he admires its composition, and admits the close and compact sequence of its sentences, there is yet something about it that does not smack of Kuang Di's style. Rather there seems to me to underlie it the antagonism of Lao and Kuang to the learning of the Confucian school. The only characteristic of our author which I miss, is the illustrative stories of which he is generally so profuse. In this the book agrees with the preceding. Book 17. Kaiyu Shue. Kaiyu Shue, or Autumn Waters, the first two characters of the first paragraph of this book, are adopted as its title. Its subject, in that paragraph, however, is not so much the waters of autumn, as the greatness of the Tao in its spontaneity, when it has obtained complete dominion over man. No illustration of the Tao is so great a favorite with Laodice as water, but he loved to set it forth in its quiet, onward movement, always seeking the lowest place, and always exercising a beneficent influence. But water is here before Quang Di's in its mightiest volume, the inundated Ho and the all but boundless magnitude of the ocean, and as he takes occasion from those phenomena to deliver his lessons, I translate the title by, The Floods of Autumn. To adopt the account of the book given by Lu Shuqi, this book, he says, shows how its spontaneity is the greatest characteristic of the Tao. And the chief thing inculcated in it is that we must not allow the human element to extinguish in our constitution the heavenly. First, using the illustrations of the Ho and the Sea, our author gives us to see the five Tis and the kings of the three dynasties as only exhibiting the Tao, in a small degree. While its great development is not to be found in outward form and appliances so that it cannot be described in words, and it is difficult to find its point of commencement, which indeed appears to be impracticable. While still by doing nothing the human may be united with the heavenly, and men may bring back their true condition. By means of the conversations between the guardian spirit of the Ho and Zo, the God, of the sea this subject is exhaustively treated. Next, in paragraph 8, the quay, the millipede, and other subjects illustrate how the mind is spirit-like in its spontaneity and doing nothing. The case of Confucius, in par. 9, shows the same spontaneity, transforming violence. Kung Sun Lung, in par. 10, refusing to comply with that spontaneity, and seeking victory by his sophistical reasonings, shows his wisdom to be only like the folly of the frog in the well. The remaining three paragraphs bring before us Quang Di's by the spontaneity of his Tao, now superior to the allurements of rank, then, like the phoenix flying aloft, as enjoying himself in perfect ease. And finally, as like the fishes, in the happiness of his self-possession. Such is a brief outline of this interesting chapter. Many of the critics would expunge the ninth and tenth paragraphs as unworthy of Quang Di's, the former as misrepresenting Confucius, the latter as extolling himself. I think they may both be allowed to stand as from his pencil. Book 18. Qi Lo. The title of this book, Qi Lo, or Perfect Enjoyment, may also be received as describing the subject matter of it. But the author does not tell us distinctly what he means by perfect enjoyment. It seems to involve two elements, 
freedom from trouble and distress, and freedom from the fear of death. What men seek for as their chief good would only be to him burdens. He does not indeed altogether condemn them, but his own quest is the better and more excellent way. His own enjoyment is to be obtained by means of doing nothing, that is, by the Tao. Of which passionless and purposeless action is a chief characteristic, and is at the same time the most effective action, as is illustrated in the operation of heaven and earth. Such is the substance of the first paragraph. The second is interesting as showing how his principal controlled Quang Di's on the death of his wife. Paragraph 3 shows us two professors of Taoism delivered by it from the fear of their own death. Paragraph 4 brings our author before us talking to a skull, and then the skull's appearance to him in a dream and telling him of the happiness of the state after death. Paragraph 5 is occupied with Confucius and his favorite disciple Yen Hui. It stands by itself, unconnected with the rest of the book, and its genuineness is denied by some commentators. The last paragraph, found in an enlarged form in the books ascribed to Lides, has as little to do as the fifth with the general theme of the book, and is a strange anticipation in China of the transrotation or transformation system of Buddhism. Indeed, after reading this book, we cease to wonder that Taoism and Buddhism should in many practices come so near each other. Book 19. Tashan. I have been inclined to translate the title of this book by, The Fuller Understanding of Life, with reference to what is said in the second book on, The Nourishment of the Lord of Life. There the life before the mind of the writer is that of the body, here he extends his view also to the life of the spirit. The one subject is not kept, however, with sufficient distinctness apart from the other, and the profusion of illustrations, taken, most of them, from the works of Li Di's, is perplexing. To use the words of Lu Xu Kai, this book shows how he who would skillfully nourish his life, must maintain his spirit complete, and become one with heaven. These two ideas preside in it throughout. In par. 2. The words of the Warden Yin show that the spirit kept complete is beyond the reach of harm. In 3. The illustration of the hunchback shows how the will must be maintained free from all confusion. In 4, that of the ferryman shows that to the completeness of the spirit there is required the disregard of life or death. In 5 and 6, the words of Tian Kai Ki convey a warning against injuring the life by the indulgence of sensual desires. In 7, the sight of a sprite by Duke Huan unsettles his spirit. In 8, the gamecock is trained so as to preserve the spirit unagitated. In 9, we see the man in the water of the cataract resting calmly in his appointed lot. In 10, we have the maker of the bell stand completing his work as he did in accordance with the mind of heaven. All these instances show how the spirit is nourished. The reckless charioteering of Tung Yi in par. 11, not stopping when the strength of his horses was exhausted, and the false pretext of Sun Tzu, clear as at noonday, are instances of a different kind. While in the skillful Shue, hardly needing the application of his mind, and fully enjoying himself in all things, his movements testify of his harmony with heaven, and his spiritual completeness. Book 20. Shan Mu. It requires a little effort to perceive that Shan Mu, the title of this book, does not belong to it as a whole, but only to the first of its nine paragraphs. That speaks of a large tree which our author once saw on a mountain. The other paragraphs have nothing to do with mountain trees, large or small. As the last book might be considered to be supplementary to, The Nourishment of Life, discussed in Book 3, so this is taken as having the same relation to Book 4, which treats of, man in the world, associated with other men. It shows by its various narratives, some of which are full of interest, how by a strict observance of the principles and lessons of the Tao a man may preserve his life and be happy may do the right thing and enjoy himself and obtain the approbation of others in the various circumstances in which he may be placed. The themes both of books I and four blend together in it. Paragraph 8 has more the character of an apologue than most of Quang Di's stories. Book 21. Tian Di's Fang. Tian Di's Fang is merely the name of one of the men who appear in the first paragraph. That he was a historical character is learned from the Plans of the Warring States, 14, Art. 
6. Where we find him at the court of the Marquis I of Wei, B.C. 424-387, acting as counselor to that ruler. Tian was his surname, Dizfang his designation, and Wukai his name. He has nothing to do with any of the paragraphs but the first. It is not easy to reduce all the narratives or stories in the book to one category. The fifth, seventh, and eighth, indeed, are generally rejected as spurious or unworthy of our author. And the sixth and ninth are trivial, though the ninth bears all the marks of his graphic style. Paragraphs three and four are both long and important. A common idea in them and in one, two, and ten, seems to be that the presence and power of the Tao cannot be communicated by words, and are independent. Of Outward Condition and Circumstances Book 22 Qi Pei Yu With this book the second part of Quang Di's essays or treatises ends. All the books in it, says Lu Xu Qi, show the opposition of Taoism to the pursuit of knowledge as enjoined in the Confucian and other schools. And this book may be regarded as the deepest, most vehement, and clearest of them all. The concluding sentences of the last paragraph and Lao Di's advice to Confucius in par. 5. To sternly repress his knowledge, may be referred to as illustrating the correctness of Lu's remark. Book 17 is commonly considered to be the most eloquent of Quang Di's treatises, but this twenty-second book is not inferior to it in eloquence, and it is more characteristic of his method of argument. The way in which he runs riot in the names with which he personifies the attributes of the Tao, is a remarkable instance of the subtle manner in which he often brings out his ideas. And in no other book does he set forth more emphatically what his own idea of the Tao was, though the student often fails to be certain that he has exactly caught the meaning. The title, Let It Be Observed, belongs only to the first paragraph. The key in it must be taken in the sense of knowledge and not of wisdom. Book 23. Kong Sang Ku. It is not at all certain that there ever was such a personage as Kong Sang Ku, who gives its name to the book. In his brief memoir of Kuang Di's, Zima Qin spells, as we should say, the first character of the surname differently, and for the Kong, employs Kang, adding his own opinion. That there was nothing in reality corresponding to the account given of the characters in this and some other books. They would be therefore the inventions of Kuang Di's, devised by him to serve his purpose in setting forth the teaching of Lao Di's. It may have been so, but the value of the book would hardly be thereby affected. Lu Shuqi gives the following very brief account of the contents. Borrowing the language of Mencius concerning Yan Hui and two other disciples of Confucius as compared with the sage, he says, Kong Sang Ku had all the members of Lao Di's, but in small proportions. To outward appearance he was above such as abjure sagehood and put knowledge away, but still he was unable to transform Nan Yang Ku, whom therefore he sent to Lao Di's. And he announced to him the doctrine of the Tao that everything was done by doing nothing. The reader will see that this is a very incomplete summary of the contents of the book. We find in it the Taoistic ideal of the perfect man, and the discipline both of body and mind through the depths of the system by means of which it is possible for a disciple to become such. Book 24 Su Wu Kui. This book is named from the first three characters in it, the surname and name of Su Wu Kui, who plays the most important part in the first two paragraphs, and does not further appear. He comes before us as a well-known recluse of Wei, who visits the court to offer his counsels to the Marquis of the State. But whether there ever was such a man, or whether he was only a creation of Kuang Di's, we cannot, so far as I know, tell. Scattered throughout the book are the lessons so common with our author against sagehood and knowledge, and on the quality of doing nothing and thereby securing the doing of everything. The concluding chapter is one of the finest descriptions in the whole work of the Tao and of the Taoistic idea of heaven. There are in the book, says Lu Fang, many dark and mysterious expressions. It is not to be read hastily. But the more it is studied, the more flavor will there be found in it. Book 25. Zeyang. This book is named from the first two characters in it, Zeyang, which again are the designation of a gentleman of Lu, called Fang Yang, who comes before us in Ku, 
seeking for an introduction to the king of that state. With the view, we may suppose, of giving him good counsel. Whether he ever got the introduction which he desired we do not know. The mention of him only serves to bring in three other individuals, all belonging to Ku, and the characters of two of them, but we hear no more of Zeyang. The second and third paragraphs are, probably, sequels to the first, but his name does not appear. The paragraphs from four to nine have more or less interest in themselves, but it is not easy to trace in them any sequence of thought. The tenth and eleventh are more important. The former deals with the talk of the hamlets and villages, the common sentiments of men, which, correct and just in themselves, are not to be accepted as a sufficient expression of the Tao. The latter sets forth how the name Tao itself is only a metaphorical term, used for the purpose of description. As if the Tao were a thing, and not capable, therefore, from its material derivation of giving adequate expression to our highest notion of what it is. The book, says Lu Xu Qi, illustrates how the great Tao cannot be described by any name. That men ought to stop where they do not really know, and not try to find it in any phenomenon, or in any event or thing. They must forget both speech and silence, and then they may approximate to the idea of the great Tao. Book 26. Why Wu? The first two characters of the first paragraph are again adopted as the title of the book, Why Wu, External Things. And the lesson supposed to be taught in it is that expressed in the first sentence, that the influence of external things on character and condition cannot be determined beforehand. It may be good, it may be evil. Mr. Balfour has translated the two characters by external advantages. Who wanting interprets them of external disadvantages. The things may in fact be either of these. What seems useless may be productive of the greatest services. And what men deem most advantageous may turn out to be most hurtful to them. What really belongs to man is the Tao. That is his own, sufficient for his happiness, and cannot be taken from him, if he prize it and cultivate it. But if he neglect it, and yield to external influences unfavorable to it, he may become bad, and suffer all that is most hateful to him and injurious. Readers must judge for themselves of the way in which the subject is illustrated in the various paragraphs. Some of the stories are pertinent enough, others are wide of the mark. The second, third, and fourth paragraphs are generally held to be spurious, poor in composition, and not at all to the point. If my note on the six faculties of perception, in par. 9 be correct, we must admit in it a Buddhistic hand, modifying the conceptions of Quang Di's after he had passed away. Book 27. Yu Yen. Yu Yen, metaphorical words, stand at the commencement of the book, and have been adopted as its name. They might be employed to denote its first paragraph, but are not applicable to the book as a whole. Nor let the reader expect to find even here any disquisition on the nature of the metaphor as a figure of speech. Translated literally, Yu Yen are lodged words, that is, ideas that receive their meaning or character from their environment, the narrative or description in which they are deposited. Quan Di's wished, I suppose, to give some description of the style in which he himself wrote, now metaphorical, now abounding in quotations, and throughout molded by his Taoistic views. This last seems to be the meaning of his Qi Yen, literally, cup, or goblet, words, that is, words, common as the water constantly supplied in the cup, but all molded by the Taoist principle. The element of and from heaven blended in man's constitution and that should direct and guide his conduct. The best help in the interpretation of the paragraph is derived from a study of the difficult second book, as suggested in the notes. Of the five paragraphs that follow the first, the second relates to the change of views, which, it is said, took place in Confucius, the third, to the change of feeling in Zhang Di's in his poverty and prosperity. The fourth, to changes of character produced in his disciple by the teachings of Tung Kuo Di's Kai, the fifth, to the changes in the appearance of the shadow produced by the ever-changing substance. And the sixth, to the change of spirit and manner produced in Yang Ku by the stern lesson of Lao Di's. Various other lessons, more or less appropriate and important, are interspersed. 
Some critics argue that this book must have originally been one with the 32nd, which was made into two by the insertion between its parts of the four spurious intervening books, but this is uncertain and unlikely. Book 28. Zhang Wang. Zhang Wang, explaining the characters as I have done, fairly indicates the subject matter of the book. Not that we have a king in every illustration, but the personages adduced are always men of worth, who decline the throne, or gift, or distinction of whatever nature, proffered to them, and feel that they have something better to live for. A persuasion, however, is widely spread, that this book and the three that follow are all spurious. The first critic of note to challenge their genuineness was Su Shi, better known as Su Tung Fo, d. 1046-1101. And now, some of the best editors, such as Lin Shikang, do not admit them into their texts, while others who are not bold enough to exclude them altogether, do not think it worth their while to discuss them seriously. Hu Wan Ing, for instance, says, their style is poor and mean, and they are, without doubt, forgeries. I will not therefore trouble myself with comments of praise or blame upon them. The reader may accept or reject them at his pleasure. But something may be said for them. Zima Keen seems to have been acquainted with them all. In his short biographical notice of Kuang Di's, he says, he made the old fisherman, the robber key, and the cutting open satchels, to defame and calumniate the disciples of Confucius. Keen does not indeed mention our present book along with Triple X and XXXI, but it is less open to objection on the ground he mentions than they are. I think if it had stood alone, it would not have been condemned. Book 29. Tao Qi. It has been seen above that Zima Keen expressly ascribes the book called The Robber Qi to Quang Di's. Keen refers also in another place to Qi, adducing the facts of his history in contrast with those about Confucius' favorite disciple Yan Hui as inexplicable on the supposition of a just and wise providence. We must conclude therefore that the book existed in Keen's time, and that he had read it. On the other hand it has been shown that Confucius could not have been on terms of friendship with Lu Siaki, and all that is related of his brother the robber wants substantiation. That such a man ever existed appears to me very doubtful. Are we to put down the whole of the first paragraph then as a jeu d'esprit on the part of Quang Di's, intended to throw ridicule on Confucius and what our author considered his pedantic ways? It certainly does so, and we are amused to hear the sage outcrowed by the robber. In the other two paragraphs we have good instances of Quang Di's metaphorical expressions, his coinage of names for his personages, more or less ingeniously indicating their characters. But in such cases the element of time or chronology does not enter, and it is the anachronism of the first paragraph which constitutes its chief difficulty. The name of Robert Key may be said to be a coinage. And that a famous robber was popularly indicated by the name appears from its use by Mencius, 3, 2, ch. 10, 3, to explain which the commentators have invented the story of a robber so-called in the time of Huang Ti, in the 27th century B.C. Was there really such a legend? And did Quang Di's take advantage of it to apply the name to a notorious and disreputable brother of Lu Siaki? Still there remain the anachronisms in the paragraph which have been pointed out. On the whole we must come to a conclusion rather unfavorable to the genuineness of the book. But it must have been forged at a very early time, and we have no idea by whom. Book 30 Yu Qian. We need not suppose that anything ever occurred in Quang Di's experience such as is described here. The whole narrative is metaphorical. And that he himself is made to play the part in it which he describes, only shows how the style of writing in which he indulged was ingrained into the texture of his mind. We do not know that there ever was a ruler of Cao who indulged in the love of the sword fight, and kept about him a crowd of vulgar bravos such as the story describes. We may be assured that our author never wore the bravo's dress or girt on him the bravo's sword. The whole is a metaphorical representation of the way in which a besotted ruler might be brought to a feeling of his degradation, and recalled to a sense of his duty and the way in which he might fulfill it. The narrative is full of interest and force. I do not feel any great difficulty in accepting it as the genuine composition of Quang Di's. 
who but himself could have composed it? Was it a good-humored caricature of him by an able Confucian writer to repay him for the ridicule he was fond of casting on the sage? Book 31 Yu Fu The Old Fisherman is the fourth of the books in the collection of the writings of Quang Di's to which, since the time of Su Shi, the epithet of Spurious has been attached by many. My own opinion, however, has been already intimated that the suspicions of the genuineness of those books have been entertained on insufficient grounds. And so far as, the old fisherman, is concerned, I am glad that it has come down to us, spurious or genuine. There may be a certain coarseness in, the robber key, which makes us despise Confucius or laugh at him. But the satire in this book is delicate, and we do not like the sage the less when he walks up the bank from the stream where he has been lectured by the fisherman. The pictures of him and his disciples in the forest, reading and singing on the apricot terrace, and of the old man slowly impelling his skiff to the land and then as quietly impelling it away till it is lost among the reeds, are delicious. There is nothing finer of its kind in the volume. What hand but that of Quang Di's, so light in its touch and yet so strong, both incisive and decisive, could have delineated them? Book 32 Li Yu Kao Li Yu Kao, the surname and name of Li Di's, with which the first paragraph commences, have become current as the name of the book, though they have nothing to do with any but that one paragraph. Which is found also in the second book of the writings ascribed to Li Di's. There are some variations in the two texts, but they are so slight that we cannot look on them as proofs that the two passages are narratives of independent origin. Various difficulties surround the questions of the existence of Li Di's, and of the work which bears his name. They will be found distinctly and dispassionately stated and discussed in the 146th chapter of the catalogue of the Qinlong Imperial Library. The writers seem to me to make it out that there was such a man, but they do not make it clear when he lived, or how his writings assumed their present form. There is a statement of Lu Xiang that he lived in the time of Duke Ma of Kong, B.C. 627-606, but in that case he must have been earlier than Laodice himself, whom he very frequently quotes. The writers think that Lif's Mu of Kong should be Mu of Lu, B.C. 409-377, which would make him not much anterior to Mencius and Quangdis. But this is merely an ingenious conjecture. As to the composition of his chapters, they are evidently not at first hand from Li, but by some one of his disciples. Whether they were current in Quang Di's days, and be made use of various passages from them, or those passages were Quang Di's originally, and taken from him by the followers of Li Di's and added to what fragments they had of their master's teaching. These are points which must be left undetermined. Whether the narrative about Li Bi from Quang Di's or not, its bearing on his character is not readily apprehended. But, as we study it, we seem to understand that his master Wu Zan condemned him as not having fully attained to the Tao, but owing his influence with others mainly to the manifestation of his merely human qualities. And this is the lesson which our author keeps before him, more or less distinctly, in all his paragraphs. As Lu Shuqi says, This book also sets forth doing nothing as the essential condition of the Tao. Li Di's, frightened at the respect shown to him by the soup vendors, and yet by his human doings drawing men to him, disowns the rule of the heavenly. Huan of Kong, thinking himself different from other men, does not know that heaven recompenses men according to their employment of the heavenly in them. The resting of the sages in their proper rest shows how the ancients pursued the heavenly and not the human. The one who learned to slay the dragon, but afterwards did not exercise his skill, begins with the human, but afterwards goes on to the heavenly. In those who do not rest in the heavenly, and perish by the inward war, we see how the small men do not know the secret of the great repose, Zhao Shang, glorying in the carriages which he had acquired, is still farther removed from the heavenly. When Yan Ho shows that the sage, in imparting his instructions, did not follow the example of heaven in diffusing its benefits, we learn that it is only the doing nothing of the true man which is in agreement with heaven. The difficulty of knowing the mind of man, and the various methods required to test it, show the readiness with which, when not under the rule of heaven, it seems to go after what is right. 
and the greater readiness with which it again revolts from it. In Kaofu, the correct, we have one indifferent to the distinctions of rank, and from him we advance to the man who understands the great condition appointed for him, and is a follower of heaven. Then comes he who plays the thief under the chin of the black dragon, running the greatest risks on a mere peradventure of success, a resolute opponent of heaven. And finally we have Quan Di's despising the ornaments of the sacrificial ox, looking in the same way at the worms beneath and the kites overhead, and regarding himself as quite independent of them. Thus giving us an example of the embodiment of the spiritual, and of harmony with heaven. So does this ingenious commentator endeavor to exhibit the one idea in the book, and show the unity of its different paragraphs. Book 33. Tian Xia. The Tian Xia with which this book commences is in regimen, and cannot be translated, so as to give an adequate idea of the scope of the book, or even of the first paragraph to which it belongs. The phrase itself means literally, under heaven or the sky, and is used as a denomination of, the kingdom, and, even more widely, of the world, or, all men. Historical phases of Taoist teaching would be nearly descriptive of the subject matter of the book. But may be objected to on two grounds, first, that a chronological method is not observed, and next, that the concluding paragraph can hardly be said to relate to Taoism at all, but to the sophistical teachers. Which abounded in the age of Quang Di's. Par. One sketches with a light hand the nature of Taoism and the forms which it assumed from the earliest times to the era of Confucius, as imperfectly represented by him and his school. Par. 2 introduces us to the system of M.O.T. in his school as an erroneous form of Taoism, and departing, as it continued, farther and farther from the old model. Par. 3 deals with a modification of Moism, advocated by scholars who are hardly heard of elsewhere. Par. For treats of a further modification of this modified Moism, held by scholars whose Tao was not the true Tao, and whose right was really wrong. Par. 5 goes back to the era of Laodice, and mentions him and Quan Yin, as the men who gave to the system of Tao a grand development. Par. 6 sets forth Quan Di's as following in their steps and going beyond them, the brightest luminary of the system. Par. 7 leaves Taoism, and brings up Hui Shi and other sophists. Whether the book should be received as from Quan Di's himself or from some early editor of his writings is, a vexed question. If it did come from his pencil, he certainly had a good opinion of himself. It is hard for a foreign student at this distant time to be called on for an opinion on the one side or the other. The Writings of Quang Di Zi. Book 1. Part 1. Section 1. Xiao Yao Yu, or, Enjoyment in Untroubled Ease. 1. In the Northern Ocean there is a fish, the name of which is Quan Four Zero, I do not know how many li in size. It changes into a bird with the name of Fing, the back of which is, also, I do not know how many li in extent. When this bird rouses itself and flies, its wings are like clouds all round the sky. When the sea is moved, so as to bear it along, it prepares to remove to the southern ocean. The southern ocean is the pool of heaven. There is the, book called, Kai C41, a record of marvels. We have in it these words, when the fang is removing to the southern ocean it flaps, its wings, on the water for three thousand li. Then it ascends on a whirlwind ninety thousand li, and it rests only at the end of six months. But similar to this is the movement of the breezes which we call, the horses of the fields, of the dust, which quivers in the sunbeams, and of living things as they are blown against one another by the air forty-two. Is its azure the proper color of the sky? Or is it occasioned by its distance and illimitable extent? If one were looking down, from above, the very same appearance would just meet his view. 2. And moreover, to speak of, the accumulation of water, if it be not great, it will not have strength to support a large boat. Upset a cup of water in a cavity, and a straw will float on it as if it were a boat. Place a cup in it, and it will stick fast, the water is shallow and the boat is large. So it is with, the accumulation of wind, if it be not great, 
it will not have strength to support great wings. Therefore, the fang ascended to, the height of ninety thousand li, and there was such a mass of wind beneath it, thenceforth the accumulation of wind was sufficient. As it seemed to bear the blue sky on its back, and there was nothing to obstruct or arrest its course, it could pursue its way to the south. A cicada and a little dove laughed at it, saying, We make an effort and fly towards an elm or saponwood tree, and sometimes before we reach it, we can do no more but drop to the ground. Of what use is it for this, creature, to rise ninety thousand li, and make for the south? He who goes to the grassy suburbs forty-three, returning to the third meal, of the day, will have his belly as full as when he set out. He who goes to a distance of one hundred li will have to pound his grain where he stops for the night, he who goes a thousand li, will have to carry with him provisions for three months. What should these two small creatures know about the matter? The knowledge of that which is small does not reach to that which is great, the experience of, a few years does not reach to that of many. How do we know that it is so? The mushroom of a morning does not know, what takes place between, the beginning and end of a month, the short-lived cicada does not know, what takes place between, the spring and autumn. These are instances of a short term of life. In the south of Ku 44, there is the tree, called Ming Ling 45, whose spring is 500 years, and its autumn the same, in high antiquity there was that called Takun 46, whose spring was 8,000 years, and its autumn the same. And Fang Zhu 47 is the one man renowned to the present day for his length of life if all men were, to wish, to match him, would they not be miserable? 3. In the questions put by Tang 48 to Ki we have similar statements, in the bare and barren north there is the dark and vast ocean, the pool of heaven. In it there is a fish, several thousand li in breadth, while no one knows its length. Its name is the Quan. There is, also, a bird named the Fang, its back is like the Tai mountain, while its wings are like clouds all round the sky. On a whirlwind it mounts upwards as on the whirls of a goat's horn for ninety thousand li, till, far removed from the cloudy vapors, it bears on its back the blue sky, and then it shapes its course for the south, and proceeds to the ocean there. A quail by the side of a marsh laughed at it, and said, Where is it going to? I spring up with a bound, and come down again when I have reached but a few fathoms, and then fly about among the brushwood and bushes. And this is the perfection of flying. Where is that creature going to? This shows the difference between the small and the great. Thus it is that men, whose wisdom is sufficient for the duties of some one office, or whose conduct will secure harmony in some one district, or whose virtue is befitting a ruler so that they could efficiently govern some one state, are sure to look on themselves in this manner, like the quail, and yet young, D's 49 of Sung 50 would have smiled and laughed at them. This young D's, though the whole world should have praised him, would not for that have stimulated himself to greater endeavor, and though the whole world should have condemned him, would not have exercised any more repression of his course. So fixed was he in the difference between the internal, judgment of himself, and the external, judgment of others, so distinctly had he marked out the bounding limit of glory and disgrace. Here, however, he stopped. His place in the world indeed had become indifferent to him, but still he had not planted himself firmly, in the right position. There was Lee, D's 51, who rode on the wind and pursued his way, with an admirable indifference, to all external things, returning, however, after fifteen days, to his place. In regard to the things that, are supposed to, contribute to happiness, he was free from all endeavors to obtain them, but though he had not to walk, there was still something for which he had to wait. But suppose one who mounts on, the ether of, heaven and earth in its normal operation, and drives along the six elemental energies of the changing, seasons, thus enjoying himself in the illimitable, what has he to wait for? Therefore it is said, the perfect man has no, thought of, self, the spirit-like man, none of merit, the sagely-minded man, none of fame 52. 4. Yao 53, proposing to resign the throne to Su Yu 54, said, when the sun and moon have come forth, if the torches have not been put out, would it not be difficult for them to give light? When the seasonal rains are coming down, if we still keep watering the ground, 
will not our toil be labor lost for all the good it will do? Do you, Master, stand forth, as sovereign, and the kingdom will, at once, be well governed? If I still, continue to, preside over it, I must look on myself as vainly occupying the place, I beg to resign the throne to you. So you said, you, sir, govern the kingdom, and the kingdom is well governed. If I in these circumstances take your place, shall I not be doing so for the sake of the name? But the name is but the guest of the reality, shall I be playing the part of the guest? The tailor bird makes its nest in the deep forest, but only uses a single branch, the mole fifty-five drinks from the hoe, but only takes what fills its belly. Return and rest in being ruler I will have nothing to do with the throne. Though the cook were not attending to his kitchen, the representative of the dead and the officer of prayer would not leave their cups and stands to take his place. 5. Qian Wu 56 asked Lin Xu 57, saying, I heard Qiu 58 talking words which were great, but had nothing corresponding to them, in reality, once gone, they could not be brought back. I was frightened by them. They were like the Milky Way 59 which cannot be traced to its beginning or end. They had no connection with one another, and were not akin to the experiences of men. What were his words? Ask Lean Shift, and the other replied, he said, that, far away on the hill of Kushi 60 there dwelt a spirit-like man whose flesh and skin were, smooth, as ice and, white, as snow, that his manner was elegant and delicate as that of a virgin. That he did not eat any of the five grains, but inhaled the wind and drank the dew, that he mounted on the clouds, drove along the flying dragons, rambling and enjoying himself beyond the four seas. That by the concentration of his spirit-like powers he could save men from disease and pestilence, and secure every year a plentiful harvest. These words appeared to me wild and incoherent and I did not believe them. So it is, said Lin Xu. The blind have no perception of the beauty of elegant figures, nor the deaf of the sound of bells and drums. But is it only the bodily senses of which deafness and blindness can be predicated? There is also a similar defect in the intelligence. And of this your words supply an illustration in yourself. That man, with those attributes, though all things were one mass of confusion, and he heard in that condition the whole world crying out to him to be rectified, would not have to address himself laboriously to the task. As if it were his business to rectify the world. Nothing could hurt that man, the greatest floods, reaching to the sky, could not drown him, nor would he feel the fervor of the greatest heats melting metals and stones till they flowed, and scorching all the ground and hills. From the dust and chaff of himself, he could still mold and fashion yaws and shun sixty-one, how should he be willing to occupy himself with things sixty-two? 6. A man of Sung, who dealt in the ceremonial caps, of Een, 63, went with them to U 64, the people of which cut off their hair and tattooed their bodies, so that they had no use for them. Yao ruled the people of the kingdom, and maintained a perfect government within the four seas. Having gone to see the four, perfect, 165 on the distant hill of Kushi, when, he returned to his capital, on the south of the Fan Water 66, his throne appeared no more to his deep-sunk oblivious eyes 67. 7. Hui D68 told Kuang Di's, saying, The king of Wei 69 sent me some seeds of a large calabash, which I sowed. The fruit, when fully grown, could contain five pickles, of anything. I used it to contain water, but it was so heavy that I could not lift it by myself. I cut it in two to make the parts into drinking vessels, but the dried shells were too wide and unstable and would not hold, the liquor. Nothing but large useless things. Because of their uselessness I knocked them to pieces. Kuang Di's replied, You were indeed stupid, my master, in the use of what was large. There was a man of Sung who was skillful at making a salve which kept the hands from getting chapped, and, his family, for generations had made the bleaching of cocoon silk their business. A stranger heard of it, and proposed to buy the art of the preparation for a hundred ounces of silver. The kindred all came together, and considered the proposal. We have, said they, been bleaching cocoon silk for generations, and have only gained a little money. 
Now in one morning we can sell to this man our art for a hundred ounces, let him have it. The stranger accordingly got it and went away with it to give counsel to the king of Wu Seven Zero, who was then engaged in hostilities with you. The king gave him the command of his fleet, and in the winter he had an engagement with that of you, on which he inflicted a great defeat seventy-one, and was invested with a portion of territory taken from you. The keeping the hands from getting chapped was the same in both cases, but in the one case it led to the investiture, of the possessor of the salve, and in the other it had only enabled its owners to continue their bleaching. The difference of result was owing to the different use made of the art. Now you, sir, had calabashes large enough to hold five pickles. Why did you not think of making large bottle gourds of them, by means of which you could have floated over rivers and lakes, instead of giving yourself the sorrow of finding that they were useless for holding anything? Your mind, my master, would seem to have been closed against all intelligence. Hui Di said to Quang Di, I have a large tree, which men call the Atlantis 72. Its trunk swells out to a large size, but is not fit for a carpenter to apply his line to it, its smaller branches are knotted and crooked, so that the disc and square cannot be used on them. Though planted on the wayside, a builder would not turn his head to look at it. Now your words, sir, are great, but of no use, all unite in putting them away from them. Quang Di's replied, Have you never seen a wild cat or a weasel? There it lies, crouching and low, till the wanderer approaches, east and west it leaps about, avoiding neither what is high nor what is low, till it is caught in a trap, or dies in a net. Again there is the Yak 73, so large that it is like a cloud hanging in the sky. It is large indeed, but it cannot catch mice. You, sir, have a large tree and are troubled because it is of no use. Why do you not plant it in a tract where there is nothing else, or in a wide and barren wild? There you might saunter idly by its side, or in the enjoyment of untroubled case sleep beneath it. Neither bill nor axe would shorten its existence. There would be nothing to injure it. What is there in its uselessness to cause you distress? Book 2 Part 1 Section 2 Kai Wu Luan, or, The Adjustment of Controversies 1. Nanquo Zikai 74 was seated, leaning forward on his stool. He was looking up to heaven and breathed gently, seeming to be in a trance, and to have lost all consciousness of any companion. His disciple, Yen Kang Dizu 75, who was in attendance and standing before him, said, What is this? Can the body be made to become thus like a withered tree, and the mind to become like slaked lime? His appearance as he leans forward on the stool today is such as I never saw him have before in the same position. Dees Kai said, Yen, you do well to ask such a question, I had just now lost myself seventy-six, but how should you understand it? You may have heard the notes seventy-seven of man, but have not heard those of earth. You may have heard the notes of earth, but have not heard those of heaven. Dees you said, I venture to ask from you a description of all these. The reply was, when the breath of the great mass, of nature, comes strongly, it is called wind. Sometimes it does not come so, but when it does, then from a myriad apertures there issues its excited noise, have you not heard it in a prolonged gale? Take the projecting bluff of a mountain forest. In the great trees, a hundred spans round, the apertures and cavities are like the nostrils, or the mouth, or the ears, now square, now round like a cup or a mortar, here like a wet footprint, and there like a large puddle. The sounds issuing from them are like, those of fretted water, of the arrowy whiz, of the stern command, of the inhaling of the breath, of the shout, of the gruff note, of the deep wail, of the sad and piping note. The first notes are slight, and those that follow deeper, but in harmony with them. Gentle winds produce a small response, violent winds a great one. When the fierce gusts have passed away, all the apertures are empty, and still. Have you not seen this in the bending and quivering of the branches and leaves? These you said, the notes of earth then are simply those which come from its myriad apertures. And the notes of man may just be compared to those which, are brought from the tubes of, bamboo, allow me to ask about the notes of heaven 78. These Kai replied, when, the wind, blows, the sounds from, 
the myriad apertures are different, and, its cessation, makes them stop of themselves. Both of these things arise from, the wind and the apertures, themselves, should there be any other agency that excites them. 2. Great knowledge is wide and comprehensive, small knowledge is partial and restricted. Great speech is exact and complete, small speech is, merely, so much talk 79. When we sleep, the soul communicates with, what is external to us, when we awake, the body is set free. Our intercourse with others then leads to various activity, and daily there is the striving of mind with mind. There are hesitancies, deep difficulties, reservations. Small apprehensions causing restless distress, and great apprehensions producing endless fears. Where their utterances are like arrows from a bow, we have those who feel it their charge to pronounce what is right and what is wrong. Where they are given out like the conditions of a covenant, we have those who maintain their views, determined to overcome. The weakness of their arguments, like the decay, of things, in autumn and winter, shows the failing, of the minds of some, from day to day, or it is like their water which, once voided, cannot be gathered up again. Then their ideas seem as if fast bound with cords, showing that the mind is become like an old and dry moat, and that it is nigh to death, and cannot be restored to vigor and brightness. Joy and anger, sadness and pleasure, anticipation and regret, fickleness and fixedness, vehemence and indolence, eagerness and tardiness. All these moods, like music from an empty tube, or mushrooms from the warm moisture, day and night succeed to one another and come before us, and we do not know whence they sprout. Let us stop. Let us stop. Can we expect to find out suddenly how they are produced? If there were not, the views of, another, I should not have mine. If there were not I, with my views, his would be uncalled for, this is nearly a true, statement of the case, but we do not know what it is that makes it be so. It might seem as if there would be a true Governor Eighty concerned in it, but we do not find any trace, of his presence and acting. That such an one could act so I believe, but we do not see his form. He has affections, but he has no form. Given the body, with its hundred parts, its nine openings, and its six viscera, all complete in their places, which do I love the most? Do you love them all equally? Or do you love some more than others? Is it not the case that they all perform the part of your servants and waiting women? All of them being such, are they not incompetent to rule one another? Or do they take it in turns to be now ruler and now servants? There must be a true ruler, among them, eighty-one whether by searching you can find out his character or not, there is neither advantage nor hurt, so far as the truth of his operation is concerned. When once we have received the bodily form complete, its parts do not fail to perform their functions till the end comes. In conflict with things or in harmony with them, they pursue their course to the end, with the speed of a galloping horse which cannot be stopped, is it not sad? To be constantly toiling all one's lifetime, without seeing the fruit of one's labor, and to be weary and worn out with his labor, without knowing where he is going to, is it not a deplorable case? Men may say, but it is not death. Yet of what advantage is this? When the body is decomposed, the mind will be the same along with it, must not the case be pronounced very deplorable 82? Is the life of man indeed enveloped in such darkness? Is it I alone to whom it appears so? And does it not appear to be so to other men? 3. If we were to follow the judgments of the predetermined mind, who would be left alone and without a teacher 83? Not only would it be so with those who know the sequences, of knowledge and feeling, and make their own selection among them, but it would be so as well with the stupid and unthinking. For one who has not this determined mind, to have his affirmations and negations is like the case described in the saying, he went to you today, and arrived at it yesterday 84. It would be making what was not a fact to be a fact. But even the spirit like you 85 could not have known how to do this, and how should one like me be able to do it? But speech is not like the blowing, of the wind, the speaker has, a meaning in, his words. If, however, what he says, be indeterminate, as from a mind not made up, does he then really speak or not? He thinks that his words are different from the chirpings of fledglings, but is there any distinction between them or not? 
But how can the Tao be so obscured, that there should be a true and a false in it? How can speech be so obscured that there should be the right and the wrong about them? Where shall the Tao go to that it will not be found? Where shall speech be found that it will be inappropriate? Tao becomes obscured through the small comprehension of the mind, and speech comes to be obscure through the vaingloriousness of the speaker. So it is that we have the contentions between the Literati 86 and the Mahists 87, the one side affirming what the other denies, and vice versa. If we would decide on their several affirmations and denials, no plan is like bringing the proper light of the mind 88 to bear on them. All subjects may be looked at from two points of view, comma, from that and from this. If I look at a thing from another's point of view, I do not see it, only as I know it myself, do I know it. Hence it is said, that view comes from this. And this view is a consequence of that, which is the theory that that view and this, the opposite views, produce each the other 89. Although it be so, there is affirmed now life and now death, now death and now life. Now the admissibility of a thing and now its inadmissibility, now its inadmissibility and now its admissibility. The disputants, now affirm and now deny, now deny and now affirm. Therefore the sagely man does not pursue this method, but views things in the light of, his, heaven 90, ly nature, and hence forms his judgment of what is right. This view is the same as that, and that view is the same as this. But that view involves both a right and a wrong, and this view involves also a right and a wrong, are there indeed, or are there not the two views, that and this? They have not found their point of correspondency which is called the pivot of the Tao. As soon as one finds this pivot, he stands in the center of the ring, of thought, where he can respond without end to the changing views. Without end to those affirming, and without end to those denying. Therefore I said, there is nothing like the proper light, of the mind, dot. 4. By means of a finger, of my own, to illustrate that the finger, of another, is not a finger is not so good a plan as to illustrate that it is not so by means of what is, acknowledged to be, not a finger. And by means of, what I call, a horse to illustrate that, what another calls, a horse is not so, is not so good a plan as to illustrate that it is not a horse, by means of what is, acknowledged to be, not a horse 91. All things in, heaven and earth may be, dealt with as, a finger, each of, their myriads may be, dealt with as, a horse. Does a thing seem so to me? I say that, it is so. Does it seem not so to me? I say that, it is not so. A path is formed by, constant, treading on the ground. A thing is called by its name through the constant, application of the name to it. How is it so? It is so because it is so. How is it not so? It is not so, because it is not so. Everything has its inherent character and its proper capability. There is nothing which has not these. Therefore, this being so, if we take a stalk of grain 92 and a, large, pillar, a loathsome, leper, and, a beauty like, she she 93, things large and things insecure, things crafty and things strange. They may in the light of the Tao all be reduced to the same category, of opinion about them. It was separation that led to completion, from completion ensued dissolution. But all things, without regard to their completion and dissolution, may again be comprehended in their unity, it is only the far-reaching in thought who know how to comprehend them in this unity. This being so, let us give up our devotion to our own views, and occupy ourselves with the ordinary views. These ordinary views are grounded on the use of things. The study of that, use leads to the comprehensive judgment, and that judgment secures the success, of the inquiry. That success gained, we are near, to the object of our search, and there we stop. When we stop, and yet we do not know how it is so, we have what is called the Tao. When we toil our spirits and intelligence, obstinately determined, to establish our own view, and do not know the agreement, which underlies it and the views of others, we have what is called, in the morning three. What is meant by that, in the morning three? A keeper of monkeys, 
in giving them out their acorns, once, said, in the morning I will give you three, measures, and in the evening four. This made them all angry, and he said, very well. In the morning I will give you four, and in the evening three. His two proposals were substantially the same, but the result of the one was to make the creatures angry, and of the other to make them pleased, an illustration of the point I am insisting on. Therefore the sagely man brings together a dispute in its affirmations and denials, and rests in the equal fashioning of heaven 94. Both sides of the question are admissible. 5. Among the men of old their knowledge reached the extreme point. What was that extreme point? Some held that at first there was not anything. This is the extreme point, the utmost point to which nothing can be added 95. A second class held that there was something, but without any responsive recognition 96 of it, on the part of men. A third class held that there was such recognition, but there had not begun to be any expression of different opinions about it. It was through the definite expression of different opinions about it that there ensued injury to, the doctrine of, the Tao. It was this injury to the, doctrine of the, Tao which led to the formation of, partial, preferences. Was it indeed after such preferences were formed that the injury came? Or did the injury precede the rise of such preferences? If the injury arose after their formation, Cow's method of playing on the lute was natural. If the injury arose before their formation, there would have been no such playing on the lute as Cow's 9-7. Cow Wan's playing on the lute, Shi Kuang's indicating time with his staff, and Hui Di's, giving his views, while leaning against a dryandra tree, were all extraordinary. The knowledge of the three men, in their several arts, was nearly perfect, and therefore they practiced them to the end of their lives. They loved them because they were different from those of others. They loved them and wished to make them known to others. But as they could not be made clear, though they tried to make them so, they ended with the obscure, discussions, about, the hard, and, the white. And their sons ninety-eight, moreover, with all the threads of their father's compositions, yet to the end of their lives accomplished nothing. If they, proceeding in this way, could be said to have succeeded, then am I also successful. If they cannot be pronounced successful, neither I nor any other can succeed. Therefore the scintillations of light from the midst of confusion and perplexity are indeed valued by the sagely man. But not to use one's own views and to take his position on the ordinary views is what is called using the proper light. 6. But here now are some other sayings 99 I do not know whether they are of the same character as those which I have already given, or of a different character. Whether they be of the same character or not when looked at along with them, they have a character of their own, which cannot be distinguished from the others. But though this be the case, let me try to explain myself. There was a beginning. There was a beginning before that beginning. There was a beginning previous to that beginning before there was the beginning. There was existence, there had been no existence. There was no existence before the beginning of that no existence 100. There was no existence previous to the no existence before there was the beginning of the no existence. If suddenly there was non-existence, we do not know whether it was really anything existing, or really not existing. Now I have said what I have said, but I do not know whether what I have said be really anything to the point or not. Under heaven there is nothing greater than the tip of an autumn down, and the Thai mountain is small. There is no one more long-lived than a child which dies prematurely, and Fang Zhu did not live out his time. Heaven, earth, and I were produced together, and all things and I are one. Since they are one, can there be speech about them? But since they are spoken of as one, must there not be room for speech? One and speech are two, two and one are three. Going on from this, in our enumeration, the most skillful reckoner cannot reach, the end of the necessary numbers, and how much less can ordinary people do so. Therefore from non-existence we proceed to existence till we arrive at three. Proceeding from existence to existence, to how many should we reach? Let us abjure such procedure, and simply rest here 101. 7. The Tao at first met with no responsive recognition. Speech at first had no constant forms of expression. 
Because of this there came the demarcations, of different views. Let me describe those demarcations, they are the left and the right 102, the relations and their obligations 103, classifications 104 and their distinctions, emulations and contentions. These are what are called the eight qualities. Outside the limits of the world of men 105, the sage occupies his thoughts, but does not discuss about anything, inside those limits he occupies his thoughts, but does not pass any judgments. In the Kun Kaya 106, which embraces the history of the former kings, the sage indicates his judgments, but does not argue, in vindication of them. Thus it is that he separates his characters from one another without appearing to do so, and argues without the form of argument. How does he do so? The sage cherishes his views in his own breast, while men generally state theirs argumentatively, to show them to others. Hence we have the saying, disputation is a proof of not seeing clearly. The great Tao 107 does not admit of being praised. The great argument does not require words. Great benevolence is not, officiously, benevolent. Great disinterestedness does not vaunt its humility. Great courage is not seen in stubborn bravery. The Tao that is displayed is not the Tao. Words that are argumentative do not reach the point. Benevolence that is constantly exercised does not accomplish its object. Disinterestedness that vaunts its purity is not genuine. Courage that is most stubborn is ineffectual. These five seem to be round, and complete, but they tend to become square, and immovable, 108. Therefore the knowledge that stops at what it does not know is the greatest. Who knows the argument that needs no words, and the way that is not to be trodden 109. He who is able to know this has what is called the heavenly treasure, house 110. He may pour into it without its being filled. He may pour from it without its being exhausted, and all the while he does not know whence, the supply, comes. This is what is called the store of light 111. Therefore of old Yao asked Shun, saying, I wish to smite, the rulers of, Zheng, Kuei, and Suao 112. Even when standing in my court, I cannot get them out of my mind. How is it so? Shun replied, Those three rulers live, in their little states, as if they were among the mugwort and other brushwood, how is it that you cannot get them out of your mind? Formerly, ten suns came out together, and all things were illuminated by them, how much should, your, virtue exceed, all, suns? 8. Nikyu asked Wang I 113, saying, Do you know, sir, what all creatures agree in approving and affirming? How should I know it, was the reply. Do you know what it is that you do not know, asked the other again, and he got the same reply. He asked a third time then are all creatures thus without knowledge? And Wang I answered as before, adding however, notwithstanding, I will try and explain my meaning. How do you know that when I say, I know it, I really, am showing that, I do not know it, and that when I say, I do not know it, I really am showing that I do know it 114. And let me ask you some questions, if a man sleep in a damp place, he will have a pain in his loins, and half his body will be as if it were dead, but will it be so with an eel? If he be living in a tree, he will be frightened and all in a tremble, but will it be so with a monkey? And does any one of the three know his right place? Many animals that have been fed on grain and grass, deer feed on the thickset grass. Centipedes enjoy small snakes, owls and crows delight in mice, but does any one of the four know the right taste? The dog-headed monkey finds its mate in the female gibbon. The elk and the axis deer cohabit. And the eel enjoys itself with other fishes. Mao Jiang and Li Qi 115 were accounted by men to be most beautiful, but when fishes saw them, they dived deep in the water from them, when birds, they flew from them aloft. And when deer saw them, they separated and fled away 116. But did any of these four know which in the world is the right female attraction? As I look at the matter, the first principles of benevolence and righteousness and the paths of approval and disapproval are inextricably mixed and confused together, how is it possible that I should know how to discriminate among them? Nikyu said, Further, since you, sir, do not know what is advantageous and what is hurtful, 
is the perfect man also in the same way without the knowledge of them. Wong I replied, the perfect man is spirit-like. Great lakes might be boiling about him, and he would not feel their heat, the Ho and the Han might be frozen up, and he would not feel the cold. The hurrying thunderbolts might split the mountains, and the wind shake the ocean, without being able to make him afraid. Being such, he mounts on the clouds of the air, rides on the sun and moon, and rambles at ease beyond the four seas. Neither death nor life makes any change in him, and how much less should the considerations of advantage and injury do so 117. 9. Ku Jiao Di's 118 asked Kang Wu Di's, saying. I heard the master, speaking of such language as the following, the sagely man does not occupy himself with worldly affairs. He does not put himself in the way of what is profitable, nor try to avoid what is hurtful, he has no pleasure in seeking, for anything from any one, he does not care to be found in, any established, way, he speaks without speaking. He does not speak when he speaks, thus finding his enjoyment outside the dust and dirt, of the world. The master considered all this to be a shoreless flow of mere words, and I consider it to describe the course of the mysterious way. What do you, sir, think of it? Kang Wu Di's replied, the hearing of such words would have perplexed even Huang Ti, and how should Kai be competent to understand them? And you, moreover, are too hasty in forming your estimate, of their meaning. You see the egg, and, immediately, look out for the cock, that is to be hatched from it, you see the bow, and, immediately, look out for the dove, that is to be brought down by it, being roasted. I will try to explain the thing to you in a rough way, do you in the same way listen to me? How could any one stand by the side of the sun and moon, and hold under his arm all space and all time? Such language only means that the sagely man, keeps his mouth shut, and puts aside questions that are uncertain and dark, making his inferior capacities unite with him in honoring, the one lord. Men in general bustle about and toil. The sagely man seems stupid and to know nothing 119. He blends ten thousand years together in the one, conception of time, the myriad things all pursue their spontaneous course, and they are all before him as doing so. How do I know that the love of life is not a delusion? And that the dislike of death is not like a young person's losing his way, and not knowing that he is, really, going home? Li Qi 120 was a daughter of the border warden of Ai. When, the ruler of, the state of Xin first got possession of her, she wept till the tears wetted all the front of her dress. But when she came to the place of the king 121, shared with him his luxurious couch, and ate his grain and grass-fed meat, then she regretted that she had wept. How do I know that the dead do not repent of their former craving for life? Those who dream of, the pleasures of, drinking may in the morning wail and weep, those who dream of wailing and weeping may in the morning be going out to hunt. When they were dreaming they did not know it was a dream. In their dream they may even have tried to interpret it 122, but when they awoke they knew that it was a dream. And there is the great awaking, after which we shall know that this life was a great dream 123. All the while, the stupid think they are awake, and with nice discrimination insist on their knowledge, now playing the part of rulers, and now of grooms. Bigoted was that Caillou. He and you are both dreaming. I who say that you are dreaming am dreaming myself. These words seem very strange, but if after ten thousand ages we once meet with a great sage who knows how to explain them, it will be as if we met him, unexpectedly, some morning or evening. 10. Since you made me enter into this discussion with you, if you have got the better of me and not I of you, are you indeed right, and I indeed wrong? If I have got the better of you and not you of me, am I indeed right and you indeed wrong? Is the one of us right and the other wrong? Are we both right or both wrong? Since we cannot come to a mutual and common understanding, men will certainly continue in darkness on the subject. Whom shall I employ to adjudicate in the matter? If I employ one who agrees with you, how can he, agreeing with you, do so correctly? And the same may be said, if I employ one who agrees with me. It will be the same if I employ one who differs from us both or one who agrees with us both. 
In this way I and you and those others would all not be able to come to a mutual understanding, and shall we then wait for that, great sage? We need not do so. To wait on others to learn how conflicting opinions are changed is simply like not so waiting at all. The harmonizing of them is to be found in the invisible operation of heaven, and by following this on into the unlimited past. It is by this method that we can complete our years, without our minds being disturbed, 124. What is meant by harmonizing, conflicting opinions, in the invisible operation of heaven? There is the affirmation and the denial of it. And there is the assertion of an opinion and the rejection of it. If the affirmation be according to the reality of the fact, it is certainly different from the denial of it, there can be no dispute about that. If the assertion of an opinion be correct, it is certainly different from its rejection, neither can there be any dispute about that. Let us forget the lapse of time, let us forget the conflict of opinions. Let us make our appeal to the infinite, and take up our position there 125. 11. The penumbra asked the shadow 126, saying, Formerly you were walking on, and now you have stopped. Formerly you were sitting, and now you have risen up, how is it that you are so without stability? The shadow replied, I wait for the movements of something else to do what I do, and that something else on which I wait waits further on another to do as it does 127. My waiting, is it for the scales of a snake, or the wings of a cicada 128? How should I know why I do one thing, or do not do another 129? Formerly, I, Quang Kao, dreamt that I was a butterfly, a butterfly flying about, feeling that it was enjoying itself I did not know that it was cow. Suddenly I awoke, and was myself again, the veritable cow. I did not know whether it had formerly been cow dreaming that he was a butterfly, or it was now a butterfly dreaming that it was cow. But between cow and a butterfly there must be a difference. This is a case of what is called the transformation of things 130. Book 3. Part 1. Section 3. Yang Shang Ku, or Nourishing the Lord of Life. 1. There is a limit to our life, but to knowledge there is no limit. With what is limited to pursue after what is unlimited is a perilous thing. And when, knowing this, we still seek the increase of our knowledge, the peril cannot be averted. 131. There should not be the practice of what is good with any thought of the fame, which it will bring. Nor of what is evil with any approximation to the punishment, which it will incur, 132, in accordance with the central element, of our nature, 133 is the regular way to preserve the body, to maintain the life, to nourish our parents. And to complete our term of years. 2. His cook 134 was cutting up an ox for the ruler Wan Hui. Whenever he applied his hand, leaned forward with his shoulder, planted his foot, and employed the pressure of his knee, in the audible ripping off of the skin, and slicing operation of the knife, the sounds were all in regular cadence. Movements and sounds proceeded as in the dance of, the mulberry forest, and the blended notes of, the King Xia 135. The ruler said, Ah! Admirable! That your art should have become so perfect! Having finished his operation, the cook laid down his knife, and replied to the remark, what your servant loves is the method of the Tao, something in advance of any art. When I first began to cut up an ox, I saw nothing but the, entire, carcass. After three years I ceased to see it as a whole. Now I deal with it in a spirit-like manner, and do not look at it with my eyes. The use of my senses is discarded, and my spirit acts as it wills. Observing the natural lines, my knife, slips through the great crevices and slides through the great cavities, taking advantage of the facilities thus presented. My art avoids the membranous ligatures, and much more the great bones. A good cook changes his knife every year, it may have been injured, in cutting, an ordinary cook changes his every month, it may have been, broken. Now my knife has been in use for nineteen years. It has cut up several thousand oxen, and yet its edge is as sharp as if it had newly come from the whetstone. There are the interstices of the joints, and the edge of the knife has no, appreciable, thickness. When that which is so thin enters where the interstice is, how easily it moves along. The blade has more than room enough. Nevertheless, 
whenever I come to a complicated joint, and see that there will be some difficulty, I proceed anxiously and with caution, not allowing my eyes to wander from the place, and moving my hand slowly. Then, by a very slight movement of the knife, the part is quickly separated, and drops like, a clod of, earth to the ground. Then standing up with the knife in my hand, I look all round, and in a leisurely manner, with an air of satisfaction, wipe it clean, and put it in its sheath. The ruler Wan Hui said, Excellent. I have heard the words of my cook, and learned from them the nourishment of, our, life. 3. When Kung Wan Shin 136 saw the master of the left, he was startled, and said, What sort of man is this? How is it he has but one foot? Is it from heaven? Or from man? Then he added 137, It must be from heaven, and not from man heaven's making of this man caused him to have but one foot. In the person of man, each foot has its marrow. By this I know that his peculiarity is from heaven, and not from man. A pheasant of the marshes has to take ten steps to pick up a mouthful of food, and thirty steps to get a drink, but it does not seek to be nourished in a coop. Though its spirit would, there, enjoy a royal abundance, it does not think, such confinement, good. 4. When Lao Tan died 138, Kin Shi 139 went to condole, with his son, but after crying out three times, he came out. The disciples 140 said to him, Were you not a friend of the master? I was, he replied, and they said, Is it proper then to offer your condolences merely as you have done? He said, It is. At first I thought he was the man of men, and now I do not think so. When I entered a little ago and expressed my condolences, there were the old men wailing as if they had lost a son, and the young men wailing as if they had lost their mother. In his attracting and uniting them to himself in such a way there must have been that which made them involuntarily express their words, of condolence, and involuntarily wail, as they were doing. And this was a hiding from himself of his heaven, nature, and an excessive indulgence of his, human, feelings, a forgetting of what he had received, in being born. What the ancients called the punishment due to neglecting the heaven, nature, 141. When the master came 142, it was at the proper time, when he went away, it was the simple sequence, of his coming. Quiet acquiescence in what happens at its proper time, and quietly submitting, to its ceasing, afford no occasion for grief or for joy 143. The ancients described, death, as the loosening of the cord on which God suspended, the life, 144. What we can point to are the faggots that have been consumed, but the fire is transmitted, elsewhere, and we know not that it is over and ended 145. Book 4 Part 4 Section 4 Zan Qian Shi, or, Man in the World, Associated with Other Men 1. Yan Hui 146 went to see Kung and I 147, and asked leave to take his departure. Where are you going to? asked the master. I will go to Wei 148, was the reply. And with what object? I have heard that the ruler of Wei 149 is in the vigor of his years, and consults none but himself as to his course. He deals with his state as if it were a light matter, and has no perception of his errors. He thinks lightly of his people's dying, the dead are lying all over the country as if no smaller space could contain them. On the plains 150 and about the marshes, they are as thick as heaps of fuel. The people know not where to turn to. I have heard you, master, say, leave the state that is well governed, go to the state where disorder prevails 151. At the door of a physician there are many who are ill. I wish through what I have heard, from you, to think out some methods, of dealing with way, if peradventure the evils of the state may be cured. Kung and I said, Alas! The risk is that you will go only to suffer in the punishment, of yourself. The right method, in such a case, will not admit of any admixture. With such admixture, the one method will become many methods. Their multiplication will embarrass you. That embarrassment will make you anxious. However anxious you may be, you will not save, yourself. The perfect men of old first had, what they wanted to do, in themselves, and afterwards they found, the response to it, in others. 
If what they wanted in themselves was not fixed, what leisure had they to go and interfere with the proceedings of any tyrannous man? Moreover, do you know how virtue is liable to be dissipated, and how wisdom proceeds to display itself? Virtue is dissipated in, the pursuit of, the name for it, and wisdom seeks to display itself in the striving with others. In the pursuit of the name men overthrow one another, wisdom becomes a weapon of contention. Both these things are instruments of evil, and should not be allowed to have free course in one's conduct. Supposing one's virtue to be great and his sincerity firm, if he do not comprehend the spirit of those, whom he wishes to influence. And supposing he is free from the disposition to strive for reputation, if he do not comprehend their, minds. When in such a case he forcibly insists on benevolence and righteousness, setting them forth in the strongest and most direct language, before the tyrant, then he, hating, his reprovers, possession of those excellences, will put him down as doing him injury. He who injures others is sure to be injured by them in return. You indeed will hardly escape being injured by the man, to whom you go, 152. Further, if perchance he takes pleasure in men of worth and hates those of an opposite character. What is the use of your seeking to make yourself out to be different, from such men about him? Before you have begun to announce, your views, he, as king and ruler, will take advantage of you, and immediately contend with you for victory. Your eyes will be dazed and full of perplexity, you will try to look pleased with him. You will frame your words with care, your demeanor will be conformed to his, you will confirm him in his views. In this way you will be adding fire to fire, and water to water, increasing, as we may express it, the evils, which you deplore. To these signs of deferring to him at the first there will be no end. You will be in danger, seeing he does not believe you, of making your words more strong, and you are sure to die at the hands of such a tyrant. And formerly Ki 153 killed Quan Lung Fong 154, and Kao 155 killed the Prince Pai Ken 156. Both of these cultivated their persons, bending down in sympathy with the lower people to comfort them suffering, as they did, from their oppressors, and on their account opposing their superiors. On this account, because they so ordered their conduct, their rulers compassed their destruction, such regard had they for their own fame. Again, Yao anciently attacked, the states of, Zunqi and Suayo 157, and you attacked the ruler of Hu. Those states were left empty, and with no one to continue their population, the people being exterminated. They had engaged in war without ceasing, their craving for whatever they could get was insatiable. And this, ruler of Wei, is, like them, one who craves after fame and greater substance, have you not heard it? Those sages were not able to overcome the thirst for fame and substance, how much less will you be able to do so? Nevertheless you must have some ground, for the course which you wish to take, pray try and tell it to me. Yen Hui said, May I go, doing so in uprightness and humility, using also every endeavor to be uniform, in my plans of operation? No, indeed, was the reply. How can you do so? This man makes a display 158 of being filled to overflowing, with virtue, and has great self-conceit. His feelings are not to be determined from his countenance. Ordinary men do not, venture to, oppose him, and he proceeds from the way in which he affects them to seek still more the satisfaction of his own mind. He may be described as unaffected by the, small lessons of, virtue brought to bear on him from day to day, and how much less will he be so by your great lessons. He will be obstinate, and refuse to be converted. He may outwardly agree with you, but inwardly there will be no self-condemnation, how can you, go to him in this way and be successful? Yen Hui, rejoined, well then. While inwardly maintaining my straightforward intention, I will outwardly seem to bend to him. I will deliver, my lessons, and substantiate them by appealing to antiquity. Inwardly maintaining my straightforward intention, I shall be a co-worker with heaven. When I thus speak of being a co-worker with heaven, it is because I know that, the Sovereign, whom we style, the Son of Heaven, and myself, are equally regarded by heaven as its sons. And should I then, as if my words were only my own, be seeking to find whether men approved of them, or disapproved of them? In this way men will pronounce me a, 
sincere and simple 159, boy. This is what is called being a co-worker with heaven. Outwardly bending, to the ruler, I shall be a co-worker with other men. To carry, the memorandum tablet to court, 160, to kneel, and to bend the body reverentially, these are the observances of ministers. They all employ them, and should I presume not to do so. Doing what other men do, they would have no occasion to blame me. This is what is called being a fellow worker with other men. Fully declaring my sentiments and substantiating them by appealing to antiquity, I shall be a co-worker with the ancients. Although the words in which I convey my lessons may really be condemnatory, of the ruler, they will be those of antiquity, and not my own. In this way, though straightforward, I shall be free from blame. This is what is called being a co-worker with antiquity. May I go to way in this way, and be successful? No indeed, said Kung and I. How can you do so? You have too many plans of proceeding, and have not spied out, the ruler's character. Though you firmly adhere to your plans, you may be held free from transgression, but this will be all the result. How can you, in this way, produce the transformation, which you desire? All this only shows, in you, the mind of a teacher. 2. Yen Hui said, I can go no farther, I venture to ask the method from you. Kung and I replied, it is fasting 161, as, I will tell you. But, when you have the method, will you find it easy to practice it? He who thinks it easy will be disapproved of by the bright heaven. Hui said, My family is poor. For months together we have no spirituous drink, nor do we taste the proscribed food or any strong-smelling vegetables 162. Can this be regarded as fasting? The reply was, It is the fasting appropriate to sacrificing, but it is not the fasting of the mind. I venture to ask what that fasting of the mind is, said Hui, and Kung and I answered, maintain a perfect unity in every movement of your will. You will not wait for the hearing of your ears about it, but for the hearing of your mind. You will not wait even for the hearing of your mind, but for the hearing of the Spirit 163. Let the hearing, of the ears, rest with the ears. Let the mind rest in the verification, of the rightness of what is in the will. But the spirit is free from all preoccupation and so waits for, the appearance of, things. Where the, proper, course is 164, there is freedom from all preoccupation, such freedom is the fasting of the mind. Hui said 165, before it was possible for me to employ, this method, there I was, the Hui that I am, now, that I can employ it, the Hui that I was has passed away. Can I be said to have obtained this freedom from preoccupation? The master replied, entirely. I tell you that you can enter and be at ease in the enclosure, where he is, and not come into collision with the reputation, which belongs to him. If he listen to your counsels, let him hear your notes. If he will not listen, be silent. Open no, other, door, employ no other medicine, dwell with him, as with a friend, in the same apartment, and as if you had no other option, and you will not be far from success in your object. Not to move a step is easy, to walk without treading on the ground is difficult. In acting after the manner of men, it is easy to fall into hypocrisy, in acting after the manner of heaven, it is difficult to play the hypocrite. I have heard of flying with wings, I have not heard of flying without them. I have heard of the knowledge of the wise, I have not heard of the knowledge of the unwise. Look at that aperture, left in the wall. The empty apartment is filled with light through it. Felicitous influences rest, in the mind thus emblemed, as in their proper resting place. Even when they do not so rest, we have what is called, the body, seated and, the mind, galloping abroad. The information that comes through the ears and eyes is comprehended internally, and the knowledge of the mind becomes something external. When this is the case, the spiritual intelligences will come and take up their dwelling with us. And how much more will other men do so? All things thus undergo a transforming influence. This was the hinge on which you and Shun moved, it was this which Fushi 166 and Kiku 167 practiced all their lives, how much more should other men follow the same rule? 3. 
Di's Kao, Duke of Xia, being about to proceed on a mission to Kai, asked Kung and I, saying, The king is sending me, Kuliang 168, on a mission which is very important. Kai will probably treat me as his commissioner with great respect, but it will not be in a hurry, to attend to the business. Even an ordinary man cannot be readily moved, to action, and how much less the prince of a state. I am very full of apprehension. You, sir, once said to me that of all things, great or small, there were few which, if not conducted in the proper way 169, could be brought to a happy conclusion. That, if the thing were not successful, there was sure to be the evil of being dealt with after the manner of men 170, that, if it were successful, there was sure to be the evil of constant anxiety 171. And that, whether it succeeded or not, it was only the virtuous man who could secure its not being followed by evil. In my diet I take what is coarse, and do not seek delicacies a man whose cookery does not require him to be using cooling, drinks. This morning I received my charge, and in the evening I am drinking iced water, am I not feeling the internal heat and discomfort? Such is my state before I have actually engaged in the affair, I am already suffering from conflicting anxieties. And if the thing do not succeed, the king, is sure to deal with me after the manner of men. The evil is twofold, as a minister, I am not able to bear the burden, of the mission. Can you, sir, tell me something, to help me in the case? Kung and I replied, in all things under heaven there are two great cautionary considerations, the one is the requirement implanted, in the nature, 172, the other is the conviction of what is right. The love of a son for his parents is the implanted requirement, and can never be separated from his heart, the service of his ruler by a minister is what is right, and from its obligation there is no escaping anywhere between heaven and earth. These are what are called the great cautionary considerations. Therefore a son finds his rest in serving his parents without reference to or choice of place, and this is the height of filial duty. In the same way a subject finds his rest in serving his ruler, without reference to or choice of the business, and this is the fullest discharge of loyalty. When men are simply obeying, the dictates of, their hearts, the considerations of grief and joy are not readily set before them. They know that there is no alternative to their acting as they do, and rest in it as what is appointed. And this is the highest achievement of virtue. He who is in the position of a minister or of a son has indeed to do what he cannot but do. Occupied with the details of the business, in hand, and forgetful of his own person, what leisure has he to think of his pleasure in living or his dislike of death? You, my master, may well proceed on your mission. But let me repeat to you what I have heard, in all intercourse, between states, if they are near to each other, there should be mutual friendliness, verified by deeds. If they are far apart, there must be sincere adherence to truth in their messages. Those messages will be transmitted by internuncios. But to convey messages which express the complacence or the dissatisfaction of the two parties is the most difficult thing in the world. If they be those of mutual complacence, there is sure to be an overflow of expressions of satisfaction. If of mutual dissatisfaction, an overflow of expressions of dislike. But all extravagance leads to reckless language, and such language fails to command belief. When this distrust arises, woe to the internuncio. Hence the rules for speech 173 say, transmit the message exactly as it stands, do not transmit it with any overflow of language, so is, the internuncio, likely to keep himself whole. 4. Moreover, skillful wrestlers begin with open trials of strength, but always end with massed attempts, to gain the victory, as their excitement grows excessive, they display much wonderful dexterity. Parties drinking according to the rules at first observe good order, but always end with disorder, as their excitement grows excessive, their fun becomes uproarious 174. In all things it is so. People are at first sincere, but always end with becoming rude, at the commencement things are treated as trivial, but as the end draws near, they assume great proportions. Words are, like, the waves acted on by the wind. The real point of the matters, discussed by them, is lost. The wind and waves are easily set in motion, the success of the matter of which the real point is lost is easily put in peril. 
Hence quarrels are occasioned by nothing so much as by artful words and one-sided speeches. The breath comes angrily, as when a beast, driven to death, wildly bellows forth its rage. On this animosities arise on both sides. Hasty examination, of the case, eagerly proceeds, and revengeful thoughts arise in their minds, they do not know how. Since they do not know how such thoughts arise, who knows how they will end. Hence the rules for speech 175 say, let not an internunciist depart from his instructions. Let him not urge on a settlement. If he go beyond the regular rules, he will complicate matters. Departing from his instructions and urging on a settlement imperils negotiations. A good settlement is proved by its lasting long, and a bad settlement cannot be altered, ought he not to be careful. Further still, let your mind find its enjoyment in the circumstances of your position, nourish the central course which you pursue, by a reference to your unavoidable obligations. This is the highest object for you to pursue. What else can you do to fulfill the charge, of your father and ruler, 176? The best thing you can do is to be prepared to sacrifice your life, and this is the most difficult thing to do. 5. Yen Ho 177, being about to undertake the office of teacher of the eldest son of Duke Ling of Wei, consulted Ku Pu, U 178. Here, said he, is this, young, man, whose natural disposition is as bad as it could be. If I allow him to proceed in a bad way, it will be at the peril of our state, if I insist on his proceeding in a right way, it will be at the peril of my own person. His wisdom is just sufficient to know the errors of other men, but he does not know how he errs himself what am I to do in such a case. Ku Piyu replied, Good indeed is your question. Be on your guard, be careful. See that you keep yourself correct. Your best plan will be, with your person to seek association with him, and with your mind to try to be in harmony with him, and yet there are dangers connected with both of these things. While seeking to keep near to him, do not enter into his pursuits, while cultivating a harmony of mind with him, do not show how superior you are to him. If in your personal association you enter into his pursuits, you will fall with him and be ruined, you will tumble down with a crash. If in maintaining a harmony with his mind, you show how different you are from him, he will think you do so for the reputation and the name, and regard you as a creature of evil omen 179. If you find him to be a mere boy, be you with him as another boy, if you find him one of those who will not have their ground marked out in the ordinary way, do you humor him in this characteristic 180. If you find him to be free from lofty airs, show yourself to be the same wink with a frown ever, leading him on so as to keep him free from faults. Do you not know, the fate of, the praying mantis? It angrily stretches out its arms, to arrest the progress of the carriage, unconscious of its inability for such a task, but showing how much it thinks of its own powers. Be on your guard, be careful. If you cherish a boastful confidence in your own excellence, and place yourself in collision with him, you are likely to incur the fate, of the mantis. Do you not know how those who keep tigers proceed? They do not dare to supply them with living creatures, because of the rage which their killing of them will excite. They do not, even, dare to give them their food whole, because of the rage which their rending of it will excite. They watch till their hunger is appeased, dealing with them, from their knowledge of their natural ferocity. Tigers are different from men, but they fawn on those who feed them, and do so in accordance with their nature. When any of these are killed by them, it is because they have gone against that nature. Those again who are fond of horses preserve their dung in baskets, and their urine in jars. If mosquitoes and gadflies light on them, and the grooms brush them suddenly away, the horses break their bits, injure, the ornaments on, their heads, and smash those on their breasts. The more care that is taken of them, the more does their fondness, for their attendants, disappear. Ought not caution to be exercised, in the management of them? 6. A, master, mechanic, called Shi, on his way to Kai, came to Ku, Yuan 181, where he saw an oak tree, which was used as the altar for the spirits of the land. It was so large that an ox standing behind it could not be seen. It measured a hundred spans round, 
and rose up eighty cubits on the hill before it threw out any branches, after which there were ten or so, from each of which a boat could be hollowed out. People came to see it in crowds as in a marketplace, but the mechanic did not look round at it, but held on his way without stopping. One of his workmen, however, looked long and admiringly at it, and then ran on to his master, and said to him, Since I followed you with my axe and bill, I have never seen such a beautiful mass of timber as this. Why would you, sir, not look round at it, but went on without stopping? Have done, said Mr. She, and do not speak about it. It is quite useless. A boat made from its wood would sink, a coffin or shell would quickly rot. An article of furniture would soon go to pieces, a door would be covered with the exuding sap, a pillar would be riddled by insects, the material of it is good for nothing, and hence it is that it has attained to so great an age 182. When Mr. She was returning, the altar oak appeared to him in a dream, and said, I what other tree will you compare with me? Will you compare me to one of your ornamental trees? There are hawthorns, pear trees, orange trees, pomelo trees, gourds and other low fruit-bearing plants. When their fruits are ripe, they are knocked down from them, and thrown among the dirt 183. The large branches are broken, and the smaller are torn away. So it is that their productive ability makes their lives bitter to them. They do not complete their natural term of existence, but come to a premature end in the middle of their time, bringing on themselves the destructive treatment which they ordinarily receive. It is so with all things. I have sought to discover how it was that I was so useless, I had long done so, till, the effort, nearly caused my death, and now I have learned it, it has been of the greatest use to me. Suppose that I had possessed useful properties, should I have become of the great size that I am? And moreover you and I are both things, how should one thing thus pass its judgment on another? How is it that you a useless man know all this about me a useless tree? When Mr. She awoke, he kept thinking about his dream, but the workman said, being so taken with its uselessness, how is it that it yet acts here as the altar for the spirits of the land? Be still, was the master's reply, and do not say a word. It simply happened to grow here, and thus those who do not know it do not speak ill of it as an evil thing. If it were not used as the altar, would it be in danger of being cut down? Moreover, the reason of its being preserved is different from that of the preservation of things generally, is not your explaining it from the sentiment which you have expressed wide of the mark. 7. Nan Padiz Kai 184 in rambling about the heights of Shang 185, saw a large and extraordinary tree. The teams of a thousand chariots might be sheltered under it, and its shade would cover them all. Diz Kai said, What a tree is this? It must contain an extraordinary amount of timber. When he looked up, however, at its smaller branches, they were so twisted and crooked that they could not be made into rafters and beams. When he looked down to its root, its stem was divided into so many rounded portions that neither coffin nor shell could be made from them. He licked one of its leaves, and his mouth felt torn and wounded. The smell of it would make a man frantic, as if intoxicated, for more than three whole days together. This, indeed, said he, is a tree good for nothing, and it is thus that it has attained to such a size. Ah! And spirit-like men acknowledge this worthlessness, and its result, 186. In Sung there is the district of King, she 187, in which catalpi, cypresses, and mulberry trees grow well. Those of them which are a span or two or rather more in circumference 188 are cut down by persons who want to make posts to which to tie their monkeys. Those which are three or four spans round are cut down by persons who want beams for their lofty and famous houses, and those of seven or eight spans are cut down by noblemen and rich merchants who want single planks for the sides of their coffins. The trees in consequence do not complete their natural term of life, and come to a premature end in the middle of their growth under the axe and bill, this is the evil that befalls them from their supplying good timber. In the same way the key 189, book, specifies oxen that have white foreheads, pigs that have turned up snouts, and men that are suffering from piles, and forbids their being sacrificed to the hoe. The wizards know them by these peculiarities and consider them to be inauspicious, 
but spirit-like men consider them on this account to be very fortunate. 8. There was the deformed object Shu190. His chin seemed to hide his navel. His shoulders were higher than the crown of his head, the knot of his hair pointed to the sky, his five viscera were all compressed into the upper part of his body, and his two thigh bones were like ribs. By sharpening needles and washing clothes he was able to make a living. By sifting rice and cleaning it, he was able to support ten individuals. When the government was calling out soldiers, this poor Shu would bear his arms among the others. When it had any great service to be undertaken, because of his constant ailments, none of the work was assigned to him, when it was giving out grain to the sick, he received three kung, and ten bundles of firewood. If this poor man, so deformed in body, was still able to support himself, and complete his term of life, how much more may they do so, whose deformity is that of their faculties 191. 9. When Confucius went to Ku-192, Kiyu, the madman of Ku-193, as he was wandering about, passed by his door, and said, O Phoenix, O Phoenix, how is your virtue degenerated? The future is not to be waited for, the past is not to be sought again. When good order prevails in the world, the sage tries to accomplish all his service, when disorder prevails, he may preserve his life, at the present time, it is enough if he simply escape being punished. Happiness is lighter than a feather, but no one knows how to support it, calamity is heavier than the earth, and yet no one knows how to avoid it. Give over. Give over approaching men with the lessons of your virtue. You are in peril. You are in peril, hurrying on where you have marked out the ground against your advance. I avoid publicity, I avoid publicity, that my path may not be injured. I pursue my course, now going backwards, now crookedly, that my feet may not be hurt 194. The mountain by its trees weakens itself 195. The grease which ministers to the fire fries itself the cinnamon tree can be eaten, and therefore it is cut down. The varnish tree is useful, and therefore incisions are made in it. All men know the advantage of being useful, but no one knows the advantage of being useless. Book 5 Part 1 Section 5 Te Kung Fu, or, The Seal of Virtue Complete 1. In Lu 196 there was a Wang Tai 197 who had lost both his feet 198, while his disciples who followed and went about with him were as numerous as those of Kung Anai. Kang Ki 199 asked Kung Anai about him, saying, Though Wang Tai is a cripple, the disciples who follow him about divide Lu equally with you, Master. When he stands, he does not teach them, when he sits, he does not discourse to them. But they go to him empty, and come back full. Is there indeed such a thing as instruction without words 200? And while the body is imperfect, may the mind be complete? What sort of man is he? Kung and I replied, This master is a sage. I have only been too late in going to him. I will make him my teacher, and how much more should those do so who are not equal to me? Why should only the state of Lu follow him? I will lead on all under heaven with me to do so. Kang Ki rejoined, He is a man who has lost his feet, and yet he is known as the Venerable Wang 201, he must be very different from ordinary men. What is the peculiar way in which he employs his mind? The reply was, Death and life are great considerations, but they could work no change in him. Though heaven and earth were to be overturned and fall, they would occasion him no loss. His judgment is fixed regarding that in which there is no element of falsehood 202, and, while other things change, he changes not. The transformations of things are to him the developments prescribed for them, and he keeps fast hold of the author of them. Kang Ki said, What do you mean? When we look at things, said Kung and I, as they differ, we see them to be different, as for instance, the liver and the gall, or Ku and Yu, when we look at them, as they agree, we see them all to be a unity. So it is with this, Wang Tai. He takes no knowledge of the things for which his ears and eyes are the appropriate organs, but his mind delights itself in the harmony of, all excellent, qualities. He looks at the unity which belongs to things, and does not perceive where they have suffered loss. 
he looks on the loss of his feet as only the loss of so much earth. Ken Ki said, he is entirely occupied with his, proper, self 203. By his knowledge he has discovered, the nature of, his mind, and to that he holds as what is unchangeable, but how is it that men make so much of him? The reply was, men do not look into running water as a mirror, but into still water. It is only the still water that can arrest them all, and keep them, in the contemplation of their real selves. Of things which are what they are by the influence of the earth, it is only the pine and cypress which are the best instances. In winter as in summer brightly green 204. Of those which were what they were by the influence of heaven 205, the most correct examples were Yao and Shun. Fortunate in, thus, maintaining their own life correct, and so as to correct the lives of others. As a verification of the power of, the original endowment, when it has been preserved, take the result of fearlessness how the heroic spirit of a single brave soldier has been thrown into an army of nine hosts 206. If a man only seeking for fame and able in this way to secure it can produce such an effect, how much more, may we look for a greater result, from one whose rule is over heaven and earth, and holds all things in his treasury. Who simply has his lodging in the six members 207 of his body, whom his ears and eyes serve but as conveying emblematic images of things, who comprehends all his knowledge in a unity, and whose mind never dies. If such a man were to choose a day on which he would ascend far on high, men would, seek to, follow him there. But how should he be willing to occupy himself with other men? 2. Sean Thursday Kia 208 was, another, man who had lost his feet. Along with D's Khan of Khan 209 he studied under the master Pahuan Wuzan 210. D's Khan said to him, One day, if I go out first, do you remain behind, and if you go out first, I will remain behind. Next day they were again sitting together on the same mat in the hall, when D's Khan spoke the same words to him, adding, Now I am about to go out, will you stay behind or not? Moreover, when you see one of official rank, like myself, you do not try to get out of his way, do you consider yourself equal to one of official rank? Sean Thursday Kia replied, In our master's school is there indeed such recognition required of official rank? You are one, sir, whose pleasure is in your official rank, and would therefore take precedence of other men. I have heard that when a mirror is bright, the dust does not rest on it, when dust rests on it the mirror is not bright. When one dwells long with a man of ability and virtue, he comes to be without error. There now is our teacher whom you have chosen to make you greater than you are, and when you still talk in this way, are you not in error? Dees Khan rejoined, A, shattered, object as you are, you would still strive to make yourself out as good as Yao. If I may form an estimate of your virtue, might it not be sufficient to lead you to the examination of yourself? The other said, Most criminals, in describing their offenses, would make it out that they ought not to have lost, their feet, for them, few would describe them so as to make it appear that they should not have preserved their feet. They are only the virtuous who know that such a calamity was unavoidable, and therefore rest in it as what was appointed for them. When men stand before, an archer like, I-211 with his bent bow, if they are in the middle of his field, that is the place where they should be hit, and if they be not hit, that also was appointed. There are many with their feet entire who laugh at me because I have lost my feet, which makes me feel vexed and angry. But when I go to our teacher, I throw off that feeling, and return, to a better mood. He has washed, without my knowing it, the other from me by, his instructions in, what is good. I have attended him now for nineteen years, and have not known that I am without my feet. Now, you, sir, and I have for the object of our study the, virtue, which is internal, and not an adjunct of the body, and yet you are continually directing your attention to my external body, are you not wrong in this? Dees Khan felt uneasy, altered his manner and looks, and said, You need not, sir, say anything more about it. 3. In Lu there was a cripple, called Shu Shan the Tolis 212, who came on his heels to see Kung and I. Kung and I said to him, By your want of circumspection in the past, sir, you have incurred such a calamity, of what use is your coming to me now? Tola said, through my ignorance of my proper business and taking too little care of my body, 
I came to lose my feet. But now I am come to you, still possessing what is more honourable than my feet, and which therefore I am anxious to preserve entire. There is nothing which heaven does not cover, and nothing which earth does not sustain. You, Master, were regarded by me as doing the part of heaven and earth, how could I know that you would receive me in such a way? Confucius rejoined, I am but a poor creature. But why, my master, do you not come inside, where I will try to tell you what I have learned? When Tolus had gone out, Confucius said, Be stimulated to effort, my disciples. This Tolus cripple is still anxious to learn to make up for the evil of his former conduct, how much more should those be so whose conduct has been unchallenged? Mr. Tolus, however, told Lao Tan, of the interview, saying, Kung Kaiu, I apprehend, has not yet attained to be a perfect man. What has he to do with keeping a crowd of disciples around him? He is seeking to have the reputation of being an extraordinary and marvelous man, and does not know that the perfect man considers this to be as handcuffs and fetters to him. Lao Tan said, Why did you not simply leave him to see the unity of life and death, and that the admissible and inadmissible belong to one category, so freeing him from his fetters? Would this be possible? Tola said, It is the punishment inflicted on him by Heaven 213. How can he be freed from it? For, Duke A.I. of Lu 214 asked Kung and I, saying, There was an ugly man in Wei, called A.I. Tai though 215. His father in law, who lived with him, thought so much of him that he could not be away from him. His wife, when she saw him, ugly as he was, represented to her parents, saying, I had more than ten times rather be his concubine than the wife of any other man 216. He was never heard to take the lead in discussion, but always seemed to be of the same opinion with others. He had not the position of a ruler, so as to be able to save men from death. He had no revenues, so as to be able to satisfy men's craving for food. He was ugly enough, moreover, to scare the whole world. He agreed with men instead of trying to lead them to adopt his views. His knowledge did not go beyond his immediate neighborhood 217. And yet his father-in-law and his wife were of one mind about him in his presence, as I have said, he must have been different from other men. I called him, and saw him. Certainly he was ugly enough to scare the whole world. He had not lived with me, however. For many months, when I was drawn to the man, and before he had been with me a full year, I had confidence in him. The state being without a chief minister, I, was minded, to commit the government to him. He responded to my proposal sorrowfully, and looked undecided as if he would fain have declined it. I was ashamed of myself, as inferior to him, but finally gave the government into his hands. In a little time, however, he left me and went away. I was sorry and felt that I had sustained a loss, and as if there were no other to share the pleasures of the kingdom with me. What sort of man was he? Kung and I said, once when I was sent on a mission to Ku, I saw some pigs sucking at their dead mother. After a little they looked with rapid glances, when they all left her, and ran away. They felt that she did not see them, and that she was no longer like themselves. What they had loved in their mother was not her bodily figure, but what had given animation to her figure. When a man dies in battle, they do not at his interment employ the usual appendages of plumes 218, as to supplying shoes to one who has lost his feet, there is no reason why he should care for them. In neither case is there the proper reason for their use. The members of the royal harem do not pare their nails nor pierce their ears. When a man is newly married, he remains, for a time, absent from his official duties, and unoccupied with them 219. That their bodies might be perfect was sufficient to make them thus dealt with. How much greater results should be expected from men whose mental gifts are perfect? This A.I. Tai though was believed by men, though he did not speak a word, and was loved by them, though he did no special service for them. He made men appoint him to the government of their states, afraid only that he would not accept the appointment. He must have been a man whose powers 220 were perfect, though his realization of them was not manifested in his person. Duke A.I. said, What is meant by saying that his powers were complete? Kung and I replied, Death and life, preservation and ruin, 
failure and success, poverty and wealth, superiority and inferiority, blame and praise, hunger and thirst, cold and heat. These are the changes of circumstances, the operation of our appointed lot. Day and night they succeed to one another before us, but there is no wisdom able to discover to what they owe their origination. They are not sufficient therefore to disturb the harmony, of the nature, and are not allowed to enter into the treasury of intelligence. To cause this harmony and satisfaction ever to be diffused, while the feeling of pleasure is not lost from the mind, to allow no break to arise in this state day or night, so that it is always spring, time 221 in his relations with external things. In all his experiences to realize in his mind what is appropriate to each season, of the year, 222, these are the characteristics of him whose powers are perfect. And what do you mean by the realization of these powers not being manifested in the person? Pursued further the Duke. The reply was, there is nothing so level as the surface of a pool of still water. It may serve as an example of what I mean. All within its circuit is preserved, in peace, and there comes to it no agitation from without. The virtuous efficacy is the perfect cultivation of the harmony, of the nature. Though the realization of this be not manifested in the person, things cannot separate themselves, from its influence. Dot. Some days afterwards Duke A.I. told this conversation to Min, D's 223, saying, Formerly it seemed to me the work of the sovereign to stand in court with his face to the south, to rule the kingdom. And to pay good heed to the accounts of the people concerned, lest any should come to a, miserable, death. This I consider to be the sum, of his duty. Now that I have heard that description of the perfect man, I fear that my idea is not the real one, and that, by employing myself too lightly, I may cause the ruin of my state. I and Kung Kaiu are not on the footing of ruler and subject, but on that of a virtuous friendship. 5. A person who had no lips, whose legs were bent so that he could only walk on his toes, and who was, otherwise, deformed, addressed his counsels to Duke Ling of Wei, who was so pleased with him. That he looked on a perfectly formed man as having a lean and small neck in comparison with him. Another who had a large goiter like an earthenware jar 224 addressed his counsels to Duke Huan of Kai 225, who was so pleased with him that he looked on a perfectly formed man as having a neck lean and small in comparison with him 226. So it is that when one's virtue is extraordinary, any deficiency in his bodily form may be forgotten. When men do not forget what is, easily, forgotten, and forget what is not, easily, forgotten, we have a case of real oblivion. Therefore the sagely man has that in which his mind finds its enjoyment, and, looks on, wisdom as, but, the shoots from an old stump, agreements with others are to him but so much glue, kindnesses are, but the arts of, intercourse. And great skill is, but as, merchants wares. The sagely man lays no plans, of what use would wisdom be to him. He has no cutting and hacking to do, of what use would glue be to him. He has lost nothing. Of what use would arts of intercourse be to him. He has no goods to dispose of, what need has he to play the merchant. The want of, these four things are the nourishment of, his, heavenly, nature, that nourishment is its heavenly food. Since he receives this food from heaven, what need has he for anything of man's, devising? He has the bodily form of man, but not the passions and desires of, other, men. He has the form of man, and therefore he is a man. Being without the passions and desires of men, their approvings and disapprovings are not to be found in him. How insignificant and small is, the body, by which he belongs to humanity. How grand and great is he in the unique perfection of his heavenly, nature. Huidis said to Kuangdis, Can a man indeed be without desires and passions? The reply was, He can. But on what grounds do you call him a man, who is thus without passions and desires? Kuangdis said, The Tao 227 gives him his personal appearance, and powers, Heaven 228 gives him his bodily form, how should we not call him a man? Huidis rejoined, Since you call him a man, how can he be without passions and desires? The reply was, You are misunderstanding what I mean by passions and desires. 
What I mean when I say that he is without these is, that this man does not by his likings and dislikings do any inward harm to his body, he always pursues his course without effort, and does not, try to, increase his, store of, life. Huides rejoined, if there were not that increasing of, the amount, of life, how would he get his body to 29? Quan Di said, the Tao gives him his personal appearance, and powers, heaven gives him his bodily form. And he does not by his likings and dislikings do any internal harm to his body. But now you, sir, deal with your spirit as if it were something external to you, and subject your vital powers to toil. You sing, your ditties, leaning against a tree. You go to sleep, grasping the stump of a rotten dryandra tree. Heaven selected for you the bodily form, of a man, and you babble about what is strong and what is white 230. Book 6. Part 1. Section 6. Ta Zung Shi, or, The Great and Most Honored Master. 1. He who knows the part which the heavenly 231, in him, plays, and knows, also, that which the human, in him ought to, play, has reached the perfection, of knowledge. He who knows the part which the heavenly plays, knows, that it is naturally born with him. He who knows the part which the human ought to play, proceeds, with the knowledge which he possesses to nourish it in the direction of what he does not, yet, know 232, to complete one's natural term of years and not come to an untimely end in the middle of his course is the fullness of knowledge. Although it be so, there is an evil, attending this condition. Such knowledge still awaits the confirmation of it as correct, it does so because it is not yet determined 233. How do we know that what we call the heavenly, in us, is not the human? And that what we call the human is not the heavenly? There must be the true man 234, and then there is the true knowledge. 2. What is meant by, the true man 235? The true men of old did not reject, the views of, the few. They did not seek to accomplish, their ends, like heroes, before others, they did not lay plans to attain those ends 236. Being such, though they might make mistakes, they had no occasion for repentance. Though they might succeed, they had no self-complacency. Being such, they could ascend the loftiest heights without fear, they could pass through water without being made wet by it, they could go into fire without being burnt. So it was that by their knowledge they ascended to and reached the Tao 237. The true men of old did not dream when they slept, had no anxiety when they awoke, and did not care that their food should be pleasant. Their breathing came deep and silently. The breathing of the true man comes, even, from his heels, while men generally breathe, only, from their throats. When men are defeated in argument, their words come from their gullets as if they were vomiting. Where lusts and desires are deep, the springs of the heavenly are shallow. The true men of old knew nothing of the love of life or of the hatred of death. Entrance into life occasioned them no joy, the exit from it awakened no resistance. Composedly they went and came. They did not forget what their beginning had been, and they did not inquire into what their end would be. They accepted, their life, and rejoiced in it, they forgot, all fear of death, and returned, to their state before life. Thus there was in them what is called the want of any mind to resist the Tao, and of all attempts by means of the human to assist the heavenly. Such were they who are called the true men. 3. Being such, their minds were free from all thought 238. Their demeanor was still and unmoved, their foreheads beamed simplicity. Whatever coldness came from them was like that of autumn, whatever warmth came from them was like that of spring. Their joy and anger assimilated to what we see in the four seasons. They did in regard to all things what was suitable, and no one could know how far their action would go. Therefore the sagely man might, in his conduct of war, destroy a state without losing the hearts of the people 239, his benefits and favors might extend to a myriad generations without his being a lover of men. Hence he who tries to share his joys with others is not a sagely man, he who manifests affection is not benevolent, he who observes times and seasons, to regulate his conduct, is not a man of wisdom. He to whom profit and injury are not the same is not a superior man, 
he who acts for the sake of the name of doing so, and loses his, proper, self is not the, right, scholar. And he who throws away his person in a way which is not the true, way, cannot command the service of others. Such men as Hu Pu Qi, Wu Kuang, Pai, Shu Kai, the Count of Qi, Su Yu, Qi the, and Sean Thursday T, all did service for other men, and sought to secure for them what they desired, not seeking their own pleasure. 240. 4. The true men of old presented the aspect of judging others aright, but without being partisans, of feeling their own insufficiency, but being without flattery or cringing. Their peculiarities were natural to them, but they were not obstinately attached to them, their humility was evident, but there was nothing of unreality or display about it. Their placidity and satisfaction had the appearance of joy. Their every movement seemed to be a necessity to them. Their accumulated attractiveness drew men's looks to them, their blandness fixed men's attachment to their virtue. They seemed to accommodate themselves to the manners of their age, but with a certain severity, their haughty indifference was beyond its control. Unceasing seemed their endeavors to keep their mouths shut. When they looked down, they had forgotten what they wished to say. They considered punishments to be the substance of government, and they never incurred it, ceremonies to be its supporting wings, and they always observed them. Wisdom, to indicate, the time, for action, and they always selected it, and virtue, to be accordance, with others, and they were all accordant. Considering punishments to be the substance, of government, yet their generosity appeared in the, manner of their, infliction of death. Considering ceremonies to be its supporting wings, they pursued by means of them their course in the world. Considering wisdom to indicate the time, for action, they felt it necessary to employ it in, the direction of, affairs. Considering virtue to be accordance, with others, they sought to ascend its height along with all who had feet, to climb it. Such were they, and yet men really thought that they did what they did by earnest effort 241. 5. In this way they were one and the same in all their likings and dislikings. Where they liked, they were the same. Where they did not like, they were the same. In the former case where they liked, they were fellow workers with the heavenly, in them, in the latter where they disliked, they were co-workers with the human in them. The one of these elements, in their nature, did not overcome the other. Such were those who are called the true men. Death and life are ordained, just as we have the constant succession of night and day, in both cases from heaven. Men have no power to do anything in reference to them, such as the constitution of things 242. There are those who specially regard heaven 3 as their father, and they still love it, distant as it is, 243. How much more should they love? That which stands out, superior and alone. Some specially regard their ruler as superior to themselves, and will give their bodies to die for him. How much more should they do so for that which is their true, ruler, 244. When the springs are dried up, the fishes collect together on the land. Then that they should moisten one another there by the damp about them, and keep one another wet by their slime, it would be better for them to forget one another in the rivers and lakes 245. And when men praise Yao and condemn Qi, it would be better to forget them both, and seek the renovation of the Tao. 6. There is the great mass, of nature, I find the support of my body on it, my life is spent in toil on it. My old age seeks ease on it, at death I find rest in it, what makes my life a good makes my death also a good 246. If you hide away a boat in the ravine of a hill, and hide away the hill in a lake, you will say that, the boat, is secure. But at midnight there shall come a strong man and carry it off on his back, while you in the dark know nothing about it. You may hide away anything, whether small or great, in the most suitable place, and yet it shall disappear from it. But if you could hide the world in the world 247, so that there was nowhere to which it could be removed, this would be the grand reality of the ever-during thing 248. When the body of man comes from its special mold 249, there is even then occasion for joy, but this body undergoes a myriad transformations, and does not immediately reach its perfection, does it not thus afford occasion for joys incalculable? Therefore the sagely man enjoys himself in that from which there is no possibility of separation, 
and by which all things are preserved. He considers early death or old age, his beginning and his ending, all to be good, and in this other men imitate him, how much more will they do so in regard to that itself on which all things depend, and from which every transformation arises. 7. This is the Tao, there is in it emotion and sincerity, but it does nothing and has no bodily form 250. It may be handed down, by the teacher, but may not be received, by his scholars. It may be apprehended, by the mind, but it cannot be seen. It has its root and ground, of existence, in itself. Before there were heaven and earth, from of old, there it was, securely existing. From it came the mysterious existences of spirits, from it the mysterious existence of God 251. It produced heaven. It produced earth. It was before the Taiki 252, and yet could not be considered high, it was below all space, and yet could not be considered deep. It was produced before heaven and earth, and yet could not be considered to have existed long. It was older than the highest antiquity, and yet could not be considered old 253. Shi Wei got it 254, and by it adjusted heaven and earth. Fu Shi got it, and by it penetrated to the mystery of the maternity of the primary matter. The Wei Tao 255 got it, and from all antiquity has made no eccentric movement. The sun and moon got it, and from all antiquity have not intermitted, their bright shining. Kanpei got it, and by it became Lord of Quanluan 256. Fang I 257 got it, and by it enjoyed himself in the great river. Qian Wu 258 got it, and by it dwelt on Mount Tai. Huang T259 got it, and by it ascended the cloudy sky. Quan Su 260 got it, and by it dwelt in the dark palace. Yu Qiang 261 got it, and by it was set on the North Pole. Shi Wang Mu 262 got it, and by it had her seat in, the palace of, Xiao Quan. No one knows its beginning, no one knows its end. Fang Zhu got it, and lived on from the time of the Lord of Yu to that of the Five Chiefs 263. Fu Yu got it, and by it became Chief Minister to Wu Ting 264, who thus, in a trice became Master of the Kingdom. After his death, Fu Yu mounted to the eastern portion of the Milky Way, where, riding on Sagittarius and Scorpio, he took his place among the stars. 8. Nan Padiz, Kuei 265, asked Nu Yu 266, saying, You are old, sir, while your complexion is like that of a child, how is it so? The reply was, I have become acquainted with the Tao. The other said, Can I learn the Tao? Nu Yu said, No. How can you? You, sir, are not the man to do so. There was Pul Yang I-267 who had the abilities of a sagely man, but not the Tao, while I had the Tao, but not the abilities. I wished, however, to teach him, if, peradventure, he might become the sagely man indeed. If he should not do so, it was easy, I thought, for one possessing the Tao of the sagely man to communicate it to another possessing his abilities. Accordingly, I proceeded to do so, but with deliberation 268. After three days, he was able to banish from his mind all worldly, matters. This accomplished, I continued my intercourse with him in the same way. And in seven days he was able to banish from his mind all thought of men and things. This accomplished, and my instructions continued, after nine days, he was able to count his life as foreign to himself. This accomplished, his mind was afterwards clear as the morning, and after this he was able to see his own individuality 269. That individuality perceived, he was able to banish all thought of past or present. Freed from this, he was able to penetrate to, the truth that there is no difference between, life and death, how, the destruction of life is not dying, and the communication of other life is not living. The Tao, is a thing which accompanies all other things and meets them, which is present when they are overthrown and when they obtain their completion. Its name is tranquility amid all disturbances, meaning that such disturbances lead to its perfection 270. And how did you, being alone, without any teacher, learn all this? I learned it, was the reply, from the son of Fuemo 271. He learned it from the grandson of Lo Sung, he learned it from Shan Ming, 
he learned it from Ni Su, he, from Su Yi, he, from Wu Wei O, he, from Su Ming, he, from Zhang Yao, and he learned it from Ai Shi. 9. Dz, Dz Yu, Dz, One I, and Dz Lai 272, these four men, were talking together, when someone said, who can suppose the head to be made from nothing, the spine from life, and the rump bone from death? Who knows how death and birth, living on and disappearing, compose the one body, I would be friends with him 273. The four men looked at one another and laughed, but no one seized with his mind the drift of the questions. All, however, were friends together. Not long after Dz Yu fell ill, and Dz Z went to inquire for him. How great, said, the sufferer, is the creator 274. That he should have made me the deformed object that I am. He was a crooked hunchback. His five viscera were squeezed into the upper part of his body, his chin bent over his navel, his shoulder was higher than his crown, on his crown was an ulcer pointing to the sky. His breath came and went in gasps 275, yet he was easy in his mind, and made no trouble of his condition. He limped to a well, looked at himself in it, and said, Alas that the Creator should have made me the deformed object that I am. D said, Do you dislike your condition? He replied, No, why should I dislike it? If he were to transform my left arm into a cock, should be watching with it the time of the night. If he were to transform my right arm into a crossbow, I should then be looking for a sea out to, bring down and, roast. If he were to transform my rump bone into a wheel, and my spirit into a horse, I should then be mounting it, and would not change it for another steed. Moreover, when we have got, what we are to do, there is the time, of life, in which to do it. When we lose that, at death, submission, is what is required. When we rest in what the time requires, and manifest that submission, neither joy nor sorrow can find entrance, to the mind, 276. This would be what the ancients called loosing the cord by which, the life, is suspended. But one hung up cannot loose himself, he is held fast by his bonds 277. And that creatures cannot overcome heaven, the inevitable, is a long acknowledged fact. Why should I hate my condition? 10. Before long Dizli fell ill, and lay gasping at the point of death, while his wife and children stood around him wailing 278. Dizli went to ask for him, and said to them, Hush! Get out of the way! Do not disturb him as he is passing through his change. Then, leaning against the door, he said, to the dying man, Great indeed is the Creator. What will he now make you to become? Where will he take you to? Will he make you the liver of a rat, or the arm of an insect 279? Dees Lai replied, Wherever a parent tells a son to go, east, west, south, or north, he simply follows the command. The yin and yang are more to a man than his parents are. If they are hastening my death, and I do not quietly submit to them, I shall be obstinate and rebellious. There is the great mass, of nature, I find the support of my body in it, my life is spent in toil on it, my old age seeks ease on it. At death I find rest on it, what has made my life a good will make my death also a good. Here now is a great founder, casting his metal. If the metal were to leap up, in the pot, and say, I must be made into a, sword like the, M.O., Ya yeah, 280. The great founder would be sure to regard it as uncanny. So, again, when a form is being fashioned in the mold of the womb, if it were to say, I must become a man, I must become a man, the Creator would be sure to regard it as uncanny. When we once understand that heaven and earth are a great melting pot, and the Creator a great founder, where can we have to go to that shall not be right for us? We are born as from a quiet sleep, and we die to a calm awaking. 11. These Sang Hu, Mang Dee's Fan, and Dee's Kin Kong 281, these three men, were friends together. One of them said, Who can associate together without any, thought of, such association, or act together without any, evidence of, such cooperation? Who can mount up into the sky and enjoy himself amidst the mists, disporting beyond the utmost limits, of things, 282, and forgetting all others as if this were living, and would have no end? 
The three men looked at one another and laughed, not perceiving the drift of the questions, and they continued to associate together as friends. Suddenly, after a time 283, Di sang he had died. Before he was buried, Confucius heard of the event, and sent Di's Kung to go and see if he could render any assistance. One of the survivors had composed a ditty, and the other was playing on his lute. Then they sang together in unison. Ah! Come, sang hu ah! Come, sang hu! You're being true you've got again. While we, as men, still here remain. Ohon 284 Dees Kung hastened forward to them, and said, I venture to ask whether it be according to the rules to be singing thus in the presence of the corpse. The two men looked at each other, and laughed, saying, What does this man know about the idea that underlies, our, rules? Dees Kung returned to Confucius, and reported to him, saying, What sort of men are those? They had made none of the usual preparations 285, and treated the body as a thing foreign to them. They were singing in the presence of the corpse, and there was no change in their countenances. I cannot describe them, what sort of men are they? Confucius replied, those men occupy and enjoy themselves in what is outside the common ways of the world, while I occupy and enjoy myself in what lies within those ways. There is no common ground for those of such different ways. And when one sent you to condole with those men, I was acting stupidly. They, moreover, make man to be the fellow of the Creator, and seek their enjoyment in the formless condition of heaven and earth. They consider life to be an appendage attached, an excrescence annexed to them, and death to be a separation of the appendage and a dispersion of the contents of the excrescence. With these views, how should they know wherein death and life are to be found, or what is first and what is last? They borrow different substances, and pretend that the common form of the body is composed of them 286. They dismiss the thought of, its inward constituents like, the liver and gall, and, its outward constituents, the ears and eyes. Again and again they end and they begin, having no knowledge of first principles. They occupy themselves ignorantly and vaguely with what, they say, lies outside the dust and dirt, of the world, and seek their enjoyment in the business of doing nothing. How should they confusedly address themselves to the ceremonies practiced by the common people, and exhibit themselves as doing so to the ears and eyes of the multitude? Dees Kung said, Yes, but why do you, Master, act according to the common ways of the world? The reply was, I am in this under the condemning sentence of Heaven 287. Nevertheless, I will share with you what I have attained to. Dees Kung rejoined, I venture to ask the method which you pursue, and Confucius said, Fishes breed and grow in the water, man develops in the Tao. Growing in the water, the fishes cleave the pools, and their nourishment is supplied to them. Developing in the Tao, men do nothing, and the enjoyment of their life is secured. Hence it is said, Fishes forget one another in the rivers and lakes, men forget one another in the arts of the Tao. Dees Kung said, I venture to ask about the man who stands aloof from others 288. The reply was, he stands aloof from other men, but he is in accord with heaven. Hence it is said, the small man of heaven is the superior man among men. The superior man among men is the small man of heaven 289. 12. Yen Hui asked Kung and I, saying, when the mother of Mang Sun Jai 290 died, in all his wailing for her he did not shed a tear, in the core of his heart he felt no distress. During all the morning rites, he exhibited no sorrow. Without these three things, he, was considered to have, discharged his mourning well, is it that in the state of Lu one who has not the reality may yet get the reputation of having it? I think the matter very strange. Kung and I said, that Mang Sun carried out, his views, to the utmost. He was advanced in knowledge. But, in this case, it was not possible for him to appear to be negligent, in his ceremonial observances, 291, but he succeeded in being really so to himself. Mang Sun does not know either what purposes life serves, or what death serves. He does not know which should be first sought, and which last 292. If he is to be transformed into something else, 
he will simply await the transformation which he does not yet know. This is all he does. And moreover, when one is about to undergo his change, how does he know that it has not taken place? And when he is not about to undergo his change, how does he know that it has taken place? 293. Take the case of me and you, are we in a dream from which we have not begun to awake? 294. Moreover, Meng Sun presented in his body the appearance of being agitated, but in his mind he was conscious of no loss. The death was to him like the issuing from one's dwelling at dawn, and no, more terrible, reality. He was more awake than others were. When they wailed, he also wailed, having in himself the reason why he did so. And we all have our individuality which makes us what we are as compared together, but how do we know that we determine in any case correctly that individuality? Moreover you dream that you are a bird, and seem to be soaring to the sky. Or that you are a fish, and seem to be diving in the deep. But you do not know whether we that are now speaking are awake or in a dream 295. It is not the meeting with what is pleasurable that produces the smile. It is not the smile suddenly produced that produces the arrangement, of the person. When one rests in what has been arranged, and puts away all thought of the transformation, he is in unity with the mysterious heaven. 13. IRDs 296 Having gone to see Su Yu, the latter said to him, What benefit have you received from Yao? The reply was, Yao says to me, you must yourself labor at benevolence and righteousness, and be able to tell clearly which is right and which wrong, in conflicting statements. Su Yu rejoined, Why then have you come to me? Since Yao has put on you the brand of his benevolence and righteousness, and cut off your nose with his right and wrong 297, how will you be able to wander in the way of aimless enjoyment, of unregulated contemplation? And the ever changing forms, of dispute? IRD said, that may be, but I should like to skirt along its hedges. But, said the other, it cannot be. Eyes without pupils can see nothing of the beauty of the eyebrows, eyes, and other features. The blind have nothing to do with the green, yellow, and variegated colors of the sacrificial robes. IRDs rejoined, yet, when Wu Kuang lost his beauty, Ku Liang 298 his strength, and Huang Ti his wisdom, they all, recovered them, 299 under the molding, of your system. How do you know that the Maker will not obliterate the marks of my branding, and supply my dismemberment, so that, again perfect in my form, I may follow you as my teacher? Su so Yu said, Ah! That cannot yet be known. I will tell you the rudiments. Oh my master! Oh my master! He gives to all things their blended qualities, and does not count it any righteousness, his favors reach to all generations, and he does not count it any benevolence. He is more ancient than the highest antiquity, and does not count himself old, he overspreads heaven and supports the earth, he carves and fashions all bodily forms, and does not consider it any act of skill. This is he in whom I find my enjoyment. 14. Yen Hui said, I am making progress. Kung and I replied, What do you mean? I have ceased to think of benevolence and righteousness, was the reply. Very well, but that is not enough. Another day, Hui again saw Kung and I, and said, I am making progress. What do you mean? I have lost all thought of ceremonies and music. Very well, but that is not enough. A third day, Hui again saw, the master, and said, I am making progress. What do you mean? I sit and forget everything 300. Kung and I changed countenance, and said, What do you mean by saying that you sit and forget, everything? Yen Hui replied, My connection with the body and its parts is dissolved, my perceptive organs are discarded. Thus leaving my material form, and bidding farewell to my knowledge, I am become one with the great pervader 301. This I call sitting and forgetting all things. Kung and I said, one, with that pervader, you are free from all likings, so transformed, you are become impermanent. You have, indeed, become superior to me. I must ask leave to follow in your steps 302. 15. D's you and D's sang 303 were friends. Once, when it had rained continuously for ten days, 
these you said, I fear that these sang may be in distress. So he wrapped up some rice, and went to give it to him to eat. When he came to Dee Sang's door, there issued from it sounds between singing and wailing, a lute was struck, and there came the words, O Father! O Mother! O Heaven! O Men! The voice could not sustain itself, and the line was hurriedly pronounced. Dee you entered and said, Why are you singing, sir, this line of poetry in such a way? The other replied, I was thinking, and thinking in vain, how it was that I was brought to such extremity. Would my parents have wished me to be so poor? Heaven overspreads all without any partial feeling, and so does earth sustain all. Would heaven and earth make me so poor with any unkindly feeling? I was trying to find out who had done it, and I could not do so. But here I am in this extremity, it is what was appointed for me 304. Book 7. Part 1. Section 7. Ng T. Wang, or, The Normal Course for Rulers and Kings. 1. Ni Kyu put four questions to Wang I, not one of which did he know, how to answer. On this Ni Kyu leaped up, and in great delight walked away and informed Fu I D. 305 of it, who said to him, Do you, only, now know it? He of the line of you was not equal to him of the line of Tai 306. He of you still kept in himself, the idea of, benevolence by which to constrain, the submission of, men, and he did win men, but he had not begun to proceed by what did not belong to him as a man. He of the line of Tai would sleep tranquilly, and awake in contented simplicity. He would consider himself now, merely, as a horse, and now, merely, as an ox 307. His knowledge was real and untroubled by doubts. And his virtue was very true, he had not begun to proceed by what belonged to him as a man. 2. Qian Wu went to see the mad, recluse, Qiyu, who said to him, What did Zakangshi 308 tell you? The reply was, He told me that when rulers gave forth their regulations according to their own views and enacted righteous measures, no one would venture not to obey them, and all would be transformed. Qyd said, That is but the hypocrisy of virtue. For the right ordering of the world it would be like trying to wade through the sea and dig through the hoe, or employing a mosquito to carry a mountain on its back. And when a sage is governing, does he govern men's outward actions? He is, himself, correct, and so, his government, goes on, this is the simple and certain way by which he secures the success of his affairs. Think of the bird which flies high, to avoid being hurt by the dart on the string of the archer, and the little mouse which makes its hole deep under Shankayu 309 to avoid the danger of being smoked or dug out. Are, rulers, less knowing than these two little creatures? 3. Tian Can 310, rambling on the south of, Mount, In 311, came to the neighborhood of the Liao water. Happening there to meet with the man whose name is not known 312, he put a question to him, saying, I beg to ask what should be done 313 in order to, carry on, the government of the world. The nameless man said, Go away, you are a rude borderer. Why do you put to me a question for which you are unprepared 314? I would simply play the part of the maker of, all, things 315. When wearied, I would mount on the bird of the light and empty air, proceed beyond the six cardinal points, and wander in the region of nonentity, to dwell in the wilderness of desert space. What method have you, moreover, for the government of the world that you, thus, agitate my mind. Tian Can, however, again asked the question, and the nameless man said, Let your mind find its enjoyment in pure simplicity. Blend yourself with, the primary, ether in idle indifference, allow all things to take their natural course, and admit no personal or selfish consideration do this and the world will be governed. 4. Yang Di's, Ku 316, having an interview with Lao Tan, said to him, Here is a man, alert and vigorous in responding to all matters 317, clear-sighted and widely intelligent, and an unwearied student of the Tao. Can he be compared to one of the intelligent kings? The reply was, Such a man is to one of the intelligent kings but as the bustling underling of a court who toils his body and distresses his mind with his various contrivances 318. And moreover, 
It is the beauty of the skins of the tiger and leopard which makes men hunt them, the agility of the monkey, or, the sagacity of, the dog that catches the yak, which make men lead them in strings. But can one similarly endowed be compared to the intelligent kings? Yang Di's Ku looked discomposed and said, I venture to ask you what the government of the intelligent kings is. Lao Ten replied, In the governing of the intelligent kings, their services overspread all under the sky, but they did not seem to consider it as proceeding from themselves. Their transforming influence reached to all things, but the people did not refer it to them with hope. No one could tell the name of their agency, but they made men and things be joyful in themselves. Where they took their stand could not be fathomed, and they found their enjoyment in, the realm of, nonentity. 5. In Kong there was a mysterious wizard 319 called Kishin. He knew all about the deaths and births of men, their preservation and ruin, their misery and happiness, and whether their lives would be long or short, foretelling the year, the month, the decade and the day like a spirit. When the people of Kong saw him, they all ran out of his way. Li Dees went to see him, and was fascinated 320 by him. Returning, he told Hu Dees of his interview, and said, I considered your doctrine, my master, to be perfect, but I have found another which is superior to it. Hu Dees 321 replied, I have communicated to you but the outward letter of my doctrine, and have not communicated its reality and spirit, and do you think that you are in possession of it? However many hens there be, if there be not the cock among them, how should they lay, real, eggs 322? When you confront the world with your doctrine, you are sure to show in your countenance, all that is in your mind, 323, and so enable, this, man to succeed in interpreting your physiognomy. Try and come to me with him, that I may show myself to him. On the morrow, accordingly, Li Dees came with the man and saw Hadis. When they went out, the wizard said, Alas! Your master is a dead man. He will not live, not for ten days more. I saw something strange about him, I saw the ashes, of his life, all slaked with water. When Li Dees re-entered, he wept till the front of his jacket was wet with his tears, and told Hu Dees what the man had said. Hu Dees said, I showed myself to him with the forms of, vegetation beneath, the earth. There were the sprouts indeed, but without, any appearance of, growth or regularity, he seemed to see me with the springs of my, vital, power closed up. Try and come to me with him again. Next day, accordingly, Li Dees brought the man again and saw Hu Dees. When they went out, the man said, it is a fortunate thing for your master that he met with me. He will get better. He has all the signs of living. I saw the balance, of the springs of life, that had been stopped, inclining in his favor, dot. Li Dees went in, and reported these words to his master, who said, I showed myself to him after the pattern of the earth, beneath the sky. Neither semblance nor reality entered, into my exhibition, but the springs, of life, were issuing from beneath my feet, he seemed to see me with the springs of vigorous action in full play. Try and come with him again. Next day Li Dees came with the man again, and again saw Hu Dees with him. When they went out, the wizard said, Your master is never the same. I cannot understand his physiognomy. Let him try to steady himself, and I will again view him. Li Dees went in and reported this to Hu Dees, who said, this time I showed myself to him after the pattern of the grand harmony, of the two elemental forces, with the superiority inclining to neither. He seemed to see me with the springs of, vital, power in equal balance. Where the water wheels about from, the movements of, a dugong 324, there is an abyss, where it does so from the arresting, of its course, there is an abyss. Where it does so, and the water keeps flowing on, there is an abyss. There are nine abysses with their several names, and I have only exhibited three of them. Try and come with him again. Next day they came, and they again saw Hu Dees. But before he had settled himself in his position, the wizard lost himself and ran away. Pursue him, said Hu Dees, and Li Dees did so, but could not come up with him. He returned, and told Hu Dees, saying, There is an end of him, he is lost. 
I could not find him. Houdiz rejoined, I was showing him myself after the pattern of what was before I began to come from my author. I confronted him with pure vacancy, and an easy indifference. He did not know what I meant to represent. Now he thought it was the idea of exhausted strength, and now that of an onward flow, and therefore he ran away. After this, Lydes considered that he had not yet begun to learn, his master's doctrine. He returned to his house, and for three years did not go out. He did the cooking for his wife. He fed the pigs as if he were feeding men. He took no part or interest in occurring affairs. He put away the carving and sculpture about him, and returned to pure simplicity. Like a clod of earth he stood there in his bodily presence. Amid all distractions he was, silent, and shut up in himself. And in this way he continued to the end of his life. 6. Non-action, makes its exemplifier, the lord of all fame, non-action, serves him as, the treasury of all plans, non-action, fits him for, the burden of all offices. Non-action, makes him, the lord of all wisdom 325. The range of his action is inexhaustible, but there is nowhere any trace of his presence. He fulfills all that he has received from heaven 326, but he does not see that he was the recipient of anything. A pure vacancy, of all purpose, is what characterizes him. When the perfect man employs his mind, it is a mirror. It conducts nothing and anticipates nothing, it responds to, what is before it, but does not retain it. Thus he is able to deal successfully with all things, and injures none. 7. The ruler 327 of the Southern Ocean was Shu 328, the ruler of the Northern Ocean was Hu 329, and the ruler of the center was Chaos. Shu and Hu were continually meeting in the land of Chaos, who treated them very well. They consulted together how they might repay his kindness, and said, Men all have seven orifices for the purpose of seeing, hearing, eating, and breathing, while this, poor, ruler alone has not one. Let us try and make them for him. Accordingly they dug one orifice in him every day, and at the end of seven days chaos died 3.30. Book 8. Part 2. Section 1. Fien Mao, or Webbed Toes. 1. A ligament uniting the big toe with the other toes and an extra finger may be natural 331 growths, but they are more than is good for use. Excrescences on the person and hanging tumors are growths from the body, but they are unnatural additions to it. There are many arts of benevolence and righteousness, and the exercise of them is distributed among the five viscera 332. But this is not the correct method according to the characteristics of the Tao. Thus it is that the addition to the foot is but the attachment to it of so much useless flesh, and the addition to the hand is but the planting on it of a useless finger. So it is that, the connecting, the virtues, with the five viscera renders, by excess or restraint, the action of benevolence and righteousness bad, and leads to many arts as in the employment of, great, powers of hearing or of vision. 2. Therefore an extraordinary power of vision leads to the confusion of the five colors 333 and an excessive use of ornament. Its possessor, in the resplendence of his green and yellow, white and black, black and green, will not stop till he has become a Liku 334. An extraordinary power of hearing leads to a confusion of the five notes 335, and an excessive use of the six musical accords 336. Its possessor, in bringing out the tones from the instruments of metal, stone, silk, and bamboo, aided by the Huangkung and Talu, tubes, will not stop till he has become a Shikwang 337. So, excessive benevolence eagerly brings out virtues and restrains its, proper, nature, that, its possessor, may acquire a famous reputation, and cause all the organs and drums in the world to celebrate an unattainable condition. And he will not stop till he has become a Zong, Shan, 338 or a Shi, Zayu, 339. An extraordinary faculty in debating leads to the piling up of arguments like a builder with his bricks, or a netmaker with his string. Its possessor, cunningly contrives his sentences and enjoys himself in discussing what hardness is and what whiteness is, where views agree and where they differ, and pressing on, though weary, with short steps. With, 
a multitude of useless words to make good his opinion. Nor will he stop till he has become a young, ku, or mo, t, 340. But in all these cases the parties, with their redundant and divergent methods, do not proceed by that which is the correct path for all under the sky. That which is the perfectly correct path is not to lose the real character of the nature with which we are endowed. Hence the union, of parts, should not be considered redundance, nor their divergent superfluity. What is long should not be considered too long, nor what is short too short. A duck's legs, for instance, are short, but if we try to lengthen them, it occasions pain. And a crane's legs are long, but if we try to cut off a portion of them, it produces grief. Where a part is by nature long, we are not to amputate, or where it is by nature short, we are not to lengthen it. There is no occasion to try to remove any trouble that it may cause. 3. The presumption is that benevolence and righteousness are not constituents of humanity, for to how much anxiety does the exercise of them give rise. Moreover when another toe is united to the great toe, to divide the membrane makes you weep, and when there is an extra finger, to gnaw it off makes you cry out. In the one case there is a member too many, and in the other a member too few. But the anxiety and pain which they cause is the same. The benevolent men of the present age look at the evils of the world, as with eyes full of dust, and are filled with sorrow by them, while those who are not benevolent, having violently altered the character of their proper nature, greedily pursue after riches and honors. The presumption therefore is that benevolence and righteousness are contrary to the nature of man how full of trouble and contention has the world been ever since the three dynasties 341 began. And moreover, in employing the hook and line, the compass and square, to give things their correct form you must cut away portions of what naturally belongs to them. In employing strings and fastenings, glue and varnish to make things firm, you must violently interfere with their qualities. The bendings and stoppings in ceremonies and music, and the factitious expression in the countenance of benevolence and righteousness. In order to comfort the minds of men, these all show a failure in observing the regular principles, of the human constitution. All men are furnished with such regular principles, and according to them what is bent is not made so by the hook, nor what is straight by the line, nor what is round by the compass, nor what is square by the carpenter's square. Nor is adhesion effected by the use of glue and varnish, nor are things bound together by means of strings and bands. Thus it is that all in the world are produced what they are by a certain guidance, while they do not know how they are produced so. And they equally attain their several ends while they do not know how it is that they do so. Anciently it was so, and it is so now, and this constitution of things should not be made of none effect. Why then should benevolence and righteousness be employed as connecting, links, or as glue and varnish, strings and bands, and the enjoyment arising from the Tao and its characteristics be attributed to them? It is a deception practiced upon the world. Where the deception is small, there will be a change in the direction, of the objects pursued, where it is great, there will be a change of the nature itself. How do I know that it is so? Since he of the line of you called in his benevolence and righteousness to distort and vex the world, the world has not ceased to hurry about to execute their commands. Has not this been by means of benevolence and righteousness to change, men's views, of their nature? 4. I will therefore try and discuss this matter. From the commencement of the three dynasties downwards, nowhere has there been a man who has not under, the influence of external, things altered, the course of, his nature. Small men for the sake of gain have sacrificed their persons. Scholars for the sake of fame have done so, great officers, for the sake of their families, and sagely men, for the sake of the kingdom. These several classes, with different occupations, and different reputations, have agreed in doing injury to their nature and sacrificing their persons. Take the case of a male and female slave 342. They have to feed the sheep together, but they both lose their sheep. Ask the one what he was doing, and you will find that he was holding his bamboo tablets and reading. Ask the other, and you will find that she was amusing herself with some game 343. They were differently occupied, but they equally lose their sheep. 
So, Pai 344 died at the foot of Xiaoyang 345 to maintain his fame, and the robber Qi 346 died on the top of Tung Ling 347 in his eagerness for gain. Their deaths were occasioned by different causes, but they equally shortened their lives and did violence to their nature, why must we approve of Pai, and condemn the robber Qi? In cases of such sacrifice all over the world, when one makes it for the sake of benevolence and righteousness, the common people style him a superior man, but when another does it for the sake of goods and riches, they style him a small man. The action of sacrificing is the same, and yet we have the superior man and the small man. In the matter of destroying his life and doing injury to his nature, the robber Key simply did the same as Pi. Why must we make the distinction of superior man and small man between them? 5. Moreover, those who devote their nature to the pursuit of benevolence and righteousness, though they should attain to be like Zhang, Shan, and Shi, Zayu, I do not pronounce to be good. Those who devote it to the study of the five flavors, though they attain to be like Shuar 348, I do not pronounce to be good. Those who devote it to the discrimination of the five notes, though they attain to be like Shi Quang, I do not pronounce to be quick of hearing. Those who devote it to the appreciation of the five colors, though they attain to be like Li Ku, I do not pronounce to be clear of vision. When I pronounce men to be good, I am not speaking of their benevolence and righteousness. The goodness is simply their possession of the qualities of the Tao. When I pronounce them to be good, I am not speaking of what are called benevolence and righteousness. But simply of their allowing the nature with which they are endowed to have its free course. When I pronounce men to be quick of hearing, I do not mean that they hearken to anything else, but that they hearken to themselves. When I pronounce them to be clear of vision, I do not mean that they look to anything else, but that they look to themselves. Now those who do not see themselves but see other things, who do not get possession of themselves but get possession of other things, get possession of what belongs to others, and not of what is their own. And they reach forth to what attracts others, and not to that in themselves which should attract them. But thus reaching forth to what attracts others and not to what should attract them in themselves, be they like the robber key or like pie, they equally err in the way of excess or of perversity. What I am ashamed of is erring in the characteristics of the Tao, and therefore, in the higher sphere, I do not dare to insist on the practice of benevolence and righteousness, and, in the lower. I do not dare to allow myself either in the exercise of excess or perversity. Book 9 Part 2 Section 2 Ma T, or, Horses as Hoofs 1. Horses can with their hoofs tread on the hoarfrost and snow, and with their hair withstand the wind and cold, they feed on the grass and drink water. They prance with their legs and leap, this is the true nature of horses. Though there were made for them grand towers 349 and large dormitories, they would prefer not to use them. But when Palau 350, arose and, said, I know well how to manage horses, men proceeded, 351 to singe and mark them, to clip their hair, to pare their hoofs, to halter their heads, to bridle them and hobble them. And to confine them in stables and corrals. When subjected to this treatment, two or three in every ten of them died. Men proceeded further, to subject them to hunger and thirst, to gallop them and race them, and to make them go together in regular order. In front were the evils of the bit and ornamented breast bands, and behind were the terrors of the whip and switch. When so treated, more than half of them died. The th first, Potter said, I know well how to deal with clay. And, men proceeded, to mold it into circles as exact as if made by the compass, and into squares as exact as if formed by the measuring square. The th first, Carpenter said, I know well how to deal with wood. And, men proceeded, to make it bent as if by the application of the hook, and straight as if by the application of the plumb line. But is it the nature of clay and wood to require the application of the compass and square, of the hook and line? And yet age after age men have praised Palau, saying, he knew well how to manage horses, and also the, first, potter and carpenter, saying, they knew well how to deal with clay and wood. This is just the error committed by the governors of the world. 
2. According to my idea, those who knew well to govern mankind would not act so. The people had their regular and constant nature 352, they wove and made themselves clothes. They tilled the ground and got food 353. This was their common faculty. They were all one in this, and did not form themselves into separate classes, so were they constituted and left to their natural tendencies 354. Therefore in the age of perfect virtue men walked along with slow and grave step, and with their look steadily directed forwards. At that time, on the hills there were no footpaths, nor excavated passages. On the lakes there were no boats nor dams, all creatures lived in companies, and the places of their settlement were made close to one another. Birds and beasts multiplied to flocks and herds, the grass and trees grew luxuriant and long. In this condition the birds and beasts might be led about without feeling the constraint, the nest of the magpie might be climbed to, and peeped into. Yes, in the age of perfect virtue, men lived in common with birds and beasts, and were on terms of equality with all creatures, as forming one family, how could they know among themselves the distinctions of superior men and small men? Equally without knowledge, they did not leave, the path of, their natural virtue, equally free from desires, they were in the state of pure simplicity. In that state of pure simplicity, the nature of the people was what it ought to be. But when the sagely men appeared, limping and wheeling about in, the exercise of, benevolence, pressing along and standing on tiptoe in the doing of righteousness, then men universally began to be perplexed. Those sages also, went to excess in their performances of music, and in their gesticulations in the practice of ceremonies, and then men began to be separated from one another. If the raw materials had not been cut and hacked, who could have made a sacrificial vase from them? If the natural jade had not been broken and injured, who could have made the handles for the libation cups from it? If the attributes of the Tao had not been disallowed, how should they have preferred benevolence and righteousness? If the instincts of the nature had not been departed from, how should ceremonies and music have come into use? If the five colors had not been confused, how should the ornamental figures have been formed? If the five notes had not been confused, how should they have supplemented them by the musical accords? The cutting and hacking of the raw materials to form vessels was the crime of the skillful workman, the injury done to the characteristics of the Tao in order to the practice of benevolence and righteousness was the error of the sagely men. 3. Horses, when living in the open country, eat the grass, and drink water, when pleased, they intertwine their necks and rub one another, when enraged, they turn back to back and kick one another, this is all that they know to do. But if we put the yoke on their necks, with the moon-like frontlet displayed on all their foreheads, then they know to look slyly askance, to curve their necks, to rush viciously, trying to get the bit out of their mouths. And to filch the reins, from their driver. This knowledge of the horse and its ability thus to act the part of a thief is the crime of Palau. In the time of, the T, Ho, Su 355, the people occupied their dwellings without knowing what they were doing, and walked out without knowing where they were going. They filled their mouths with food and were glad. They slapped their stomachs to express their satisfaction. This was all the ability which they possessed. But when the sagely men appeared, with their bendings and stoppings in ceremonies and music to adjust the persons of all, and hanging up their benevolence and righteousness to excite the endeavors of all to reach them. In order to comfort their minds, then the people began to stump and limp about in their love of knowledge, and strove with one another in their pursuit of gain, so that there was no stopping them, this was the error of those sagely men. Book 10 Part 2 Section 3 Ku Ki, or Cutting Open Satchels 1. In taking precautions against thieves who cut open satchels, search bags, and break open boxes, people are sure to cord and fasten them well, and to employ strong bonds and clasps, and in this they are ordinarily said to show their wisdom. When a great thief comes, however, he shoulders the box, lifts up the satchel, carries off the bag, and runs away with them, afraid only that the cords, bonds, and clasps may not be secure. And in this case what was called the wisdom, of the owners, proves to be nothing but a collecting of the things for the great thief. Let me try and set this matter forth. 
Do not those who are vulgarly called wise prove to be collectors for the great thieves? And do not those who are called sages prove to be but guardians in the interest of the great thieves? How do I know that the case is so? Formerly, in the state of Kai, the neighboring towns could see one another, their cocks and dogs never ceased to answer the crowing and barking of other cocks and dogs, between them. The nets were set, in the water and on the land. And the plows and hoes were employed over more than a space of two thousand li square. All within its four boundaries, the establishment of the ancestral temples and of the altars of the land and grain, and the ordering of the hamlets and houses, and of every corner in the districts, large, medium, and small, were in all particulars according to the rules of the sages 356. So it was, but yet one morning, Tian Kangdi's 357 killed the ruler of Kai, and stole his state. And was it only the state that he stole? Along with it he stole also the regulations of the sages and wise men, observed in it. And so, though he got the name of being a thief and a robber, yet he himself continued to live as securely as Yao and Shun had done. Small states did not dare to find fault with him, great states did not dare to take him off. For twelve generations, his descendants, have possessed the state of Kai 358. Thus do we not have a case in which not only did, the party, steal the state of Kai, but at the same time the regulations of its sages and wise men, which thereby served to guard the person of him, thief and robber as he was? 2. Let me try to set forth this subject, still further. Have not there been among those vulgarly styled the wisest, such as have collected, their wealth, for the great chief? And among those styled the most sage such as have guarded it for him? How do I know that it has been so? Formerly, Lung Fong was beheaded, Pai Kan had his heart torn out, Kang Hung 359 was ripped open, and Di's Su 360 was reduced to pulp, in the Kiang. Worthy as those four men were, they did not escape such dreadful deaths. The followers of the robber Ki asked him, saying, Has the robber also any method or principle, in his proceedings? He replied, What profession is there which has not its principles? That the robber in his recklessness comes to the conclusion that there are valuable deposits in an apartment shows his sageness, that he is the first to enter it shows his bravery. That he is the last to quit it shows his righteousness, that he knows whether, the robbery, may be attempted or not shows his wisdom, and that he makes an equal division of the plunder shows his benevolence. Without all these five qualities no one in the world has ever attained to become a great robber. Looking at the subject in this way, we see that good men do not arise without having the principles of the sages, and that Qi could not have pursued his course without the same principles. But the good men in the world are few, and those who are not good are many, it follows that the sages benefit the world in a few instances and injure it in many. Hence it is that we have the sayings, when the lips are gone the teeth are cold 361. The poor wine of Lu gave occasion to the siege of Han 10362, when sages are born great robbers arise 363. When the stream is dried, the valley is empty, when the mound is leveled, the deep pool, beside it, is filled up. When the sages have died, the great robbers will not arise, the world would be at peace, and there would be no more troubles. While the sagely men have not died, great robbers will not cease to appear. The more right that is attached to, the views of, the sagely men for the government of the world, the more advantage will accrue to, such men as, the robber key. If we make for men pecks and bushels to measure, their wares, even by means of those pecks and bushels should we be teaching them to steal 364. If we make for them weights and steelyards to weigh, their wares, even by means of those weights and steelyards shall we be teaching them to steal. If we make for them tallies and seals to secure their good faith, even by means of those tallies and seals shall we be teaching them to steal. If we make for them benevolence and righteousness to make their doings correct, even by means of benevolence and righteousness shall we be teaching them to steal. How do I know that it is so? Here is one who steals a hook, for his girdle. He is put to death for it, here is another who steals a state, he becomes its prince. But it is at the gates of the princes that we find benevolence and righteousness, most strongly, professed. 
Is not this stealing benevolence and righteousness, sageness and wisdom? Thus they hasten to become great robbers, carry off princedoms, and steal benevolence and righteousness, with all the gains springing from the use of pecks and bushels, weights and steelyards. Tallies and seals even the rewards of carriages and coronets have no power to influence, to a different course, and the terrors of the axe have no power to restrain in such cases. The giving of so great gain to robbers, like, key, and making it impossible to restrain them, this is the error committed by the sages. 3. In accordance with this it is said, fish should not be taken from, the protection of, the deep waters. The agencies for the profit of a state should not be shown to men 365. But those sages, and their teachings, are the agencies for the profit of the world, and should not be exhibited to it. Therefore if an end were put to sageness and wisdom put away, the great robbers would cease to arise. If jade were put away and pearls broken to bits, the small thieves would not appear. If tallies were burned and seals broken in pieces, the people would become simple and unsophisticated. If pecks were destroyed and steelyards snapped in two, the people would have no wrangling. If the rules of the sages were entirely set aside in the world, a beginning might be made of reasoning with the people. If the six musical accords were reduced to a state of utter confusion, organs and lutes all burned, and the ears of the musicians like the blind quang stopped up, all men would begin to possess and employ their natural power of hearing. If elegant ornaments were abolished, the five embellishing colors disused, and the eyes of men like Li Ku glued up, all men would begin to possess and employ their natural power of vision. If the hook and line were destroyed, the compass and square thrown away, and the fingers of men, like, the artful Kui 366 smashed, all men would begin to possess and employ their, natural, skill. As it is said, the greatest art is like stupidity 367. If conduct such as that of Zhang, Shan, and Shi, Kaiyu, were discarded, the mouths of Yang, Ku, and Mo, T, gagged, and benevolence and righteousness seized and thrown aside, the virtue of all men would begin to display its mysterious excellence. When men possessed and employed their, natural, power of vision, there would be no distortion in the world. When they possessed and employed their, natural, power of hearing, there would be no distractions in the world. When they possessed and employed their, natural, faculty of knowledge, there would be no delusions in the world. When they possessed and employed their, natural, virtue, there would be no depravity in the world. Men like Zhang, Shan, Shi, Kaiyu, Yang, Ku, Mo, T, Shi Quang, the musician, the artist Kui, and Li Ku, all display their qualities outwardly, and set the world in a blaze, of admiration, and confound it, a method which is of no use. 4. Are you, sir, unacquainted with the age of perfect virtue? Anciently there were Yang Kang, Ta Thing, Pahuang, Kongyang, Li Lu, Li Ku, Xinyuan, Ho Su, Zun Lu, Kuyang, Fu Shi, and Shan Nang 368. In their times the people made knots on cords in carrying on their affairs. They thought their, simple, food pleasant, and their, plain, clothing beautiful. They were happy in their, simple, manners, and felt at rest in their, poor, dwellings. The people of, neighboring states might be able to descry one another, the voices of their cocks and dogs might be heard, all the way, from one to the other, they might not die till they were old. And yet all their life they would have no communication together 369. In those times perfect good order prevailed. Nowadays, however, such is the state of things that you shall see the people stretching out their necks, and standing on tiptoe, while they say, in such and such a place there is a wise and able man. Then they carry with them whatever dry provisions they may have left, and hurry towards it, abandoning their parents in their homes, and neglecting the service of their rulers abroad. Their footsteps may be traced in lines from one state to another, and the ruts of their chariot wheels also for more than a thousand li. This is owing to the error of their superiors in their, inordinate, fondness for knowledge. When those superiors do really love knowledge, but do not follow the, the proper course, the whole world is thrown into great confusion. How do I know that the case is so? 
The knowledge shown in the making of bows, crossbows, hand nets, stringed arrows, and contrivances with springs is great, but the birds are troubled by them above. The knowledge shown in the hooks, baits, various kinds of nets, and bamboo traps is great, but the fishes are disturbed by them in the waters. The knowledge shown in the arrangements for setting nets, and the nets and snares themselves, is great, but the animals are disturbed by them in the marshy grounds. So, the versatility shown in artful deceptions becoming more and more pernicious, in ingenious discussions as to what is hard and what is white, and in attempts to disperse the dust and reconcile different views, is great. But the common people are perplexed by all the sophistry. Hence there is great disorder continually in the world, and the guilt of it is due to that fondness for knowledge. Thus it is that all men know to seek for the knowledge that they have not attained to. And do not know to seek for that which they already have, in themselves, and that they know to condemn what they do not approve, in others, and do not know to condemn what they have allowed in themselves. It is this which occasions the great confusion and disorder. It is just as if, above, the brightness of the sun and moon were darkened, as if, beneath, the productive vigor of the hills and streams were dried up. And as if, between, the operation of the four seasons were brought to an end in which case there would not be a single weak and wriggling insect, nor any plant that grows up, which would not lose its proper nature. Great indeed is the disorder produced in the world by the love of knowledge. From the time of the three dynasties downwards it has been so. The plain and honest-minded people are neglected, and the plausible representations of restless spirits received with pleasure, the quiet and unexciting method of non-action is put away, and pleasure taken in ideas garrulously expressed. It is this garrulity of speech which puts the world in disorder. Book 11 Part 2 Section 4 Zayu, or, Letting Be, and Exercising Forbearance 1. I have heard of letting the world be, and exercising forbearance, I have not heard of governing the world. Letting be is from the fear that men, when interfered with, will carry their nature beyond its normal condition, exercising forbearance is from the fear that men, when not so dealt with, will alter the characteristics of their nature. When all men do not carry their nature beyond its normal condition, nor alter its characteristics, the good government of the world is secured. Formerly, Yao's government of the world made men look joyful. But when they have this joy in their nature, there is a want of its, proper, placidity. The government of the world by Qi, on the contrary, made men look distressed. But when their nature shows the symptoms of distress, there is a want of its, proper, contentment. The want of placidity and the want of contentment are contrary to the character, of the nature. And where this obtains, it is impossible that any man or state should anywhere abide long. Are men exceedingly joyful, the yang or element of expansion in them is too much developed. Are they exceedingly irritated? The yin or opposite element is too much developed. When those elements thus predominate in men, it is as if 370, the four seasons were not to come, at their proper times, and the harmony of cold and heat were not to be maintained. Would there not result injury to the bodies of men? Men's joy and dissatisfaction are made to arise where they ought not to do so, their movements are all uncertain, they lose the mastery of their thoughts. They stop short midway, and do not finish what they have begun. In this state of things the world begins to have lofty aims, and jealous dislikes, ambitious courses, and fierce animosities, and then we have actions like those of the robber Qi, or of Zhang, Shan, and Shi, Zayu, 371. If now the whole world were taken to reward the good it would not suffice, nor would it be possible with it to punish the bad. Thus the world, great as it is, not sufficing for rewards and punishments, from the time of the three dynasties downwards, there has been nothing but bustle and excitement. Always occupied with rewards and punishments, what leisure have men had to rest in the instincts of the nature with which they are endowed? 2. Moreover, Delight in the power of vision leads to excess in the pursuit of ornamental colors. Delight in the power of hearing, to excess in seeking the pleasures of sound, delight in benevolence tends to disorder that virtue, as proper to the nature, delight in righteousness sets the man in opposition to what is right in reason. 
Delight in, the practice of, ceremonies is helpful to artful forms, delight in music leads to voluptuous airs, delight in sageness is helpful to ingenious contrivances, delight in knowledge contributes to fault-finding. If all men were to rest in the instincts of their nature, to keep or to extinguish these eight delights might be a matter of indifference. But if they will not rest in those instincts, then those eight delights begin to be imperfectly and unevenly developed or violently suppressed, and the world is thrown into disorder. But when men begin to honor them, and to long for them, how great is the deception practiced on the world! And not only, when, a performance of them, is once over, do they not have done with them, but they prepare themselves, as, with fasting to describe them, they seem to kneel reverentially when they bring them forward. And they go through them with the excitements of music and singing. And then what can be done, to remedy the evil of them? Therefore the superior man, who feels himself constrained to engage in the administration of the world will find it his best way to do nothing 372. In, that policy of, doing nothing, he can rest in the instincts of the nature with which he is endowed. Hence he who will administer, the government of, the world honoring it as he honors his own person, may have that government committed to him, and he who will administer it loving it as he loves his own person, may have it entrusted to him 373. Therefore, if the superior man will keep, the faculties lodged in, his five viscera unemployed, and not display his powers of seeing and hearing, while he is motionless as a representative of the dead, his dragon-like presence will be seen. While he is profoundly silent, the thunder, of his words, will resound, while his movements are, unseen, like those of a spirit, all heavenly influences will follow them. While he is, thus, unconcerned and does nothing, his genial influence will attract and gather all things round him, what leisure has he to do anything more for the government of the world? 3. Ku 374 asked Lao Tan, saying, If you do not govern the world, how can you make men's minds good? The reply was, Take care how you meddle with and disturb men's minds. The mind, if pushed about, gets depressed. If helped forward, it gets exalted. Now exalted, now depressed, here it appears as a prisoner, and there as a wrathful fury. At one time, it becomes pliable and soft, yielding to what is hard and strong. At another, it is sharp as the sharpest corner, fit to carve or chisel, stone or jade. Now it is hot as a scorching fire, and anon it is cold as ice. It is so swift that while one is bending down and lifting up his head, it shall twice have put forth a soothing hand beyond the four seas. Resting, it is still as a deep abyss, moving, it is like one of the bodies in the sky. In its resolute haughtiness, it refuses to be bound, such is the mind of man 375. Anciently, Huang Ti was the first to meddle with and disturb the mind of man with his benevolence and righteousness 376. After him, Yao and Shun wore their thighs bare and the hair off the calves of their legs, in their labors to nourish the bodies of the people. They toiled painfully with all the powers in their five viscera at the practice of their benevolence and righteousness, they tasked their blood and breath to make out a code of laws, and after all they were unsuccessful. On this Yao sent away Huan Tao to Kung Hill, and, the chiefs of, the three Miao to Sanwei, and banished the minister of works to the dark capital, so unequal had they been to cope with the world 377. Then we are carried on to the kings of the three, dynasties, when the world was in a state of great distraction. Of the lowest type of character there were Qi and Qi, of a higher type there were Zhang, Shan, and Shi, Zayu. At the same time there arose the classes of the literati and the Mahists. Hereupon, complacency in, and hatred of, one another produced mutual suspicions, the stupid and the wise imposed on one another, the good and the bad condemned one another. The boastful and the sincere interchanged their recriminations, and the world fell into decay. Views as to what was greatly virtuous did not agree, and the nature with its endowments became as if shriveled by fire or carried away by a flood. All were eager for knowledge, and the people were exhausted with their searchings, after what was good. On this the axe and the saw were brought into play, guilt was determined as by the plumb line and death inflicted. The hammer and gouge did their work. The world fell into great disorder, 
and presented the appearance of a jagged mountain ridge. The crime to which all was due was the meddling with and disturbing men's minds. The effect was that men of ability and worth lay concealed at the foot of the crags of Mount Tai, and princes of ten thousand chariots were anxious and terrified in their ancestral temples. In the present age those who have been put to death in various ways lie thick as if pillowed on each other, those who are wearing the Kang press on each other, on the roads. Those who are suffering the bastinado can see each other, all over the land. And now the literati and the mahists begin to stand, on tiptoe and with bare arms, among the fettered and manacled crowd. Ah! Extreme is their shamelessness, and their failure to see the disgrace. Strange that we should be slow to recognize their sageness and wisdom in the bars of the Kang, and their benevolence and righteousness in the rivets of the fetters and handcuffs. How do we know that Zhang and Xi are not the whizzing arrows of Qi and Qi 378? Therefore it is said, abolish sageness and cast away knowledge, and the world will be brought to a state of great order 379. 4. Huang Ti had been on the throne for 19 years 380, and his ordinances were in operation all through the kingdom, when he heard that Kuang Kang Di's 381 was living on the summit of Kung, Thung 382, and went to see him. I have heard, he said, that you, sir, are well acquainted with the perfect Tao. I venture to ask you what is the essential thing in it. I wish to take the subtlest influences of heaven and earth, and assist with them the growth of the five cereals for the better nourishment of the people. I also wish to direct the operation of the yin and yang, so as to secure the comfort of all living beings. How shall I proceed to accomplish those objects? Quan Kang Di's replied, What you wish to ask about is the original substance of all things 383, what you wish to have the direction of is that substance as it was shattered and divided 384. According to your government of the world, the vapors of the clouds, before they were collected, would descend in rain, the herbs and trees would shed their leaves before they became yellow. And the light of the sun and moon would hasten to extinction. Your mind is that of a flatterer with his plausible words, it is not fit that I should tell you the perfect Tao. Huang Ti withdrew, gave up, his government of, the kingdom, built himself a solitary apartment, spread in it a mat of the white mao grass, dwelt in it unoccupied for three months, and then went again to seek an interview with, the recluse. Quan Kang Di's was then lying down with his head to the south. Huang Ti, with an air of deferential submission, went forward on his knees, twice bowed low with his face to the ground, and asked him, saying, I have heard that you, sir, are well acquainted with the perfect Tao. I venture to ask how I should rule my body, in order that it may continue for a long time. Quan Kang Di's hastily rose, and said, A good question. Come and I will tell you the perfect Tao. Its essence is, surrounded with, the deepest obscurity. Its highest reach is in darkness and silence. There is nothing to be seen, nothing to be heard. When it holds the spirit in its arms in stillness, then the bodily form of itself will become correct. You must be still, you must be pure. Not subjecting your body to toil, not agitating your vital force, then you may live for long. When your eyes see nothing, your ears hear nothing, and your mind knows nothing, your spirit will keep your body, and the body will live long. Watch over what is within you, shut up the avenues that connect you with what is external, much knowledge is pernicious. I, will, proceed with you to the summit of the grand brilliance, where we come to the source of the bright and expanding, element. I will enter with you the gate of the deepest obscurity, where we come to the source of the dark and repressing, element. There heaven and earth have their controllers, there the yin and yang have their repositories. Watch over and keep your body, and all things will of themselves give it vigor. I maintain the, original, unity, of these elements, and dwell in the harmony of them. In this way one have cultivated myself for one thousand and two hundred years, and my bodily form has undergone no decay 385. Huang Ti twice bowed low with his head to the ground, and said, In Quan Kang Di's we have an example of what is called Heaven 386. The other said, Come, and I will tell you, the perfect Tao, is something inexhaustible, and yet men all think it has an end, it is something unfathomable, 
and yet men all think its extreme limit can be reached. He who attains to my Tao, if he be in a high position, will be one of the august ones, and in a low position, will be a king. He who fails in attaining it, in his highest attainment will see the light, but will descend and be of the earth. At present all things are produced from the earth and return to the earth. Therefore I will leave you, and enter the gate of the unending, to enjoy myself in the fields of the illimitable. I will blend my light with that of the sun and moon, and will endure while heaven and earth endure. If men agree with my views, I will be unconscious of it, if they keep far apart from them, I will be unconscious of it. They may all die, and I will abide alone 387. 5. Yun Kang 388, rambling to the east, having been borne along on a gentle breeze 389, suddenly encountered Hung Meng, who was rambling about, slapping his buttocks 390 and hopping like a bird. Amazed at the sight, Yun Kang stood reverentially, and said to the other, Venerable Sir, who are you? And why are you doing this? Hung Meng went on slapping his buttocks and hopping like a bird, but replied, I am enjoying myself. Yun Kang said, I wish to ask you a question. Hung Meng lifted up his head, looked at the stranger, and said, Pooh. Yun Kang, however, continued, The breath of heaven is out of harmony, the breath of earth is bound up. The six elemental influences 391 do not act in concord, the four seasons do not observe their proper times. Now I wish to blend together the essential qualities of those six influences in order to nourish all living things, how shall I go about it? Hung Meng slapped his buttocks, hopped about, and shook his head, saying, I do not know, I do not know. Yun Kiang could not pursue his question. But three years afterwards, when, again, rambling in the east, as he was passing by the wild of Sung, he happened to meet Hung Meng. Delighted with the rencontre, he hastened to him, and said, Have you forgotten me, O heaven? Have you forgotten me, O heaven? At the same time, he bowed twice with his head to the ground, wishing to receive his instructions. Hung Meng said, wandering listlessly about, I know not what I seek. Carried on by a wild impulse, I know not where I am going. I wander about in the strange manner, which you have seen, and see that nothing proceeds without method and order 392, what more should I know? Yun Kiang replied, I also seem carried on by an aimless influence, and yet the people follow me wherever I go. I cannot help their doing so. But now as they thus imitate me, I wish to hear a word from you, in the case, dot. The other said, what disturbs the regular method of heaven, comes into collision with the nature of things, prevents the accomplishment of the mysterious, operation of, heaven, scatters the herds of animals, makes the birds all sing at night. Is calamitous to vegetation, and disastrous to all insects. All this is owing, I conceive, to the error of governing men. What then, said Yun Kiang, shall I do? Ah, said the other, you will only injure them. I will leave you in my dancing way, and return to my place. Yun Kiang rejoined, It has been a difficult thing to get this meeting with you, O oh heaven. I should like to hear from you a word, more, dot. Hung Meng said, Ah. Your mind, needs to be, nourished. Do you only take the position of doing nothing, and things will of themselves become transformed. Neglect your body, cast out from you your power of hearing and sight, forget what you have in common with things. Cultivate a grand similarity with the chaos of the plastic ether, unloose your mind, set your spirit free, be still as if you had no soul. Of all the multitude of things every one returns to its root. Every one returns to its root, and does not know, that it is doing so. They all are as in the state of chaos, and during all their existence they do not leave it 393. If they knew, that they were returning to their root, they would be, consciously, leaving it. They do not ask its name, they do not seek to spy out their nature, and thus it is that things come to life of themselves. Yun Kang said, Heaven, you have conferred on me, the knowledge of, your operation, and revealed to me the mystery of it. All my life I had been seeking for it, and now I have obtained it. He then bowed twice, with his head to the ground, arose, took his leave, and walked away. 6. 
The ordinary men of the world 394 all rejoice in men's agreeing with themselves, and dislike men's being different from themselves. This rejoicing and this dislike arise from their being bent on making themselves distinguished above all others. But have they who have this object at heart so risen out above all others? They depend on them to rest quietly, in the position which they desire, and their knowledge is not equal to the multitude of the arts of all those others. 395. When they wish again to administer a state for its ruler, they proceed to employ all the methods which the kings of the three dynasties considered profitable without seeing the evils of such a course. This is to make the state depend on the peradventure of their luck. But how seldom it is that that peradventure does not issue in the ruin of the state. Not once in ten thousand instances will such men preserve a state. Not once will they succeed, and in more than ten thousand cases will they ruin it. Alas that the possessors of territory, the rulers of states, comma, should not know the danger, of employing such men. Now the possessors of territory possess the greatest of, all, things. Possessing the greatest of all things, possessing, that is, men, comma, they should not try to deal with them as, simply, things. And it is he who is not a thing, himself, that is therefore able to deal with, all, things as they severally require. When, a ruler, clearly understands that he who should so deal with all things is not a thing himself, will he only rule the kingdom? He will go out and in throughout the universe, at his pleasure. He will roam over the nine regions 396, alone in going, alone in coming. Him we call the sole possessor, of this ability, and the sole possessor, of this ability, is what is called the noblest of all. The teaching of, this, great man goes forth as the shadow from the substance, as the echo responds to the sound. When questioned, he responds, exhausting, from his own stores, all that is in the, inquirer's, mind, as if front to front with all under heaven. His resting place gives forth no sound, his sphere of activity has no restriction of place. He conducts everyone to his proper goal, proceeding to it and bringing him back to it as by his own movement. His movements have no trace, his going forth and his re-enterings have no deviation. His course is like that of the sun without beginning, or ending. If you would praise or discourse about his personality, he is united with the great community of existences. He belongs to that great community, and has no individual self. Having no individual self, how should he have anything that can be called his? If you look at those who have what they call their own, they are the superior men of former times. If you look at him who has nothing of the kind, he is the friend of heaven and earth. 7. Mean, and yet demanding to be allowed their free course, such are things. Lo, and yet requiring to be relied on, such are the people. Hidden, as to their issues, and yet requiring to be done, such are affairs. Coarse, and yet necessary to be set forth, such are laws. Remote, and yet necessary to have dwelling, in oneself. Such is righteousness. Near, and yet necessary to be widely extended, such is benevolence. Restrictive, and yet necessary to be multiplied, such are ceremonies. Lodged in the center, and yet requiring to be exalted, such is virtue. Always one, and yet requiring to be modified, such is the Tao. Spirit-like, and yet requiring to be exercised, such is heaven 397. Therefore the sages contemplated heaven, but did not assist it. They tried to perfect their virtue, but did not allow it to embarrass them. They proceeded according to the Tao, but did not lay any plans. They associated benevolence, with all their doings, but did not rely on it. They pursued righteousness extensively, but did not try to accumulate it. They responded to ceremonies, but did not conceal, their opinion as to the troublesomeness of them. They engaged in affairs as they occurred, and did not decline them. They strove to render their laws uniform, but, feared that confusion, might arise from them. They relied upon the people, and did not set light by them. They depended on things as their instruments, and did not discard them. 398. They did not think things equal to what they employed them for, but yet they did not see that they could do without employing them. Those who do not understand heaven are not pure in their virtue. 
those who do not comprehend the Tao have no course which they can pursue successfully. Alas for them who do not clearly understand the Tao. What is it that we call the Tao 399? There is the Tao, or way of heaven, and there is the Tao, or way of man. Doing nothing and yet attracting all honor is the way of heaven, doing and being embarrassed thereby is the way of man. It is the way of heaven that plays the part of the Lord, it is the way of man that plays the part of the servant. The way of heaven and the way of man are far apart. They should be clearly distinguished from each other. Book 12 Part 2 Section 5 TNT, or, Heaven and Earth 1. Notwithstanding the greatness of heaven and earth, their transforming power proceeds from one lathe. Notwithstanding the number of the myriad things, the government of them is one and the same, notwithstanding the multitude of mankind, the Lord of them is there, one, ruler four hundred. The rulers, course, should proceed from the qualities, of the Tao, and be perfected by heaven 401, when it is so, it is called, mysterious and sublime. The ancients ruled the world by doing nothing, simply by this attribute of heaven 402. If we look at their words 403 in the light of the Tao, we see that, the appellation for the ruler of the world 404 was correctly assigned. If we look in the same light at the distinctions which they instituted, we see that, the separation of ruler and ministers was right. If we look at the abilities which they called forth in the same light, we see that the duties of, all the offices were well performed. And if we look generally in the same way at all things, we see that, their response, to this rule, was complete 405. Therefore that which pervades, the action of, heaven and earth is, this one, attribute. That which operates in all things is, this one, course, that by which their superiors govern the people is the business, of the various departments, and that by which aptitude is given to ability is skill. The skill was manifested in all the departments of, business, those departments were all administered in righteousness, the righteousness was, the outflow of, the natural virtue, the virtue was manifested according to the Tao. And the Tao was according to, the pattern of, heaven. Hence it is said 406, the ancients who had the nourishment of the world wished for nothing and the world had enough, they did nothing and all things were transformed. Their stillness was abysmal, and the people were all composed. The record says 407, when the one, Tao, pervades it, all business is completed. When the mind gets to be free from all aim, even the spirits submit. 2. The Master said 408, it is the Tao that overspreads and sustains all things. How great it is in its overflowing influence. The superior man ought by all means to remove from his mind, all that is contrary to it. Acting without action is what is called heaven, like. Speech coming forth of itself is what is called, a mark of, the, true, virtue. Loving men and benefiting things is what is called benevolence. Seeing wherein things that are different yet agree is what is called being great. Conduct free from the ambition of being distinguished above others is what is called being generous. The possession in himself of a myriad points of difference is what is called being rich. Therefore to hold fast the natural attributes is what is called the guiding line, of government, 409. The perfecting of those attributes is what is called its establishment, accordance with the Tao is what is called being complete, and not allowing anything external to affect the will is what is called being perfect. When the superior man understands these ten things, he keeps all matters as it were sheathed in himself, showing the greatness of his mind, and through the outflow of his doings, all things move, and come to him. Being such, he lets the gold he hid in the hill, and the pearls in the deep, he considers not property or money to be any gain, he keeps aloof from riches and honors, he rejoices not in long life, and grieves not for early death. He does not account prosperity a glory, nor is ashamed of indigence, he would not grasp at the gain of the whole world to be held as his own private portion, he would not desire to rule over the whole world as his own private distinction. His distinction is in understanding that all things belong to the one treasury, and that death and life should be viewed in the same way 410. 3. The Master said, How still and deep is the place where the Tao resides! 
how limpid is its purity. Metal and stone without it would give forth no sound. They have indeed the power of sound in them, but if they be not struck, they do not emit it. Who can determine the qualities that are in all things? The man of kingly qualities holds on his way unoccupied, and is ashamed to busy himself with the conduct of affairs. He establishes himself in what is the root and source of his capacity, and his wisdom grows to be spirit like. In this way, his attributes become more and more great, and when his mind goes forth, whatever things come in his way, it lays hold of them and deals with them. Thus, if there were not the Tao, the bodily form would not have life, and its life, without the attributes, of the Tao, would not be manifested. Is not he who preserves the body and gives the fullest development to the life, who establishes the attributes of the Tao and clearly displays it, possessed of kingly qualities? How majestic is he in his sudden issuings forth, and in his unexpected movements, when all things follow him, this we call the man whose qualities fit him to rule. He sees where there is the deepest obscurity, he hears where there is no sound. In the midst of the deepest obscurity, he alone sees and can distinguish various objects, in the midst of a soundless abyss, he alone can hear a harmony of notes. Therefore where one deep is succeeded by a greater, he can people all with things, where one mysterious range is followed by another that is more so, he can lay hold of the subtlest character of each. In this way in his intercourse with all things, while he is farthest from having anything, he can yet give to them what they seek, while he is always hurrying forth, he yet returns to his resting place, now large, now small, now long, now short. Now distant, now near 411. For, Huang Ti, enjoying himself on the north of the red water, ascended to the height of the Quanluan mountain, and having looked towards the south, was returning home when he lost his dark-colored pearl 412. He employed wisdom to search for it, but he could not find it. He employed, the clear-sighted, Li Ku to search for it, but he could not find it. He employed, the vehement debater, Qi Kao to search for it, but he could not find it. He then employed purposeless 413, who found it, on which Huang Ti said, how strange that it was purposeless who was able to find it. 5. The teacher of Yao was Su Yu, of Su Yu, Ni Qiu, of Ni Qiu, Wang Ai, of Wang Ai, Fei I 414. Yao asked Su Yu, saying, Is Ni Qiu fit to be the correlate of Heaven 415? If you think he is, I will avail myself of the services of Wang Ai to constrain him, to take my place. Dot. Su Yu replied, Such a measure would be hazardous, and full of peril to the kingdom. The character of Ni Kyu is this, he is acute, perspicacious, shrewd and knowing, ready in reply, sharp in retort, and hasty. His natural, endowments, surpass those of other men, but by his human qualities he seeks to obtain the heavenly gift, he exercises his discrimination in suppressing his errors, but he does not know what is the source from which his errors arise. Make him the correlate of heaven. He would employ the human qualities, so that no regard would be paid to the heavenly gift. Moreover, he would assign different functions to the different parts of the one person 416. Moreover, honor would be given to knowledge, and he would have his plans take effect with the speed of fire. Moreover, he would be the slave of everything he initiated. Moreover, he would be embarrassed by things. Moreover, he would be looking all round for the response of things to his measures. Moreover, he would be responding to the opinion of the multitude as to what was right. Moreover, he would be changing as things changed, and would not begin to have any principle of constancy. How can such a man be fit to be the correlate of heaven? Nevertheless, as there are the smaller branches of a family and the common ancestor of all its branches, he might be the father of a branch, but not the father of the fathers of all the branches 417. Such government, as he would conduct, would lead to disorder. It would be calamity in one in the position of a minister, and ruin if he were in the position of the sovereign. 6. Yao was looking about him at Wa 418, the border warden of which said, Ha! The sage! Let me ask blessings on the sage. May he live long. Yao said, Hush, 
but the other went on, may the sage become rich. Yao, again, said, hush. But, the warden, continued, may the sage have many sons. When Yao repeated his, hush, the warden said, long life, riches, and many sons are what men wish for, how is it that you alone do not wish for them? Yao replied, many sons bring many fears, riches bring many troubles, and long life gives rise to many obloquies. These three things do not help to nourish virtue, and therefore I wish to decline them. The warden rejoined, at first I considered you to be a sage, now I see in you only a superior man. Heaven, in producing the myriads of the people, is sure to have appointed for them their several offices. If you had many sons, and gave them, all their, offices, what would you have to fear? If you had riches, and made other men share them with you, what trouble would you have? The sage finds his dwelling like the quail, without any choice of its own, and is fed like the fledgling, he is like the bird which passes on, through the air, and leaves no trace, of its flight. When good order prevails in the world, he shares in the general prosperity. When there is no such order, he cultivates his virtue, and seeks to be unoccupied. After a thousand years, tired of the world, he leaves it, and ascends among the immortals. He mounts on the white clouds, and arrives at the place of God. The three forms of evil do not reach him, his person is always free from misfortune, what obloquy has he to incur? With this the border warden left him. Yao followed him, saying, I beg to ask, but the other said, Be gone. 7. When Yao was ruling the world, Pekang Di's Kao 419 was appointed by him prince of one of the states. From Yao, afterwards, the throne passed to Shun, and from Shun, again, to Yu, and, then, Pekang Di's Kao resigned his principality and began to cultivate the ground. You went to see him, and found him plowing in the open country. Hurrying to him, and bowing low in acknowledgement of his superiority, you then stood up, and asked him, saying, Formerly, when Yao was ruling the world, you, sir, were appointed prince of a state. He gave his sovereignty to Shun, and Shun gave his to me, when you, sir, resigned your dignity, and are, now, plowing, here, I venture to ask the reason of your conduct. Dee's cow said, when Yao ruled the world, the people stimulated one another, to what was right, without his offering them rewards, and stood in awe, of doing wrong, without his threatening them with punishments. Now you employ both rewards and punishments, and the people notwithstanding are not good. Their virtue will from this time decay, punishments will from this time prevail, the disorder of future ages will from this time begin. Why do you, my master, not go away, and not interrupt my work? With this he resumed his plowing with his head bent down, and did not, again, look round. 8. In the grand beginning, of all things, there was nothing in all the vacancy of space. There was nothing that could be named 420. It was in this state that there arose the first existence 421, the first existence, but still without bodily shape. From this things could then be produced, receiving, what we call their proper character 422. That which had no bodily shape was divided 423, and then without intermission there was what we call the process of conferring 424. The two processes, continuing in operation, things were produced. As things were completed, there were produced the distinguishing lines of each, which we call the bodily shape. That shape was the body preserving in it the spirit 425, and each had its peculiar manifestation, which we call its nature. When the nature has been cultivated, it returns to its proper character. And when that has been fully reached, there is the same condition as at the beginning. That sameness is pure vacancy, and the vacancy is great. It is like the closing of the beak and silencing the singing, of a bird. That closing and silencing is like the union of heaven and earth, at the beginning, for twenty-six. The union, effected, as it is, might seem to indicate stupidity or darkness, but it is what we call the, mysterious quality, existing at the beginning. It is the same as the grand submission, to the natural course. 9. The Master 427 asked Lao Tan, saying, Some men regulate the Tao, as by a law, which they have only to follow, a thing, they say, is admissible or it is inadmissible. 
it is so, or it is not so. They are like, the sophists who say that they can distinguish what is hard and what is white as clearly as if the objects were houses suspended in the sky. Can such men be said to be sages 428? The reply was, they are like the busy underlings of a court, who toil their bodies and distress their minds with their various artifices. Dogs, employed, to their sorrow to catch the yak, or monkeys 429 that are brought from their forests, for their tricksiness. Caillou, I tell you this. It is what you cannot hear, and what you cannot speak of, of those who have their heads and feet, and yet have neither minds nor ears, there are multitudes. While of those who have their bodies, and at the same time preserve that which has no bodily form or shape, there are really none. It is not in their movements or stoppages, their dying or living, their falling and rising again, that this is to be found. The regulation of the course lies in, their dealing with, the human element in them. When they have forgotten external things, and have also forgotten the heavenly element in them, they may be named men who have forgotten themselves. The man who has forgotten himself is he of whom it is said that he has become identified with heaven 430. 10. At an interview with Ki K, Kiang Lu Min 431 said to him, Our ruler of Lu asked to receive my instructions. I declined, on the ground that I had not received any message 432 for him. Afterwards, however, I told him, my thoughts. I do not know whether, what I said, was right or not, and I beg to repeat it to you. I said to him, you must strive to be courteous and to exercise self-restraint you must distinguish the public-spirited and loyal, and repress the cringing and selfish, who among the people will in that case dare not to be in harmony with you. Ki K laughed quietly and said, Your words, my master, as a description of the right course for a T or king, were like the threatening movement of its arms by a mantis which would thereby stop the advance of a carriage. Inadequate to accomplish your object. And moreover, if he guided himself by your directions, it would be as if he were to increase the dangerous height of his towers and add to the number of his valuables collected in them. The multitudes, of the people, would leave their, old, ways, and bend their steps in the same direction. Kiang Lu Min was awestruck, and said in his fright, I am startled by your words, master, nevertheless, I should like to hear you describe the influence, which a ruler should exert, dot. The other said, if a great sage ruled the kingdom, he would stimulate the minds of the people, and cause them to carry out his instructions fully, and change their manners. He would take their minds which had become evil and violent and extinguish them, carrying them all forward to act in accordance with the good, will belonging to them as individuals, as if they did it of themselves from their nature. While they knew not what it was that made them do so. Would such an one be willing to look up to Yao and shun in their instruction of the people as his elder brothers? He would treat them as his juniors, belonging himself to the period of the original plastic ether 433. His wish would be that all should agree with the virtue, of that early period, and quietly rest in it. 11. Dizkung Kung had been rambling in the south in Ku, and was returning to Xin. As he passed, a place, on the north of the Han, he saw an old man who was going to work on his vegetable garden. He had dug his channels, gone to the well, and was bringing from it in his arms a jar of water to pour into them. Toiling away, he expended a great deal of strength, but the result which he accomplished was very small. Dees Kung said to him, There is a contrivance here, by means of which a hundred plots of ground may be irrigated in one day. With the expenditure of a very little strength, the result accomplished is great. Would you, master, not like, to try it? The gardener looked up at him, and said, How does it work? Dees Kung said, It is a lever made of wood, heavy behind, and light in front. It raises the water as quickly as you could do with your hand, or as it bubbles over from a boiler. Its name is a shaduf. The gardener put on an angry look, laughed, and said, I have heard from my teacher that, where there are ingenious contrivances, there are sure to be subtle doings, and that, where there are subtle doings, there is sure to be a scheming mind. But, when there is a scheming mind in the breast, its pure simplicity is impaired. When this pure simplicity is impaired, the spirit becomes unsettled, and the unsettled spirit is not the proper residence of the Tao. It is not that I do not know, 
the contrivance which you mention, but I should be ashamed to use it. At these words, these come looked blank and ashamed, he hung down his head, and made no reply. After an interval, the gardener said to him, Who are you, sir? A disciple of Kung Kaiu, was the reply. The other continued, Are you not the scholar whose great learning makes you comparable to a sage, who make it your boast that you surpass all others, who sing melancholy ditties all by yourself? Thus purchasing a famous reputation throughout the kingdom? If you would, only, forget the energy of your spirit, and neglect the care of your body, you might approximate, to the Tao. But while you cannot regulate yourself, what leisure have you to be regulating the world? Go on your way, sir, and do not interrupt my work. Zikung shrunk back abashed, and turned pale. He was perturbed, and lost his self-possession, nor did he recover it, till he had walked a distance of thirty li. His disciples then said, Who was that man? Why, master, when you saw him, did you change your bearing, and become pale, so that you have been all day without returning to yourself? He replied to them, Formerly I thought that there was but one man 434 in the world, and did not know that there was this man. I have heard the master say that to seek for the means of conducting his undertaking so that his success in carrying them out may be complete, and how by the employment of a little strength great results may be obtained, is the way of the sage. Now, I perceive that, it is not so at all. They who hold fast and cleave to the Tao are complete in the qualities belonging to it. Complete in those qualities, they are complete in their bodies. Complete in their bodies, they are complete in their spirits. To be complete in spirit is the way of the sage. Such men, live in the world in closest union with the people, going along with them, but they do not know where they are going. Vast and complete is their simplicity. Success, gain, and ingenious contrivances, and artful cleverness, indicate, in their opinion, a forgetfulness of the proper mind of man. These men will not go where their mind does not carry them, and will do nothing of which their mind does not approve. Though all the world should praise them, they would, only, get what they think should be loftily disregarded. And though all the world should blame them, they would but lose, what they think, fortuitous and not to be received, the world's blame and praise can do them neither benefit nor injury. Such men may be described as possessing all the attributes, of the Tao, while I can only be called one of those who are like the waves carried about by the wind. When he returned to Lu, Dees Kung, reported the interview and conversation to Confucius, who said, the man makes a pretense of cultivating the arts of the embryonic age 435. He knows the first thing, but not the sequel to it. He regulates what is internal in himself, but not what is external to himself. If he had intelligence enough to be entirely unsophisticated, and by doing nothing to seek to return to the normal simplicity, embodying, the instincts of, his nature, and keeping his spirit, as it were, in his arms. So enjoying himself in the common ways, you might then indeed be afraid of him. But what should you and I find in the arts of the embryonic time, worth our knowing? 12. Kuen Mang, on his way to the ocean, met with Yuan Feng 436 on the shore of the Eastern Sea, and was asked by him where he was going. I am going, he replied, to the ocean, and the other again asked, what for? Kuen Mang said, such is the nature of the ocean that the waters which flow into it can never fill it, nor those which flow from it exhaust it. I will enjoy myself, rambling by it. Yuan Feng replied, have you no thoughts about mankind 437? I should like to hear from you about sagely government. Kuen Mang said, Under the government of sages, all offices are distributed according to the fitness of their nature, all appointments are made according to the ability of the men, whatever is done is after a complete survey of all circumstances. Actions and words proceed from the inner impulse, and the whole world is transformed. Wherever their hands are pointed and their looks directed, from all quarters the people are all sure to come, to do what they desire, this is what is called government by sages. I should like to hear about, the government of, the kindly, virtuous men 438, continued Yuan Feng. The reply was, under the government of the virtuous, when quietly occupying, their place, they have no thought, and, when they act, they have no anxiety. 
They do not keep stored, in their minds, what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. They share their benefits among all within the four seas, and this produces what is called, the state of, satisfaction. They dispense their gifts to all, and this produces what is called, the state of, rest. The people, grieve, on their death, like babies who have lost their mothers, and are perplexed like travelers who have lost their way. They have a superabundance of wealth and all necessaries, and they know not whence it comes. They have a sufficiency of food and drink, and they know not from whom they get it, such are the appearances, under the government, of the kindly and virtuous. I should like to hear about, the government of, the spirit-like men, continued Yuan Feng once more. The reply was, men of the highest spirit-like qualities mount up on the light, and, the limitations of, the body vanish. This we call being bright and ethereal. They carry out to the utmost the powers with which they are endowed, and have not a single attribute unexhausted. Their joy is that of heaven and earth, and all embarrassments of affairs melt away and disappear, all things return to their proper nature and this is what is called, the state of, chaotic obscurity 439. 13. Man Wu Kui and Kai Kong Man Kai 440 had been looking at the army of King Wu, when the latter said, it is because he was not born in the time of the Lord of Yu 441, that therefore he is involved in this trouble, of war, dot. Man Wu Kui replied, was it when the kingdom was in good order, that the Lord of Yu governed it? Or was it after it had become disordered that he governed it? The other said, that the kingdom be in a condition of good order, is what, all, desire, and, in that case, what necessity would there be to say anything about the Lord of Yu? He had medicine for sores, false hair for the bald. And healing for those who were ill, he was like the filial son carrying in the medicine to cure his kind father, with every sign of distress in his countenance. A sage would be ashamed, of such a thing, 442. In the age of perfect virtue they attached no value to wisdom, nor employed men of ability. Superiors were, but, as the higher branches of a tree, and the people were like the deer of the wild. They were upright and correct, without knowing that to be so was righteousness, they loved one another, without knowing that to do so was benevolence, they were honest and leal-hearted, without knowing that it was loyalty. They fulfilled their engagements, without knowing that to do so was good faith, in their simple movements they employed the services of one another, without thinking that they were conferring or receiving any gift. Therefore their actions left no trace, and there was no record of their affairs. 14. The filial son who does not flatter his father, and the loyal minister who does not fawn on his ruler, are the highest examples of a minister and a son. When a son assents to all that his father says, and approves of all that his father does, common opinion pronounces him an unworthy son. When a minister assents to all that his ruler says, and approves of all that his ruler does, common opinion pronounces him an unworthy minister. Nor does any one reflect that this view is necessarily correct 443. But when common opinion, itself, affirms anything men therefore assent to it, or counts anything good and men also approve of it, then it is not said that they are mere consenters and flatterers. Is common opinion then more authoritative than a father, or more to be honored than a ruler? Tell a man that he is merely following, the opinions, of another, or that he is a flatterer of others, and at once he flushes with anger. And yet all his life he is merely following others, and flattering them. His illustrations are made to agree with theirs, his phrases are glossed, to win the approbation of the multitudes. From first to last, from beginning to end, he finds no fault with their views. He will let his robes hang down 444, display the colors on them, and arrange his movements and bearing, so as to win the favor of his age, and yet not call himself a flatterer. He is but a follower of those others, approving and disapproving as they do, and yet he will not say that he is one of them. This is the height of stupidity. He who knows his stupidity is not very stupid. He who knows that he is under a delusion is not greatly deluded. He who is greatly deluded will never shake the delusion off, he who is very stupid will all his life not become intelligent. If three men be walking together, and, only, one of them be under a delusion, as to their way, 
they may yet reach their goal, the deluded being the fewer. But if two of them be under the delusion, they will not do so, the deluded being the majority. At the present time, when the whole world is under a delusion, though I pray men to go in the right direction, I cannot make them do so. Is it not a sad case? Grand music does not penetrate the ears of villagers, but if they hear, the breaking of the willow, or, the bright flowers 445, they will roar with laughter. So it is that lofty words do not remain in the minds of the multitude, and that perfect words are not heard, because the vulgar words predominate. By two earthenware instruments the music of, a bell will be confused, and the pleasure that it would afford cannot be obtained. At the present time the whole world is under a delusion, and though I wish to go in a certain direction, how can I succeed in doing so? Knowing that I cannot do so, if I were to try to force my way, that would be another delusion. Therefore my best course is to let my purpose go, and no more pursue it. If I do not pursue it, whom shall one have to share in my sorrow 446? If an ugly man 447 have a son born to him at midnight, he hastens with a light to look at it. Very eagerly he does so, only afraid that it may be like himself. 15448. From a tree a hundred years old a portion shall be cut and fashioned into a sacrificial vase, with the bull figured on it, which is ornamented further with green and yellow, while the rest, of that portion, is cut away and thrown into a ditch. If now we compare the sacrificial vase with what was thrown into the ditch, there will be a difference between them as respects their beauty and ugliness, but they both agree in having lost the proper nature of the wood. So in respect of their practice of righteousness there is a difference between the robber, Ki on the one hand, and Zang, Shan, or Shi, Zayu, on the other, but they all agree in having lost the proper qualities of their nature. Now there are five things which produce, in men, the loss of their proper nature. The first is, their fondness for, the five colors which disorder the eye, and take from it its, proper, clearness of vision. The second is, their fondness for, the five notes, of music, which disorder the ear and take from it its, proper, power of hearing. The third is, their fondness for, the five odors which penetrate the nostrils, and produce a feeling of distress all over the forehead, the fourth is, their fondness for, the five flavors, which deaden the mouth, and pervert its sense of taste. The fifth is their preferences and dislikes, which unsettle the mind, and cause the nature to go flying about. These five things are all injurious to the life. And now Yang and Mo begin to stretch forward from their different standpoints, each thinking that he has hit on, the proper course for men. But the courses they have hit on are not what I call the proper course. What they have hit on, only, leads to distress, can they have hit on what is the right thing. If they have, we may say that the dove in a cage has found the right thing for it. Moreover, those preferences and dislikes, that, fondness for, music and colors, serve but to pile up fuel, in their breasts. While their caps of leather, the bonnet with kingfisher's plumes, the memorandum tablets which they carry, and their long girdles, serve but as restraints on their persons. Thus inwardly stuffed full as a hole for fuel, and outwardly fast bound with cords, when they look quietly round from out of their bondage, and think they have got all they could desire. They are no better than criminals whose arms are tied together, and their fingers subjected to the screw, or than tigers and leopards in sacks or cages, and yet thinking that they have got, all they could wish. Book 8 Part 2 Section 6 Tian Tao, or, The Way of Heaven 1. The Way of Heaven operates, unceasingly, and leaves no accumulation 449, of its influence, in any particular place, so that all things are brought to perfection by it. So does the way of the tis operate, and all under the sky turn to them, as their directors, so also does the way of the sages operate, and all within the sea submit to them. Those who clearly understand, the way of, heaven, who are in sympathy with, that of, the sages, and familiar through the universe and in the four quarters, of the earth, with the work of the tis and the kings yet act spontaneously from themselves with the appearance of being ignorant they are yet entirely still. 
The stillness of the sages does not belong to them as a consequence of their skillful ability 450, all things are not able to disturb their minds, it is on this account that they are still. When water is still, its clearness shows the beard and eyebrows, of him who looks into it. It is a perfect level 451, and the greatest artificer takes his rule from it. Such is the clearness of still water, and how much greater is that of the human spirit. The still mind of the sage is the mirror of heaven and earth, the glass of all things. Vacancy, stillness, placidity, tastelessness, quietude, silence, and non-action, this is the level of heaven and earth, and the perfection of the Tao and its characteristics 452. Therefore the Tis, kings, and sages found in this their resting, place 453. Resting here, they were vacant, from their vacancy came fullness, from their fullness came the nice distinctions, of things. From their vacancy came stillness. That stillness was followed by movement, their movements were successful. From their stillness came their non-action. Doing nothing, they devolved the cares of office on their employees. Doing nothing was accompanied by the feeling of satisfaction. Where there is that feeling of satisfaction, anxieties and troubles find no place, and the years of life are many. Vacancy, stillness, placidity, tastelessness, quietude, silence, and doing nothing are the root of all things. When this is understood, we find such a ruler on the throne as Yao, and such a minister as Shun. When with this a high position is occupied, we find the attributes of the Tis and kings, the sons of heaven. With this in a low position, we find the mysterious sages, the uncrowned kings, with their ways. With this retiring, from public life, and enjoying themselves at leisure, we find the scholars who dwell by the rivers and seas, among the hills and forests, all submissive to it. With this coming forward to active life and comforting their age, their merit is great, and their fame is distinguished, and all the world becomes united in one. 2. Such men, by their stillness become sages and by their movement, kings. Doing nothing, they are honored, in their plain simplicity, no one in the world can strive with them, for the palm of, excellence. The clear understanding of the virtue of heaven and earth is what is called, the great root, and, the great origin. They who have it are in harmony with heaven, and so they produce all equable arrangements in the world, they are those who are in harmony with men. Being in harmony with men is called the joy of men. Being in harmony with heaven is called the joy of heaven. Quan Di said, My master. My master. He shall hash and blend all things in mass without being cruel, he shall dispense his favors to all ages without being benevolent. He is older than the highest antiquity, and yet is not old. He overspreads the heavens and sustains the earth, from him is the carving of all forms without any artful skill 454. This is what is called the joy of heaven. Hence it is said, those who know the joy of heaven during their life, act like heaven, and at death undergo transformation like, other, things 455. In their stillness they possess the quality of the Yin, and in their movement they flow abroad as the Yang. Therefore he who knows the joy of heaven has no murmuring against heaven, nor any fault-finding with men. And suffers no embarrassment from things, nor any reproof from ghosts. Hence it is said, his movements are those of heaven, his stillness is that of earth, his whole mind is fixed, and he rules over the world. The spirits of his dead do not come to scare him, he is not worn out by their souls. His words proceeding from his vacancy and stillness, yet reach to heaven and earth, and show a communication with all things, this is what is called the joy of heaven. This joy of heaven forms the mind of the sage whereby he nurtures all under the sky 456. 3. It was the way 457 of the Tis and kings to regard heaven and earth as their author, the Tao and its characteristics as their lord, and doing nothing as their constant rule. Doing nothing, they could use the whole world in their service and might have done more, acting, they were not sufficient for the service required of them by the world. Hence the men of old held non-inaction in honor. When superiors do nothing and their inferiors also do nothing, inferiors and superiors possess the same virtue, and when inferiors and superiors possess the same virtue, there are none to act as ministers. 
When inferiors act, and their superiors also act, then superiors and inferiors possess the same Tao, and when superiors and inferiors possess the same Tao, there is none to preside as Lord. But that the superiors do nothing and yet thereby use the world in their service, and that the inferiors, while acting, be employed in the service of the world, is an unchangeable principle. Therefore the ancient kings who presided over the world, though their knowledge embraced, all the operations of, heaven and earth, took no thought of their own about them. Though their nice discrimination appreciated the fine fashioning of all things, they said not a word about it, though their power comprehended all within the seas, they did nothing themselves. Heaven produces nothing, yet all things experience their transformations, earth affects no growth, yet all things receive their nurture, the tis and kings did nothing, yet all the world testified their effective services. Hence it is said, there is nothing more spirit-like than heaven, there is nothing richer than earth, there are none greater than the ts and kings. Hence it is said, further, the attributes of the tis and kings corresponded to those of heaven and earth. It was thus that they availed themselves of, the operations of, heaven and earth, carried all things on unceasingly, in their courses, and employed the various classes of men in their service. 4. Originating belongs to those in the higher position, details, of work, to those who are in the lower. The compendious decision belongs to the Lord, the minutiae of execution, to his ministers. The direction of the three hosts 458 and their men with the five weapons 459 is but a trifling quality, rewards and penalties with their advantages and sufferings, and the inflictions of the five punishments 460 are but trivial elements of instruction. Ceremonies, laws, measures, and numbers, with all the minutiae of jurisprudence 461, are small matters in government. The notes of bells and drums, and the display of plumes and flags are the slightest things in music, and the various grades of the mourning garments are the most unimportant manifestations of grief. These five unimportant adjuncts required the operation of the excited spirit and the employment of the arts of the mind, to bring them into use. The men of old had them indeed, but they did not give them the first place. The ruler precedes, and the minister follows, the father precedes, and the son follows, the elder brother precedes, and the younger follows, the senior precedes, and the junior follows, the male precedes, and the female follows. The husband precedes, and the wife follows. This precedence of the more honorable and sequence of the meaner is seen in the, relative, action of heaven and earth, and hence the sages took them as their pattern. The more honorable position of heaven and the lower one of earth are equivalent to a designation of their spirit-like and intelligent qualities. The precedence of spring and summer and the sequence of autumn and winter mark the order of the four seasons. In the transformations and growth of all things, every bud and feature has its proper form. And in this we have their gradual maturing and decay, the constant flow of transformation and change. Thus since heaven and earth, which are most spirit-like, are distinguished as more honorable and less, and by precedence and sequence, how much more must we look for this in the ways of men? In the ancestral temple it is to kinship that honor is given, in court, to rank, in the neighborhoods and districts, to age, in the conduct of affairs, to wisdom, such is the order in those great ways. If we speak of the course, to be pursued in them, and do not observe their order, we violate their course. If we speak of the course, and do not observe it, why do we apply that name to it? 5. Therefore the ancients who clearly understood the great Tao first sought to apprehend what was meant by heaven 462, and the Tao and its characteristics came next. When this was apprehended, then came benevolence and righteousness. When these were apprehended, then came the distinction of duties and the observance of them. This accomplished, there came objects and their names. After objects and their names, came the employment of men according to their qualities, on this there followed the examination of the men and of their work. This led to the approval or disapproval of them, which again was succeeded by the apportioning of rewards and penalties. After this the stupid and the intelligent understood what was required of them, and the honorable and the mean occupied their several positions. The good and the able, and those inferior to them, sincerely did their best. Their ability was distributed, 
the duties implied in their official names were fulfilled. In this way did they serve their superiors, nourish their inferiors, regulate things, and cultivate their persons. They did not call their knowledge and schemes into requisition, they were required to fall back upon, the method of, heaven, this was what is called the perfection of the rule of great peace. Hence it is said in the book 463, there are objects and there are their names. Objects and their names the ancients had, but they did not put them in the foremost place. When the ancients spoke of the great Tao, it was only after four other steps that they gave a place to objects and their names, and after eight steps that they gave a place to rewards and penalties. If they had all at once spoken of objects and their names, they would have shown an ignorance of what is the root of government. If they had all at once spoken of rewards and penalties, they would have shown an ignorance of the first steps of it. Those whose words are thus an inversion of the proper course or in opposition to it, are, only fit to be, ruled by others. How can they rule others? To speak all at once of objects and their names, and of rewards and penalties, only shows that the speaker knows the instruments of government, but does not know the method of it, is fit to be used as an instrument in the world. But not fit to use others as his instruments, he is what we call a mere sophist, a man of one small idea. Ceremonies, laws, numbers, measures, with all the minutiae of jurisprudence, the ancients had, but it is by these that inferiors serve their superiors, it is not by them that those superiors nourish the world. 6. Anciently, Shun asked Yao, saying, In what way does your majesty by the grace of heaven 464 exercise your mind? The reply was, I simply show no arrogance towards the helpless, I do not neglect the poor people, I grieve for those who die. I love their infant children, and I compassionate their widows. Shun rejoined, Admirable, as far as it goes, but it is not what is great. How then, asked Yao, do you think I should do? Shun replied, When, a sovereign, possesses the virtue of heaven, then when he shows himself in action, it is in stillness. The sun and moon, simply, shine, and the four seasons pursue their courses. So it is with the regular phenomena of day and night, and with the movement of the clouds by which the rain is distributed. Yao said, Then I have only been persistently troubling myself. What you wish is to be in harmony with heaven, while I wish to be in harmony with men. Now, the way of, heaven and earth was much thought of of old, and Huang Ti, Yao, and Shun united in admiring it. Hence the kings of the world of old did nothing, but tried to imitate that way. 7. Confucius went to the West to deposit, some, writings in the library of Cao 465, when Dees Lu counseled him, saying, I have heard that the officer in charge of this Kong 466 repository of Cao was one Lao Tan, who has given up his office. And is living in his own house. As you, master, wish to deposit these writings here, why not go to him, and obtain his help, to accomplish your object, for 67. Confucius said, Good, and he went and saw Lao Tan, who refused his assistance. On this he proceeded to give an abstract of the Twelve Classics 468 to bring the other over to his views 469. Lao Tan, however, interrupted him while he was speaking, and said, This is too vague, let me hear the substance of them in brief. Confucius said, The substance of them is occupied with benevolence and righteousness. The other said, let me ask whether you consider benevolence and righteousness to constitute the nature of man? I do, was the answer. If the superior man be not benevolent, he will not fulfill his character, if he be not righteous, he might as well not have been born. Benevolence and righteousness are truly the nature of man. Lao Ten continued, Let me ask you what you mean by benevolence and righteousness. Confucius said, to be in one's inmost heart in kindly sympathy with all things, to love all men, and to allow no selfish thoughts. This is the nature of benevolence and righteousness. Lao Tan exclaimed, Ah! You almost show your inferiority by such words. To love all men, is not that vague and extravagant. To be seeking to allow no selfish thoughts. That is selfishness 470. If you, master, wish men not to be without their, proper, shepherding, 
think of heaven and earth, which certainly pursue their invariable course, think of the sun and moon, which surely maintain their brightness. Think of the stars in the zodiac, which preserve their order and courses, think of birds and beasts, which do not fail to collect together in their flocks and herds, and think of the trees, which do not fail to stand up, in their places. Do you, Master, imitate this way and carry it into practice, hurry on, following this course, and you will reach your end? Why must you further be vehement in putting forward your benevolence and righteousness, as if you were beating a drum, and seeking a fugitive son, only making him run away the more? Ah! Master, you are introducing disorder into the nature of man. 8. Shikang Kai 471, having an interview with Lao Dees, asked him, saying, I heard, Master, that you were a sage, and I came here, wishing to see you, without grudging the length of the journey. During the stages of the hundred days, the soles of my feet became quite callous, but I did not dare to stop and rest. Now I perceive that you are not a sage. Because there was some rice left about the holes of the rats, you sent away your younger sister, which was unkind, when your food, whether raw or cooked, remains before you not all consumed, you keep on hoarding it up to any extent 472. Lao Dees looked indifferent, and gave him no answer. Next day Kai again saw Lao Dees, and said, Yesterday I taunted you, but today I have gone back to a better mood of mind. What is the cause, of the change, 473? Lao Dees replied, I consider that I have freed myself from the trammels of claiming to be artfully knowing, spirit-like, and sage. Yesterday if you had called me an ox, you might have done so. Or if you had called me a horse, you might have done so 474. If there be a reality, corresponding to men's ideas, and men give it a name, which another will not receive, he will in the sequel suffer the more. My manner was what I constantly observe. I did not put it on for the occasion. Shi Kang Kai sidled away out of Lao's shadow, then he retraced his steps, advanced forward, and asked how he should cultivate himself. The reply was, your demeanor is repelling, you stare with your eyes. Your forehead is broad and yet tapering, you bark and growl with your mouth, your appearance is severe and pretentious. You are like a horse held by its tether, you would move, but are restrained, and, if let go, would start off like an arrow from a bow, you examine all the minutiae of a thing, your wisdom is artful, and yet you try to look at ease. All these are to be considered proofs of your want of sincerity. If on the borders one were to be found with them, he would be named a thief. 9. The Master 475 said, The Tao does not exhaust itself in what is greatest, nor is it ever absent from what is least, and therefore it is to be found complete and diffused in all things. How wide is its universal comprehension? How deep is its unfathomableness? The embodiment of its attributes in benevolence and righteousness is but a small result of its spirit-like, working, but it is only the perfect man who can determine this. The perfect man has, the charge of, the world, is not the charge great. And yet it is not sufficient to embarrass him. He wields the handle of power over the whole world, and yet it is nothing to him. His discrimination detects everything false, and no consideration of gain moves him. He penetrates to the truth of things, and can guard that which is fundamental. So it is that heaven and earth are external to him, and he views all things with indifference, and his spirit is never straitened by them. He has comprehended the though, and is in harmony with its characteristics. He pushes back benevolence and righteousness, into their proper place, and deals with ceremonies and music as, simply, guests, yes, the mind of the perfect man determines all things aright. 10. What the world thinks the most valuable exhibition of the Tao is to be found in books. But books are only a collection of words. Words have what is valuable in them, what is valuable in words is the ideas they convey. But those ideas are a sequence of something else, and what that something else is cannot be conveyed by words. When the world, because of the value which it attaches to words, commits them to books, that for which it so values them may not deserve to be valued, because that which it values is not what is really valuable. Thus it is that what we look at and can see is, only, 
the outward form and color, and what we listen to and can hear is, only, names and sounds. Alas! That men of the world should think that form and color, name and sound, should be sufficient to give them the real nature of the Tao. The form and color, the name and sound, are certainly not sufficient to convey its real nature. And so it is that, the wise do not speak and those who do speak are not wise. How should the world know that real nature? Duke Juan 476, seated above in his hall, was, once, reading a book, and the wheelwright Fien was making a will below at 477. Laying aside his hammer and chisel, Fien went up the steps, and said, I venture to ask your grace what words you are reading. The duke said, The words of the sages. Are those sages alive? Fien continued. They are dead, was the reply. Then, said the other, What you, my ruler, are reading are only the dregs and sediments of those old men. The duke said, How should you, a wheelwright, have anything to say about the book which I am reading? If you can explain yourself, very well, if you cannot, you shall die. The wheelwright said, Your servant will look at the thing from the point of view of his own art. In making a wheel, if I proceed gently, that is pleasant enough, but the workmanship is not strong, if I proceed violently, that is toilsome and the joinings do not fit. If the movements of my hand are neither, too, gentle nor, too, violent, the idea in my mind is realized. But I cannot tell, how to do this, by word of mouth, there is a knack in it. I cannot teach the knack to my son, nor can my son learn it from me. Thus it is that I am in my seventieth year, and am, still, making wheels in my old age 478. But these ancients, and what it was not possible for them to convey, are dead and gone, so then what you, my ruler, are reading is but their dregs and sediments. Book 14 Part 2 Section 7 Tian Yun, or, The Revolution of Heaven 1. How, ceaselessly, heaven revolves. Flow, constantly, earth abides at rest. And do the sun and moon contend about their, respective, places? Who presides over and directs these, things? Who binds and connects them together? Who is it that, without trouble or exertion on his part, causes and maintains them? Is it, perhaps, that there is some secret spring, in consequence of which they cannot be but as they are? Or is it, perhaps, that they move and turn as they do, and cannot stop of themselves? Then, how the clouds become rain? And how the rain again forms the clouds? Who diffuses them so abundantly? Who is it that, without trouble or exertion on his part, produces this elemental enjoyment, and seems to stimulate it? The winds rise in the north. One blows to the west, and another to the east, while some rise upwards, uncertain in their direction. By whose breathing are they produced? Who is it that, without any trouble and exertion of his own, affects all their undulations? I venture to ask their cause 479. Wu Xin Thio 480 said, Come, and I will tell you. To heaven there belong the six extreme points, and the five elements 481. When the Tis and kings acted in accordance with them, there was good government. When they acted contrary to them, there was evil. Observing the things, described, in the nine divisions, of the writing, of Lo 482, their government was perfected and their virtue was complete. They inspected and enlightened the kingdom beneath them, and all under the sky acknowledged and sustained them. Such was the condition under the August, Sovereigns 483, and those before them. 2. Tang 484, the chief administrator of Shang, asked Quan Di's about benevolence 485, and the answer was, wolves and tigers are benevolent. What do you mean, said Tang? Quan Di's replied, father and son, among them, are affectionate to one another. Why should they be considered as not benevolent? Allow me to ask about perfect benevolence, pursued the other. Quan Di said, perfect benevolence 486 does not admit, the feeling, of affection. The minister said, I have heard that, without, the feeling of, affection there is no love, and without love there is not filial duty, 
is it permissible to say that the perfectly benevolent are not filial? Quan Di's rejoined, that is not the way to put the case. Perfect benevolence is the very highest thing, filial duty is by no means sufficient to describe it. The saying which you quote is not to the effect that, such benevolence, transcends filial duty, it does not refer to such duty at all. One, traveling to the south, comes, at last, to Ing 487, and there, standing with his face to the north, he does not see Mount Ming 488. Why does he not see it? Because he is so far from it. Hence it is said, filial duty as a part of reverence is easy, but filial duty as a part of love is difficult. If it be easy as a part of love, yet it is difficult to forget 489 one's parents. It may be easy for me to forget my parents, but it is difficult to make my parents forget me. If it were easy to make my parents forget me, it is difficult for me to forget all men in the world. If it were easy to forget all men in the world, it is difficult to make them all forget me. This virtue might make one think light of Yao and Shun, and not wish to be they 490. The profit and beneficial influences of it extend to a myriad ages, and no one in the world knows whence they come. How can you simply heave a great sigh, and speak, as you do, of benevolence and filial duty? Filial duty, fraternal respect, benevolence, righteousness, loyalty, sincerity, firmness, and purity, all these may be pressed into the service of this virtue, but they are far from sufficient to come up to it. Therefore it is said, to him who has what is most noble 491, all the dignities of a state are as nothing 492, to him who has what is the greatest riches, all the wealth of a state is as nothing. To him who has all that he could wish, fame and praise are as nothing. It is thus that the Tao admits of no substitute. 3. Pei Man Kang 493 asked Huang Ti, saying, You were celebrating, O T, a performance of the music of the Xin, Kai 494, in the open country near the Thungthing Lake. When I heard the first part of it, I was afraid, the next made me weary. And the last perplexed me. I became agitated and unable to speak, and lost my self-possession. The T said, It was likely that it should so affect you. It was performed with, the instruments of, men, and all attuned according to, the influences of, heaven. It proceeded according to, the principles of, propriety and righteousness, and was pervaded by, the idea of, the grand purity. The perfect music first had its response in the affairs of men, and was conformed to the principles of heaven, it indicated the action of the five virtues, and corresponded to the spontaneity, apparent in nature. After this it showed the blended distinctions of the four seasons, and the grand harmony of all things, the succession of those seasons one after another, and the production of things in their proper order. Now it swelled, and now it died away, its peaceful and military strains clearly distinguished and given forth. Now it was clear, and now rough, as if the contracting and expanding of the elemental processes blended harmoniously, in its notes. Those notes then flowed away in waves of light, till, as when the hibernating insects first begin to move, I commanded the terrifying crash of thunder. Its end was marked by no formal conclusion, and it began again without any prelude. It seemed to die away, and then it burst into life, it came to a close, and then it rose again. So it went on regularly and inexhaustibly, and without the intervention of any pause, it was this which made you afraid. In the second part, of the performance, I made it describe the harmony of the yin and yang, and threw round it the brilliance of the sun and moon. Its notes were now short and now long, now soft and now hard. Their changes, however, were marked by an unbroken unity, though not dominated by a fixed regularity. They filled every valley and ravine. You might shut up every crevice, and guard your spirit, against their entrance, yet there was nothing but gave admission to them. Yeah, those notes resounded slowly, and might have been pronounced high and clear. Hence the shades of the dead kept in their obscurity, the sun and moon, and all the stars of the zodiac, pursued their several courses. I made, my instruments, leave off, when, the performance, came to an end, and there, echoes, flowed on without stopping. You thought anxiously about it, and were not able to understand it, you looked for it, 
and were not able to see it. You pursued it, and were not able to reach it. All amazed, you stood in the way all open around you, and then you leant against an old rotten Dryandra tree and hummed. The power of your eyes was exhausted by what you wished to see. Your strength failed in your desire to pursue it, while I myself could not reach it. Your body was but so much empty vacancy while you endeavored to retain yourself, possession 495, it was that endeavor which made you weary. In the last part of the performance, I employed notes which did not have that wearying effect. I blended them together as at the command of spontaneity. Hence they came as if following one another in confusion, like a clump of plants springing from one root, or like the music of a forest produced by no visible form. They spread themselves all around without leaving a trace, of their cause. And seemed to issue from deep obscurity where there was no sound. Their movements came from nowhere, their home was in the deep darkness, conditions which some would call death, and some life, some, the fruit, and some, merely, the flower. Those notes, moving and flowing on, separating and shifting, and not following any regular sounds, the world might well have doubts about them, and refer them to the judgment of a sage, for the sages understand the nature of this music. And judge in accordance with the prescribed, spontaneity. While the spring of that spontaneity has not been touched, and yet the regulators of the five notes are all prepared, this is what is called the music of heaven, delighting the mind without the use of words. Hence it is said in the eulogy of the Lord of Pyao 496, you listen for it, and do not hear its sound, you look for it, and do not perceive its form, it fills heaven and earth, it envelopes all within the universe. You wish to hear it, but could not take it in, and therefore you were perplexed. I performed first the music calculated to all, and you were frightened as if by a ghostly visitation, I followed it with that calculated to weary. And in your weariness you would have withdrawn. I concluded with that calculated to perplex, and in your perplexity you felt your stupidity. But that stupidity is akin to the Tao. You may with it convey the Tao in your person, and have it, ever, with you. For, when Confucius was traveling in the West and Way, Yen Yuan asked the music master Kin 497, saying, How is it, do you think, with the course of the master? The music master replied, Alas! It is all over with your master. How so? asked Yen Yuan. And the other said, Before the grass, dogs 498 are set forth, at the sacrifice, they are deposited in a box or basket, and wrapped up with elegantly embroidered cloths. While the representative of the dead and the officer of prayer prepare themselves by fasting to present them. After they have been set forth, however, passers by trample on their heads and backs, and the grass cutters take and burn them in cooking. That is all they are good for. If one should again take them, replace them in the box or basket, wrap them up with embroidered cloths, and then in rambling, or abiding at the spot, should go to sleep under them, if he do not get, evil, dreams. He is sure to be often troubled with the nightmare. Now here is your master in the same way taking the grass dogs, presented by the ancient kings, and leading his disciples to wander or abide and sleep under them. Owing to this, the tree, beneath which they were practicing ceremonies, in Sung was cut down 499, he was obliged to leave Wei, he was reduced to extremities in Shang 500 and Kao 501 were not those experiences like having, evil, dreams. He was kept in a state of siege between Khan and Jai 502, so that for seven days he had no cooked food to eat, and was in a situation between life and death were not those experiences like the nightmare. If you are traveling by water, your best plan is to use a boat, if by land, a carriage. Take a boat, which will go, easily, along on the water, and try to push it along on the land, and all your lifetime it will not go so much as a fathom or two are not ancient time and the present time like the water and the dry land. And are not cow and loo like the boat and the carriage? To seek now to practice, the old ways of, cow and loo is like pushing along a boat on the dry land. It is only a toilsome labor, and has no success, he who does so is sure to meet with calamity. He has not learned that in handing down the arts, of one time, he is sure to be reduced to extremity in endeavoring to adapt them to the conditions, of another. And have you not seen the working of a shaduf? 
When, the rope of, it is pulled, it bends down, and when it is let go, it rises up. It is pulled by a man, and does not pull the man, and so, whether it bends down or rises up, it commits no offense against the man. In the same way the rules of propriety, righteousness, laws, and measures of the three Huangs and five Tis 503 derive their excellence, not from their being the same as those of the present day, but from their, aptitude for, government. We may compare them to Haas 504, pears, oranges, and pumelos, which are different in flavor, but all suitable to be eaten. Just so it is that the rules of propriety, righteousness, laws, and measures, change according to the time. If now you take a monkey, and dress it in the robes of the Duke of Cow, it will bite and tear them, and will not be satisfied till it has got rid of them altogether. And if you look at the difference between antiquity and the present time it is as great as that between the monkey and the Duke of Cow. In the same way, when she she 505 was troubled in mind, she would knit her brows and frown on all in her neighborhood. An ugly woman of the neighborhood, seeing and admiring her beauty, went home, and also laying her hands on her heart proceeded to stare and frown on all around her. When the rich people of the village saw her, they shut fast their doors and would not go out, when the poor people saw her, they took their wives and children and ran away from her. The woman knew how to admire the frowning beauty, but she did not know how it was that she, though frowning, was beautiful. Alas! It is indeed all over with your master 506. 5. When Confucius was in his fifty-first year 507, he had not heard of the Tao, and went south to Fei 508 to see Lao Tan, who said to him, You have come, sir, have you? I have heard that you are the wisest man of the north, have you also got the Tao? Not yet, was the reply, and the other went on, how have you sought it? Confucius said, I sought it in measures and numbers, and after five years I had not got it. And how then did you seek it? I sought it in the yin and yang, and after twelve years I have not found it. Lao Di said, Just so. If the Tao could be presented, to another, men would all present it to their rulers. If it could be served up, to others, men would all serve it up to their parents, if it could be told, to others, men would all tell it to their brothers, if it could be given to others, men would all give it to their sons and grandsons. The reason why it cannot be transmitted is no other but this, that if, within, there be not the presiding principle, it will not remain there, and if, outwardly, there be not the correct obedience, it will not be carried out. When that which is given out from the mind, in possession of it, is not received by the mind without, the sage will not give it out. And when, entering in from without, there is no power in the receiving mind to entertain it, the sage will not permit it to lie hid there 509. Fame is a possession common to all, we should not seek to have much of it. Benevolence and righteousness were as the lodging houses of the former kings, we should only rest in them for a night, and not occupy them for long. If men see us doing so, they will have much to say against us. The perfect men of old trod the path of benevolence as a path which they borrowed for the occasion, and dwelt in righteousness as in a lodging which they used for a night. Thus they rambled in the vacancy of untroubled ease, found their food in the fields of indifference, and stood in the gardens which they had not borrowed. Untroubled ease requires the doing of nothing. Indifference is easily supplied with nourishment, not borrowing needs no outlay. The ancients called this the enjoyment that collects the true. Those who think that wealth is the proper thing for them cannot give up their revenues. Those who seek distinction cannot give up the thought of fame, those who cleave to power cannot give the handle of it to others. While they hold their grasp of those things, they are afraid, of losing them. When they let them go, they are grieved. And they will not look at a single example, from which they might perceive the, folly, of their restless pursuits such men are under the doom of heaven 510. Hatred and kindness, taking and giving, reproof and instruction. Death and life, these eight things are instruments of rectification, but only those are able to use them who do not obstinately refuse to comply with their great changes. Hence it is said, correction is rectification. When the minds of some do not acknowledge this, it is because the gate of heaven 5.11, in them, has not been opened. 
6. At an interview with Lao Tan, Confucius spoke to him of benevolence and righteousness. Lao Tan said, If you winnow chaff, and the dust gets into your eyes, then the places of heaven and earth and of the four cardinal points are all changed to you. If mosquitoes or gadflies puncture your skin, it will keep you all the night 512 from sleeping. But this painful iteration of benevolence and righteousness excites my mind and produces in it the greatest confusion. If you, sir, would cause men not to lose their natural simplicity, and if you would also imitate the wind in its, unconstrained, movements, and stand forth in all the natural attributes belonging to you. Why must you use so much energy, and carry a great drum to seek for the sun whom you have lost 513? The snow goose does not bathe every day to make itself white, nor the crow blacken itself every day to make itself black. The natural simplicity of their black and white does not afford any ground for controversy, and the fame and praise which men like to contemplate do not make them greater than they naturally are. When the springs, supplying the pools, are dried up, the fishes huddle together on the dry land. Then that they should moisten one another there by their gasping, and keep one another wet by their milt, it would be better for them to forget one another in the rivers and lakes 514. From this interview with Lao Tan, Confucius returned home, and for three days did not speak. His disciples, then, asked him, saying, Master, you have seen Lao Tan, in what way might you admonish and correct him? Confucius said, In him, I may say, that I have now seen the dragon. The dragon coils itself up, and there is its body, it unfolds itself and becomes the dragon complete. It rides on the cloudy air, and is nourished by the yin and yang. I kept my mouth open, and was unable to shut it, how could I admonish and correct Lao Tan? 7. Dees, Kung 515 said, So then, can, this, man indeed sit still as a representative of the dead, and then appear as the dragon? Can his voice resound as thunder, when he is profoundly still? Can he exhibit himself in his movements like heaven and earth? May I, Zs, also get to see him? Accordingly with a message from Confucius he went to see Lao Tan. Lao Tan was then about to answer, his salutation, haughtily in the hall, but he said in a low voice, My years have rolled on and are passing away, what do you, sir, wish to admonish me about? Dees Kung replied, The three kings and five tis five one six ruled the world not in the same way, but the fame that has accrued to them is the same. How is it that you alone consider that they were not sages? Come forward a little, my son. Why do you say that, their government, was not the same? Yao, was the reply, gave the kingdom to Shun, and Shun gave it to you. You had recourse to his strength, and Tang to the force of arms. King Wan was obedient to Cao, Hsan, and did not dare to rebel, King Wu rebelled against Cao, and would not submit to him. And I say that their methods were not the same. Lao Tan said, Come a little more forward, my son, and I will tell you how the three Huangs and the five Tis ruled the world. Huang Ti ruled it, so as to make the minds of the people all conform to the one, simplicity. If the parents of one of them died, and he did not wail, no one blamed him. Yao ruled it so as to cause the hearts of the people to cherish relative affection. If any, however, made the observances on the death of other members of their kindred less than those for their parents, no one blamed them 517. Shun ruled it, so as to produce a feeling of rivalry in the minds of the people. Their wives gave birth to their children in the tenth month of their pregnancy, but those children could speak at five months, and before they were three years old, they began to call people by their surnames and names. Then it was that men began to die prematurely. You ruled it, so as to cause the minds of the people to become changed. Men's minds became scheming, and they used their weapons as if they might legitimately do so, saying that they were, killing thieves and not killing other men. The people formed themselves into different combinations. So it was throughout the kingdom. Everywhere there was great consternation, and then arose the literati and, the followers of, M. O. T. From them came first the doctrine of the relationships, of society. And what can be said of the now prevailing customs, in the marrying of, wives and daughters. 
I tell you that the rule of the three kings and five tis may be called by that name, but nothing can be greater than the disorder which it produced. The wisdom of the three kings was opposed to the brightness of the sun and moon above, contrary to the exquisite purity of the hills and streams below, and subversive of the beneficent gifts of the four seasons between. Their wisdom has been more fatal than the sting of a scorpion or the bite of a dangerous beast 518. Unable to rest in the true attributes of their nature and constitution, they still regarded themselves as sages, was it not a thing to be ashamed of? But they were shameless. These kung stood quite disconcerted and ill at ease. 8. Confucius said to Lao Tan, I have occupied myself with the Shi, the Shu, the Li, the Yo, the Yi, and the Kun Kayu, those six books, for what I myself consider a long time 519, and am thoroughly acquainted with their contents. With seventy-two rulers, all offenders against the right, I have discoursed about the ways of the former kings, and set forth the examples of, the dukes of Cao and Shao. And not one of them has adopted, my views, and put them in practice how very difficult it is to prevail on such men, and to make clear the path to be pursued. Lao Dees replied, It is fortunate that you have not met with a ruler fitted to rule the age. Those six writings are a description of the vestiges left by the former kings, but do not tell how they made such vestiges. And what you, sir, speak about are still only the vestiges. But vestiges are the prints left by the shoes, are they the shoes that produced them? A pair of white herons look at each other with pupils that do not move, and impregnation takes place. The male insect emits its buzzing sound in the air above, and the female responds from the air below, and impregnation takes place, the creatures called lay are both male and female, and each individual breeds of itself 520. The nature cannot be altered, the conferred constitution cannot be changed, the march of the seasons cannot be arrested, the Tao cannot be stopped. If you get the Tao, there is no effect that cannot be produced. If you miss it, there is no effect that can. Confucius, after this, did not go out, till at the end of three months he went again to see Lao Tan, and said, I have got it. Ravens produce their young by hatching. Fishes by the communication of their milt, the small-waisted wasp by transformation 521, when a younger brother comes, the elder weeps 522. Long is it that I have not played my part in harmony with these processes of transformation. But as I did not play my part in harmony with such transformation, how could I transform men? Lao Di said, You will do. Caillou, you have found the Tao. Book 15 Part 2 Section 8 Ko I, or, Ingrained Ideas 1. Ingrained ideas and a high estimate of their own conduct, leaving the world, and pursuing uncommon ways, talking loftily and in resentful disparagement of others. All this is simply symptomatic of arrogance. This is what scholars who betake themselves to the hills and valleys, who are always blaming the world, and who stand aloof like withered trees, or throw themselves into deep pools 523, are fond of. Discoursing of benevolence, righteousness, loyalty, and good faith, being humble and frugal, self-forgetful and courteous, all this is simply symptomatic of, self, cultivation. This is what scholars who wish to tranquilize the world, teachers and instructors, men who pursue their studies at home and abroad, are fond of. Discoursing of their great merit and making a great name for themselves. Insisting on the ceremonies between ruler and minister, and rectifying the relations between high and low, all this shows their one object to be the promotion of government. This is what officers of the court, men who honor their lord and would strengthen the state and who would do their utmost to incorporate other states with their own, are fond of. Resorting to marshes and lakes, dwelling in solitary places. Occupying themselves with angling and living at ease, all this shows their one object to be to do nothing. This is what gentlemen of the rivers and seas, men who avoid the society of the world and desire to live at leisure, are fond of. Blowing and breathing with open mouth, inhaling and exhaling the breath, expelling the old breath and taking in new, passing their time like the dormant, bare, and stretching and twisting, the neck, like a bird 524. All this simply shows the desire for longevity. 
This is what the scholars who manipulate their breath, and the men who nourish the body and wish to live as long as Pang Zhu, are fond of. As to those who have a lofty character without any ingrained ideas, who pursue the path of self-cultivation without benevolence and righteousness, who succeed in government without great services or fame, who enjoy their ease without resorting to the rivers and seas, who attain to longevity without the management, of the breath, who forget all things and yet possess all things, whose placidity is unlimited, while all things to be valued attend them, such men pursue the way of heaven and earth, and display the characteristics of the sages. Hence it is said 525, placidity, indifference, silence, quietude, absolute vacancy, and non-action, these are the qualities which maintain the level of heaven and earth and are the substance of the Tao and its characteristics. 2. In accordance with this it is said, the sage is entirely restful, and so, his mind, is evenly balanced and at ease. This even balance and ease appears in his placidity and indifference. In this state of even balance and ease, of placidity and indifference, anxieties and evils do not find access to him, no depraving influence can take him by surprise, his virtue is complete, and his spirit continues unimpaired. Therefore it is, also, said, the life of the sage is, like, the action of heaven, and his death is the transformation common to, all, things. In his stillness his virtue is the same as that of the yin, and in movement his diffusiveness is like that of the yang. He does not take the initiative in producing either happiness or calamity. He responds to the influence acting on him, and moves as he feels the pressure. He rises to act only when he is obliged to do so. He discards wisdom and the memories of the past, he follows the lines of his heaven, given nature. And therefore he suffers no calamity from heaven, no involvement from things, no blame from men, and no reproof from the spirits of the dead. 526. His life seems to float along, his death seems to be arresting. He does not indulge any anxious doubts. He does not lay plans beforehand. His light is without display, his good faith is without previous arrangement. His sleep is untroubled by dreams, his waking is followed by no sorrows. His spirit is guileless and pure. His soul is not subject to weariness. Vacant and without self-assertion, placid and indifferent, he agrees with the virtue of heaven. Therefore it is said, further, sadness and pleasure show a depraving element in the virtue, of those who feel them, joy and anger show some error in their course, love and hatred show a failure of their virtue. Hence for the mind to be free from sorrow and pleasure is the perfection of virtue, to be of one mind that does not change is the perfection of quietude, to be conscious of no opposition is the perfection of vacancy. To have no intercourse with, external, things is the perfection of indifference, and to have no rebellious dissatisfactions is the perfection of purity. 3. Therefore it is said, still further, if the body be toiled, and does not rest, it becomes worn out, if the spirit be used without cessation, it becomes toiled, and when toiled, it becomes exhausted. It is the nature of water, when free from admixture, to be clear, and, when not agitated, to be level, while if obstructed and not allowed to flow, it cannot preserve its clearness, being an image of the virtue of heaven. Hence it is said, once again, to be guileless and pure, and free from all admixture, to be still and uniform, without undergoing any change, to be indifferent and do nothing. To move and yet to act like heaven, this is the way to nourish the spirit. Now he who possesses a sword made it can, U527 preserves it carefully in a box, and does not dare to use it, it is considered the perfection of valuable swords. But the human spirit 528 goes forth in all directions, flowing on without limit, reaching to heaven above, and wreathing round the earth beneath. It transforms and nourishes all things, and cannot be represented by any form. Its name is, the divinity, in man, 529. It is only the path of pure simplicity which guards and preserves the spirit. When this path is preserved and not lost, it becomes one with the spirit. And in this ethereal amalgamation, it acts in harmony with the orderly operation of heaven. There is the vulgar saying, the multitude of men consider gain to be the most important thing, 
pure scholars, fame. Those who are wise and able value their ambition, the sage prizes essential purity. Therefore simplicity is the denomination of that in which there is no admixture, purity of that in which the spirit is not impaired. It is he who can embody simplicity and purity whom we call the true man 530. Book 16. Part 2. Section 9. Shan Xing, or, Correcting the Nature. 1. Those who would correct their nature by means of the vulgar learning 531, seeking to restore it to its original condition, and those who would regulate 532 their desires, by the vulgar ways of thinking. Seeking thereby to carry their intelligence to perfection, must be pronounced to be deluded and ignorant people. The ancients who regulated the town nourished their faculty of knowledge by their placidity, and all through life abstained from employing that faculty in action. They must be pronounced to have, thus also, nourished their placidity by their knowledge 533. When the faculty of knowledge and the placidity, thus, blend together, and they nourish each other, then from the nature there come forth harmony and orderly method. The attributes, of the Tao, constitute the harmony. The Tao, itself, secures the orderly method. When the attributes appear in a universal practice of forbearance, we have benevolence, when the path is all marked by orderly method, we have righteousness. When the righteousness is clearly manifested, and, all, things are regarded with affection, we have leal-heartedness, when the, hearts, core is thus, pure, and real, and carried back to its, proper, qualities, we have music. When this sincerity appears in all the range of the capacity, and its demonstrations are in accordance with what is elegant, we have ceremony. If ceremonies and music are carried out in an imperfect and one-sided manner, the world is thrown into confusion. When men would rectify others, and their own virtue is beclouded, it is not sufficient to extend itself to them. If an attempt be made so to extend it, they also will lose their, proper, nature. 2. The men of old, while the chaotic condition was yet undeveloped 534, shared the placid tranquility which belonged to the whole world. At that time the yin and yang were harmonious and still, their resting and movement proceeded without any disturbance, the four seasons had their definite times, not a single thing received any injury, and no living being came to a premature end. Men might be possessed of, the faculty of, knowledge, but they had no occasion for its use. This was what is called the state of perfect unity. At this time, there was no action on the part of any one, but a constant manifestation of spontaneity. This condition, of excellence, deteriorated and decayed, till Suazon and Fuxi arose and commenced their administration of the world 535, on which came a compliance, with their methods, but the state of unity was lost. The condition going on to deteriorate and decay, Shan Nang and Huang Ti arose, and took the administration of the world, on which, the people, rested, in their methods, but did not themselves comply with them. Still the deterioration and decay continued till the lords of Tang and Yu 536 began to administer the world. These introduced the method of governing by transformation, resorting to the stream, instead of to the spring, 537, thus vitiating the purity and destroying the simplicity, of the nature. They left the Tao, and substituted the good for it, and pursued the course of haphazard virtue. After this they forsook their nature and followed, the promptings of, their minds. One mind and another associated their knowledge, but were unable to give rest to the world. Then they added to this knowledge, external and, elegant forms, and went on to make these more and more numerous. The forms extinguished the, primal, simplicity, till the mind was drowned by their multiplicity. After this the people began to be perplexed and disordered, and had no way by which they might return to their true nature, and bring back their original condition. 3. Looking at the subject from this point of view, we see how the world lost the, proper, course, and how the course, which it took, only led it further astray 538. The world and the way, when they came together, being, thus, lost to each other, how could the men of the way make themselves conspicuous in the world? And how could the world rise to an appreciation of the way? Since the way had no means to make itself conspicuous in the world, 
and the world had no means of rising to an appreciation of the way, though sagely men might not keep among the hills and forests, their virtue was hidden. Hidden, but not because they themselves sought to hide it. Those whom the ancients called retired scholars did not conceal their persons, and not allow themselves to be seen. They did not shut up their words, and refuse to give utterance to them, they did not hide away their knowledge, and refuse to bring it forth. The conditions laid on them by the times were very much awry. If the conditions of the times had allowed them to act in the world on a great scale, they would have brought back the state of unity without any trace being perceived, of how they did so. When those conditions shut them up entirely from such action, they struck their roots deeper, in themselves, were perfectly still and waited. It was thus that they preserved, the way in, their own persons. For, the ancients who preserved, the way in, their own persons did not try by sophistical reasonings to gloss over their knowledge. They did not seek to embrace, everything in, the world in their knowledge, nor to comprehend all the virtues in it. Solitary and trembling they remained where they were, and sought the restoration of their nature. What had they to do with any further action? The way indeed is not to be pursued, nor, all, its characteristics to be known on a small scale. A little knowledge is injurious to those characteristics, small doings are injurious to the way. Hence it is said, they simply rectified themselves. Complete enjoyment is what is meant by, the attainment of the aim. What was anciently called, the attainment of the aim, did not mean the getting of carriages and coronets 539. It simply meant that nothing more was needed for their enjoyment. Nowadays what is called, the attainment of the aim, means the getting of carriages and coronets. But carriages and coronets belong to the body. They do not affect the nature as it is constituted. When such things happen to come, it is but for a time, being but for a time, their coming cannot be obstructed and their going cannot be stopped 540. Therefore we should not because of carriages and coronets indulge our aims, nor because of distress and straightness resort to the vulgar, learning and thinking. The one of these conditions and the other may equally conduce to our enjoyment, which is simply to be free from anxiety. If now the departure of what is transient takes away one's enjoyment, this view shows that what enjoyment it had given was worthless. Hence it is said, they who lose themselves in their pursuit of things, and lose their nature in their study of what is vulgar, must be pronounced people who turn things upside down. Book 17 Part 2 Section 10 Kaiushue, or, The Floods of Autumn 1. The time of the autumnal floods was come, and the hundred streams were all discharging themselves into the hoe. Its current was greatly swollen 541, so that across its channel from bank to bank one could not distinguish an ox from a horse. On this the th spirit, Earl of the Ho laughed with delight, thinking that all the beauty of the world was to be found in his charge. Along the course of the river he walked east till he came to the North Sea, over which he looked, with his face to the east, without being able to see where its waters began. Then he began to turn his face round, looked across the expanse, as if he were, confronting Zo 542, and said with a sigh, what the vulgar saying expresses about him who has learned a hundred points, of the Tao. And thinks that there is no one equal to himself, was surely spoken of me. And moreover, I have heard parties making little of the knowledge of Kung and I and the righteousness of Pai, and at first I did not believe them. Now I behold the all but boundless extent, of your realms. If I had not come to your gate, I should have been in danger, of continuing in my ignorance, and been laughed at for long in the schools of our great system 543. Zo, the spirit lord, of the northern sea, said, a frog in a well cannot be talked with about the sea, he is confined to the limits of his hole. An insect of the summer cannot be talked with about ice, it knows nothing beyond its own season. A scholar of limited views cannot be talked with about the Tao, he is bound by the teaching, which he has received. Now you have come forth from between your banks, and beheld the great sea. You have come to know your own ignorance and inferiority, and are in the way of being fitted to be talked with about great principles. Of all the waters under heaven there are none so great as the sea. A myriad streams flow into it without ceasing, and yet it is not filled, 
and afterwards 544 it discharges them, also, without ceasing, and yet it is not emptied. In spring and in autumn it undergoes no change. It takes no notice of floods or of drought. Its superiority over such streams even as the Kiang and the Ho cannot be told by measures or numbers. And that I have never, notwithstanding this, made much of myself, is because I compare my own bodily form with, the greatness of, heaven and earth, and, remember that, I have received my breath from the yin and yang. Between heaven and earth I am but as a small stone or a small tree on a great hill. So long as I see myself to be thus small, how should I make much of myself? I estimate all within the four seas, compared with the space between heaven and earth, to be not so large as that occupied by a pile of stones in a large marsh. I estimate our middle states, compared with the space between the four seas, to be smaller than a single little grain of rice in a great granary. When we would set forth the number of things, in existence, we speak of them as myriads. And man is only one of them. Men occupy all the nine provinces, but of all whose life is maintained by grain food, wherever boats and carriages reach, men form only one portion. Thus, compared with the myriads of things, they are not equal to a single fine hair on the body of a horse. Within this range are comprehended all, the territories, which the five tis received in succession from one another. All which the royal founders of the three dynasties contended for, all which excited the anxiety of benevolent men, and all which men in office have toiled for. Pai was accounted famous for declining, to share in its government, and Kung Yanai was accounted great because of the lessons which he addressed to it. They acted as they did, making much of themselves. Therein like you who a little time ago did so of yourself because of your, volume of, water. 2. The Earl of the Ho said, Well then, may I consider heaven and earth as, the ideal of, what is great, and the point of a hair as that of what is small. Zo of the Northern Sea replied, No. The different, capacities of things are illimitable. Time never stops, but is always moving on, man's lot is ever changing, the end and the beginning of things never occur, twice, in the same way. Therefore men of great wisdom, looking at things far off or near at hand, do not think them insignificant for being small, nor much of them for being great, knowing how capacities differ illimitably. They appeal with intelligence to things of ancient and recent occurrence, without being troubled by the remoteness of the former, or standing on tiptoe to lay hold of the latter, knowing that time never stops in its course. They examine with discrimination, cases of, fullness and of want, not overjoyed by success, nor disheartened by failure, knowing the inconstancy of man's lot. They know the plain and quiet path, in which things proceed, therefore they are not overjoyed to live, nor count it a calamity to die, the end and the beginning of things never occurring, twice, in the same way. We must reckon that what men know is not so much as what they do not know, and that the time since they were born is not so long as that which elapsed before they were born. When they take that which is most small and try to fill with it the dimensions of what is most great, this leads to error and confusion, and they cannot attain their end. Looking at the subject in this way, how can you know that the point of a hair is sufficient to determine the minuteness of what is most small, or that heaven and earth are sufficient to complete the dimensions of what is most large? 3. The Earl of the Ho said, The disputers of the world all say, that which is most minute has no bodily form, and that which is most great cannot be encompassed, is this really the truth? Zo of the Northern Sea replied, When from the standpoint of what is small we look at what is great, we do not take it all in when from the standpoint of what is great we look at what is small, we do not see it clearly. Now the subtle essence is smallness in its extreme degree, and the vast mass is greatness in its largest form. Different as they are, each has its suitability according to their several conditions. But the subtle and the gross both presuppose that they have a bodily form. Where there is no bodily form, there is no longer a possibility of numerical division. Where it is not possible to encompass a mass, there is no longer a possibility of numerical estimate. What can be discoursed about in words is the grossness of things, what can be reached in idea is the subtlety of things. What cannot be discoursed about in words, 
and what cannot be reached by nice discrimination of thought, has nothing to do either with subtlety or grossness. Therefore while the actions of the great man are not directed to injure men, he does not plume himself on his benevolence and kindness, while his movements are not made with a view to gain, he does not consider the menials of a family as mean. While he does not strive after property and wealth, he does not plume himself on declining them. While he does not borrow the help of others to accomplish his affairs, he does not plume himself on supporting himself by his own strength, nor does he despise those who in their greed do what is mean. While he differs in his conduct from the vulgar, he does not plume himself on being so different from them, while it is his desire to follow the multitude, he does not despise the glib-tongued flatterers. The rank and emoluments of the world furnish no stimulus to him, nor does he reckon its punishments and shame to be a disgrace. He knows that the right and the wrong can, often, not be distinguished, and that what is small and what is great can, often, not be defined. I have heard it said, the man of Tao does not become distinguished, the greatest virtue is unsuccessful. The great man has no thought of self, to so great a degree may the lot be restricted. 4. The Earl of the Ho said, Whether the subject be what is external in things, or what is internal, how do we come to make a distinction between them as noble and mean, and as great or small? Zo of the Northern Sea replied, When we look at them in the light of the Tao, they are neither noble nor mean. Looking at them in themselves, each thinks itself noble, and despises others. Looking at them in the light of common opinion, their being noble or mean does not depend on themselves. Looking at them in their differences from one another, if we call those great which are greater than others, there is nothing that is not great, and in the same way there is nothing that is not small. We shall, thus, know that heaven and earth is but, as, a grain of the smallest rice, and that the point of a hair is, as, a mound or a mountain, such is the view given of them by their relative size. Looking at them from the services they render, allowing to everything the service which it does, there is not one which is not serviceable, and, extending the consideration to what it does not do, there is not one which is not unserviceable. We know, for instance, that East and West are opposed to each other, and yet that the one cannot be without, suggesting the idea of, the other, thus, their share of mutual service is determined. Looking at them with respect to their tendencies, if we approve of what they approve, then there is no one who may not be approved of, and, if we condemn what they condemn, there is no one who may not be condemned. There are the cases of Yao and Qi, each of whom approved of his own course, and condemned the other, such is the view arising from the consideration of tendency and aim. Formerly Yao and Shun resigned, their thrones, and yet each continued to be T, Qi Kui 545 resigned, his Marquis 8, which led to his ruin. Tang and Wu contended, for the sovereignty, and each became king. The Duke of Pai 546 contended, for Ku, which led to his extinction. Looking at the subject from these examples of striving by force and of resigning, and from the conduct of Yao, on the one hand, and of Qi, on the other, we see that there is a time for noble acting, and a time for mean. These characteristics are subject to no regular rule. 5. A battering ram may be used against the wall of a city, but it cannot be employed to stop up a hole, the uses of implements are different. The, horses, Kaiki and Walu 547 could in one day gallop 1000 li, but for catching rats they were not equal to a wild dog or a weasel, the gifts of creatures are different. The white horned owl collects its fleas in the night time, and can discern the point of a hair, but in bright day it stares with its eyes and cannot see a mound or a hill, the natures of creatures are different. Hence the sayings, shall we not follow and honor the right, and have nothing to do with the wrong? Shall we not follow and honor those who secure good government, and have nothing to do with those who produce disorder? Show a want of acquaintance with the principles of heaven and earth, and with the different qualities of things. It is like following and honoring heaven and taking no account of earth. It is like following and honoring the yin and taking no account of the yang. It is clear that such a course cannot be pursued. Yet notwithstanding they go on talking so, if they are not stupid, they are visionaries. The T sovereigns resigned their thrones to others in one way, and the rulers of the three dynasties transmitted their thrones to their successors in another. 
He who acts differently from the requirements of his time and contrary to its custom is called an usurper, he who complies with the time and follows the common practice is said to be righteous. Hold your peace, O Earl of the Ho. How should you know what constitutes being noble and being mean, or who are the small and who the great? 6. The Earl of the Ho said, Very well. But what am I to do? And what am I not to do? How am I to be guided after all in regard to what I accept or reject, and what I pursue or put away from me? Zo of the Northern Sea replied, From the standpoint of the Tao, what is noble? And what is mean? These expressions are but the different extremes of the average level. Do not keep pertinaciously to your own ideas, which put you in such opposition to the Tao. What are few? And what are many? These are denominations which we employ in thanking, donors, and dispensing gifts. Do not study to be uniform in doing so, it only shows how different you are from the Tao. Be severe and strict, like the ruler of a state who does not selfishly bestow his favors. Be scrupulous, yet gentle, like the tutelary spirit of the land, when sacrifice is offered to him who does not bestow his blessing selfishly. Be large-minded like space, whose four terminating points are illimitable, and form no particular enclosures. Hold all things in your love, favoring and supporting none specially. This is called being without any local or partial regard. All things are equally regarded, there is no long or short among them. There is no end or beginning to the Tao. Things indeed die and are born, not reaching a perfect state which can be relied on. Now there is emptiness, and now fullness. They do not continue in one form. The years cannot be reproduced, time cannot be arrested. Decay and growth, fullness and emptiness, when they end, begin again. It is thus that we describe the method of great righteousness, and discourse about the principle pervading all things. The life of things is like the hurrying and galloping along of a horse. With every movement there is a change. With every moment there is an alteration. What should you be doing? What should you not be doing? You have only to be allowing this course of natural transformation to be going on. 7. The Earl of the Ho said, What then is there so valuable in the Tao? Zo of the Northern Sea replied, He who knows the Tao, is sure to be well acquainted with the principles, that appear in the procedures of things. Acquainted with, those, principles, he is sure to understand how to regulate his conduct in all varying circumstances. Having that understanding, he will not allow things to injure himself. Fire cannot burn him who is, so, perfect in virtue, nor water drown him, neither cold nor heat can affect him injuriously, neither bird nor beast can hurt him. This does not mean that he is indifferent to these things. It means that he discriminates between where he may safely rest and where he will be in peril, that he is tranquil equally in calamity and happiness, that he is careful what he avoids and what he approaches, so that nothing can injure him. Hence it is said, what is heavenly is internal, what is human is external. The virtue, of man, is in what is heavenly. If you know the operation of what is heavenly and what is human, you will have your root in what is heavenly and your position in virtue. You will bend or stretch, only, after the, necessary, hesitation. You will have returned to the essential, and may be pronounced to have reached perfection. What do you mean, pursued the earl, by the heavenly, and by the human? Zo replied, oxen and horses have four feet. That is what I call their heavenly, constitution. When horses' heads are haltered, and the noses of oxen are pierced, that is what I call, the doing of, man. Hence it is said, do not by the human, doing, extinguish the heavenly, constitution. Do not for your, human, purpose extinguish the appointment, of heaven, do not bury your, proper, fame in, such, a pursuit of it, carefully guard, the way, and do not lose it, this is what I call reverting to your true, nature. 8. The Quay 548 desires to be like 549 the millipede, the millipede to be like the serpent, the serpent like the wind, the wind to be like the eye, and the eye to be like the mind 550. The quay said to the millipede, With my one leg I hop about, and can hardly manage to go along. 
Now you have a myriad feet which you can employ, how is it that you are so abundantly furnished? The millipede said, It is not so. Have you not seen one ejecting saliva? The largest portion of it is like a pearl, while the smaller portions fall down like a shower of mist in innumerable drops. Now I put in motion the spring set in me by heaven, without knowing how I do so. The millipede said to the serpent, I go along by means of my multitude of feet, and yet how is it that I do not go so fast as you who have no feet at all? The serpent replied, How can the method of moving by the spring set in us by heaven be changed? How could I make use of feet? The serpent said to the wind, I get along by moving my backbone and ribs, thus appearing to have some, bodily, means of progression. But now you, sir, rise with a blustering force in the North Sea, and go on in the same way to the South Sea. Seemingly without any such means. How does it take place? The wind said, yes. With such a blustering force I rise in the North Sea and go on to the South Sea. But you can point to me, and therein are superior to me, as you are also in treading on me. Yet notwithstanding, it is only I who can break great trees, and blow down great houses. Therefore he whom all that are small cannot overcome is a great overcomer. But it is only he who is the sagely man 551 that is the great conqueror, of all. Dot. 9. When Confucius was traveling in Quang 552, some people of Sung, once, surrounded him, with a hostile intention, several ranks deep, but he kept singing to his lute without stopping. Dees Lu came in, and saw him, and said, How is it, master, that you are so pleased? Confucius said, Come here, and I will tell you. I have tried to avoid being reduced to such a strait for a long time. And that I have not escaped shows that it was so appointed for me. I have sought to find a ruler that would employ me for a long time, and that I have not found one, shows the character of the time. Under Yao and Shun there was no one in the kingdom reduced to straits like mine, and it was not by their sagacity that men succeeded as they did. Under Qi and Kao no, good and able man, in the kingdom found his way to employment. And it was not for, want of, sagacity that they failed to do so. It was simply owing to the times and their character. 2. People that do business on the water do not shrink from meeting iguanodons and dragons, that is the courage of fishermen. Those who do business on land do not shrink from meeting rhinoceroses and tigers, that is the courage of hunters. When men see the sharp weapons crossed before them, and look on death as going home, that is the courage of the determined soldier. When he knows that his strait is determined for him, and that the employment of him by a ruler depends on the character of the time, and then meeting with great distress is yet not afraid, that is the courage of the sagely man. Wait, my good you, and you will see what there is determined for me in my lot. A little afterwards, the leader of the armed men approached and took his leave, saying, We thought you were Yang Hu 553, and therefore surrounded you. Now we see our mistake. With this, he begged to take his leave, and withdrew. 10. Kung Sun Lung 554 asked Mao of Wei 555, saying, When I was young, I learned the teachings of the former kings. And when I was grown up, I became proficient in the practice of benevolence and righteousness. I brought together the views that agreed and disagreed, I considered the questions about hardness and whiteness 556. I set forth what was to be affirmed and what was not, and what was allowable and what was not. I studied painfully the various schools of thought, and made myself master of the reasonings of all their masters. I thought that I had reached a good understanding of every subject, but now that I have heard the words of Kuang Di's, they throw me into a flutter of surprise. I do not know whether it be that I do not come up to him in the power of discussion, or that my knowledge is not equal to his. But now I do not feel able to open my mouth, and venture to ask you what course I should pursue. Kung Di's Mao leant forward on his stool, drew a long breath, looked up to heaven, smiled, and said, Have you not heard of the frog of the dilapidated well, and how it said to the turtle of the eastern sea, how I enjoy myself? I leap upon the parapet of this well. I enter, and having by means of the projections formed by the fragments of the broken tiles of the lining proceeded to the water, I draw my legs together, 
keep my chin up, and strike out. When I have got to the mud, I dive till my feet are lost in it. Then turning round, I see that of the shrimps, crabs, and tadpoles there is not one that can do like me. Moreover, when one has entire command of all the water in the gully, and hesitates to go forward, it is the greatest pleasure to enjoy oneself here in this dilapidated well 557. Why do not you, master, often come and enter, and see it for yourself? The turtle of the eastern sea, was then proceeding to go forward, but before he had put in his left foot, he found his right knee caught and held fast. On this he hesitated, drew back, and told, the frog, all about the sea, saying, a distance of a thousand li is not sufficient to express its extent, nor would, a line of, eight thousand cubits be equal to sound its depth. In the time of you, for nine years out of ten the flooded land, all drained into it, and its water was not sensibly increased. And in the time of Tang for seven years out of eight there was a drought, but the rocks on the shore, saw, no diminution of the water because of it. Thus it is that no change is produced in its waters by any cause operating for a short time or a long, and that they do not advance nor recede for any addition or subtraction, whether great or small. And this is the great pleasure afforded by the Eastern Sea. When the frog of the dilapidated well heard this, he was amazed and terror-struck, and lost himself in surprise. And moreover, when you, who have not wisdom enough to know where the discussions about what is right and what is wrong should end, still desire to see through the words of Quang Di's. That is like employing a mosquito to carry a mountain on its back, or a millipede 558 to gallop as fast as the hoe runs. Tasks to which both the insects are sure to be unequal. Still further, when you, who have not wisdom enough to know the words employed in discussing very mysterious subjects, yet hasten to show your sharpness of speech on any occasion that may occur. Is not this being like the frog of the dilapidated well? And that, Quan Di's, now plants his foot on the yellow springs, below the earth, and anon rises to the height of the Empyrean. Without any regard to south and north, with freedom he launches out in every direction, and is lost in the unfathomable. Without any regard to east and west, starting from what is abysmally obscure, he comes back to what is grandly intelligible. All the while, you, sir, in amazement, search for his views to examine them, and grope among them for matter for discussion, this is just like peeping at the heavens through a tube, or aiming at the earth with an awl. Are not both the implements too small for the purpose? Go your ways, sir. And have you not heard of the young learners of Shaoling 559, and how they did in Hantan? Before they had acquired what they might have done in that capital, they had forgotten what they had learned to do in their old city, and were marched back to it on their hands and knees. If now you do not go away, you will forget your old acquirements, and fail in your profession. Kung Sun Lung gaped on the speaker, and could not shut his mouth, and his tongue clave to its roof. He slank away and ran off. 11. Quan Di's was, once, fishing in the river Fu 560, when the king of Ku 561 sent two great officers to him, with the message, I wish to trouble you with the charge of all within my territories. Quan Di's kept on holding his rod without looking round, and said, I have heard that in Ku there is a spirit like tortoise shell, the wearer of which died three thousand years ago 562, and which the king keeps, in his ancestral temple. In a hamper covered with a cloth. Was it better for the tortoise to die, and leave its shell to be thus honored? Or would it have been better for it to live, and keep on dragging its tail through the mud? The two officers said, it would have been better for it to live, and draw its tail after it over the mud 563. Go your ways. I will keep on drawing my tail after me through the mud. Twelve. Hui Di's being a minister of state in Liang 564, Quang Di's went to see him. Someone had told Hui Di's that Quang Di's was come with a wish to supersede him in his office, on which he was afraid, and instituted a search for the stranger all over the kingdom for three days and three nights. After this, Quang Di's went and saw him, and said, There is in the south a bird, called, the young phoenix 565, do you know it? Starting from the South Sea, it flies to the northern. Never resting but on the Bignonia 566, 
never eating but the fruit of the Melia Azedarach 567, and never drinking but from the purest springs. An owl, which had got a putrid rat, once, when a phoenix went passing overhead, looked up to it and gave an angry scream. Do you wish now, in your possession of the kingdom of Liang, to frighten me with a similar scream? 13. Quandis and Huidis were walking on the dam over the Hao 568, when the former said, These thrissas come out, and play about at their ease, that is the enjoyment of fishes. The other said, You are not a fish. How do you know what constitutes the enjoyment of fishes 569? Quandis rejoined, You are not I. How do you know that I do not know what constitutes the enjoyment of fishes? Huidis said, I am not you. And though indeed I do not fully know you, you certainly are not a fish, and, the argument, is complete against your knowing what constitutes the happiness of fishes. Quandis replied, Let us keep to your original question. You said to me, How do you know what constitutes the enjoyment of fishes? You knew that I knew it, and yet you put your question to me, Well, I know it, from our enjoying ourselves together, over the how.